Climate Pledge Arena. We already have quite a lot of people filling out the arena, filling out the seats, and we are down to just three teams. Our top three teams remaining today, and at the end of it, we will have our TI-12 champion. We will be seeing all those players lift the Aegis for themselves. My morning panel has changed up from the last few days. I still have Lacoste with me. I still have Rezo, but this time I have Gunnar joining me. Hello, hello. Pleasure to be here on the final day. Yeah, you get to do the opener, and I'm in a little bit of spoiler. You'll be working this first series with us as well. But how how excited are you? You hear? Maybe not as excited as if you're playing, but it's, it is it's the exciting. final day. Yeah, and. Uh... I like to see the kind of comparisons between the teams. I think gaming has been playing really fast, and I think the other teams have been playing really long games, so it's going to be a battle of kind of the styles today. Yeah, which tempo is going to come out on top and which tempos are we going to see? But what about yourself, Reza? Man, I want to say thank you to, you know, to, to being here and, like, welcome to Seattle, guys. Hey, hey, everybody. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it's, it's an amazing day. Like, I'm really sad that this is the last day because it's, like, it's been such an incredible journey already. Like, we've seen so many games, so many clutch games, so many, like, long games as well. But the Gaming Gladiators, like, giving us this, the fast tempo as well. They're coming with a new, unique play style that they came up for this specific tournament. And uh, I'm, I'm really, like, uh, I'm really excited, like, how is it going to, like, continue doing the same things? Like, uh, are they going to continue stomping their teams and, like, going to the finals and making the same thing to LGD and Spirit? Or, like, you know, LGD are going to come up with some in you and like stop their pressure. Yeah, it's, it's been three weeks leading up to this final day. I can't believe how quickly it's gone. The fact that we're down to three teams, Lacoste. Yeah, it feels kind of sad, but I'm also very hyped about what's going to happen today because we see, we've seen some of these matchups, like the big storylines coming into this TI. The whole 2023 was pretty much Gaming Gladiators against Team Liquid. They had to face in the lower bracket, and unfortunately, one of them had to go home. They're still going to, you know, stay here, watch the Grand Finals. But uh, the other thing is Team Spirit, just dominating. Whenever there's a lot of money involved, a lot of prestige, you know that this team, they're going to speed things up. They want to be the one, you know, crowding themselves as a second time champion at TI. I was just looking at Yatora yeah. games and he's doing this once again. He's playing every game with a new hero. Like <laughs> old he hero does challenge again. Old hero <laughs> challenge again. Like the only two heroes that had like two repetitions was like CK and Muerta. But other than that, he's like every game new hero, like Troll, Sven, Turboblade, you name it, you know. <laughs> he's going for this new play. Like he he doesn't really like he doesn't like to play the same heroes. Yeah. They're running back the style that uh garnered them a lot of success for TI ten. You know the benefit of being on the morning panel, by the way, the opening the pre show, is that you can put out who you think is gonna win. TI out of these three remaining teams and you get to look smarter than everyone else that comes on later in the day. So do you want to give it a go? Do you want to say your bold prediction? It's, it's a one in three chance. So it's 50%. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I, I do feel like Team Spirit, they've showed the best like map movements. Uh, their drafts are always on point, how they play. If, you, if you're playing late game against Team Spirit, and we've seen a lot of these games going to the late game, I feel like they're going to take it. But also between the two teams that we're going to see right now, LGD Gaming against Gaming Gladiators, I feel, you know, and they have the upper hand because they really stepping it up. Ever since they played against Nine Pandas, all of their games are like 20 to 30 minute games pretty much. I mean, to me, the finals are going to be between Spirit and Gaming, to okay. be honest. Yeah, I, th I think LGD are not going to handle the pressure from Gaming Gladiators. Like, it's we, way we too much. We had a few Gaming Gladiators fans that year when you, when you said that they were going to be making it to the <laughs> sorry, final. Sorry, guys. Sorry to <laughs> upset you. But yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Gamings, they're like very good at laning, and it's been LGD struggle for like a long time. So <laughs> I think uh, they're not going to be able to handle that pressure. But for the finals, I think Spirit are like way more solid. Like they're, very, they're very adaptable, and I'm, I'm, I think this is the only one team that who can stop the gaming later from like you know doing the same thing. And like because they're also very good at laning, and if you're good at laning, and that that timing doesn't really work when you're like on even terms. I think there's also a comparison because Spirit is probably the best team at playing from behind in this tournament. No matter how bad the game is, they can still win. You feel like they're gonna win even mm -hmm. if they're down a lot. And so for gaming, a lot of their ways they win is just early game pressure and just taking over the game so fast. But I think Spirit's probably, if there's one team to beat, that'd be Spirit. Okay, all right. So we're all kind of putting a lot of eggs in the Team Spirit basket. They had to be repeat TI winners, but it's a long day ahead of us. We don't know what is going to happen, but we're going to start this day off with the right turn. We got Casey. We're going to catch up with her and what it's like in the arena. Welcome to Grand Finals Day! We made it! There have been people lining up here since 6 a.m. and I only know that because that's what time I arrived. 
So here they all are coming in. We know there's so many people watching from home and we thought we'd walk you through the experience of those attending here because we want you to feel like you're here with all of the energy. Everybody is walking through the entrance here. Tell me more about what made you decide to come to TI. How long have you been playing Dota? I've been playing Dota not very long, only about three years. What about you? Three years. I've been playing since like 2012, like high school, beginning of high school. Oh God, what? I'm so sorry. Oh, I didn't know you were here. Uh, Connell, by far. Sorry, sorry. We're doing no. mandatory entrance interviews as what? always. No, Hello, no, no, welcome. No, no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, I'm no. being taken over. Absolutely. Thank you. What did she ask you? She asked me uh, who was going to win TI. Who's going to win TI? I said Team Spirit. Was gonna win okay, TI. great. Mandatory interview over. Your turn. Favorite hero? Uh, Arc Warden. Uh, match breaking ranking. Bad. Here, get up the escalator. Come <laughs> on. Guys. Ah! Are you ah! Yes, very much. Very Who's gonna win? Very, very. Who's gonna win? Quinn. Uh, that's not a team, but okay. All right. Mandatory entrance interview. Mandatory uh, interview. Hello. <laughs> we do this every TI. Say a word. Uh, good. Oh, CCNC. Oh, okay. Nice job. These are always Flex. a banger. Yeah. Flex. Keep going, Casey. I'm trying to get away from you. You good? Who's gonna win? Gladiators. Who's gonna win? Most likely spirit. Who's gonna win? Most likely spirit. Who's gonna win? GG for the win. GG. Who's gonna win? GG. Gladi. Who's gonna win? Are you? Are you? Afraid? Who's gonna win? Hopefully. Let's go. AG. Yeah. Who's gonna win? GG. Who's gonna win? GG. How about GG? GG. GG. How about it? Howdy. I'm Slack. Those are even words. Your turn. Go. Who's gonna lose? TS. Oh, that's how you get him. That's how you get him. No. Slack. No. Get no. Keep him away from me. No. Who's gonna win? Could not tell you. <laughs> now that's the kind of energy we like. Team Spirit. Team Spirit. Team GG. Team Spirit. Let's go. All right. Woo! I think that worked. Yeah. Those were very quick interviews, Neil. Mandatory. Mandatory. Well, what do you reckon the interview per minute was at that rate? I feel a little bit sad that there's like no, uh, not a lot of LGD fans were there on, at this moment. I, I'm sure there's a lot of in the crowd right now. Can we hear them, guys? Anyone LGD fans? Yeah, that's what I'm love. talking about. Give us wait, some wait, love. Give us some I, I want to know, I want to know, gaming gladiator fans though. Oh. They're a little bit louder. And what about Team Spirit, guys? Okay, I didn't think we were gonna get that loud of Team Spirit chance until later. We know yeah. that they're already in the grand finals, so I thought all the Team Spirit fans might have been getting their sleep in, getting their uh, gamer hours going, and, and they were gonna arrive a little bit later. But it was nice to, to know the chaos that KC Tsunami Slacks are working hard in the concourse, getting some more interviews for us. But if you're at home, fret not. There's also a lot of content for you guys today that you get to enjoy here for our final day of TI-12. We are gonna have our short film contest. The finalists will be in announce our cosplay contest as well and then at the very end of the day we're going to have our last late game live with uh Perian and jenkins that's been happening the last two nights as well so if you guys want to Oh, want to be in the background? Charlotte Theatre is where I heard it's been taking place. So it'd be nice to see you all down there. The short film, the cosplay, that will be taking place between the lower bracket finals and the grand finals. So there is action all throughout the day. Nothing that you guys want to miss at all. And there's already been a lot of action, Lacoste. Oh, absolutely. If we're talking about the Dota action, like mm -hmm. you've even seen like this, this whole meta shift that uh, has been going on ever since the group stage started, where you had all these tanky uh, mid laners, off laners with the Blade Mail Heart, and then you had like some of these strong off lane duos with the uh, Viva Plus Grimstroke that has risen at, at the recent uh, stages of the tournament, uh, Tusk Plus Dawnbreaker, and also some of these untargetable heroes. And then there's a separate meta that Gaming Gladiators are playing, which is constant push like they're just going for these 20 minute games picking all these pretty much heroes that they've been playing throughout the whole year just switching things up a little bit uh, bringing out chen which is you know undefeated in their hands so far mm -hmm. and i think this might be the hero to look out for in this particular series because both of these teams are undefeated with the hero and also this is the hero when gaming gladiators they lost to chen when they met in the group stage I just think it's really scary for non-gaming gladiators today because every other team is so used to buying Midas, going late game, and gaming won't let you do that. So hopefully everyone did their homework and they're ready to not lose in 20 minutes like I did to gaming and they can beat them. It feels so bad when you say it like that. We're like all oh, hyping up game gladiators and then it's the reality. Like, yeah, we had to face that. That was our first uh, patch up in the main stage. 
It is what it is. It is what it is. Reza, how do you feel about the, the meta shift and some new heroes that we're seeing, mostly at this main stage? I just love when uh, teams are innovating, right? Uh, when, they, when you come into the games and you don't really expect like, what's going to happen. LGD, I think they have that. Like They pulled the Tinker in the last series against Spirit. It was a pretty good game. Like I, They could have won easily. It was like 70 minute game again. But the game later, they're like they're inv innovating like every game. They're bringing new heroes. Like they have this strict like playstyle that they invented, but they also like innovate in terms of heroes as well because they brought a Husker yesterday as well, yeah. and they brought the Underlord back from the you know nobody picked that hero for a long time. So they're like they're thinking about like they have the structure of like how they want to play, but they're still like adding on top of it new new stuff. And I'm I'm like for Spirit for example, they're like very solid, very steady, but they're not like very innovative in that sense. They only brought Magnus, but I mean everybody's playing Magnus right now. It's also collapsed Magnus. Yeah, so kind it's of a classic. A little bit of cheat in there. I, there were a lot of teams yesterday though that had that innovation too. I remember Bet Boom, they brought out the Dragon Knight, a hero that hadn't been picked at TI-12 yet. So we saw it yesterday. We started yesterday with six teams. We ended yesterday with three teams. If you missed it, luckily for you, we have a little bit of a recap and we get to see all the highlights of the action that took place in day two here at Climate Pledge Arena. Footstep of his own fountain, yes! Ultra kill for Duraccio will chase the Dawnbreaker ultimate coming in for the turn. Whoever is left behind, it's going to be three down. So before the no collapse, he cannot be underestimated. Team Liquid versus Game and Gladiators. You don't want to give up this Roshan. Celery deep in the corner. How do you get, get this way. guy out of here? Put a core though. Oh, it's yeah. on three. That's beautiful. But immediately the BKB going up. They are doing a lot of damage. The Necrophones is getting low. Can they finish? Oh, side. Oh, and it's just cleaning up with the glaze. And Celery dove on through the pit, but he missed the ages. Luna Siege. It is all the more dangerous once your tier three is down and you start getting those bouncy glaives into play. Exactly. Trying to pull Jirachu out of position, almost got him, but he pushed a little bit over to the side instead. Harpoon pulling in the Kunkka. Now they did roll Follow this one up. He has no BKB. You gotta remember. Yeah, this is gonna be neat to die straight up immediately. Now Liquid left at a four versus oh, five. Oh, oh. He's gonna stand his ground, but Quinn, what a hit on through with the Swatch Buckle almost finishing up. The Radiant's gonna run down Mickey on his first life. They are absolutely gonna be losing four here. Meanwhile, mid lane, they really? are fighting this one out. Quinn, what hit? once again survives on just a little bit of damage. He actually went for that kill, you madman. The block, the shield is just enough to get Celery out of it, but Mickey, he's gonna be in trouble. As soon as Zai dies, they're gonna turn all their attention over this guy. The eighth oh, the land. He gets it just on the tip, Quinn. GG is called Gaming Gladiators. They will bring down Team Liquid. Azure Ray versus Boom T. But FY, wait, he bought back. FY, does he have enough to stay alive though? The stun is there, a long duration, but no, he's gone. Just like that one. GPK stunned for a little while. Chal is still there for the control, but he's out of position. Three seconds stun, starts to fall and gone. Can they find more? But there's the Reaper Scythe, oh. there for a turnaround. The fight, it's lasted too long. This is where Somnus shows up. Who takes the down? Two seconds done on the sun. Oh, he's running at the kill, but he transfers it over. Gets the cheese off in time. The Lotus, not sure what it was. He's but like, now he's defense. over to the side and Som is still living. Somehow, someone. Oh, he's gonna do it! Triple kill for GPK. Oh, oh, he's in the Can they do it? They take him down. GPK trying to run. Oh, 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 oh. is too strong. They see GPK, decide to jump on him to start, make him less tanky, oh, no. but the chrono for the turn, and the deeps being thrown out and ripping them to shreds. No, they don't head for the roast, they just head down the lane right now. Ben Boom trying to hold for all their worth, but do they have enough damage? Do they have enough to take him down? Nightfall, he's out of the base yet again, he's gonna die! 80 seconds gone! Azure, they lasted long enough, and one death was all it took. They're stepping out of the base here. Bro, they got vision uh, collapse. Uh, he's able to get the jump, get the hold on, straight back, straight away, into the fair, push back for the the boys come flying in, put the men off, and then take it down. Yeah. Shiro's so The Vegas put the men off, and the BKB goes for a second round. And Shiro, he's trying to escape here with the invis, he's trying to jump forward. He's actually going to drive back with the Xbox, Shiro's out of the game as well. Spirit, take this game one, 76 minutes in. Lay down a stick, Shiro's from off the side of it, he's really, really the jump of the league, because he's there. He's able to fade away from the initial attempt from Edgini, but still there's RP. Not to say, drags him back towards the rest of the team now. They 
Spring got Throw him. down. TB's coming in for Spring. Can follow pretty much the fallback turn away there. Pulling the back. The fifth fall up as well. Straight down under nothing to say. The Magnus will fall. Here comes Collapse. And Elsie Red drags back Shearer. They fully focus the Spring to the top. Follow up there for a while. Double kill for Collapse. A Spirit, they'll lose your Toro, but they make the planet pay. They'll find the third. Triple kill for Collapse. Give Maybe the fourth. More. They chase our planet. Ultra kill in. 23 minutes in for Collapse on the CK. <laughs> Zoracho getting healed from the sideline from Tofu. They're going to have to do a lot more healing than that. They're going to be able to kill off the edge eventually, as Chalice is now going to die. And just like that, it's a five versus three. So their racks will end up falling at 18 and a half minutes. Gaming Gladiator is playing way too fast for Azure Ray to handle. So oh, Lanham's not going to be too happy with the beginning of this game. Holy <laughs> Jesus, dude. That was the biggest inner fire I've ever seen. Already three kills for Gaming Gladiator. Those, now Sobna is under his tier one. The battle begins. That's our three remaining teams there. We saw them, LGD Gaming Gladiators and Team Spirit. Yesterday, we did see Liquid, Betboom, and Azure Ray end their TI-12 run. They should be extremely happy with where they placed because it was a tough run for themselves, tough opponents all around, and that is how our bracket is shaping up. Did you guys do your bracket predictions, by the way, in the, the client? Your Oracle? You didn't? I didn't. I never did. How, how accurate? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I have to explain. Get the one. other winners so, <laughs> in the finals. I think I had Azure Ray reaching top three, but uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but after what happened yesterday, these guys, we got to give them credit. After yeah. they lost, first they managed to win against Betboom. You know, there was some beef going on, some all chat, some question marks in the all chat. Uh, and uh, after that, it seems like the job was done. You know, they, they came here to play. They came here to beat the Betboom. And then, you know, this is the team that formed pretty much. Uh, this is the streamer team. When, and they wanted to, you know, show that they can still do it on the main stage. Uh, this, these are the players that don't receive salaries, some of them. And they just wanted to do it for fun. They lost big smiles on their faces, and I think we got to give them give credit and the big applause for what they managed to do at this DI. Yeah. The other team well, I wanted to mention is uh, Liquid, because they're the, the only one who actually managed to take down games from both Gaming and the Spirit. So they're like, I think, for, for to me at least, they're deserving to be like in the top three, top, top four. But, you know, because the bracket happened to be that way, he, <laughs> they're actually eliminated already. So, yes. But it's sad. It's sad to have, have them go. A lot of really good showings. I want to talk about fantastic showings, though. Enough to break TI records, okay? It's been a wild month, and so we've had some all-time TI records set during this TI-12. So in a single match, these are our new records that we created this year throughout the three weeks. TA-2000 getting two TI records for himself. Excellent. New as well, Kiritich and Virtus Pro. It's in the same game. TA-2000, he did play yep. Nagasaren and broke those records. He's an insane player. Usually, when we talk about TA-2000, he was the guy that plays these agi carry heroes, but he also shines on some of these melee heroes as well. And also, as we've seen, Neo, uh, Doom, GPM, this guy is just a monster. I mean, he's been the driving force of the new LGD as well, calling some of these shots. And, uh, you know, TI-23 23 leaders, uh, Kiritich on his Spectre. He also broke a couple of records in that game as well. This guy is just insane. Really glad that Virtus Pro showed some top-class Dota at TI. I like the Nightfall one. 300 34 map pings. Yeah, they're by far the team that pings the most. <laughs> they're like 600, and everybody, then there's like Talon with 400, and everybody else. That, I mean, you can expect this. Yeah, if you play pubs with Nightfall, you, you know that. <laughs> he, he loves just pinging and talking. You can know, like, you can kind of know how he's on a team, just of how much he talks in games and pubs. Because mm -hmm. you always talk more in real games than pubs. So if he talks a lot in pubs, I'm sure his pings are just crazy in a tournament. It's also the most skilled stat right there on the spot because, <laughs> you know, you, you have to have a, have a skill to ping 300 times a, yeah. a game. But other stats like, you know, Naga, 1000 GPM, like, it's whatever. Like, it's long game, like, we all know that, but the pings.
It's a skill. The, the snaking one was interesting as well very quickly because it's now no longer the longest game. So it makes more sense if you had the longest game. Placing that many observer wards would make sense. But now no longer the longest game, but still holds that record for this tier as the most observer wards placed. Uh, look, I don't really have a segue for this one. All I'm going to say is I'm excited to hear a little bit more about some meta changes, some big heroes that showed up yesterday. And to give us that information, it's Purge. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, we have a huge match coming up today. Uh, LGD coming from the winner bracket. They've played the entire tournament with a unique style. They've been playing up meta. They bought few hand of Midas's compared to the other teams, and it rewarded them heavily. They won the vast majority of their games until yesterday, where they faltered a little bit. Now, in the, one thing that was trending for them in the previous matches is they were winning with Magnus in almost every series that they played it. And surprisingly, uh, they didn't ban Spirit Breaker. Uh, Zhao 8 said that he he didn't think the hero was overpowered. Now, he's a big spammer, so he's probably just biased here. But it's the seventh most banned hero for the entire tournament so far. So the fact that they finally banned it for the first time yesterday means that meta is shifting a little bit, and maybe LGD is feeling less confident in their ideas now that they're getting some losses. And in terms of the Magnus, what it accomplished, they won three of their last uh, series with the Magnus, but this one yesterday was a little bit too tough. They got behind in the laning stage against Team Spirit's farm-heavy style, and normally Normally, you would think that their high tempo playstyle would be able to beat that. But in every single one of these clips, even though they're getting successful kills, they are still behind in net worth because Team Spirit was so good at playing the map here. This is a clip we saw earlier in one of the, uh, the highlight reels, but this is a great moment. They kill the enemy carry with a great RP. Magnus has been successful yesterday in getting these grabs that are difficult to snag and giving really solid team fight power but Team Spirit was just too good against it. So hopefully for LGD, they don't falter from their ideas and their confidence after their loss yesterday. And we'll see how they can do against Gaming Gladiators, who so far has looked pretty unstoppable. Thank you so much, Purge. While we're, you know, talking about some other people and hearing from other people, let's hear from Slax and Casey. I do believe they're in the crowd somewhere. Oh, that's right, Nat! We are here! Check in the morning. Casey's volume is up all the way, so I thought it'd really get us some energy. Crowd, good morning. How you doing, gamers? All right, you ready to go talk to some psychos? I'm not gonna call them psychos. Hi, friends. Hi, non-psycho friends. First thing I did was I said, who is here with a big group of friends? And what did you guys say? We made friends all day today. Okay. Really? Then what is his name? Clay. And what is his name? Ryan. Are those your actual names? Yes. <laughs> all right, all right, yeah, this is so wholesome. Hello! Who wants to be on camera, sucker? Out of my way, excuse me. Hello, you seem excited. GG fans over here, how you feeling? Good, really good. Uh, who's gonna win? GG. Oh, wow, how surprising. Say something I wouldn't expect. Uh, North America for the win. Wow, that was very unexpected. Not a lot of people would expect that. How are you doing? Hello, good to see you. Look at all these signatures. He's got RTZ, he's got Abed. How are you feeling? Great, how are you doing? I'm good, okay. I, Don't and ask he got him. this one? Uh, what, what? And he got this one? Oh, yeah. We're coming back. Shopify is going to take it. <laughs> very depressing stuff. Casey, what's going on down there? What do you got? All right, Slacks, it's time for us to do something we've done every year since TI4. I don't know if you're ready for this. Myron, give me your camera. Oh, yes! Here, TI4, I'm giving you my, the my microphone. Door, my I'm friend. sorry, but it's time for you to experience my pain. Yes. yes. And be interviewed by Slacks. I'm so sorry. Come, Myron, once more. Every year we have shown our wonderful camera crew, and this year, Myron! He's back on the camera, the Myron Lord continues. Myron, so good to have you. The crowd walk and they love you again, Myron. Oh my goodness, they love you. Sir, we need to expand our Myron Lord. What is your middle name? Reggie. Reggie, his middle name is Reggie. It's Reggie. Thank you so much, Myron. It's Reggie because my mom named me that because it has what? What letters? Two GGs in the middle! Oh, baby! Oh. Oh. Thank you, Myron! Myron, another year, another banger. 
there, Casey. You're lifting that so well. Thank you so much, Casey. Thank you. Yes, incredible. Can I have the camera too? Is that not good? Wants to replace slacks. Oh, that's a horn. I think we need to go. I don't know what horn that is, but that means go. So we put it back. Take it back. Hey, yo, what's up? Slacks, thank you so much. Casey, thank you as well. I loved knowing that uh, not only Dewey Down and Myron's middle name, but uh, that he's a Game of Gladiators fan. Yeah, for a good reason. I mean, he made the, their, their uh, days shorter, you know. They were long days, and he's like, you know, I want to get this camera on. It's pretty <laughs> heavy, but uh, yeah, really glad that now we know his middle name. Yeah. Well, look, we'll see when Game and Gladiators are playing. We're going to have our schedule. You get to see, we already know that they're in the top three, but we're going to see that they are in the first series here. So they are up against LGD and then potentially another long day for themselves up against Team Spirit if they do make it through. They already had a marathon of a day yesterday. They were first and fourth series yesterday. I just hope that uh, Duracha feels way better today because he was very sick yesterday and he still managed to perform like insanely well. He was like 15-0-12 on the Viewer game last one. And it was like after, you know, for the second series they already played. They're walking confidently. Can we see Duracha? No. Oh, yeah, you can kind of see him a little bit in the back there, but uh, Ace is leading the charge. He's doing all the signatures uh, for the team of Gaming Gladiators. But LGD, this bounce back for them, Actually, I'm going to change this. Let's just talk about all the carries, okay? Because there's still three teams left. We don't necessarily have to talk about this exact matchup right now because we could be seeing any iteration of the grand finals. So we have our carry comparisons here. We still got Duraccio left in the pool. You already talked about Rezu. He might be feeling a little bit under the weather despite how good of a performance he had yesterday. There's still the chance it affects him. Shiro is uh, the carry for LGD. And then Yatora, of course, being the carry for Team Spirit. So this is their hero pool of what they played at TI-12 and their average kills, deaths, and assists over the course of this tournament. I mean, the cool stat here is that they, they both, like, all, all of them, like, have pretty similar death rate, which is uh, kind of insane because Yator, like, is playing, like, r longer games with Shira, but for Duracho, it's, like, the same rate considering the, the, lane, the games are, like, finishing, like, within 20 to 30 minutes. Because, like, this guy, he's playing super aggressive and he's not afraid. Like, he, he said it multiple times. He's not afraid to die. He's just doing whatever his team is needed. And he's he has, like, full confidence of, like, Queen and Ace, like, you know, following up and not dying, like, and, and carrying the game for him as well. You can also see Spirit and LGD have this 45, 46 minute average timing where gaming, you know, they're finishing the games on average a lot quicker. And so that's kind of where you see Yatoro get a lot more kills on average. But I also think it's impressive that he's managing to die pretty much the same amount of times with more games, but your more time being played in the game. Yeah. We also had the shortest games, 19, 29, and 30 minutes, respectively. So that's massive. Gaming Gladiators getting a 19-minute win for themselves. Yeah, it's pretty insane what they can do when they get the hands on the heroes that they like to play. And they it feels like they, they got the heroes that they wanted in the last eight games they played because they wanted to speed things up. Uh, they're bringing out these enchantresses, this Chen. And the, we've seen Duraccio, you know, having slightly more deaths because this guy is nuts. Like, I really love to watch this guy play Dota because you mentioned the Weaver game yesterday where he was diving tower four minutes in. He's on tier two tower. He's building Urn of Shadows on a carry, something that we've seen only on Spectre pretty much. He wants to keep this aggression. This is the team that uh, once they realize that you're bleeding, your lanes are bleeding, they're not going to let you go. I also like the way he's walking on the stage, like Duraj. He he always feels that you know that love from the crowd, and he's like uh, putting his hands up, like you know, give me that love, and he he wants to have that attention, right? Mm -hmm. And then in fact, for G for the LGD, the biggest challenge right now for this series is gonna be like how strong of the lanes they can get, because this is the team that they're focusing like on this mid-game strategies and like how their heroes synergize well between each other. But to me, the most important thing is like how they're gonna get out from the lanes today. I think with uh, their draft from yesterday, I'm hoping that LGD kind of changes things up. They picked slow heroes, I think, for Spirit, which was fine. The games went really long. They had a Tinker yesterday, a Spectre, and I'm hoping for them to pick faster-paced heroes, kind of adapt. Maybe they take the Tides, the Chens, the Entrances, or Kunkas, something that allows them to fight gaming gladiators really early on, because I think if you're able to contest them and you drag the game out longer, that's how you have the ability to actually beat this team. How quick is it to make that adjustment, though? I think for a caliber team like LGD, they can probably do it on uh, like an afternoon. Oh, really? That yeah. quick? Okay. They have one of the best coaches in the world. They have Zhao Wei, so he's probably cooking something up right now. He's probably telling the boys what they're going to do. Just trust me. I'll draft you something to win, and 
hopefully they win. Yeah, look, they've had a couple days to see that tempo of gaming gladiators. We'll see how they do fare up. But before we do anything else, we have to get our day started. So let's do it. Let's make some noise, everyone. It's the final day of TI-12 starting now. It is a beacon sounding a call to greatness that echoes worldwide. A crucible forging a single contender worthy of rising above the very best. And a celebration gathering a community of millions to witness history unfold. It is the International, the final proving ground where the world's finest Dota teams assemble to face each other in the ultimate test. Each challenger has earned this honor through hard-fought victories in matchups around the globe. The journey has tested some more than others, but the favorites and underdogs all know the road to the Aegis defies all prediction. And anyone can carve a new legacy here. The Aegis of Champions returns to Seattle, and with it the eyes of the world. Three teams compete for ultimate glory. Only one can seize immortality. Will emerge victorious. The battle begins. It's our final day, TI 12. At the end of today, at the end of two series, we will be seeing a team lift the ages. And I cannot wait. Our lower bracket finals is going to start very soon. But first, let's welcome our first team. change is going to have to happen and the fact that they are one of the best coaches to make it happen for them. Yeah, I really think the draft is going to play the biggest part. Both teams already proved their players are good enough to just be here and they don't need to do anything special. So it's going to break down to the draft mostly and we'll see. I think Gaming Gladiators have a really good read on the meta of the tournament and kind of just breaking it compared to everyone else playing really fast. And I've really liked the way they draft. It seems really hard to beat them in the draft. So I think if LGD can even get an even draft with a good, you know, tempo for the game, it'll be they'll be in a good position. Mm -hmm. Look, we, we pulled all the extra stops for this lower bracket finals to help us with the draft as well. We've got Sheepstick joining us, by the way. Can we get a round of applause for her? 
crowd? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Matt. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I just appeared out of nowhere. You really did. Yeah, Lacoste is gone now. Sorry. You just ate him. You consumed him, and you're like, I'm taking his spot here. And you're going to help us talk about gaming, Gladi. It is LGD for the lower bracket grand finals. Do you agree with Gunnar that they're able to make this uh, change in tempo for themselves despite the really rough loss, especially that 76-minute game yesterday? Oh my god, watching that was heartbreaking for LGD. Uh, I believe that they are a super top team, obviously coming this far. I think when we saw them play against Azure Ray, it was kind of like uh, there that they exampled how they lost the early game, but they really understood their timings. They really understood uh, where they wanted to go with their team and they, the moves that they pulled off to kind of bring back and equalize the game and then take the advantage and win and just close it out very cleanly without throws. Like that's the LGD I want to see coming here, smart, disciplined and ready to own. Yeah, but uh, they're not facing Azure Ray. They're facing gaming guys who are rarely making any mistakes, right? They're just like very confident going objective after objective. And if they're not confident that they can break it, they're not going to go for it. They're not going to give the chances. So it's, it's a very different uh, game we're going to witness here. It's tough to know what is going to be their win conditions before we see their drops, but I want to talk about stable players for them who has been the most consistent in showing up. And I feel for both these teams, it's the off laners. It's Ace, it's New for both teams. New is also really new to this team. Uh, he only came in after two or three. You're laughing because New is new. New is new, yeah. <laughs> I thought so. I thought you'd have a little bit of giggle over that one. But yeah, he, he's quite new to this team, but he slotted in perfectly. And there are a lot of games that I saw him being the anchor, the one that's holding down the fort for them holding those defenses to allow Shiro that time to be able to build what he needs on his carry. I think the offlaners that are left in this tournament are very like stable and uh, all of their like initiation power like they're doing it very well and very methodically and uh, for new like even Centaur game yesterday he was carrying the game so hard on the hero that you would not expect that to have that much of an impact so that makes like him incredible like skilled player that knows his timing very well and also like you know he, he delivers <laughs> so this is like this is the strength of their team like for sure. Also during last chance qualifier last year, people were singing his praises, new, and they were saying, you know, he's gonna be on the best Chinese team by the next TI. And here he is, he's proving himself at TI, he's already top three, so I definitely think that the offliners for both of these teams are kind of their like rocks where no matter how the game is going, they're gonna win their lanes, they're gonna have a very stable game and always do their job, kind of no matter the draft, no matter the hero, no matter the situation. Yeah, I really want to highlight as well. It's not just the offlaner, it's who you're laning with. The pause fours, I think, new. Uh, prior to this team, he played on Vici Gaming, he played with FY. Now he's playing with Planet, who not as big of a name known, but I think Planet is easily one of the best uh, pause four players I've seen this year playing. This guy is phenomenal. Um, I would hype him up any chance I got. Last yesterday I was, or two days ago I was saying, I want to see Planet Rubik. We saw it. He owned with it. He's the only guy winning with it really in this tournament. I think Planet is amazing, and seeing him and New lane together have been. I mean, they've just been destroying. Yeah, I want to ask you a question off the back of that then, because we talked about these stable off laners. As a mid player, Gunner, how important is it to have a stable off laner that allows your pause four to do so much? Or is it not so much for you as it is important for your safe lane? It matters, honestly, for all three lanes. Okay. If you win your off lane, it allows the five to rotate through the gate right now, gank the carry. It allows the fours to check the water rooms, the power rooms at six, eight minutes. And kind of everything, I think if you win your off lane, it almost wins your other two lanes just for you. And it's really hard these days to just stomp the mid in a pure 1v1. We've honestly seen it the last two days, which was very surprising that the mid lane matchups went really bad. We saw the Dragonite versus Puck, we saw the Void versus Puck, so maybe it's just Puck, not the mid lane. <laughs> but they've kind of had rough times where the game snowballed out of control, but I wouldn't expect that today. I think it's more so going to be mid lane stable and whether side lanes kind of snowball one way or the other. Also concerning how important the laning are right now, like if it's really important to have the synergy between position three and four, like same as like a safe lane, and you, you almost like need to have like those two uh, players to be like a friends because like it was it was the same for me when I was playing with Zeist, like we had an incredible incredible like uh, you know, working working together time because like we we understood each other very well. We are friends, and this is like what's important for for these players as well, like to have that synergy and like you know talk uh, talk with the, about mistakes, like improve on laning and understand each other without even words sometimes. How would you compare uh, Quinn and Nothing to Say in the mid lane? Whether it's Hero Pool, whether it's the importance their team places on them, how would you describe them or, or compare them, Gunnar? Uh. They're honestly pretty different mids. I think Quinn, when you think of him, you think of him as more either a spirit or a counter pick. Like he played Huskar and he plays the Necrophos, these like kind of annoying heroes that just you feel 
it feels really bad to play verse. Mm -hmm. And I would say nothing to say outside of his tinker. I think he's a lot more of he just plays his good heroes. Uh, he's really confident playing just the same heroes all the all the time. He plays Ember, Pango. He plays a lot of Magnus for a really long time, which is kind of coming back in this tournament. So. I think for Quinn, you're looking more for this guy to snowball the game for you and win the game for you, and nothing to say to just have a solid game plan. All right, we'll see if they're going to draft around that, if we're going to see any new picks for them, or what's going to be banned, as we do have our lower bracket grand final game one. LGD Gaming versus Gaming Gladiators. Game one. Ban a bristle is what the audience is saying. How much uh, weight would you put th into that one, Gunnar? Uh, for LGD, I think bristle is one of gaming's best strategies, especially because it's ace. You allow ace to get a carry in the off lane. That's pretty much his bread and butter. He plays lone druid. He, he used to be a carry, mm -hmm. so it's not surprising that he's able to play the carries in the off lane, win his lane, and just have a stable game. <laughs> I don't think bristle beggars the intro guys <laughs> ever, ever again. I think that here is way too hard to deal with, and uh, they, you know when the AA is banned and like. What is the best answer for you, Gunnar, against this hero? So I think one of the big reasons why Bristle is so strong is his counters are also meta, so it ends up that the Primal Beast gets banned, the Phoenix gets banned, the AA gets banned, and so all of your responses to Bristle are just banned due to the nature of the draft. And so it, it's just a strong hero now. Yeah, and the Where, Viper and Kudwin are not really Yeah, the other hero. ways to break him and reduce his HP region don't really exist anymore. So I love what LGD did against Bristol back when they were playing. They had this Magnus, and they always like break his positioning because he's always in the front. And they they managed to take him with his cure like way back into his own team. And then Muerta like with the extra damage to to stop that hero, it actually works. But and also you don't get damage from the, when you're an ulti, you don't get damage from spells. But uh, yeah, it's not gonna be seen anytime soon. <laughs> I see the entry and the Chen ban here, so a lot of importance placed on taking out what they deem as Celery's uh, most confident and broken heroes. But now I see Chaos Knight left in the pool as well, which is another one that has seen ban after ban after ban. And Primal Beast is letting through too. True, I didn't even notice that one. I want to see Primal Beast so bad. Yeah? Yeah, I'm begging them to ban CK. <laughs> I mean, they'll probably just take it, they have first pick. I, I'm really glad to see the Chen ban, though. I think a lot of teams seem to be kind of disrespecting game, and I think they kind of showed early on that they're capable of this uh, death ball type lineup. Let's go, Primal! Woo! Yeah, it's not like Primal. All right, but they they show that they can go fast and hard, and they're like super happy to just run you over. And we still see teams picking like Naga first phase against them. It's like you cannot disrespect Gaiman in this way, especially when you leave the Chen in the pool, even to the second phase. So LGD taking that Chen out, I'm very happy to see it. Also, the Enchantress, I think, kind of does the same thing. Whereas they both win their lanes, they're very stable, which leads Duraccio kind of gets to do his own thing. And Celery can help Quinn, which is, again, kind of their bread and butter. And uh, they buy auras, they push towers really fast. It's kind of everything they want in one package. Yeah. I also like that LGD chose to let the Primal Beast through because I think for Ace, that here is not really what he's looking for. Specifically because he he used to play like this lone druid bristol back type of hero that are more scalable But for primal beast he doesn't he doesn't scale as much like in terms of like at least tower push, right? Like he's not he's not gonna be like the hero who's gonna take all the towers from the LGD So it's already like I think it's good for LGD that they don't have that pressure already starting from the first pick And I like the Chen and Enchantress bands for sure The nice thing with the primal is Quinn's been <coughs> practicing and playing it quite a bit in his pubs and his games so it ends up being a flex as well, so you can't just end up just instant picking a carry counter pick or a mid counter pick because it'll go to both. I would say they're valuing it more as an offlaner right now, just due to how kind of the map setup that the offlaners get up get more farm than the mids right now. And Primal Beast is here that can farm really fast with just trampling over camps and waves at the same time. So it ends up just becoming a stronger core in the offlane if you get away with the lane. Is that every team is doing that or more gaming gladiators specific when you get your hands on a Primal? Um, I don't know if I can speak for most teams, because some teams, their offlaners don't play Primal, so it ends up just kind of being forced to mid, but for gaming, I would say right now I'd expect this to be an offlane. Yeah. Yeah. Primal's like weird when it goes offlane because it, it can be punishable, but there's ways to bring him back into the game. Like, for example, your four can go and stack like the triangle, and it's very easy for him to take stacks or trample. And also, you're kind of just waiting for this timing, right? We've seen primals in the offlane get absolutely obliterated, but as soon as they hit that BKB timing, it's just his spells do so much damage just alone. Like, you don't even need anything more than that BKB that that's when, like, games have turned around and they've made these comebacks. Primal is such a hero not to be 
<sighs> underestimated. I mean, it's also very hard to take him down, right? There's right. not a lot of things that, that could do that in this meta. I mean, I think Muerta would be nice, but it's already out of the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, for, for Primal, usually pick, uh, they, they, they don't really go for BKBs nowadays. They also go for different item builds, like with the Blade Nail, Heart, and just trade chaos. Usually the important thing is buying, uh, picking a stun for the safe lane. You want to pick a Sven, a Chaos Knight, are the important ones. Not just because they have the damage to like out CS the Primal, but mostly because they have a stun to prevent the trample. And something really interesting with the Phoenix is Phoenix is good in the game versus Primal with the Sunray just doing percent damage, kind of chewing through Primal's health. But in the lane, the Fire Spirits don't really affect you. You don't attack, you're disarmed anyway while trampling. So it ends up actually being a really comfortable lane for Primal there. I completely agree with you. I think something like Clockwork is way better than having the things there against the Primal primal lane. Yeah, purely for the lane. It yeah. kind of secures, you can pick a ranged carry then. Uh, the popular carries versus primal are either melee with stun or a ranged carry with kite. I'm sure the LGD want to put this phoenix on the offlane with the centaur for now. Ten seconds like, at least that, I, I would be thinking about that. Yeah. I guess now for Gaiman, if they want, they have Grimstroke available for them. If they do want to, I mean, it's just good for any side lane, but if, if they do want primal in the offlane, it's going to especially be nice there. They're probably going to end up taking their carry, which is really cool from the Centaur pick, because now if gaming wants to instantly counter, they can get carry counter pick for the side of LGD plus the lane counter with the Primal Beast. So it's kind of this weird position where if you delay your carry too long, you're allowing the Centaur to be free in the draft, and if you pick it now, you open up, you know, Jirachu to get countered in the game, which yep. we've seen him counter pick with the Razor yesterday, where it had a rough game, and I was even worried that he would carry, but he just ended up destroying the game with how good of a Razor it was. I love this Lifestealer ban. I think it's the only two teams that are actually raiding this hero at all. <laughs> because uh, n nobody else uh, are, are really looking for that one. And Durachi is like, he's known for his Lifestealer as well. Yeah, we saw it yesterday in the Azure Race series with Bepum. And the, sh the strongest thing about the Lifestealer is that he sits in his lane for 10 to 12 minutes and you can never kick him out. Which really hurts how Gaming Gliders wants to play. They want to move their heroes around, take the towers really fast, and when there's a carry that's sitting in the lane and you can never pressure into him, it feels really bad for how you want to move around the map. Yeah, and for Gaming to, to have that hero on your safe lane and not care about like how to make his uh, gameplay better and like have complete freedom and supports. You know, this is what they excel at. Like, their two supports are usually running around mid lane and helping uh, CCNC to, you know, do all this pressure and like start from the mid lane. This is like what this team is really excel at. Bigram did end up getting picked up by the way, Sheep. That was one that you were talking about. It's just really powerful hero. I mean, you play around this Inkswell like dear purge of the stuns. It makes it so hard for anyone. Like you're playing with a primal already who's just gonna want to go in and destroy everyone. Like this Grimshot on top of that elevates his uh, like strengths throughout all stages of the game, early, mid to late. I think the hero is just, to, to be given so freely to game in, it, I think was was rough for LGD. And now they have a silencer on top of that to cover their team fight. I mean, looking at these three heroes, like I don't, I don't really like it for Gladiators that much, just purely because they're uh, going away from their idea of like pressuring so much, and I think it benefits LGD because in that game, like the normal game where there's not a lot of pressure, I think this is like their best chance of like taking the series down. I also think so. The way the draft kind of plays out these days is the second phase is really hard to ban heroes as they only get one ban for the side of LGD. So they end up picking the one hero that they think is the best, the Life Slayer, and they have to give up the Grim, they have to give up anything else. So pretty much the only bans you really get and feel confident about are the first phase, and they chose to take out pretty much Celery's heroes. They take out the Chen Ench, which are, I think are his top two right now in this tournament. And so now you see him force the Sansa. Yeah, as you said, I don't really feel too confident with this, just because it's moving into, they're playing into LGD's book, I would say. And that is something that has not really gotten them to where they are right now in the tournament. And the Shadow Demon is such a great pickup to stop in this Primal Beast from doing anything in the mid game. Like it, the lane might be rough a little bit, uh, but uh, I mean, looking at their support, right? They don't have really a good way of stopping him. But in the mid game, like against playing against Purge and the Shadow Demon as a Primal Beast is actually impossible. Yeah, the it's also really good for Grimstroke. You can purge the Ink Swall anytime you see a hero. The Primal, surprisingly, it purges the charge, so he can't even charge out when he gets yes, purged. Yes, exactly. Uh, and the defensive purge is really nice for Silencer, too. Maybe he can click it on the Phoenix early in the fight. The Phoenix will always get stuff off. And we see the cow. I mean, the cow is amazing here as well, because those two supports, they don't have really a good mechanic to stop him from charging. Neither it's Primal Beast, so they're going to have to think about buying Yules on somebody. 
to be able to stop his charges, but it's still like we've seen so many times the spirit break is just like going first in the net first. Like even after losing his lane horribly, it doesn't matter. As soon as you're buying like Midas and Nocturne, you're just pushing every wave, and then you have this mechanic of like coming back to the fights uh, from anywhere else. And I think it's really important in this patch to have one of those heroes that can connect easily to the fight and like being on the other side of the map. So it's either like Spectre, Dawnbreaker, or Spirit Breaker. That's why those heroes are seen more. All right, so there's some really quick stuff. Uh, Quinn played versus Spirit Breaker mid because that's what this is. We see the Centaur, so we know that this will be nothing to say's hero. And it was versus Nine Pandas, Kiyotaka, and he absolutely destroyed the Spirit Breaker. And as we talked about earlier, Quinn's this type of player who you give him a counter pick like Necro versus a melee strength hero, and he's going to do some work in the game. I honestly was thinking that they might put the Primal mid because that was the matchup he played versus Nine Pandas, whereas Primal versus Spirit Breaker, he solo killed the lane, the game ended in 20 something minutes. But they picked Necro, which is, if anything, is a stronger lane now versus Spirit Breaker, so. I would be really confident now just for the fact that they have a hero to play around with Quinn. Yeah. Even like despite that, I kind of don't like the supports on LGD. I think that they're both not high on burst damage, they're pretty slow. I think it's much easier for Gaiman to make moves. You talked about how they like to kind of crush early. I think now with this winning mid matchup, I think they can make much more plays or they can even just kind of play it chill and wait for their timings on Primal or whoever and just make sure that they're playing defensively where they use Global to cover any ganks that LGD try and make. Yeah, it seems like they don't really think about like going to the mid game and like how Necrofoss might be bit against Porch and like not you know like not being that tanky core. But at the same time, like they're just looking purely on lens and they're like, this Necrofoss is gonna stomp the Spear Breaker so hard that you're gonna like you know completely run them over. But I'm still worried because usually their lineups they have this good tower damage and this is how they were able to uh, close the games out so fast. But on this lineup specifically, there's no like hero that you know kills tower, so they need to find some. Uh, material like Turbo Blade or something from the Russia side that actually like helps them take down the ob objectives in this game. A lot of their success with the Decapose ends up pairing it with other push or other healing. They picked it with Dazzle offlane in the past, where they both just ball up and they go just end the game. And they probably picked it with Tides and Chen, so they don't really have the draft that you win 20 minutes and you walk down a lane yet. We'll see what Dracha ends up picking, but I would say it's outside of Terror Blade that's not really his hero pool. He doesn't really pick the early game. Alchemist. That's one way to up the to tempo. To me, this game looks like the game won against uh, Liquid, where they chose to go for a uh, you know, regular lineup, and it didn't really work for them, and they lost that game to, to Liquid. So I think that, like to me, it looks at, at least uh, that uh, this is the game for LGD. If they manage to like get out from the lanes evenly, or like not super stomped, and uh, you know, going to the mid game, I think they have way better chances. I want to trust this uh, Spirit Breaker. I think Spirit Breaker is a crazy hero, but I'm too worried about the mid matchup going away for Game Gladiator. So I think that Quinn will just stomp the mid lane and just carry the momentum throughout the whole game. Do you think even if uh, the Spirit Breaker does get shut down in lane, he's still going to have that disruption in team fights and will still have an impact that could carry a later game for LGD? If there's one hero I would want to get crushed on mid, it'd be Spirit Breaker. Okay. So uh, he has that going for him. <laughs> that, that one small glimmer of hope. Yeah, I agree with you guys. Although, I, that being said, I, I really like Gaiman's speed that they can pull up here. I think like when Alchemist gets his Blink Dagger and they're able to kind of move around the map and be really fast about it, I think LGD are going to struggle playing into this global. Uh, anything else that you guys want to talk about very quickly, especially this Alchemist? We've seen it a couple times for Duraccio. Is it going to be that thing that ties it all together, the make or break for Gaming Gladiators quickly, Gunnar? Uh, yeah, I think the Alchemist lane is going to be really stable top and they'll have a really good time and just they have so much time to make space for him, just bodies on the map and pressure that he'll have a good time farming his Radiance. All right, I like it. Let's see how much confidence uh, Gaming Gladiators coach has in their draft. Thank you very much. I am standing by with CY of Gaming Gladiators, who uh, you had a late, last, late, late night last night, my man. How much time did you have to prepare for today as a whole? Did you only get to prepare for LGD? Or did you prepare for LGD and Spirit? We only prepared for LGD. We didn't have that much time as well. I also want to get some sleep, it's pretty important, but one game at a time, you know? So, no preparation for Spirit. One game at a time and you come up with a silencer. What's this guy doing in this draft for you guys? Hopefully he silences Phoenix. I never knew Dota was just that simple. Now you only got to prepare for LGD, but I remember that during the Riyadh Masters, you and I got a, quite a few opportunities to interact, and you seemed confident in your lower bracket run. It unfortunately got cut short at fourth place. Why should I believe you this time that you're gonna make it all the way? 
I mean, this time we already made it to third, right? So it's better than last time. So you should just believe. Seattle, you ready to watch some Dota? Let's get lower bracket finals started. Let's indeed. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It's LGD up against Gaming Gladiators to start off this final day of the International Fog. We heard there from CY coming in with a bit of a different pick this game on Gaming Gladiators' side, the Silencer. Could this be the answer to the Phoenix, a hero that we're seeing time and time again so far this tournament? Definitely feels like a kind of cool pick, a very different one style here. Very good versus the Phoenix, but also versus these saves that we've been seeing a lot coming out in this tournament, the Shadow Demon in particular. We've seen so many games where people just get bailed out of certain death. Very difficult if you're global, so we'll have to see itemization and stuff. Of course, there's going to be some demonic cleanses that you can precast and stuff like that. We'll get all into that as we do have an early smoke from LGD. Let's see if they can get the catch here. Coming in with a wraparound, trying to enter in to Gaming Gladiators' jungle. But Gaming Gladiators, they're hovering around that mid-tier 1 tower in a bit of a tough point of the map for LGD to strike. Very unlikely somebody gets caught out here gaming. Yeah, they're Very prepared. super prepared. Yep. They know this sort of play is going to be coming out here. I'm looking forward to this one. This looks like it should be a pretty fight-heavy oh. style draft. I'll say that they're Directio right. and Celery. They kind of step okay. across. Gonna set up with a disruption. You looking for the follow-up. Who's the concoction's there? Tries to hold him back. Doesn't matter. And you still fight the who's the monster Celery. Celery taken down. First blood for That's LGD. Right. So if they can find something in return, Game of Gladiators, the curse upon you, they will at least get the trade. Quinn not able to get the first blood, but still getting that kill as the mid lane is going to feel pretty good for him as the Necrophos. Especially versus that Spirit Breaker in particular, too. This is a matchup that Quinn could snowball out of control, just like Panel was talking about. Planet messing with Duracho quite a bit here. He's going to try and make it a try little bit more, it more awkward for him on his way back towards that top lane. Extra bit of damage coming in. And he'll certainly have money to play with, as he was the one indeed to get that first blood yeah, Planet, for LGD. Planet not hesitating whatsoever. Instantly buys out pretty much everything. I think triple mangoes purchased up, so he's looking to be pretty aggressive up here. A pretty strong lane. I don't think that we've seen too much anymore. I know the Centaur a ton, but Centaur and Shadow Demon, an old classic. Very aggressive as well. A lot of damage. If these two start to get a bit of a level advantage, this Alchemist and, and Silencer could end up being very vulnerable against the huge amounts of burst that these two can come out within the landing stage. Gaming Gladiators, they've got to be careful up there. Yeah, absolutely. This is probably the lane where lots of chaos is going to be happening. Mid lane, I think we already kind of expect the Quinn should be able to take advantage of this one massively versus nothing to say. Bottom lane, all right, this one could also be pretty kill heavy as well, too, especially for the side well, of gaming already. Yeah, they're getting Shiro. right in underneath the tower. Shiro in trouble. One more slap from Ace right. will get the job done. Shiro taken down. Ace will lose his life, but happily taking that trade. They're getting in and taking the carry out. All right, this is going to be bloodthirsty in these side lanes. Uh, and overall as well, what would you sort of take away from the, the carry decisions from both teams? Because it was quite a quick pick with the Luna in response to the Alchemist coming out at the end from uh, from Gaming Gladiators. Do you feel that this was what LGD were going for for any way, or do you think this was directly because of the out being picked? I think it probably could have been something they were looking for anyway because of the Necrophos. I know Shiro, he's one of the few players that I've seen that's actually still doing this like 3-1-1 build even in the early game. He's very aggressive, likes to be involved early on. So maybe it's that mixed magical physical damage they wanted to just be able to have versus the Necro as well too. And it fits for kind of this early style with the Shadow Demon that can look to brawl and fight often. So probably a couple mixtures of things that they did want it want with it. Also, it's going to be very good for this night vision, of course, too. Playing with the spirit breaker, playing with this lunar night vision can be pretty strong inside of these team fights. So, so far, looking at the last hit, that's the, the mid lane, as you say, as expected. The edge here for Quinn. But look at Ace's last hits right now. Bottom does get that kill early on, of course, but he's only got three to his name versus Shiro at the moment. Getting to the point already where you know it's not easy for nothing to say to sort of approach this mid wave. And it will take a huge amounts of damage and favorable trade going the way of, of it's Quinn Necrophos in this 1v1. Top lane, Duraccio is in a bit of trouble. He's got the concoction cooking up. Is he able to throw it out? He's not, oh, he holds it for the deny. All right. All right. That'll, that'll get the job done. He's out of the lane for a few seconds, but at least able to stop LGD from getting the kill against him. But he is really struggling on the last hit department. So far, new and planted bringing it to him. A new. Didn't win yesterday, but made some pretty amazing plays Ooh, on his side. Look at this in the mid lane. It's getting pretty nasty. <laughs> Quinn just sort of running nothing to say right back underneath the tier two. He's just I mean, what, what, what do you do at this point in this 1v1? At the least, he can go back and he can just charge out and stuff, right? So he can make moves all okay. over the match, but it's a matchup that he knows he's going to inevitably lose. But it is at least a hero that can make moves around and is probably one of the best recovery heroes in the game at the moment, so. For sure. Uh, and for gaming gladiators, they need Quinn to be having this sort of start in the mid because as yep. we're seeing on the side lanes, it, 
it's not going quite as well for them. Yeah, they need somebody to build a rally around, especially if the Alchemist is having this slow of a start for Duraccio. Nice attempt there from Planet, trying to catch the wave. Unable to. Level 3, another big kill threat that they're going to be able to have up here on the side of LGD. Bottom though, Ace, continuing to get aggressive. And they've got the Inks well stunned. They'll allow them to set up to take down Why You Smile. Gladiators, whilst they might not be getting the easiest to farm here for Ace down bottom, they're finding action. Top lane, Duraccio. It's going to fall pretty low here to the Poisons, won't quite die. And both New and Planet also getting out. Beaten down pretty low here by Celery. If he gets another one, could be a kill. She's cooking up a concoction. One more. So if anything, it's just going to allow planets to try and find further connections, but nah, the force's not there. Nope. I'll turn towards Celery instead. New, he's stepping up. He's got a hoof stomp and a double A. Celery, he could be in a lot of trouble here. New will go with the right clicks alone and take Celery down. Backs away. Make sure not to use the double H to bring himself too low. Back and up, charges in. Through. Nothing to say with the rotation. Charges forward on towards Duraccio. Duraccio, this time, will not be able to deny himself. Planet gets the kill. I mean, these two, honestly, Planet and New yesterday were making magic happen again putting a ton of pressure up here. The Silencer's trying to dissuade the pressure, of course, with those Arcane Curses, but they're just waiting patient. And as you said there, they understand. Don't use the double edge. Exactly. Just go for the right clicks. Very, very calculated. Yeah, New in particular really knowing his limits yep. on this hero, playing aggressively despite his HP being incredibly low in these situations. And there you see right away, it's a gap. He's losing the mid lane on this Spirit Breaker, but I think Spirit Breaker, Primal Beast, probably two of the best heroes that can just easily make those rotations, gets a good connection. But yeah, Quinn, he definitely will be an issue that they're going to have to find some answers. And they do have answers. I was going to say, because game progresses, yeah. they've got the Demonic Purge. It's yep. always going to be able to remove the Ghost Shard. They've got this massive amount of magic damage that comes from Phoenix and potentially from the Luna. As he's not going for the beam build just yet, but of course, he'll have those points in later. So overall for, for LGD, the fact that they know that Quinn's getting this completely uninterrupted free farm in the mid lane, you don't think they're too concerned about that? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's going to be, of course, a lot of plays that happen with these, you know, global silences that can just potentially save Quinn versus a lot of the burst and whatnot, but they probably feel like they do have some answers since they have that mixed magic. Nothing to say, shows in the mid. That's deep, they cliff the wave. Ofu not quite able to connect with the initial slow. See, Quinn should be able to close in with the Inkswell buff upon him. He's got the sights ready to drop down. If he feels that the kill's going to be there, he'll drop it, and he's got it. Quinn able to take down nothing to say. Same time up top though. Duraccio in a spot of bother being chased out by LGD. Completely surrounded by the three of them. Disruption's there to try and mess up the ability for him to fry his concoction. It will sell stun and cause the stun to hit onto new, but it won't save Duraccio as he goes down once again. Planet actually even holding the poisons. I think maybe just saving that kill there for new. Some calculation coming in five to four. Action packed early game. I mean, this nice top lane, he's, he's sort of been what knocked out of this top lane three times already, Duraccio. It's uh, not getting nothing. any easier for him up here. Uh, he's got pretty much nothing right now. I mean, 2,400 gold, so he's similar as that Spirit Breaker, but level three only on the Alchemist so far. Now, soon to be hitting, what, level five on you. Yep. Massive amounts of burst going to be coming in. They've got this decently sized creep wave pushing forward in towards them as well. So LGD in a very happy spot in this top lane in particular. Yeah, they're starting to leave Ace alone down bottom. Tofu's trying to rectify what's going on up top, trying to help out Duraccio. Yeah, they hit it with the scan though, LGD. So new, he'll be knowing to say, stay safe to close to the tower. He's unlikely to be caught out by this rotation. Nice attempt there by Y. Ace, maybe gonna force a dive here. Ooh. He actually stops it as well, right. too. Very well played, but at the same time, why are you smiling? He's down to the low ground with the Sunray. That was so quick, the Sunray, but can he get away? I don't know if he can. He's going to have a few spirits to throw down onto Ace. Lucent Beam as well, trying to hold Ace back. He's going to continue to run this down. Another spirit out, slowing down the attack speed. Okay. It's enough to actually allow why you smile to get away. Meanwhile, back on the top side of the map, Duraccio got taken down once again. This time, Quinn turns up, wants to try and make LGD pay for it. They will get near in return, but they won't get nothing to say. Just another instance now where Duraccio, he is not having fun up here. He certainly isn't. But New does have to be a little cautious. The one thing about Centaur playing versus Silencer, don't want to die too much. Giving up that int can be a problem mid. for the hero. Another connection. Up, Quinn's in with the burst. It's another side kill here for Quinn. And this Necro, I think that's what Boots Travel finished up, so his movement around the map is going to get faster and faster. Now looking to pressure, I mean, he's going to get good damage onto this tower here. Good thing that Y's there to at least drag a little bit, but Quinn just starts chasing. Oh, 
He's in under the tower. Celery is getting dove here by the two of them. I don't think there'll be any TP backup for this poor old Silent Servo. He's coming in now, but Celery will still fall. Planet finishes off the kill. Question is if Gaming Gladiators can find some return. Duraccio is able to step in, throw down the concoction. These are big kills for Gladiators to be picking up. Same time down bottom. Ace chased upon by nothing to say. And Shiro, the, the ultimate up in a second here for the Spirit Breaker, but he can't quite find the vision, nothing to say. So Ace, he'll walk out alive once more. A good attempt, but just a bit too tanky. You see that he actually did put at least two points in the Lucent Beam. Most of these players haven't gone for like the 1-1-3 build. Not able to get the kill, but a good attempt. Top three cores on the side of Gaming Gladiators, even though Duracho is dying a lot of time. He's still doing pretty decent, I mean, all things considered. Especially with the fact that those kind of last few deaths on new on that top lane, definitely swinging things back in favor of Gaming Gladiators. And now can they hold on to this mid-tower is the question. The planet, planet is surrounded. Another easy kill here for Quinn to get involved in now dominating on the Necrophos. And he knows immediately the Shadow Demon was getting those stacks up. We'll be able to take him away instantly. Aggressive posturing by Gaming Gladiators again. Playing around Quinn with this strong start. Yeah, they can play aggressively around him on this mid area of the map. And at the same time, if LGD look for any moves now in the side lanes with the boots of travel, Quinn, he's likely to be there every single time. So whilst LGD got away with those early kills, the whole the, the, the difficulty, it stepped up massively. Making the moves for LGD, it's no longer easy. No, and nobody wants to go mid, right? They have Why You Smile here just trying to slow down the push, just throwing fire spirits on the wave, but the tower inevitably dropping very soon. Quinn, very active as smoke, moving toward top new. He shows himself. Yeah, so it's back up. He's ready to look for another stack. See if News able to play as well. This, the looks of it sort of avoided one another. New will be able to get around from this one. They'll hit him with the scan, but he's already back to the safety of his side of the map. So New nicely avoiding that move there. It's actually both scans. They used immediately both of them trying to find him, so he was able to sneak himself away from that at least. Ace will be able to clean off some jungle. Is going down the blade mail route. Pretty good blade mail game versus this Luna versus the Phoenix. I think across the board. And very early aggressive wards that we're seeing gaming already placing down. So they're going to have good information. When you're playing versus something like Spirit Breaker, if he has such a hard lane, you know he doesn't want to return back mid. When they get these deep wards down, you're going to see these charges coming through. So they're, they're going to have a lot of information to play off in these next few moments. I mean, what, 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 what do LGD do for the next move? They're going to try and go on bottom, but the global silence comes out and for Seven Ace. He's ready to turn. Goes back in with the ultimate straight on towards Shiro. The sight's there. They've got the burst. Quinn turns up, takes him down. As at this point of the game, it feels just it's so incredibly difficult for LGD to make any sort of moves, but at the same time, they don't want to sit back and farm because on the other side of the map, there's an alchemist picking things up. I think it's still a bold attempt to go for this primal. He is very tanky, 1400 HP already. They are quite lacking in the damage early game. Quick rotation, this tower gonna get pressured massively here. They will be able to hold on to their mid tower at the least and get some levels on the Phoenix, but damage being done here from Gaming Gladiators early on. They're opening it up for Duracho to get good timing. So oh, he he's got four deaths. He's about to have his Sacred Relic already done. It, it really seems like it didn't matter. Catching up massively. LGD, where do they go next? Hey, difficult for Aluna as well, too. If you do start struggling in this game, the heroes that you have to run you down. There's a Primal Beast. There's this Necro who's going to be immensely tanky. And a Radiance that's going to come out soon. LGD need to start getting something going in their favor. They'll get the, they'll get the top tier one, but TPs are coming in from Gaming Gladiators. Right so if they're able to catch anything, Quinn, not quite able to get in reach of you with the ink swell. As LGD, they'll get the objective and they won't lose anything for it. Right, look where nothing to say is being forced to try to find farm. He's just on the outskirts try, trying to get anything. It looks like it was scouted out, though. I mean, they were pinging it. Yeah, Celery, he seems to know something's up. And that's sort of one way to, to get back in the game as a mid-spirit breaker. It's just not easy. Looking for kills, oh. looking for action. It's not LGD's strong point right now against the tools that Gaming Gladiators have managed to amass. No, and overall, too, he's, he's playing into the Primal Beast, which is a hero that just doesn't even care about status or just if he gets the grab onto the Shiro again. He's in, in trouble. trouble. He's put the Lucid Beam just in time to hold Ace back. And he's able to get out of the range of the Ink Swell. So by now, under the two supports, Gaming Gladiators are going to continue to move forward. Nice they've got the burst, they've got the side, not quite enough damage to burst. And the egg is down, good spot. Playsmart pops the egg, they can't quite take it out. Quinn and Celery, they try to hit it, but they can't stop the supernova. It's a turnaround from LGD, they've taken out Tofu, they've taken out Celery, they'll bring Quinn low. Duraccio. Can LGD get more out of this? Both Ace and Quinn incredibly low at the side of the fight. Duraccio on the retreat, nothing to say, charging it over towards Quinn. Who's stopped from you? Double edge as well, they've got Massive. the burst, they take down a LGD strike back hard! Beautiful connection. What an egg right in the middle of everybody. 
Gaming try to go for a very early aggressive play here. The Reaper doesn't do much damage at all. Oh, they needed that. They needed that big time. That An amazing big. fight there for LGD. A right, big wombo combo team fight abilities connecting perfectly there. We'll see the, the, the move again, you know, Gaming Gladius, they walk right into this. I mean, it looked like a solid start going for Shira, but between the Stampede, the, the hold back of the Lucent Beam, avoiding that initial attempt from Ace, they, they feel good and they get the soul bind. It's an early side, but it's one that you feel tempted to go for because they're linked together, but it's just a bit too soon. The burst isn't there, and at this point, I think you got the Fire Spirits out as well, the Who's Tom's are new. They just didn't allow Gaming Gladius any chance to take down this egg. I honestly look pretty beautiful spell casting coming out across the board. Planet, even with that little disruption, buying time, so that they both don't get grabbed from the Primal Beast. They're going to try and go again in Gaming Gladiators. This time, They'll they might find Shiro. Find Shiro. They're in on top of him. Solvine's back up. The grab's there. Shiro won't survive this time round. Gaming Gladiators, not to be deterred after that, the way that their last fight went. They went straight back here. This time, they get the job done. No hesitation. They know that they are pretty cool down the line to be able to turn those fights early game since they do have that little bit of a lead. They do have Global as well, too. That last fight, Celery, didn't have it, so hanging on to it for the next upcoming fights. So with the clean up these ancients, Radiance, it is finished. Radiant are scanning. Seeing if Y is gonna commit for this here. He has the shard queued up very early on this Phoenix. I was expecting to maybe see that Midas queued up, but we'll have to see which route he wants to be able to go on this Phoenix. Just to calm down a little bit here from Gaming Gladiators. It's definitely going to be a bit more careful about how they make that next move. Yeah, I think if they're going to make that next move, they're likely to have the global in particular, hesitate a little bit more with how far they go for the big dive. But LGD, feeling more confident here. Looking for Quinn as well, too. The Bible comes out. Comes out. But they will manage to walk this off, so not the worst of situations there for LG. They'll feel quite good about that one, baiting the global. Gives them a good few, you know, minute or so to make that next play without the threat of Celery being able to put a stop to their move. So a successful bait of the ultimate from LGD. Yeah, good trade. Demonic Purge only has like a 60 second cooldown, so that's going to be coming up pretty soon again if they want to make that aggressive move onto Quinn. It's always going to be a pretty good kill threat, just being able to get, make sure he can't ever get Ghost Trout off, get the focus fire so he can't move. But yeah, here's the smoke. every minute that anything slows down, the game the gold lead just massively goes for yeah. Gaming Gladiators in seconds. LGD, they've got to try and abuse this window, the, the global silence being on, unavailable for Gaming Gladiators. Can they find Quinn? Can they pop him? Ult at the ready. It's underneath this ward setup from Gaming Gladiators, and so not an easy part for, for LGD to strike into whilst they lack the vision on the high ground. Ace. Giving a lot of information as well for Gladiators. Their, their front line is just so tanky here. They All three cores it. effectively are pretty, pretty tanky in the side of gaming. Quinn almost has his heart finished up. I was waiting to see if Tofu was actually queuing up his. Bit of a different route of items. He's actually going for the Yule. So, I mean, playing versus the Spirit Breaker, it's pretty common to see it. But, I mean, I think we've pretty much always seen those Grims go for those shards right away. Just how effective it can be. But I guess maybe because of the Shadow Demon, he is... Hesitating for it a little bit just because that demonic purge, but we'll have to see. Gladiators. You're gonna have Quinn on the front line. He's gonna get caught in the only combo for nothing to say, but he's it's still got space for the play where they jump for it. But the soul might there responds. Quinn, he's perfectly fine. Turns with a side down under the two of them, takes nothing to say out. Use your fall for the curse damage and salary. The egg successful, but there's no chance for LGD to fight aggressively off the back of it. Why Ismar has to TP out of the fight. I mean, your two tanky frontliners just get detonated right at the start of the fight. Egg connects, but doesn't really do much of anything. Tower now. Looks like gaming. Still want to go for even more kills as well, too. Duracho, full BKB. Now he feels pretty unkillable with this BKB on the Alchemist now. I mean, mostly magic damage on their draft early game here for LGD. This is just going to make Duracho pretty invincible. And yeah, Quinn. Looks like he does go for that shard before finishing up the heart, so he's got a bit more mobility versus the Shadow Demon as well. And they are controlling a lot of this map. I mean, they're denying a lot of farm away from LGD, from Shiro in particular. Yeah, I think the concern as well for LGD is the fact that the, the one fight that they did have going in their favor, it was one that Gaming Gladiators handed to them. They're still yet able to find anything positive with regards to starting the action themselves and looking to make the initiation. It just hasn't happened from LGD. Not easy into this draft versus these bruisers versus these tanky, tanky cores. And yeah, the early BKB from Duracho, it's going to cause some big issues. How, who do they really want to focus fire now at this point? Do you focus fire the BKB Alchemist? You probably have to go for these supports because these frontliners are just going to pretty much absorb everything that you throw at them. So now at the moment, no egg for 30 seconds gaming. I see up. Quinn. Keeping that farm going, Quinn. He's able to dive away here while you smile, but Ace is closing in upon him. Why you smile? No egg, no dive at the ready. There's no chance for survival. Another kill. 
Nothing to say. He is very deep. He's going to be okay. Gets the charge off in time before Dracho is able to find him. So still doing his best to pick up what he can across the map and continue to try and catch up to, towards getting that Octarine done. That's still going to take time, though, for him. Going to take time, and it's always still going to be issues because he doesn't have ways to really protect himself besides that. This big burst that comes out from Reaper, the grab that comes out from the Primal Beast, always going to be an issue for this Breaker. Duracho on the Alchemist, the Blink Dagger around the corner. Next time round, he will be able to get that catch. And they will be able to get the double connections constantly with the Soul Bind with that as well, too. Some very, very difficult fights ahead here for LGD. He's getting too tanky too fast on the side of gaming. Ace, heart soon on the menu for him, too. Quinn, he's got it finished. Even though they've got this Demonic Purge, he's just too tanky. 6-1-3 and three so far on this Necro. This pick seems to be a bit too much for them to deal with at the moment. Tier 2 now, starting to get pressured. Can they mount a defense here? This is not an easy spot to fight. They have got the ultimates, but at the same time, so do Gaming Gladiators. Unless someone in LGD is able to find their way to the back lines, find this silence, the Celery is going to be able to put a stop to any sort of team fight that the LGD try and respond with. Yeah, not easy for you to just like charge through or anything like that either. There's a Primal Beast, there's a Soulbind that's always going to be stopping you. And gaming, they're just playing as a unit so far, not giving the opportunities to LGD. Shiro is getting some good time to get that farm going. He's got his Manta, got the Mask of Madness, but he needs more to be able to actually show up to these fights, it feels like. This is great for farming, but definitely needs a BKB this game. Planet. Okay. I mean, Duracho a bit far forward, but has BKB. Drop the ult upon him. Ace, flanking. Trying to see if we get the grab on the YU smile, but a quick dive is there. A bit of a poke from the supports, but nothing more to push Gaming Gladiators back. As they'll continue to push on and look to take this tier two. Now, Duracho knows his strength. Having that silencer behind him, too. A tier two default very early, pre 20 minutes. Also able to hold on to the tier two top. They did have quite a few heroes up on this top lane, LGD, but unable to push the tier two themselves. Duracho, okay. <laughs> he always wants to play super aggressive. He wants to go for the SD. They might be able to sandwich Planet here. I think they will. Ace coming in from the side. Planet, Whoop. he can't run from this one. Jump forward to low ground for Duracho. Another kill and more gold here for the Alchemist. Just getting way too much on the map. Quinn shows himself top. They have a ward on top of him. But there's just no way for them to punish it. They do have... Okay, the center's kind of in the area, but they, yeah, they can't go for it. And very close to the sort of timing, 21 minutes or so in, where they're going to have to deal with these two cores that have hearts upon them. You know, Ace has pretty much got his done. Quinn's already got his. And a BKB Alchemist. That's, that's, that's a lot of HP that you've got to try and get through with the damage that, that you've got on LGD's lineup. And, and you just sort of look at the heroes, and unless everything connects perfectly, it's hard to sort of see these situations in which these cores of gaming gladiators get taken down. Yeah, and can you protect your egg? You're going to need absolutely everything to connect perfectly, it feels like, for LGD in these next few moments. And for gaming, the pace is going to continue accelerating. Roche, soon to be on the menu for them, too. But continuing to look to just control the map before that. Full Hyperstone now on Duraccio. Altering done now, at least, for nothing to say. So at the higher frequency of weaving in and out of the fights with these charges keep that farm going, but it still feels like they need more and more time, which just still doesn't feel if it's really, really benefiting them. The gaming, it's just been consistently like 6 to 8k gold lead, even though they're playing versus this Midas. I just sweep in the map, taking these towers down, and LGD, they will not be showing up to defend them. Oh, they have this deep ward already placed down, too. Why? Has to be careful. If he gets any closer to this high ground, I mean, even as he is, he can't he's still going to get, get close. Duracho just jumps in under the tier two. Now they know that ward is there, but they get a free kill out of it. And potentially even going to get to pressure two lanes off of this here with Duracho on one and Quinn on the other. How does LGD slow this down? I mean, they're going to continue to try to get this charge, of course, to clear these waves, but they need more time for Shiro to feel ready to fight. Yeah, now BKB at the least a necessity, but still a, a, a couple of thousand gold away from that. And the necessity, of course, it'll help protect it, but his damage is definitely starting to feel, I mean, it's, it's still fun to feel pretty lackluster even with that BKB. They need everything to connect perfectly. They need this egg, the sun ray. It feels like it's going to be probably their highest damage potential. And for Gladiators, Roshan is at the ready if they want to look for that one first. They almost have Aghanim is also now finished up on Quinn. 
And with those early boots of travel that he was able to get to, it's always this way to answer something like the Spirit Breaker, right? He goes to one lane, clears it out, and then he can go join his team constantly while they're on the hunt for this SB. But nothing to say. He's doing a good job, at least, of keeping these waves quite cleared out. And he's only died the three times, so he's getting some pretty decent recovery. Buys his shard. So, gonna be going for that planar pocket to absorb some type of spells at the least to protect Shiro. Not too often, I think, I've seen people purchase it. He has eyes on Quinn, but of course, oh. nothing really that he can do about this. Now, the cool thing is, I guess, with the planar pockets, the magic resist too. 75% magic it's a resist. Lot. If you eat that with a Reaper Scythe, you're probably just going to live through it. So, it's going to be a cool itemization here from Nothing to Say to tank spells for Shiro. Potentially trying to cut some of the creep waves coming in on, the, on this top lane, but Gaming Gladiators, they've already got one. He's right up to the tier two. And Diracha, I mean, he, he has AC done. He's just brute forcing these towers, the map is shrinking more and more. Shiro with the illusion is trying to at least hold back the waves in the mid lane. BKB is finished. Definitely feels like moments away from gaming gladiators. Maybe trying to look at a high ground push. As I say, though, Roshan is there, so it's probably going to wait for like that they'll go for the pickup on that one. Yeah, it's going to shift up top in about 40 seconds. So imagine they're going to set up around there. That very much feels like that they're in a position where they don't really need to take too many risks right now. Gaming Gladiators, a pretty comfortable hold on the game. Ooh. Ah, he gets the, the catch, jump. Tofu! In with the Inks, well, they don't even have to, to use the Reaper Scythe early. They'll drop it now, still won't get the kill with it, but they get the kill after. Oh, that was sick by Tofu. What a quick blink into insta-popping that Inkswell. 20 seconds till that Roche starts shifting. They're already positioned around the top lane. Gaming's just kind of cruising. Playing the map, it feels like wherever they want. Even though LGD is getting the farm, they are completely avoiding anywhere that Gaming Gladiators does go. Yeah, LGD, I mean, in terms of items, we'll, we'll see sort of what pickups they are able to get in place before this kind of Roshan pickup into high ground push that's very likely to be coming in from Gaming Gladiators does occur. With the BKB, it's there. He's got the money for the shard if he wants to pick that up. Anything to sort of provide him some defensive capabilities. Trying to get that small crit online as well, Shiro, just to have some sort of damage against this inevitable push that Gaming Gladiators is going to come charging at them with. And that feels like it's going to be the big issue is will they have enough damage to go through Ace, the Heart, Primal Beast, the Alchemist, who's incredibly tanked, and this Necrophos. And now an Aegis as well, too, which they cannot contest up here. The levels as well, too, on the supports. I mean, that's something I'm always going to be looking at for the Phoenix. It does feel like he's going to be one of the most important ones for the side of LGD. Still not level 12. So with this pace of this game, he's not able to find the connection or get those extra levels from fights. That's how this Roche, it's gone. Should be able to finish the tier one mid. Get an extra bit of a cash bonus here for the team. Any little bit they can get, they need. LGD, have to be very careful with their position. Outside of the base right now, they are in a spot that Gaming Gladiators is starting to close in upon. Illusion. The high ground, surely going to be the best place for LGD to try and make their stand here against Gaming Gladiators. Gaming even wants to go for that high ground too. We'll have to wait how long they want to push the issue forward here. Shiro does find an Illusion Rune, probably one of the better ones that he can get in this type of style game where things have slowed down massively, cutting some waves, does get that top wave cut out there. So this is the final wave that gaming has if they do, do want to go threaten that high ground. Level 18 has been hit on Duraccio. See if he does threaten a little bit here. He wants to. He knows it's so hard for LGD to punish any sort of jump that he wants to go for on this push. Yeah, he can just start getting the poke. Quinn got to start throwing those heals out as well too. This tower is dropping, there's no glyph. 13 gotta, seconds. Got to do something there, LGD, otherwise they're going to be losing a rack. Right, that was perfect timing, really, for gaming to take advantage of that glyph still being down. So clear out the illusions. Right, the rack's gone. That's Take out the range. They're onto the melee. LGD, what's the plan? The fire spirits for now seem to be enough to stop the, the push here from gaming gladiators. They've Planet. got the lanes cut, so Luna does get both of those. So no more creep wave up in the top lane. So we'll buy them some time. A nice move from Shiro. Nothing to say considering a charge, but doesn't want to start a fight just yet into this Aegis. Nice play from Shiro. Yeah, a little illusion micro. Definitely making a big deal there. Level 18 now, and he does have that small crit finish. So now maybe this is that indicator for LGD. This could be the call where they feel like they're going to start having some damage to look for the fight. 
BB BKB also finished on new, so he can actually get into those fights and not have to worry about just getting instantly globaled and get nothing off. That's a double damage as well on the top side of the river. Would be quite the pickup if LGD are able to catch wind of that one. Gaming. They're going to continue the siege. Now BKB. On Quinn. He's also ready to go fully in on the push. Duracho. Onto the barracks. LGD, they may just have to let this set go by the looks of it. They, yeah. they don't try anything on the defensive on this one. So a full set of racks will be taken down by Gladiators. Yeah, still too afraid. Still Two and a half minutes left with this Aegis to potentially push for more. They are going to have to head back and deal with the state of the, the rest of the creep waves as they have been. You say consistently pushed in. Shiro really pulling off the work here to keep this game alive. Charge through. Oh my goodness. Very deep positioning here. Playing around his vision though does have that ward on the high ground. And nothing to say should be fine. Now Gladiators, they'll send Duraccio down bottom to deal with the creep wave on that lane. The rest of the team ready to start pushing back out the mid. I mean, they're doing kind of this cool maneuvers though, where it's, yeah, the objectives are being taken from gaming, but look at the gold. You know, it's starting to get a little bit better there for LGD with the way that you're just playing the full farm game around the map rather than contesting the push. And maybe feeling strong enough to set up for something themselves here, LGD. Start Smoke up out. with Shiro, feeling that they're now at a point where they can try for, for, for looking for a team fight. Duracho on the front lines though, the DD still in the top lane. I mean, ideally, who, who are you finding here? Do you, do you want something to get, like the, the quick squishy heroes? Do you want to get on the silencer first, take him out? You know, what would be the ideal catch for LGD? You probably at least want to know where the silencer is, and someone has to stop the global to come out, but we'll see who they want to jump first. They've got eyes on the two of them. He gets the charge. Let's interrupt the initial attempt from you. The global silence comes out. The supernova's there, but Gaming Gladiators is just, they can fight this out. You can keep to the distance. Ace will get caught by the initial stun, but he's so tanky. Got the grab on both. The turn. The soul right there, the grab as well. Dredger picks up the double shiro. He's got the BKB in the Eclipse. Ace, he's Summer's still alive, finally he'll fall, there's nothing to say, takes him out with the ultimate. Oh my you see Shiro able to BKB TP out, so Barely. LGD at least able to cut their losses there. And they do find a kill in return in that fight, nothing to say. Only just able to catch Ace underneath the tower. So look, something to be found, but still not quite what LGD were hoping for. I mean, look how much they have to commit just to kill Ace, and he actually had the BKB coming out on the Courier, so it's good that they got the jump right there, otherwise he absolutely just lives. And now down the mid they go. Duracho still has 30 seconds with this Aegis. Quinn backing him up. They used absolutely everything there on the side of LGD. No BKB at the ready for Shiro. Him walking up, he could just get exploded instantly if he does. Yeah, not a, not a great fight, of course, for LGD, but it definitely could have gone a lot worse. If, if they lost their yep. Lunar in that situation, it would have been rough. Nothing and to say. Trying to clear out the way. Put a stop Duracho. to the push there. In with the summer out of Eight Dredge. Seconds. A lot of damage. Dredge's down once. He's got his BKB ready here for the second round. He's got the blink as well. He's going to be out. Nothing to say, though. He charges forward. He he gets clipped by the Phantom's Embrace from Tofu. They turn with a slow jump forward again. They're trying to control the Spirit Breaker. Now throw out the dust. Another slow, not going to connect. So now he's trying to close in, but the charges back up. Nothing to say, able to put a stop to the push and get away. We'll live to see another day. Tofu, we'll be okay. And they're looking to keep going. How long on this egg? 20 seconds. Full butterfly now for Shiro. I mean, Shiro, he, he's, he's silently, slowly, he's, he's doing it. You know, the, the farm is there. Can they keep him alive? BKB is back up. Can they protect him? Push just continued to commence. Glyph, still cooled down for about four minutes. Who goes in first for LGD? It's got to be new. And look at Duracho the whole time he's been doing this, turning that Radiance off consistently when he's going for the... And he's in. Duracho's in. The BKB's off just in time, though, for sure. It's still going to get killed by the Soulbind. He tried to turn in with the Eclipse. Ace is falling low. Shiro focused on the one and able to take that Ace. Delete it. Duracho to back up the running away of the BKB, but the physical damage is coming in. Duracho finally able to keep to his distance. Quick gets back in on the midst of his... He's in the middle of everybody. Inside. He's able to finish off Shiro. Quinn taking down the Luna. Shiro out with no buyback available. He's spent up for the Butterfly. See LGD with the disruption, but they're not going to be able to find anything more. That I mean, it oh looked to be a, so a solid close. defense from LGD, but the fact that Quinn, he knew that he could get straight back in there, finish off the Luna, it's a big kill to be found because I mean, if Shiro survives through that, LGD, they'd definitely be looking to make a play within this next minute. With, with Shiro going down there because of that play from Quinn, LGD, they'll have to hold back once more. Look how much damage Shiro was able to do. I mean, Ace popped BKB and just literally died in seconds. I think he hadn't even had like the Vindicator's Axe bonus armor. He literally died so fast trying to get the double grab.
But Quinn, I, that was a really cool call to make. Like, you see Duracho drops to what? I think it was like 100 HP or something like that. Quinn just jumps into four or five heroes and ends up just getting away because of it. Yeah, the, these players uh, cool. really knowing their limits. We sort of saw it yesterday right with Yator and his morph, you know, yep. for me into these crazy situations. This game is Quinn just going right into the midst of pretty much, what, four heroes uh, to, take, to take down that crucial kill and keep this game for now held in gaming gladiators favor definitely seeing though that shiro he, if they do if they don't kill if they him. don't give him the respect he is going to be doing a lot of damage now at this point with this butterfly keeping this game alive here lgd he's consistently just been sitting at that 6k gold lead And high ground, it's always going to be the best place for them to get this defense. It's always going to allow Why You Smile to have kind of like perfect positioning with his egg and sunray. They're looking to actually make an aggressive move themselves. They're feeling confident perhaps after that last fight. It was very close to them just wiping, you know, pretty much everybody there on the side of gaming. So don't blame them if they feel quite a bit more confident now. I see a smoke from Gaming Gladiators themselves as well. Yeah, Celery's about ready to pop it. Okay, smoke maybe, on smoke. Maybe reading the movements. I mean, Roche is soon going to be coming up. New pick up as well for nothing to say. Has his Lincoln, so not easy as, as it before to sort of set up from a, any of these single target disruptions or plays from Gaming Gladiators. Roche, it's a long spawn. Nice. Oop. Smoke to spell. Both teams aware of one another. Taracho looks like he's potentially setting up for something here. They see up around this top rune. He's actually going to go for nothing to say. Bulldoze and Lincoln will eat it. Be okay. LGD. Time being bought. Shiro getting bigger and bigger. Getting these buff ups too. I saw the solo crest picked up before that last fight as well too from Why You Smile. They're starting to throw their eggs into this Luna basket. Yeah, Roche, one and a half. LGD getting more and more time. I think they'll want to try and contest this Roshan though. Yes, they they so. certainly feel a whole lot stronger right now, LGD. Yeah, especially, I mean, with the Lincolns, in, in particular, for nothing to say. Now he's going to be able to just straight charge through these fights and perhaps just eat one of these big spells or two, especially with Planar Pocket, too, right? He could just tank it off one of his teammates. Gaming going to play patient around here, but that does potentially mean that this map is going to get farmed out from nothing to say and from Shiro. Satanic soon on the horizon for Shiro. Gladiators, they want to try and look for the hit before the Roche spawns. Okay. Get an angle. I'm mean, highly suspect that LGD will start to, to set up outside of the base. Oh, they sent to remove the themselves. But the high ground here, who are they with the jump upon? Dracho goes towards the creep. Not going to find anyone there, though. So they're in towards the triangle, LGD. That was close to disaster. Lanes just being shoved in, though. Look at bottom and mid. Nothing to say. Has completely pushed those into the tier twos now at this point. New. And why? You're able to get away. 15 seconds, Roche. They know it's got to be up soon, gaming. Just continue to play in that corner area. LGD's got to get over here. Smoke up from the cells this time. Full satanic the... done on Shiro. Check this illusion push in mid. Hey, Quinn, he's actually got to go answer it a little bit here. Double catapult wave with these double illusions. LGD smoked up. They saw Quinn move. This could be their opportunity to strike. 28 seconds, no TP for Quinn to join his team. You're getting all these little lines. The fact that they've now got oh, look at this position. the two Lotus Orbs ready for the next fight, Shiro. My goodness. Looking new. He yeah, knows. He knows. He knows. It's he's perfect. Over, they take down Duraggio. They'll be able to break down Celery as well. As Gaming Gladiators are trapped in the corner. They didn't quite have the detection for Celery. He'll use himself up, but there's no escape for this silencer. So sick. I mean, just trapped in the corner there, Gladiators. They were not ready for LGD to come and pizza them in and now open up the opportunity for LGD to head into the pit and get Roshan for themselves. It's the big brain split push plays that were coming out. Spirit Breaker cutting bottom, Luna cutting mid. Eventually, someone reacts as soon as they see Quinn. No hesitation. They know exactly LGD, where they were. The way that they've held on in this game, kept well, their cool. Now they're striking back, and they're striking back hard. Gladiators are going to be shaking in their boots a little bit with the way that these last few fights have gone. These moves, absolutely huge for LGD, as LGD now starting to take the lead in this game. I mean, Shiro is pretty much completely neck and neck with that Alchemist now. Yeah, this, and an Aegis. It really feels like some of the best Lunar performance we've seen, really, honestly, with how Shiro's done in terms of finding the farm, keeping the game alive with his, his sort of the map movements of himself and the illusions. He's been doing so much. I mean, him and nothing to say, even though you don't really... 
it's like this invisible kind of impact from this Spirit Breaker, but the amount of space that he's been able to make just clearing creep waves with this charge, it's gotten them completely back into it, and now they're potentially the ones going for this high ground. Absolutely. I mean, now for gaming, Gladiators, now, now that they're playing from behind, how does this change things up for them? What sort of conversations do you think is going on right now in the Gladiators boost? Good question. They're probably still feeling pretty confident with their fight, but they're definitely feeling a little bit more scared of this Luna. They probably Where need to start go? figuring out the answer for nothing to say, because he's just getting way too big on this Spirit Breaker now, too. And DD DD, in the bottle. They've I mean, got everything at the ready. Sure, is very close, about 1,000 gold away from being able to pick up the full day list Boy. as well. This Luna, an absolute terror in these team fights. I mean, why Smile is also queuing up for the big play. He's going for that refresher, feeling they do not have an answer for the egg. If they don't get the global off, he's got to get these eggs off every single time. Ooh. Let's see what Shiro's. We'll see what Shiro does. Does go down this route. Changing item builds a little bit, but he is just going to go Daedalus. Gladiators. Do they want to try and fight into this Aegis? Three and a half minutes here for Shiro. They don't have the same way to be able to push these waves invisibly, right? Like, now it's difficult for them to actually keep their lanes pushed out. They don't have these illusion pushes. They don't have the Spirit Breaker kind of charge thing to be able to deal with it. So they kind of have to stick as this unit now on Gaming Gladiators for the next, probably for these next, like, two, three minutes. LGD patiently waiting. I mean, we'll be point, able to find the Demon Edge. A big kill. Well, they do. They'll be able to stop a bit of that damage being built up by Duraccio. Shiro, he's ready to start pushing. It dies. I mean, this building dies quick versus the DD. Forces out the fortification. Now it's Gladiator's turn to try and do something on the defensive. We'll see if they're able to put a stop to this one. I mean, as soon as that tower drops, these racks are going to drop in seconds. Try and get the jump on the Shiro, but the Mantis part, Dace. He has to back away. He has to stay in with the charge, but he gets pushed back. Duraccio. He's going to try and go for the Kakochi, but it's off to the Illusion. Shiro is able to put the BKB. He's starting to get a bit low himself, so he doesn't feel confident, even though he has the Aegis to finish off the racks. He'll back off for now. Daedalus now picked up. That was pretty cool from Duraccio, actually. Doesn't have to use his BKB. He doesn't, he's scared about the reflection of the concoction. Actually forces Shiro to use his. He'll back away. I mean, they've got so many ways as well to, to sort of buff up and protect here on the pushes. Right, with the Lotus picked up by New, the Lotus picked up by Planet. So many things to just throw upon this Luna and just allow Shira to get in and do the damage. LGD, they may have been pushed back, but I'm pretty sure they'll be looking to go again. Still two minutes to play aggressive with the Aegis. Yeah, some nice itemization. I mean, playing into the Silencer, playing into Necro even, even with Grimstruck. I mean, this, this Lotus could be incredibly effective. And gaming now a bit trapped inside their own base. Nice to Racho. They're gonna get the jump on him. Gonna get jumped. Still open things up. They'll drop the global, but the supernova was there time with the sound ray. It burst through Duracho. Oh He's God. out for 75. New Ogre Seal toming forward. They're pushing in on the mid lane. They'll be ready to approach the high ground again and maybe even force out this buyback from Duracho. He's out for 70. Quinn. Now Quinn also. Thanks to Lucent Beam. Charging for nothing to say. Knocks it back in the ball of the Ottoman. Eclipse. 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 But the BKB's the out. BKB. Quinn backs away. The turn of the soul bind. Jump forward. Dracho tries to get the Abyss Blade stun, but it's onto the Lotus Hole. Stuns himself. Ace in the midst of the wall. The side's coming. They get the Reaper. It takes nothing to say down. There's a Shiro's Rashira. in trouble. He's getting completely trampled upon by Ace. Well, that's Shiro down once. Back. Can they do it a second time round? BKB is still on cooldown for two seconds. He's going to have it up now. He's ready to press it, ready to turn. Looks towards Dredger with a loose beam, but Ace crashing it across the two of them. Shiro in the He's, run. He's driving the DB out of the BKB. He's come to end again. He yes, can't out. Shiro able to TP out as Healer's game. You will not. As Gladiators, they'll fight you, but they won't get anything else. No, I, I don't know how, but how Shiro, did Shiro live? able to live there. Despite oh, his BKB wow. coming to an end, I mean, both saw the things around there. The fact that his BKB came back up just in time from being able to survive that initial burst from Gladiators. And then even though it was a short one, he still is able to TP away. Both teams expending a buyback. Duracho with a buyback for Gladiators. Nothing to say with a buyback from, uh, from LGD. Quinn is still a definite problem for them, though. I'm seeing him in these fights just absolutely wrecking everybody. Look at these he gets damage ignored numbers. for a second. And I, like, I watched Zero pop Satanic and turn to try to hit, and I'm just watching his health actually going down anyway, so it does still have to be careful. It's still showing that it's anybody's game. These Absolutely. buybacks, though, gonna be very crucial. Duracho having to his use last, having Hughes use his hit for the defense there, and then also now Spirit Breaker, nothing to say. He used his to try to join that fray afterwards. Yeah, has at least, he got worried. He, he got the BKB purchase as well, now ready for the next fight. So a new BKB on him, close to the 25 as well, on nothing to say. MKB now finally done with the courier coming back up. Durach is able to pick up his Demon Edge. Big two items big for themselves. Ups. Hex for Quinn. They have two different ways now to be able to go for these big plays, to go for this big double plays as well, too, with the Grimstroke. More and more ways to break this Lincolns. More and more ways to go for nothing to say. Do 
Tofu with his Aghanims, of course, finished up all. Now, another element that LGD does have to answer. This, <laughs> this Luna illusion is going to be terrifying. Oh, it is. We've seen it's many, really many times how much this Dark Portrait can do against the right carry. And against this Shiro Luna, it's certainly the one to, to get a Dark Portrait upon. If they have these butterfly, I mean, Shiro, butterflies, about the Shiro. Item to have on these Dark Portraits. Shiro. Quinn, trying to close in. Tofu's able to get the signs. Trying to get the Hex as well, but it was Lotus back up towards Quinn. He was a He's a three-man who's stop into the charge. A beautiful jump from you. Gaming Gladiators, they have to run. BKB for Diacho is on the retreat. Another charge for for nothing. Say over towards Ace. Quinn getting completely kited as LGD back off away from him during his BKB. Can they break up? Newis again. Catches there. Who's up into the charge? Do they have the damage to threaten you, Quinn? The buyback's going to be coming out from Tosha. Shiro. They'll turn back over. They've got the hex in on the Shiro. Shiro needs help. He's, He's got the disruption. All disruption. He's there. Pushes up to the side. But it's still going to be kept. The greater one. They finish him off. Shiro out of the game. The title one. Nothing to say. Nothing to say. He has no buyback. He cannot afford to get caught. And he won't. Charges over towards the mid lane. He misses his back up. Can he get away? It's heaping over. Look like they have the detection here on the front line, so nothing to say he'll live. A big escape from him. If he goes down, he's down for two minutes. I mean, massive stun from New, but still the issue is Quinn. He's zoning four heroes away while protecting his allies. And they find the big one. They take Shiro out. Buyback is available for him. We'll see how much they're able to take here, Gaming Gladiators, before the buybacks come out from LGD. It's Duraccio in on the mid lane. Tier 3 are gone. Onto the backs. There's the buyback the from buyback. Shiro. Gaming Gladiators, they respect it immediately. They got out big there on the side of gaming. Forcing these buybacks. Roche, 50 seconds till coming back up. How did they kill Quinn? <laughs> Actually, like, he's really just zoning four or five heroes away constantly. Even though his alchemist is getting burst in a lot of these situations, Quinn, he is a standing star. Nine, one, and six so far in this Necro. Sort of uh, offensive-wise in terms of the items, we're seeing LGD just feeling that they have to lean towards the defensive. You know, Looks Shiro like is queuing up himself. A Lincoln Sphere for the next item. Just really doesn't want to get caught or suffer the threat of being just jumped upon by this instant hex catch from Quinn. Hey, Lotuses and Lincolns actually are the dream versus yep. these single target abilities, but... I don't know. I'm seeing him switching a lot. Yeah, okay, now he's got the rapier. Oh, up. I saw him do this before. And so we get that one. Maybe he feels like he does need it, just be able to bring down this necro because they're he might. their overall damage. It's not fast enough to kill him. It seems like he's getting this regen just to build up constantly. And yeah, just the overall damage he does in these team fights. Neck and neck still 6k lead back up for gaming. A lot of buybacks, of course, to use the most important thing here. LGD used quite a bit there. They did the big one. Shiro and nothing to say. Bit of time for theirs. Of course, over on the side of Game Gladiators, Duracho is still on the three minute cooldown himself. Absolutely. Two minutes or so until we see Roshan back in the game. Ninja Gear picked up for Duracho. Level 25 also has been attained. Could make the difference as well. Those last few jumps of Duraccio, they have been kind of caught out by the Lotus Swords they're able to sure. get out. This time, maybe making the jump from the Ninja Gear smoke up could allow him to get in with that opening Abyssal Blade before LGD can react. This could also be a big difference maker in the fights. Why now has the refresher? Oh, I mean, so. we're seeing some fantastic eggs and sun rays come out from yep. him. He can now have that double, of course. And he's level 18. Yep. So there's that big one. His mana pool is quite lackluster, though. I think he's lost a bit of it. He's at 699 mana, so... Pretty much has to just refresh her an egg. <laughs> has to be a little bit careful about that secondary. This could be, I mean, Gaming Gladiators okay, is ready for this one. Goes. That's smart. Oh, did you see the smoke up new? Charge coming in. Trying to get some information, nothing to say, get some vision here for maybe new to follow up with a potential hoost on the illusion. They're pressuring in on the mid lane as well. Gaming Gladiators, they might have to do something about this. It's going to be a fair bit of damage done potentially with these creep waves pushing in. I don't think they want to go back though. Last time the Quinn went back, I mean, these illusions. And his barracks are taking quite the hit in the mid lane. Likely to fall. I mean, these these illusions. Yeah, they have to put the fortification at least there. I and mean, Quinn is walking back. Okay, so he's trying to save his TP to build his join his team. But yeah. the racks, at least the range racks might just fall down. They'll finish it off. Roche, 30 seconds. Yeah, it's, that's sort of the slightly longer respawn. So definitely working in favor of gaming gladiators, is allowing them time to get back and hold the base and maybe get back over towards the pit if they do want to try and contest LGD in this position. Do they have a? I don't think they have a smoke left on the side of gaming though. They have a couple ninja gears, but I don't see a smoke on them to make it their way back up there. They're gonna go as a unit. I mean, do you think you have to still try and force this fight, or do you? you now, what's the call here from Gladiators? This I mean, could be a difficult still. fight to take. They probably still want to fight because they feel maybe like they have like some of this number advantage with Quinn having this buyback. 
Got to make the call quick though, because this Rosha dies in Oh, it's going to be going down quickly. There's the smoke delivered out. Gaming Gladiators, they'll start to head towards the pit, but they've got to do it fast. Look at the positioning from Nothing to Say. He'll be able to break the smoke. He's in on the it's high ground. Up. It's going to be hard for Gladiators to get past him. Sure, and you getting the space to finish off. Hey, Nothing to Say. They're going to get the grab. They turn straight away. The side comes down, and Nothing to Say is able to put the BKB jump for from H. Nothing to Say is able to live for now. He takes out. He's onto the egg with a chemical range. He's able to he take solo it. Kills it. Takes the super over out. Turns over to one. Juju put the BKB. Big stun. Zero. Juju with the turn. Gets the Aegis on the Luna. Dracho tries to stand his ground against him, but he's caught by the disruption. They're on to the Luna. The Luna's out the watch. And he's not got a lot of buyback. This second life here for Shiro could be a rough one. So he's able to get out of this one. Yeah, he's, like he's, he's alone. Like, he's picked up the rapier. He's not able to get it out. He tries to put the refresher, but he's He's gone. He's out, and he just sped up. His buyback, of course, still on cooldown. He is out of the game for two minutes. A huge window now for Gaming Gladiators to try and end this one. They had the bodies. Duraccio solo killed the egg. He just full commits onto it. No Shiro here. Oh, that's got to be it. I mean, they can just push the, the I mean, two most important heroes are gone. Nothing to say we'll be back in 20 seconds. Okay. 20 seconds and buyback will be there for the Spirit Breaker, but no Luna for the defense. They at least have one of the extra eggs still up with that buyback from the Phoenix, since he did just die on the first go. I mean, Gaming just throw bodies in at Quinn. I mean, can they hold? It's not easy without Shiro. He's all the damage. They're going for the Megas, they're playing it safe here, just in case. Nothing to say, the buyback available. There will be a 4v5 at the least here for the defense. The rack's gone. Building's dropping, Spirit Breaker buyback, but still 60 seconds, no Shiro. LGD. Nothing to say. Trying to start off the defense. Jump off from you. And with a hoose stop straight away on towards Duraccio. Duraccio stepping away is able to put the BKB. Oh, for nothing to say. Bashing it on towards Ace. They're bringing Ace down low. The supernova pops successfully. But the building, the objective is being taken. The base exposed. They've got to do something crazy here, LGD, if they want to hold. Duraccio being careful. 10 seconds for chemical rage. He's letting Quinn just hit the throne. They're doing it safely. They're doing it carefully here, Gaming Gladiators. Another charge for for nothing to say. Trying his best to tank the spells. Loads are thrown out upon him. Reflectively, a pistol blade from Duraccio. Celery trying to hit onto the ancient himself. 20 seconds. They've got the fortification. LGD doing their best, holding out for a Shiro here. But he may not respawn to die as he's dead for 15 more seconds. Right, They're looking to close it, it onto the ancient. 10 seconds until the Luna's up. Nothing to say. Tried it, but it stopped to it all. New. He's in with the hoost up. He's got the two of them. He gets the jump. The burst is over. But Durango, he's there to kill them. It doesn't matter though. But they got it. Ace finishes off the ancient. Wow. GG is called. Gaming Gladiators will take this game one. I right, what a team fight up top. I mean, beautiful stuff from Gaming Gladiator, just having the confidence to just walk in there and take out nothing to say. I mean, throwing everything onto him. He feels so tanky. He's got bulldoze. He's got all this capabilities to try to protect himself, but they still burst him through it. And somehow Duraccio solo kills the egg when it means everything. Wow. I mean, in an insane final push and a close push as well. You know, Very if there was close. sort of anything like a 10 second list on that cooldown of the, the, the buyback of Shiro, if he was able to turn up for that defense, maybe they could have held. But as it was, Gladiators realizing that they had this window to go all in to end the game before Shiro was able to do anything with the rapier pickup. I mean, look at these damage numbers in particular. Quinn doing about 60,000 damage wow. in this game. The next highest on his team, Duracho with like 27. Shiro also, of course, carrying heavily inside that later stage, just 52 damage but overall gaming this necro pick seemed to be pretty perfect for Quint to take over I think it certainly did either way an insane opening here to this final day of the international both teams absolutely playing their hearts out but as it is gaming gladiators they will close up and take this game one a phenomenal showing for this first game. I really thought LGD had that middle part of the game that they were going to be able to close it down. That Lunar Illusion taking a lot of, doing a lot of damage to the racks, but ultimately that third Roche fight was the game changer, Gunnar. Yeah, and it looked like they had it for a second. The Luna had charges, was doing so much damage, but I think nothing to say dying at the start of the fight really hurt them. He wasn't able to protect the egg, which was really important for kind of their success. Also, uh, there was an uncharacteristic mistake, I think, from gaming with the high ground push. I was really surprised because they're probably the best team at this early game high ground siege. They know when to do it, they know how to do it without dying, but in this game, after they had this really nice early game lead, they kind of threw it away a little. 
Yeah, they didn't have the best lanes this game, but they, they managed to come strong. But uh, like, I want to talk about like how they managed to take that uh, mid-game lead with, with the rotations of the support because they play so well with the CCNC that they managed to like make an even game to look like insanely one-sided, right? And they were pushing for a long time. They were pressuring them. Of course, they have few sleep, sleep ups on the high grounds. But I mean, the, the fights, the fights around this rush pits. Like they were, they were very deciding, and I think on the last fight, uh, LGD had had an opportunity to jump them first when they saw them on the on the board, but they decided to go for the rush pit instead, and like it was like very um, the, the last position there, in my opinion. Having a look at some of the reactions there from uh, not only the players but also their supporting members too. Uh, this game wasn't clean at all by any means for Gaming Gliders. We've already pointed out the high ground issues that they had, but what exactly were LGD able to do, Sheep, to be able to capitalize on those poor high ground pushes and make it so difficult for Gaming? I think it was more than just the high ground pushes, but just like a little bit of sloppiness and lack of discipline from Gaming in general. Like, for example, when they smoked into the triangle to try and uh, disrupt Luna, get a kill there, the fact that they overcommitted and dived and threw away the lives of four heroes when they had like, it was close to like five or six K leads so early on, like that was kind of where they could stomp and end the game. Game, and instead they kind of threw it away and I think that was like a massive moment for them um, otherwise like I think they did a really good job getting to that place in the in the first place the fact that this fast boots of travel on Necro allow them to be everywhere on the map. I think Ace, usually he plays incredibly greedy, but this game, he was way more sacrificial. He was way lower on the net worth. He was super hyperactive with his supports playing around, making moves. I also want to talk about the item builds because when you're playing against lineup like this on the gamings, like they have three heroes that build like, you know, two heroes have hearts. Alchemist if it's insane in the HP region. And on the side of LGD they didn't have like they didn't have Shiva. <laughs> Poor Celery, did you guys see that? He went to go for the bit fist pump on Quinn and Quinn just stood up and walked away. <laughs> oh that happened to me many times. It's, yeah, it's all right, Celery. He's still oh, he's a winner. Win. He's too focused There's on the win. a game too, he's gotta get back in the zone. <laughs> but yeah, the item builds, like then you need to have Shivas, you need to have Vessel against the lineup like this and if you don't have then we've seen so many fights when they start and like the fight look good in the beginning but then they go out they region and then they go back and this is like how they lost many fights I was a little bit worried about the Alc. I mean, we've just seen him be quite tumultuous throughout this event. He's had some really good showings, some really rough ones. And that mid game was where I worried about if the Duracho Alc was going to be able to carry it. Obviously, we see it. It was able to in this way. But what else about the Alc meant that that late game was kind of difficult, that he wasn't really hitting the, the timings or couldn't be together as much with gaming gladiators? Uh, the biggest thing with Alc is you generally want this really fast early game timing, which is always what gaming goes for. So. I think the Alc looked really good up until the high ground push, and then after that, it kind of just ended up being a little scary because he'll get outscaled by the Luna really quickly. And I think they threw their gold lead up to around or only four or five k gold. And when you have an Alc, it's always just fake. So it started to look a little scary, but I think just the power of Necrophos in this draft was it kind of showed. Also, Primal Beast with like they have double hearts. I think heart there was none on LGD if I'm not mistaken. Maybe the Senta had one, but I just think that having more health than the other guys just matters so much right now. It's all about being tanky. We're going to see some uh, more breakdowns of this game at number one. Purge has all the information. Thank you, Nat. Yeah, being tanky is very important, but how you get there is by collecting gold and experience. And the way the game gladiators do it is so, so fast compared to other teams. And a lot of this comes with pressure on the map. Quinn here, eight minutes into the game, they just got a kill on the Spear Breaker. He's constantly crossing into the enemy part of the map, and they already have an Observer Ward in this part of the jungle. So what he does is puts himself in an offensive position, but also is stealing stacks that enemies made. That means he's basically getting himself more gold while wasting their time with this move. And this continuously happened the first 15 minutes of the game. Here's the obvious Shadow Demon stacking two camps in this area. He kills the Watch Rune, which gives them vision, and they come over and kill him. They were just ignoring the Tier 1 tower, the vast majority of this game, which is not normal. Instead, saying we're ganking and clearing stacks easily using Necrophos, who's tanky and has tons of AoE damage. Very able to do this uh, at this stage of the game. Now, the invade fail that happened at the Tobin and Mark was a little bad for them. This AoE here, this ink swell around the Primal Beast, if Luna gets within this range, she gets stunned and probably comboed. She interrupts the first stun. Stampede keeps her slightly outside of that range, and that's why they were able to disengage and win that huge fight against Gladiators. But what did they do immediately after they respawned? They went back to the same spot. 
they do not want to let them clear these stacks easily. They want to get kills, they want to accelerate the gold advantage, and this all helps them accelerate their timing. So they win this fight, and Duraccio rotates over with his Radiance to clear this Ancient stack, taking it away from uh, Luna. And all of this acceleration that they work for hits them with this crazy timing of 16 minutes. BKB finished on Alchemist. The whole team is already set up to prep this fight, and it ends up going well for Gaming Gladiators. This is why they're able to rack so early. It's because they're invading constantly in slightly abnormal ways and winning great fights. It was a very, very close game, though. It was a really close one. That early game, we've already said it many times. You said it, Rezo, LGG sometimes struggle with the laning phase. Gaming Gladiators, they love the tempo. They love to be aggressive for themselves. Everyone in this arena, they loved the game one, and it's nice to know that we still have at least one more game in this best of three to be able to see some more action just like that. But it's not only people in this arena that are enjoying TI-12. There are locations all across the world right now that are enjoying the action that is taking place here. So Game Gladiator fans, LGD fans, they spend all the way across the world, not just here, guys. Yeah, and the game is amazing. Like you know, you 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 ex you expect this game to be like over soon because of the high lead of the uh, gaming galleries that they that they had. But at the same time, like it's just like uh, very back and forth in those team fights. Like there are very little gimmicks that decide like, who's gonna win the game. You know, it's it's not clear until the very end. Yeah, we, we talked a lot about how gaming maybe made a mistake on the high ground push, but I think LGD the way they played the mid game from behind was really commendable. They actually came back into the game at some points. They had a rapier timing on this Aegis, and it was just unfortunate that, that the contest on the Roche fight didn't work out, because he ended the game with a rapier in his inventory. He was just dead for two minutes, so he couldn't use it. And so in the next game, I'm probably looking for their lanes to go slightly better in the draft. I think maybe the Necro ban is probably something they should look towards, because it seems like the hero pool they won for nothing to say is not really going to work out versus Quinn, at least if he gets the Necro. Um, but overall, I think the way that they're playing is honestly pretty stable versus Gaming Gladiators. If they can kind of fix some of the big major mistakes in the draft, I think they'll be kind of set for the next game. All righty. Well, let's see where the crowd is sitting. If they're Gaming Gladiator fans, if they're LGD fans, if they're hoping for a 2-0, if they're hoping for three games. So let's see. Slacks, uh, where, where are you? Where are you? Hello. I am here with the LGD fans. LGD fans, this is the dark. They are down a game and they need us now more than ever. Gentlemen, ladies, it is time. Please get your dogs out. Team Hot Dog, let's go with LGD. LGD, 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 LGD. Excuse you. What, what? Excuse you. What? We vegans will not be ignored. Get out your celery. We've also been talking in honor of our vegetarian Game and Gladiators, the <laughs> Celery Dance. Are you ready? Celery Dance! Celery Dance! What the hell is that? No, no! We will not let these calorie deficient vegetarians beat us! We are preserved! We are the hot dogs! LG, uh, hot dogs, one more time! Oh god, no, get, it, get, oh get him god. away from Slax, get him away from Slax. <laughs> I saw we might have to give him the Heimlich maneuver there, he said he's checking on the hot dog. Uh, but that is a, a great bit, we love to hear the chance. Celery, team hot dog. Uh, where are you guys going for, for game number two? Do you believe in the comeback from LGD that they're going to face Team Spirit again in the grand finals? Whoa, 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 we're not biased panelists. We are very... I am. Okay. Oh. I am very biased. biased. <laughs> like, even, like, if they manage to win this game, like, with this, uh, you know, back and forth, and, you know, happening in the game for uh -huh. gaming leaders, I, I don't think, like, the next game is going to look any different. Like, if, if they get their lineup with the, you know, pushes and, like, how they can take down the towers early on, even earlier than this game, I think it's going to be, like, super easy, super one-sided. Okay, you guys might not be uh, biased, but maybe I can win you over because we do have a listen in. We have inside the pods for Game and the Gladiators during that game one. But it doesn't matter, I think. No, we just want to fight. Fuck this Roche. I don't need these objectives. Just want a straight fight. Head to head. Did, did it convince you? 
They just want to fight? Yeah. Very calm. Yeah. No, they want, they, they're calm, and all they want to do is just uh, take fights. They don't care about objectives. They don't care about buildings or Roche or anything like that. Just make sure you're killing the enemy heroes. And just kill them twice. Yeah. I mean, I'm biased for a game three, so... Okay, so you're... I threw for LGD this game just for a uh, game three, because I think, you know, the more games today, the merrier. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's our final day, so we want to see everything go the distance. Yeah, I completely agree. It's also like the level of Dota now is just like so unbelievably high when it gets really close. Like when we see these 78 minute games, we're getting all the tier 5 items out. That's the hype. That's the stuff I want to see today. I want to go the distance. And you wanted to go the distance. You want 70 plus of minute games. You want three games in this best of three. Well, game two, it's still a little bit away, but we can talk about some change ups. That Necro is a focus that you guys talked about, but then I wonder what you're willing to let through. Are you willing to let through a bristle, a dazzle, the Chen, the Edge on the side uh, of LGD4 Gaming Gladiators to pick up? I think it's hard to make an argument for Chen or Ench just because they both fill the same role. So if you ban one, it's kind of forced to ban both. Otherwise, yeah. there's no point. So it ends up being they have to choose between Dazzle or Bristle if they want to ban the Necro. And I think gaming has shown for both heroes that it's really, really scary to deal with. And I think as, as of now, Bristle probably has... People are more used to playing versus it than the Dazzle, especially because Dazzle's a flex hero. It goes mid, it goes offlane mm -hmm. for gaming. But the Bristle's kind of always offlane, so you'll know... You go in the draft knowing what's going to happen, and you kind of at least can have a plan walking into it. Yeah. I imagine this time LGD will have first pick as well, since it's game two, which gives them the advantage, because last game, obviously, the Necro came out at the end of second phase, where they got to just, like, counter their lane and have a really good moment for the Necro. So they shouldn't have that this time. So I'm not sure if they need to, like, ban it. I mean, if anything, they could change the Lifestealer ban to Necro ban, right, in the second phase. I think it's important. But I, I do think that, that there's two topics that uh, they need to, like, discuss within the team. First is, like, how to prevent those rotations from supports and, like, protecting your mid lane, because this is where, you know, gaming players start to pressure on you super hard. And the second thing is about item builds. If you're playing against lineup that has a lot of region, like, you need to have Vessel, you need to have Shivas, you need to have some ways to deal with it. Look, Gunnar, I'm going to ask you a question. You can tell me no. You don't have to answer. But you are in this position. You are on the main stage, and you were facing up against Gaming Gladiators. You guys lost game one. What was that 15 minutes for you spent like to look towards game two? What was your focus, and what did you just kind of have to push to the side and ignore? It was a lot about... We talked a lot about the Chen, which is kind of the guys are going to try to end the game really fast, and we need to find a way to deal with it. And we didn't find the solution in time, and so... It's time to see if LGD can find a solution in time. All right. Well, the players are walking out now. They're going to be taking the stage. Maybe for the last time for LGD, maybe there's going to be a little bit more in it. We don't really know, but we do want to know more about LGD. You just put carry mag and throw a lean mid or what? We'll have to see here. I do know for a fact that we've seen some interesting heroes from Shiro. Well, they're gonna put the Skyrath. Wait, are they gonna put the Skyrath mid? I no, I believe that's Kiyotaka. I, I think that's Kiyotaka. Is this Mother? Carrie Willow? It's Carrie uh, Willow. Did you hear her? Carrie, Carrie Willow. Oh, okay. Carrie. Wow. Um, to be. 一号位花烟池，我们当时的选项是根据阵容选择进程，到后面我们决定就是选择到最后几手时再决定把它当成一号位的。Carrie, Dark Willow. Yeah. What in God's green earth is this? 嗯，英雄的多样性，我认为是现阶段来说，嗯，可以算是我们队伍的强项吧。但是，我认为是什么驱使他成为我们强项，可能更多是我们队伍生活平时聊聊英雄、聊阵容更比较偏多吧，就是日积月累的形成吧。This is why LGD has so many fans, because every time you think you've got this team figured out on how they want to play, they just bust out the wildest draft. 关于我们为什么可以一直选比较偏新的英雄，然后我觉得更多还是出自于我们一个是团队的自信，然后再加上更多是我们选择的新英雄的大哥，我们三大哥都很自信，然后并且很很敢打，我觉得这是比较关键的。在关键的系列，在他们敢做出这样第一步，我觉得是他们自信的表现。Can they find him? Yes. The curse crown with that shard activating as triple kill for Shiro. 嗯，我觉得是，我觉得更多是良好的团队氛围。我觉得是我们彼此每一个人都觉得，你玩就是可能
，就可能我们中单小完，猛马的时候，我们每个人也会去鼓励他。然后我们我们三号位小完蜘蛛的时候，我我们彼此互相都会觉得你玩肯定可以的，就是这样的。关于大家认为我们的打法比较先进并且多样这个问题，我认为我们更多的是我们每个选手对于自己打法的自信吧。我觉得，嗯，更加坚信自己玩，我们就是把自己玩的东西玩得更好一点，然后越来越自信了，所以玩敢选的东西就越来越多了。GG Gaming versus Gaming Gladiators. Game two. Game two of our lower bracket finals. We just heard it there from Y. Innovation is a confidence. This team, they've been known for those wild drafts. They were the first ones to do Dark Willow on the main stage. We saw it last weekend. This could be the do or die. This is where the innovation is really going to come in clutch for them. How far do you push the envelope to make it to the grand finals to make a comeback in this lower bracket? To me, it's definitely the, it was their best, best draft with Dark Willow and Broodmother and Magnus. And I, I would love to see them going for this again because I think this is like the way to break the game against Game Gladiators and they, it's to pull something that it, they don't expect and it will break their plan of like, you know, having this stable mid, mid game. I definitely hope they don't take the carry Dark Willow. I think the rest is good. But if you remember that game, I think the Willow took a really long time to come online. If you're playing against Gaiman who want to press you so early, I don't think you can be one hero down in the way they were for so long. Like, she just needs so many items to come online. And it really was a case of, like, the rest of the LGD team really, like, carrying the game to the point where Shiro could take part. Yeah, because the big timing at level is level 20 for Dark Willow carry. It's when you get the more duration on the W, so... A lot of the time, when you talk about the hero, like, we're playing for the level 20 team, guys, and uh, <laughs> if you're playing for level 20 for his gaming gladiators, you might be in for a struggle. So, good news is, uh, it looks like LGD is first pick, so that means that they have the opportunity to ban the Chen and the Ench, and then they can take whatever they want in the draft. So, I'm, I'll be interested to, to see how the draft changes up this time. I'm mostly talking about like how they can take a lead and like uh, pressure uh, GG uh, themselves because this brood mother had an opportunity, like, you know, to to pressure their towers and to create a lot of chaos. And I think this this is what they should be aiming for, not dark real specific, but something unique. LGD had the first pick. They're still focusing on that Dazzle, that Chen Enchantress. Like you said, Gunner, if you're going to take one out, take both of them out. So that's their three bands, and it opens up the Murta for them to, to be able to get their hands on. The cool thing about the Muerta is we were talking about the Necrophos, and so thankfully if Muerta ends up being a carry, she had, she's really good because she can shoot him no matter what if he's Ghost Shrouded. So it's kind of already like a soft counter to the Necro later in the draft. And it's also, I think it's one of the better carries versus Chaos Knight. He can't burst you during your ult, so you have kind of a way to fight around him. Yeah, I've seen this matchup go both ways. Obviously because Muerta is very uh, dependent on her positioning in fights and Chaos Knight usually goes for this like Silver Edge and stuff, he's going to be seeking her out. If they do find her, it, I mean the burst is insane, Muerta is quite squishy without her ult. Um, and Chaos Knight in general, just this, this patch is, is so strong, his laning is terrifying, like I, I wonder if we'll see Grimstroke contested again going into the second phase. But Boom had the flex with Chaos Knight yesterday. We saw it, it was able to go to carry off lane for themselves. Is that the same for Gaming Gladiators? Or this is very much a Duraccio. They're okay with uh, if this hero is attempted to be countered, that Duraccio can still have a really good game for himself and he'll be able to come back and do it. I think it's mostly heroes for Duraccio because it's already a very strong lane and it's the hero he excels and it's very aggressive as well. And it allows Celery to pick heroes uh, that are not really uh, needed for the lane because it's already like very self-sustainable so he can do his things with it's often like run around mid lane help queen so something i'm interested in is uh, naga siren i think this hero is pretty strong and she's really good versus chaos knight either in a lane matchup or just in the game as a carry to carry she her illusions pretty much do the same thing as chaos knights where chaos knight will just use his ult to push out all the lanes the whole game and naga does that for free with a much lower cooldown so she's always ready to fight she can use song to disengage from the chaos knight ult and they also ban the brew uh, for the side of gaming. So if I was LGD, I'd probably be looking at a Naga at some point in this draft. And I'm sure GG is looking for another long Druid game. I think it would fit their lineup yeah. very well. 
they want to keep picking their comfort. It's gotten them this far. It'll keep, you know, keep them going. So I don't think gaming really feels like they have the need to change anything. If they get, you know, one to two of their just stable heroes every game and they just change the rest around to just fit it, I think it's kind of their formula. I was very shocked that, maybe not very shocked is the right word here, but I was surprised LGD, they went hardcore still on the supports. The Phoenix and the Grim being their ban does still leave that Dark Willow open for gaming gladiators to pick up, but their response is Magnus ET. Yeah, I think teams consider ET like one of the counter picks to the CK nowadays because it stops the illusions and along with the Magnus as well, you have their AOE RP and there's also like uh, one of the best uh, nothing to say heroes. So they're looking pretty good already. Mew is also fight. one of the first people to actually start spamming them in pubs a few weeks ago. He, I, he honestly, you know, not to hype him up too much, but I would say he probably started the meta in pubs a few weeks ago, just like spamming it offline every game. And around that same time was when, you know, you saw everyone just starting to even play at mid. But he he's also really good on in the offlane, so I wouldn't be surprised that they just have this as a flex pick. And if wow. you know Quinn tries to counter it right now, that it can just go to the offlane and be comfortable versus Chaos Knight. Oh, there's another Ace hero yeah. that he excels at. I thought they would go for the Laundry, but uh, Wraith King is also quite nice. It's very stable, very solid. They like to play with the two cores in the side lanes, so. I mean, they had it uh, earlier in this weekend as well, and it was a part of that push strat that they had. Those skeletons can be very annoying and obnoxious. I, I think everything right now, though, is leading for Naga Siren for LGD. This is looking really scary unless this next pick kind of counters it, which I don't really know what they can pick outside of a Pugna to prep for it. And if, if LGD get a Naga, I think the draft looks pretty good for them. They'll have a way to constantly give vision for the Magnus. ET also gives vision. They have saw, uh, sleep into, you know, net and sleep plays, so they just have a lot of kind of utility with the Naga Siren across the map. I like the Naga suggestion for sure because it can delay the game for them. But, and I was, I was suggesting this Prophet, yeah, I was, I was seeing coming. And the Naga as well. Yeah, well, that Prophet pick was like, that just made Naga even, even better. better yeah. <laughs> so they take the Furion. I really like this first the strong laning fives like Elder Titan. Because what happens is the Furion goes to your safe lane and kind of exists there, and he's always a 3v2 in the top lane. So anytime ET wants to go aggressive onto this, the you know, the safe lane, the Furion will TP in, now it's a 3v2, and the ET's not as strong of a hero. Well, last time I saw this Prophet, I wasn't really a big fan of, because uh, it looked like very squishy during the mid game, but the way the GG are playing, this is like, this is such a huge tempo, and uh, you know, this Naga, like we've seen many times already, like this, this Naga is not gonna be able to come online even after like, you know, they're pushing your high ground at 20 minutes. Ten seconds remaining. Yeah, thankfully for Naga, one of the cool things is the games are really boring to play when you're the other team, because she just delays it. So if there's one way to stop gaming from pushing your base, it's to cut all three waves at the same time simultaneously and be completely safe because you have song. So Naga is one of the ways that you can pretty much delay a game. It's kind of like a probably more consistent version of Keeper of the Light, just from the carry roll. So already right now, I feel way more confident for LGD to take this game into the mid game, to the late game, to where they're more comfortable taking the win. Dude, I'm terrified for, for gaming. Like how, how do you ever take high ground when you're playing into ET, Stomp, you're playing into this skewer back, you have a Naga that's gonna cut your ways while they're holding you off like that. It seems so difficult to ever breach high ground without just killing the entirety of LGD. It's so easy when you're doing it this early. <laughs> yeah, I thought that too for their previous draft, but it seemed, they seem to be make it work, you know, somehow. Oh. Just purely from winning lanes and uh, making this aggressive move in the mid game and like taking complete lead because of how stable their mid game is. I think as long as this last pick for LGD, either the mid or offlane, has some sort of wave clear to deal with the skeletons that are going to come and kind of help defend the tier twos when they're actually sitting there in front of you. I'll be really happy for LGD's draft. Oh, there's no way they didn't pick Pango. And they pick Pango. All right. <laughs> well, there's their wave shove. It gives them also a team fight to fight on the towers. I really like this matchup versus Raid King. You one shot the skeletons, you burn his mana before the shard. So I, I really like the LGD draft. I think it's uh, much better than what they had last game. They also kind of don't have the ability to get countered as hard. So I feel very good for them. And I'm curious as to what Quinn will play. This is, you know, is he knows Pangolier. Yeah, is it another Huskar game for him? Just purely of like how how they can snowball after this game. I'm I'm not too sure. I think there's probably a Queen of Pain angle. I think Queen of Pain is scales really nicely for Naga Siren. Also, there's not really stuns that he has to worry about. It's only the root from Naga Siren, and so I think Queen of Pain kind of has the mobility. Also, it ganks really well with the Fury, and they can set up everywhere across the map. He just needs to now deal with the Naga Siren and have a stable lane versus Pango as his two big goals. I just really believe in the Huskar. I think you can allow to have two melee heroes against uh, Queen and not bend the Huskar in the last pick. I think he's 
He's juicing about it right now. He's thinking about it. He's worried. He's telling him, like, don't worry, man. He won't husk guards. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Trying to ease those nerves. Yeah. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. <laughs> oh, you're right. That's a good thing. Nice suggestion. Uh, I, I think it does check all the boxes for gaming gladiators, but it's kind of... I, again, I'm really scared of this Naga. I thought the second that they picked Chaos Knight, Naga was going to come out at some point in the draft. And so, if anything, I would give LGD an edge right now. Yeah. All right. And what about yourself, Sheep? Uh, I think Gunner's popped off. He <laughs> kinda... That's true. You kind of predicted everything. Yeah, he really did. Sorry. No, it was great. I Never apologize. I, I agree with that. I think LGD have the stronger draft. I think this Pango brought everything together. That was a hero I was thinking of for Gaiman to help deal with the Naga, but them just sweeping it. I think it just solidifies their draft. I think their high ground is way too scary to go into as well. So even if uh, we focus Naga's lane time and time again, Gunna, you think that that shutting down isn't enough to build into gaming gladiators, that everyone else on the side of LGD will be able to make space? Yeah, I think she got picked into pretty much Wraith King and Chaos Knight, which are the same hero that she'll excel in the lane. They don't really have a way to clear the illusions that easily, so her lane should be fine. She can honestly be left alone after four or five minutes, and her game will be good. The biggest thing is whether Quinn can get a lot of work done in this mid matchup is kind of the way that GG wants to play is bring stuff to mid. Quinn's going to outplay the enemy mid laner and just go from there. I'm just worried about supports on the LGD side. Like, how are they going to protect the Pengo from the, you know, from being a run over with the Queen and supports? All right, we'll keep our eyes on mid. We'll see how impactful this Naga is, and we'll see how confident LGD are feeling about their draft. I am joined by Xiao Wait of LGD, and Helen will be helping me translate. Xiao Wait, you have played a countless TIs, you've coached countless TIs, you've won TI. When you are looking at this tournament, is there any one thing that's unique about this international compared to others in the past? Uh, it's been a while since I've been in Seattle, so that familiar feeling is coming back. I'm happy to hear it. But how about all the fans who are watching across the world? This may be your last game. Is there anything you'd like to say to them to get them excited that LGD is going to continue fighting? There we have it, some good words of confidence coming into this game two here for LGD up against Gaming Gladiators. A hard fought game one from them, but they Definitely. weren't able to do it. Gladiators pulling through in that first game. Here in this game two, what do you think about the change ups? I'm seeing already the fact that LGD, that they've got Shira on this Naga Siren. If his Manta play was anything to go by in the last game with the Luna, you've only got to imagine what he's going to be able to do on a Naga Siren. Yeah, it feels like two very different style drafts versus each other. A very fast paced draft gaming, trying to just take advantage, just slam these lanes in particular mid. Quinn going for his Queen of Pain, of course. They're trying to just snowball the game out of control. LGD trying to slow things down. And if they can, their draft looks amazing, right? If they can get to these later stages, this draft from LGD does look like it will reign supreme. But can they withstand the pressure? Gaming has been the team to dictate the pace, to dictate these quick games. This could be another one they're able to set up if they set up this Queen of Pain in particular for that success. Sure, and you think sort of some rightful concerns from the panel as well with regards to what LGD supports are going to be able to do early on to sort of enable the other lanes? Or, or how do you think that's going to play out? I mean, it, it's just difficult to be able to, like, with the pro, you know, the Nature's Prophet constantly making these rotations with the teleport, that's where something they could struggle. They're gonna have to, like, preemptively be ready for the moves, as already, Talking right off the, the bat. Here. Is somebody get off the three bad shield crash, but still the, the damage coming in, he's gonna be first blood for Celery. The power of the Nature's Prophet already coming into fruition here with that level one play. Whose blood grenade was that? Was that Celery's? I saw one being thrown out. Uh, yeah, it was, okay. So, I mean, easy, easy grab there for him, getting set up. Quinn doesn't get the last hit, but either way, does get an advantage inside that middle lane. That's the way they're gonna look to play. I'm gonna be just watching Celery overall, these TPs, but are they going to be able to slow down Duracho is the question, because if Celery is going to be constantly moving around, perhaps that's where New and Planet are able to take some advantage versus this Chaos Knight who usually just wins every single lane. Yeah, talk to me more about this sort of Queen of Pain pick. We just don't see it a lot, but Quinn realizing that this is the game to pull it off. What, what would you think 
think it is directly about this draft from LGD that's made him want to get the Queen of Pain out against it. Definitely limited stuns, right? Just looking overall what they have. They have to commit kind of like ultimates. There's a net and then there's a silence from the Muerta and a dead shot. It's pretty limited. These skill shots are not the easiest things to land on something like the Queen of Pain if he's able to get that big snowball advantage. Nothing to say. Getting seven of the last hits on the first two waves though. So even though he does get killed right away, a very, very good start for this Pango. But it gets it gets quite rough. Those levels, once they build up for the Queen of Pain, it does get pretty difficult for that, that Pango in the mid. Bottom lane, Jiracha have been kept very low here by the harassment from you and Planet. I mean, how, how strong of a lane is this in your book in, in terms of the Magnus and the, the Moeta? Very strong, yeah. They, I mean, it's, it's universal Magnus. You always have great right click this year, I think, has. Hey, he's been the one who actually did it first. I think they were mentioned Raccio. on the panel. The Raccio. Has to turn it to put the stun there to hold back new. Very much playing on the edge of his life here, Duraccio. I'm glad to see more of the Magnus. I feel like this hero always has potential in the off lane just to make so many outplays. Just the shockwave and the skewer plays. Overall good base damage to get last hits. I like this lane a lot. It's quite a bit of attack speed slow too, so even if they try to like turn and fight you, you skewer and you have this calling down, both abilities of course slowing attack speed, it's really tough to fight versus these two. Looking at sort of the, the, the top lane at why you smile on the Elder Titan. A, a pretty good game for E.T. to combo up with some of his teammates. Absolutely. I mean, he's playing. It's all about stalling, right? Stalling out the games. They have the Magnus as well, too. Two of the best Wombo combo. Bottom. And he with the Naga. This time will. around, they'll get him. Get Stuart Gacho. Ford from you. Duracho getting punished. The same time, though, Shira also to fall. Both carries getting punished in the safe lane. Oh, wow. The top one, I, the top one I really wouldn't anticipate happening. But the bottom one, with the way that they were bringing it to Duracho. I was definitely more expected. I can't believe they killed this Naga with this top lane. There's a reason this Wraith King has been constantly picked for this off lane. How much he's able to do in the early game. And Ace, he's been one of the best with it. Keeping eyes on this mid as well. Definitely a matchup where you could you could see the solo kills occurring. Mm -hmm. Both heroes having to be cautious. They've got good amounts of jump and resets way to back up and, and jump back in if they catch one another low. Yeah, nothing to say. Just has to be very careful with how he uses those swashbuckles. A TP comes in from the nature's prop and it could just net a kill almost immediately up top. The stomp it. Gets the Lotus. The two of them, Shiro trying to close in onto Tofu, but Tofu does have the Shadow Realm of the Celery's Red. here. And they've got backup. Celery's in. They turn over the Red Fire Blast over towards Shiro. Shiro getting surrounded. Caught in the Sprout. He's oh, taken out again. They could be able to have a good chance of chasing Why You Smile out as well as Why You Smile trying to back off. But the right clicks from Tofu and Celery are enough. Double kill for Tofu. This top lane getting messy. Messy already. As soon as the Naga comes back, I mean, this is going to be the long walk of shame. 30 seconds, no TP. So much physical damage. The Blightstone coming in. The Wraith King skeleton just hitting on. Him. It's nothing the Naga can do. Yeah, these early deaths, they absolutely hurt for Shiro. Yep. And Duracho, even though he did die, this hero overall, it sustains on its own really nicely. Two points up on the Chaos Strike for Duracho, so should be able to at least get this farm under under the tower here. And Shiro, you know, no, TP's still on cooldown. He's having to take the smoke to try and get back to lane as quickly as he can. A, a big hit against the Naga Siren in this laning stage. A massive one is also Quinn can now go for the bottom room while Tofu checks the top one. Will nothing to say be able to get it? Nope, Quinn gets it. And now Tofu's here to back up. Nothing to say as a squash. He's going to get caught by the Bramble, though. Still able to jump away. But uh, we'll have to, to potentially back off as this dagger ticks him down. Quinn's just jumping he's in. in for the kill. Another dagger, Quinn. He's going to get it. The kill's there. Gladiator's finding a lot of early action. Done bottom planet and knew they tried for Celery, but Celery's able to just walk away from them. The stomp does clip him. Can they finish? Shockwave will drag it back. New really wants to kill. He'll get him. But the now New's under tower. Down. The stun's there. Director trying to step up, see if he can finish on New in return. He's not looking to have any further grab. Five, six seconds until the stun's back up. In fact, he might be in trouble himself. Another dead shot connection from Planet into the shockwave. Got a Lotus. He may, may be able to turn aboard Planet because the stun is back up. The crits are coming in. The stop is there just in time before Dredge is able to pull in Planet with a reality rip. Doesn't matter though. Celery Teep is in grass in the vision as he'll grab him back. I mean, now why you smile's got to be cautious. Dredge has been handed over a Tango. He can start healing up. Hey, look at New. He even has to be careful with his positioning. Hey, Doracho just standing toe to toe versus three heroes. I mean, again in the mid lane, nothing to say, getting bullied Another by one. Quinn and Tofu. As soon as he's back to the mid lane, he's back out again, uh -oh. dead without TP available. And Ace is now in a 1v1 versus the Naga Siren. He's more than happy with this, with this type of setup. They have to just keep trying to move these lanes around the outside of LTD. They Planet, need to do something. And they will. Planet turns up, make sure that this time round, Shiro is able to get the kill against Ace. I mean, look at the aggressions. 10 kills, 5 minutes. Gaming Gladiators, their draft definitely thrives off of this. They want to be the ones just dictating pace, getting these early kills, getting that lane advantage, and so far looking pretty damn good. 
A long walk back to the mid lane. It's going to mean that there's going to be quite the XP difference here between the mids. And Gwen no already halfway through the six. And of course, nothing to say yet to hit his. And it's right around the power rune too. Quinn are very likely to be able to set this one up. Planet has to play around mid to try to stop this Queen of Pain from snowballing so hard. Will he get lucky? Planet will get it. Quick pause. Okay. Oh. Get a crash. Okay. Okay. So a quick reset here from Duracho, but yeah, as things have gone in this first six minutes, Gladiators exactly the way they want it. An explosive opening, really, with these moves that they've made, and as was expected with the power of Selu's Nature's Prophet, he's always been there as a plus one. I mean, even Tofu too, four zero and two so far, right? He is actually ahead of Duracho on net worth. He's tied with almost all the corners at this point as his Willow. Beautiful stuff. I mean, getting those early kills up top, making the rotations onto mid. So far, I mean, it's exactly what gaming wants to do with their draft. Get early kills, snowball, keep putting that aggressive posture on the map. I mean, they've, they've kind of pushed Shiro a little bit to the jungle already. He has to move away as this Naga Siren so early in the game. He's got Midas queued up. It's going to be one of those recovery games for him after a lane like this. Those early deaths slowing down sort of the potential. But as we saw last game, LGD, they are very good at stalling the games yes. now, even if the beginning goes rough. Yeah, they don't have a Shadow Demon, though, to create those illusions. Yes, they have the natural Naga Siren, but they don't have a Spirit Breaker who just literally clears every single wave. A lot more difficult for nothing to say, it would seem, this game being slowed down this much. And losing, I mean, losing the lanes like this also, when you're playing versus something like this, this Wraith King and this Nature's Prophet, there's a reason that Gaming likes to play this so much, right? You pick up the tempo so fast. So if you start having to get pushed to jungle this early on the side of LGD, these towers are going to start dropping very, very early on with the way that they want to make moves. And with the, the sort of the start that the supports of Gaming Gladius has got and the fact that Quinn is, is in the lead right now, it's, it's not going to be too difficult for Gladiators to go for these deep movements and try and catch Shiro in his jungle. Absolutely. They just have to watch out how far they overextend because the way the counter initiation and everything from LGD, that's kind of their biggest thrive is, is if gaming pushes the limit too far, they have wombo combo team fight. They have massive ways of repositioning and taking them under these tier twos potentially. So far early game, right, exactly what gaming gladiators wants, maybe even more than they could have hoped for with Ace having such a damn good start in top. Just not easy for nothing to say to hop around this mid. He's just mm. trying to at least find the XP for his level six. And Ace definitely having a very nice understanding with this Wraith King playing versus the Naga Siren versus the ET. He's all about that plus armor. He's got the Ring of Protection, I believe he started with. Wraith Band right afterwards and Phase Boots. So hard for them to really bring him out of this lane with this, with this Naga or this ET. This lane's about to restabilize. Duraccio now able to get this free farm. And why are you smart? Maybe see if we can go for some sort of stomp play to grab the wisdom, but... It's a risky play for some Nature's Prophet. And he's not going to be able to stop them from securing it themselves. It gladiators. In fact, and he actually gets caught. Ace, Ace is here. Indeed, is ready with the stun. Puts a stop to the TP. So not only not getting the chance to grab the wisdom rune, he ends up losing his life to Ace. Oh, he's such a quick movement there from Ace. Don't think that the ET expected him to move that quick. He's queued up the Radiance now already. So going to have that itemization. Even versus the Naga Sarn, as game does potentially progress, he is incredibly farmed so far on this Wraith King. I mean, for LGD, can they look for aggressive moves themselves, or is it just a case of them preparing to turn things around if gaming gladiators start heading onto their half of the map? They need more levels, for sure. I mean, the big one that usually wants to make the moves is going to be that mid laner, but when he's playing versus Queen of Pain, he's super shut down and new. Also, it's level 4 Magnus now versus the level 6 CK. Duraccio is perfectly fine to be left alone down here. So difficult for them to really make moves in this early game now. As they said on panel, these supports, that are kind of needed with the, with the cores. They have to make the moves with the cores in particular. Let this say we'll get another power rune, Quinn. And they're trying to set up, but it's so hard. They need kind of the, the silence from the, the calling to, to really clip him. Outside of that, Quinn, he's jumping away every time. Yeah, they need like the perfect kind of chain stun with the rolling thunder and everything. That's why they wanted this pop. Very elusive. Still looking to play around mid, too. They've got three heroes poised on the side of Gaming Gladiators. Looking to still go for nothing to say. Almost eight on Quinn. Actually, just gonna instantly smoke him. Takes the point in the Sonic way. If he wants to look, keeping the pre look, look to keep the pressure going here. I mean, wouldn't it be a bad catch finding you. He's already had a bit of a tough time in the lane. If they Ooh, can pick him down, we'll be able to break that smoke at the they'll, least. They'll see what's coming. But look at Duracho's positioning. He still wants to dive new. I mean, who wants to come down here to help him? TPs are going to be coming over. He's got the pain. He's getting caught by the Bramble, though. Nothing to say. The stun's out for Duracho. Nothing to say. He's got the Rolling Thunder at the ready, but the Sonic Wave pointed the two of them back. Now he's too low. 
There's now nothing to say, he's gonna run. Perfect angle from Quinn to get that pushback. Stops him in his tracks. Gaming just continue to keep the planet. advantage going and plan it, be careful. He's gonna miss the dead shot. The stun's there, I mean, he's planet, down. he's gone as well. Then in an instant. They just can't fight them at this point, despite how hard yes. they try, LGG. And I mean, without Rolling Thunder now, they cannot protect this tower. Top also looks like it's starting to get pressure. Rotation from Tofu coming in with Ace. Pressure on all fronts, 10 to 3, a 4K lead already, pre-10 minutes gaming, doing what they do best. Taracha almost having it, he's gonna have his arm lift pretty much done already. Shiro is starting to get some recovery farm, but he's not really the one who makes plays to recover things. He's the one who has to just kind of sit back and farm for a very, very long time. The fact that this offlane and mid lane are struggling so much, it's gonna be very difficult for LGD to mount these defenses on these early towers. It's going to take time for, for New Year's sort of watch. Just 300 gold in towards the Blink Dagger. Yeah, it's very poor. It's tier 1 in the mid lane. Starting to take, you get a bit of a beat down here by Duraccio. He's actually ready to start jungling over on LGD's side of the map. He knows that there's very little that LGD can do to push back the CK. I mean, he knows they're just very underleveled. Magnus still not quite level 6. The two supports as well, too. Their damage is just extremely lackluster on the side of LGD. The only damage they really have is going to be coming out from the Pango right now. And this Pango is very shut down in this game. Top tower to fall. Ace. I'm Dracha, he's, close to a relic. he's getting the chance to step up and, and, and trade hits here with Shira right up towards close to the tier two. Look how confident he is. They can't he's, punish him. They don't have damage for him by this point. He doesn't even have the armlet just yet. I mean, Shira's just getting chased out completely from his jungle. And immediately he has a wave bottom, meets his tower. Duracho just heads back over as they take out top tower. Ace is going to have this. I mean, this is going to be one of the faster offlane radiances that comes out. And it's a great radiance game playing versus this Nox. Quinn. Continue to play incredibly aggressive here, push the limits. I mean, you got Tofu coming in from the side as well. <laughs> and look at Taracho. I mean, he just pops a Phantasm and sends the illusion on New and just zones him out of the lane. New actually can't walk up and contest an illusion. And could just die if he steps up a little bit too far. Has I mean, to be pretty careful. Same to be said for nothing to say. He's having to go right back under the tier two. Cannot show his face anywhere close New? to tier one. Gonna try and TP down bottom. Skewer's only gonna be on towards the Phantasm. Maybe they can find Celery. They'll get the stomp set up. Duraccio's considering maybe helping out on this fight, but with the wrong is here. Here. they're in with the stun. Sonic Wave pushing back the three of them. It's actually giving the space for Celery to walk away. I mean, the Celery, punk out. He's perfectly fine. Duraccio's considering diving in towards New. Nothing saying he tripped up by the spells of Tofu as the jump forward there from Quinn. Oh, Nothing good. to stay taken down. They just can't kill any of them. I mean, this Not is even man. Celery. Again and again. I mean, Quinn, uh, this time a Sonic Wave just to knock back the Pango. Works out perfectly, completely messes with nothing to say. This Pango is having no effect of this night right now. Can't even touch a Celery. A 6k lead already for gaming gladiators. This oh, is boy. as hot as a start as you can get, really. I mean, the Relic is done. The Radiance is going to be coming up with 13, 14 minutes for Ace. Oh. 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 It's a Duraccio. I was gonna say, it's bound to happen. It hasn't happened much at I mean, PI, I feel thing, like. When he dies like this, the win is pretty much guaranteed. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't believe it always happens. <laughs> we should have had a camera on him. That was unexpected. We'll get a replay. Uh, okay. Well, as I say, uh, when that's happened before, he pretty much always wins the game. Yep. So, um, you know, all past the course here for Duraccio. <laughs> I can't believe it always happens. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Things calming down for a few moments here, but gaming have... I mean, they've hit so hard in these first 12 minutes. What more could you ask for? All three tier ones taken out. You've completely shut down the Pango. The Magnus, his timings are all shot as well, too. You're having three cores farming perfectly, and the two supports as well, too. Look at how farm the two of them are. Neck and neck, 3,600 gold on the two of them. And yeah, Radiance, it's, it's going to be done already. So he's going to have that way to just control the map even more and have the counter versus the Nagasaren, even as game progresses. Now these passive moments just not favoring LGD at all. See it again here. I mean, at this point, we all knew there was a high likelihood something was going to go wrong, and it did. Wait, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> and he ran. Uh. There we go. <laughs> Tofu with a smile for that one. Quinn did not oh, smile. Quinn, Quinn, say, all Quinn serious say. business from Quinn. He weren't happy. How dare you? In my perfect Queen of Pain game, what are you doing? Look how aggressive they're still posturing, though. Continuing just go for nothing oh, to say. No space for this man. Too. Uh -oh. oh man. I mean, Xiaowei gave him some rubs on the shoulders, but so far it's not helping. 0 5 0. They're trying to find anything that they can to get. Look at this. And why you smile now? Positioning for Wisdom Room potentially. Trying to get the two of them stolen at least. But Tofu already running over. 
And Celery's even TPing in aggressively. They're just going to take both, it seems, on the side well, of gaming. We'll, maybe with a stone, why you smart can get this one? No, Tofu's got the kite and out, gets back in, picks it up. Okay. we will be able to grab their own. Okay, Duraccio actually isolated. New is here as well. If they could get it. They've got the skewer. They'll try and turn, but this time. Ooh. Nice song. It might be allowing them to get the two of them, actually, because yep. now they can set up over towards Celery. They kill off Duraccio. They close the gap in on towards Celery. Gets clipped by the dead shot. A couple of kills here for LGD. Yeah. Nicely done from Shiro. I mean, he's the one with the Midas, and he's the one actually making the plays happen here to bring some stuff back. Nicely done. And they got the wisdom. Something finally going for the side of LGD. Now that area of the map, not, not really been a happy place for Duraccio in these last few moments. To get... back. Ends up denying himself and also ends up getting killed off. Probably not a place we'll see him head back to anytime soon. But ASC probably says, don't worry, guys. I'm the real carry. I mean, it's all a distraction. It, it certainly seems that way because, indeed, he continues to match the farm of Shiro. And I just, I mean, I, this is going to be one of the slower timings I think we see that comes out for nothing to say. This Diffusal Blade, it's been slowed down so much. He still doesn't have it. He's still about 800 gold away. On Midas, I, they're just going to be going for all the way to this late game here. Double Midas is coming out for LGD. Shiro, he's caught. He's Can he get away? Gonna clip, get, clip on the Sonic Wave once more. Nothing to say, getting pushed back. Have to use the re remainder of the Rolling Thunder to just retreat. Cannot afford to go into the high ground against Gaming Gladiators. His bottom lane, Duraccio. Now he's alone. I mean, he still feels just sort of super confident to play like this and just be this distraction, really. Just try and draw the attention of LGD down here and away from Ace. It's very typical Duraccio, right? Just just getting in their faces. Super aggressive, sometimes over-aggressive, but either way, it's his play style and it works time and time again it for really gaming. It really does. It really does. Look at these illusions. They die so fast. Extra bit of gold going for Celery. Going straight down that pipe route himself, too, after the Solar Crest. Just looking to ball up. 7k lead. Quinn oh. does get caught by the net. Oh, for the opening net. Do they have the follow up? For the silence, the dead shot as well. It's perfectly done, but not he gets out. enough. No way. Quinn still able to blink away. The wraparound coming in from Ace. In with the rain fire blast and the skeletons over towards Why You Smile. Why You Smile. He's able to move speed over here. Has enough move speed to get away from him. Ace trying to turn his attention towards more, but LGD have kited out this counterplay oh, from planet. Ace. Planet. He's caught. Well, back in range of the, the Wraith King, though, is Ace. With the backup of Celery, should be able to block off his escape. The stone comes in, the crits come out. They take Planet down. I think you can imagine the gaming's gonna look to really accelerate things as soon as they see new. The Magnus having a Midas, they're probably like, guys, let's go, go, go. I they mean, have no blink dagger on Mag. Every, every single time, is just going straight for yeah. new. Anytime new shows his face on the lane. All right, LGD, they're playing for the super late game, right? This Midas queued up top. Gaming probably wants to keep pushing down for this tower. Glyph is down. Can't believe Quinn gets away. I mean, he is very that tanky was, at this point. I mean, and they really did everything they could to they lock did. him down. It just wasn't enough. It was yeah. pretty much perfect, but yeah. The occult bracelet, the magic resistance, just get 2,000 HP on this Queen of Pain because that advantage he's gotten from the early game. All right, Blink done on you. Are you, are you smoking up on LGD to make a play around this, or are you still sitting back and looking for the counter plays? I think they can look to make plays with the Pango and the Magnus, for sure. Still, I mean, they're going to be playing for later stages, but if they can find opportunities to catch heroes that are pushed up too far toward these tier twos, they can definitely get some kills. Maybe even surprise ones onto something like Ace. Who panel was talking about the the mana burn sometimes from the Pango can be a little bit of an issue for these Wraith Kings. Ace is just going to go straight for that shard next. Catch bottom. Got a split up. Do they have enough? It's a huge amount of damage. Not quite enough yet. Does get Sprouts the Pango off this as well, making sure that these illusions aren't able to finish direct you off. I mean, Shiro is he's getting quite involved with this Nagasar and just trying to bring things back together for his team. I mean, he really did so much last game, keeping it he going did. into Luna with the illusions. This very much a, 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 a even more perfect hero for him to play when it comes to just keeping the game going, buying time for the entire team of LGD to scale. There's that shard for Ace. Doesn't have to worry about that mana burn coming into play here. LGD still looking for a player at DD now on nothing to say. They want to get something done with this blink. A solo RP will, would absolutely cut it. They'll, they'll go for I mean, Quinn if they want thinking to. about it. Can they get the catch? There it is. They can. Straight in, they get the drag back. This time, have they got enough lockdown? The sleep, the He's beat. still alive. Pushes back you. And Quinn is able to jump away, turn with the sonic wave, and walk this one off. As Ace, he's considering getting involved. He, he starts to say straight towards them, feeling strong with the fact that he's got that shot, has the, I, the reincarnation ready to use aggressively. I mean, they just use so much. Use their Pango roll, they use their Magnus roll too, so gaming, they're gonna run at them right here. Celery, TPing up top already, looking for nothing to say. He's got backup coming in, but they want this tower, it's 300 HP. 
Queen just keeps getting away over and over again here. A nice attempt there, though, from LGD. Yeah, they, had, they had to go Ooh. for it. Gotcha. I mean, look how aggressive he's playing even near the tier two. I mean, they've got the vision down. Magnus. This is, this, this is dangerous positions here, though. Those skewer plays near tier two is just something they still have to do respect on the side of gaming. And Duracho, we're closing in on the, the BKB time. He's got it pretty soon if he wants yeah. to take apart the Echo. Still looking to keep accelerating things with these ults on cooldown. 50 seconds, no RP. 28 on the Rolling Thunder. Top tower will fall. Ace has skeletons prepped at the ready, too. So you want to keep threatening it all here. Maybe swing toward the mid lane. They've actually dragged the wave from mid to Rachio to look to keep this pressure going. Quinn picking out Shiro bottom. That's five time from Gaming Gladiators this time around. They know the heroes are positioned on the bottom, in particular that Naga sign. They know that Shiro was down here, making the long wrap around. You see nothing to say for a second here. Ace is oh, the jump. Straight away with the stun. It's far too dead. much damage for nothing to say to survive through. All right, Tofu and Ace menaces this game. Tofu 5 0 5, the instant bedlam, trusting his buddy. Might be able to run into more, too. Shiro, he's been spotted. Ace. Oh, he knows which one the real one is. In with the jump. The illusions are out, Shiro. Good look to try and turn. Tofu's in with the fear. Pushing back Shiro for now. Means that Ace doesn't have to worry about losing the reincarnation quite yet. He's still got that to protect himself and go for a second round. It will get forced out here with the yeah. splitter. Duracho, deep forward, new, looking for some skewer plays. Five seconds till it's back up. We'll Managed to clear out the illusions, make sure there's no vision for LGD to play around to try for that sort of jump. So Gaming Gladiators will back off safely. A cool smoke though from Gaming. They kind of force LGD all the way back to their base, getting out of their jungle with that one, even while picking up a kill. Shiro's farm continues to roll in very Good. nicely. He's Still is nice. Trying to get this heart done on top of the mantra, and he's closing in on it. The only scare is that the Pangle just continues to have this very, very hard game. Same thing for the Magnus. And the Naga Siren, even at this point, like, even if he gets the ultimate scaling all the way to the end of these games, is he able to parry versus all this? They have great late game, but it's an 8k lead already for the side of Gaming Gladiators. They're getting crazy scaling, even on the supports, as we were mentioning. I've been waiting to see what Tofu looks to queue up because he's having such a good game. The Yule Scepter, but he's sitting on 1200 if he does want to look to go down some scaling route too. And there's the pipe now for Celery. More and more tankiness. I mean, when he's got the Aghanims finished up now too, so much more burst potential, much better ways to be able to clear out this Naga Siren too. As Roche potentially soon on the docket here for Gaiman. BKB finished up for Duracho. On those last few attempts from LGD, they just haven't been able to take down this Queen of Pain 100 to 0. And Shiro's gone for the full tanky route rather than the aggressive route that we sometimes do see from the Naga Sirens. I think sometimes we do see that like Orchid kind of playmaking style come out, but Shiro, he's just trying to build up for himself. Celery. He was spotted. He's got eyes on you. Further TP's coming in as well. See if he can get the blink off in time. Oh, right hit. clicks are there. Celery will catch him. They drag him back into the stun. New. Punished here for trying to farm on this bottom half of the map. Gaming Gladiators, they'll be having none of that. Kind of the name of the game, though, for LGD. Pull, pull gaming away from their base, try to buy more and more time. Even though New does die, does force yeah, three heroes to make the move down there. Yeah, Setting up the rush now. Rush now, yep. Look to grab this. Ace also very close to his own BKB. Yeah, and with that kill that they got onto New, so I'll, I mean, for LGD, it's probably too difficult for them to contest down here anyway. But now it's guaranteed here for Gaming to be able to finish that one off. And Tofu, still considering his item build. Yeah, I've still 1,700 gold. He hasn't queued it up. I've been waiting to see which one he does want to go down the route of. We shall see. Queen going for a little bit more protection, something you don't see too often anymore on the Queen of Pain, but is buying a Yules after having his Aghanims and his Kaya, so just that little bit of extra protection versus the Calling in particular could be huge. As with this Aegis, imagine the game is going to look to control the map a lot more here, try to constrict this Naga Siren from getting out. Shiro playing in these dangerous positions, trying to get farm in the enemy Ancients. And cutting some waves. Some nice micro coming out from him, just like we saw from that Luna. I mean, honestly, as long as he's able to survive and stay alive, you can probably guarantee that two of these waves, at least, will be held right back onto Gaming Gladiator's half of the map. It's not going to be too easy for them to get a push going towards multiple lanes at the same time, Gladiator's, with a play from Shira. 
As LGD smoked up. I'm gonna try something here with the RP once more. See Quinn. They're gonna try it again. This time round, do they have enough? He's got the Yules. Nice, got the Yules. I mean, and he's, he's out. out of there. That's an RP down and a splitter. And that time they don't even come close to killing him. Nice, this Yules pickup feels pretty damn beautiful there. If they don't have that chain stun, which they really don't they have don't. in their draft, he's gonna be able to get it off every time. And he's going for Kaya San, so status is just gonna make it potentially even easier for him to get off afterwards in these later instances. Pretty much the only way they can kill this Queen of Pain is if Quinn sort of blinks into them, yep. but Quinn's not been making those mistakes this game. Or if they have absolutely everything that comes in, like perfectly with Shiro, though. They need everybody hitting him at the same time. Ults on cooldown gaming. Might look to make another move here. They see Shiro top. I mean, this is an empowered Naga sign. They're kind of giving away which the real one is. I mean, and they know that there's no RP. And Ace knows this is the real one. I mean, they're already TPing in onto the back lines as well. Shiro's going to go for the song TP out. Tofu. Same to be said for why you smile. Get out. Well, that was close though. The fear from Tofu nearly catching him, but LGD will escape. Oh man, if Tofu's blink was actually on him there, that potentially could have been a catch on to either one of these heroes. The blink was coming on the courier for the Willow. So Tofu, he made his decision what he wants to go for. This is a cool pickup too. I feel like this is more about stopping it, that initiation or the counter initiation that LGD is going for, rather than scaling for himself. He's looking to see where this RP comes, blink, get the fear off, and reset the fights for his team. So a cool choice if he's able to get those catches. Has nothing to say. This game going. I mean, recovering slightly, but still zero six and zero. Hasn't been involved in any sort of positive action this game when it I comes mean, to kills. It's been rough. He's tried, but it's just been completely stopped from Quinn. Every single time he comes in, a sonic wave just pushes him back and stops him in his tracks. Eighty-one percent, as we see there right now for gaming. Dota Plus is liking their chances. So much weight right now on Shiro's shoulders. It really feels like all of it's going to be these big plays that he's able to make with these yeah. illusions. Asun having a butterfly, so he is getting quite tanky. But the rest of his allies continue to be pretty poor in gaming. They're scaling on all three cores. Oh, they really are. They really are. Ace still holding the top spot out of the team. Incredible farm on this offlane Wraith King. And just the blink, the BKB going down the aura round afterwards just to enable his teammates even more so. And just keeping it, now they're starting to keep more and more control of the map. After they got this Aegis, they're dealing with all three lanes. Celery's showing on one lane, Ace showing on another, and Quinn with the backup of two heroes showing on another one. So they're keeping the lanes shoved in and constricting Shiro from getting his illusions actually out to cut these waves. He's actually un been unable to for the last few minutes. Well, the fact that they are yeah, RMD getting the chance to hit these two tier twos at the same time, definitely a concern for how LGD would want to be keeping this game going. And they can potentially even set up for Tormentor if they'd like to. Maybe a little bit of a risk playing versus the Magnus and everything, but Ace may be thinking about it. Did Celery show what he's going to be building just yet? Okay, he does have the Aghanims queued up. You know, he's going to be a great option. Look at this. Oh, this is the deep jump. Oh, he's going in past the tier three. He's ready to sort of dive in and look for action. The sleep is there. RP as well. Down to two. two of them. It's going to bring them low. Yule's up for Quinn. Quinn will be able to jump out of this one. Gets to the side. Actually hits pretty much a fight. Gets a fall. Wave there. Ace here on the second line. Goes towards the easy. Takes down while you smile. Shira has to use the song to back up. I mean, what a jump there. I mean, Salary TPing in aggressively and then Ace jumping forward. They just Quinn. goes straight for it. Yeah, Quinn gets a connection on almost everybody I think with Shadow Strike. I think it was pretty much a vibe. Just trying to use this Aegis as much as possible. Duracho, 40 seconds left on it. He should be able to pop it the once. Maybe, maybe not. He's actually able to, to get out of this Duracho. He's not even going to lose the Aegis quite yet. Little toggle gets himself out. They force the glyph. They force quite a bit there. I mean, pretty much every single ulti being used from the side of LGD just to sustain and withstand themselves. Celery does buy back at the least there. One silver lining for LGD, but gaming. I mean, at any moment, you can see they're very confident just jumping in. Duracho. Wolf. The skewer back on him. Ten seconds to later. Seconds. They will just look to take him down the first time whilst the Aegis is still there. And, okay, and they get the Tormentor too. Quinn. They go around to Quinn. He's in with the jump. Duracho plus the BKB turns over to Shiro. Shiro's in the trouble. Stun. They surrounded him in the corner. They came blocked off by Duracho. Sonny Wave as well. He's pushed off to the side of the map. Quinn jumps in. He's killing off the back lines. He's taken out Brad and use the ball as well. Shiro. He's around to the Niger side. Shiro, he's out. 50 seconds. None of them with buyback gold available. As GG will be able to push down this bottom lane, maybe even get the tier three in the barracks with this one. They're starting to fall a bit long, Quinn. But Duraccio's, he's full HP. He's back to four, Quinn. Look I mean, what can they do to push this one back? At the least, there's still a tier two in the mid lane. They don't have their Magnus. They have no way to skewer, no way to hold this off. This Rax is looking pretty dead. Can they stop this? 
I right, Quinn, this arcane rune right Ace. there coming into play. And now Ace. Nothing to say. Going to try and put a bit of a slowdown to this push, but at the same time, he's going to make sure that he keeps a fair bit of a distance when the Rolling Thunder does come to an end. I mean, they're still going even for the melee racks here. Gaming Gladiators pushing the limits. We'll be backing up. Agnes is respawning. RP's back up. They'll give respect. But another massive hit, 13k lead. They bring down Shiro and, and Quinn with the back of that arcane rune kind of making the magic happen. The confident blink forward into everybody. I mean, he knows they can't kill him. Yep. Now, his itemization feels absolutely perfect this game, and he knows it. He's playing so confident. Full heart now on the CK as well, too. A massive hit from Gaiman. And everything coming back up for them pretty soon. Sonic Wave, 15 seconds. It's just been he so hard for LGD to really find a... A killer tool. Yep. I mean, as soon as the song gets used, they kind of just have to like reset and run. And then when Shiro gets isolated with that song, he's just dead. They have no way to follow up to protect him. Quinn soon to have a Shiva's as well, too. More and more layers for them to try to get through to bring down this quad. They're trying to step out of their base a little bit, LGD, but. Scary to come out. They keep having to just follow each other together. They have to play as a unit here versus the side of gaming. They could just get picked off in an instant as we see there. Gaming, no hesitation to jump if a hero's isolated. OGD. Did they find something with this smoke, Quinn? He's got a shield ruin. Uh, they try for the Fine. skewer back. No hesitation, of course. They, they don't want to drop the RP because the last few times it's just not worked out. I mean, even if they get him there, honestly, he just probably pops shield ruin and we'll probably see the same thing that happened time and time before. Three lanes being shoved in. You see the lines being drawn from LGD. They're like, we need to get these lanes out. Taracho. Looking for the very aggressive play here. Looking for the jump. Jump, Shiro. He's got backup. He glimmered. Instant play. I mean, why you smile? In the perfect position there to protect him. More and more items to deal with that Naga. You said, you know, the Radiance is out. The AC is out for Ace. Great items versus Naga. Now it's Shiva's, of course, coming out for Quinn. Harder and harder for Shiro to solo carry this. All three lanes shoved in. No space for Shiro to get out on the map. Should be able to take out this final tier two tower now, Gaming Gladiators. And Roche, it's gonna be a long spawn. Ace in. just jumps in. He goes straight for it, straight over towards Planet. There will be the Glimmer again to try and get him out of there, but Celery's in with the TP, falls up to the high ground. Planet, he's been caught by the Sprout. They get the skewer back onto Celery. Celery caught by the Silence. They take the Nature's Prophet down with the Sonic Wave from Quinn. Clips Planet. Look how confident he is with the Shield Rune. Knows they have no way to get him. Celery does die, and that was the dieback, so 60 seconds without him. Gaming looks like they will be happy with that tier two and that kill. He'll back up and get that farm going here. DD spawns up top. And Quinn gets one of those big talents with the Aghanim's build. He's got the 20 talent. A long spawn on that rush. Maybe a fortunate one for LGD, it feels like a little bit. But either way, they have more than enough time on the side of gaming to just keep these lanes shoved in to constrict Hero. The scaling continues. We're going to be able to listen in on, uh, I believe, Gaming Gladiator to see what they had to say about those previous moments. If we play in formation, they have no chance of fighting. We just do not overreach. The only way they can kill us is if we get, like, ultra scared into some turbo us. combo. Yep. I mean, he's, he's, he's yep. absolutely right on that one. We're seeing it the way that the Gaming Gladiators are moving as a unit. It's just not allowing LGD any opportunity to, to get the jump on them. Not to get the jump on multi-heroes too, right? We've seen one-man RPs, one-man skewers, one-man splitters. Just, yeah, gaming, they really have not been giving the opportunities to them to get that big wombo combo onto multiple heroes. Full Hex now onto Shiro. A little bit more catch to potentially trip up Quinn. He's, he's really got his work cut out, Shiro. He really does. He's had the chance to get the farm, but can, can he do what's necessary to keep LGD's hopes alive here in this game too? It really is all up to him. Roche, 30 seconds. Gaming positioning themselves for it. All four or five heroes actually set up down bottom. Duraccio getting closer and closer to his MKB to be able to focus down this Naga Siren as well. Ace almost has an Aghanim, so even if they do get oh caught boy. in some type of Wombo combo and stuff like that, there's the plays yep. around it. More and more scaling continues. Roche. LGD. 
is a tough call to make, but maybe they might feel like they have to potentially try to contest this Roshan, but yeah, this is a very, very hard call to make. I mean, and, and Gaming Gladiators, they're going to be coming straight for them first. Oh, Smoke up from Gladiators. Guard. This could be totally unexpected here. They're going to be ready to head into the triangle. Duracho leading the charge here. Yeah. Scouted by a tree. Wait, Link. Link is there in time. Nicely done. And they will all get out. So they will back up, deal with the lanes as his team goes for the Roche. Nice. Super close to his own Agonims. The item. I mean, this item is always super nice, just so you don't have to really like commit your hero so far. And he just throws a wrath of nature because it disarms as well too with all the bounces that it gets on with the root. So can be really nice to just protect the heroes if they do get caught inside of a big wombo combo. As Roche yeah, will fall. Duracho can play a little bit more. I mean, I say a little bit more aggressive, but more aggressively. Quinn, a secondary life has yet to die this game. I mean, they're heading towards him top. There's still a tier one available here for backup to come in if, if, if they do want to dive this, but it's a CK with an Aegis. Instant they try and KB. tease something out. They'll get the BKB response, but nothing more. Taracho seems like he knew that was coming from a mile away. Celery. Wisdom runes. Double grab, double grab again for gaming. LGD looking to try to keep getting something up out of top here, but the lanes are starting to get pushed in. It is a lot of them out here, pretty deep on, on the map, but can they really start a fight? Planet, is it under division. Is able to get the pierce the veil off. A little bit of protection, but still the damage really coming in from the Bad magical, look. bringing him down low. He's caught in the trees. Quinn finishes him off. LGD, they've got to get out of here. Nice ward from Tofu. Quickly places that one down on the side. Tofu also still just having this flawless game. 5 0 and 8. It's enabled Quinn to be able to snowball. I mean, it's sort of 80 spawns bottom. Ace able to grab this one now, too. <laughs> and that Agonims is done. And they can play like this. Just sort of split across the map, knowing that LGD just can't really jump any of them. Nope. And if they do, there's going to be more than enough time for, for them to survive long enough for backup to arrive. Yeah, and they've got all these itemization to be able to deal with this Nagasar and Ace also, of course, didn't point it out, but he did get blessed with the Cloak of Flames on top of everything too. So Cloak of Flames Radiant, so he's going to be amazing versus these Illusion Heroes on top of Flynn, having the Shivas and everything too, and having Cloak of Flames. Look how many of them they have. And yeah, these lanes, they're just constantly being dealt with. On top of the Wrath of Nature, of course, brooding. Once you get that Agonim, the cooldown also dropping down to that 60 seconds. He can just throw it off cooldown, keep these lanes constantly shoved in, keep LGD inside of their base. Quinn now with the Lincolns as well to another layer to I mean, try to go through. They're just never going to catch him. Nope, it doesn't feel like it. Not with the way that he's played. I mean, honestly, it's been pretty much zero mistakes from him so far, Quinn. A flawless game, a flawless two games, to be honest with you. LGD. I'm going to try it for it again. Smoke up. They've got to take some sort of high-risk plays here to try and pull this game back in their favor. Who do you want to go for, though? There's an Agonyms Wraith King as well, too. These tanky frontliners with Aegis Cheese, too. And Ace is just walking. He might just even blink in. He's taunting them. He wants them to go for him. He's going to jump. The stone off, and you see they turn with the Hex. If they can bring him down the once, they get the drive back up towards the tier three. To the base. Take him down once. So just they can do it a second time. Quinn starts to jump forward, gets the Shadow Strike out onto New. It's enough to hold them back, and indeed there's not a, any sort of attempt from LGD to try and go on Ace a second time. 60 seconds, we'll be back up. Pretty much all waves starting to push in against LGD. Still two minutes. Yeah, big, just on Duraccio. Big neutrals found. Penta Edge now for him as well. After this MKB, he is hitting incredibly hard. Quinn also finds himself a Stormcrafter and Ace. A Havoc Hammer. More really good items versus pretty much all these illusions. It's rare to see the Naga Siren unable to really send the illusions out to try to get any farm, but they're just dealing with them so quickly every time they see them. Leaving the base just. Just does not feel like an option right now for LGD whatsoever. Getting massively out farmed. The gaming's farming 90% of the map. We heard it in the comms earlier, just sort of keeping everything very calm on Gaming Gladiators. Dredge 
Getting clipped by the harpoon. They're able to pull him in, but Quinn's here with a backup. Ace is dead. Oh, they get the Sony Wave pushed back onto the three of them. The RP's there, but it looks like it doesn't really matter. They've already lost Planet. Shira having to use the song to reset. It's another retreat from LGD. They can't even hold around the barracks as the melee barracks will fall. Is that another four-man Sonic Wave, I feel like, from Quinn? I feel like every single time he's getting so many of these heroes. I can't imagine what his damage is in this game, but it probably is by far the highest. And Ace, he's going again. again. He's going up towards the tier fours to get another round of the Shadow Strike daggers out into the two of them. Shiro trying to step forward, but the illusion's out. But Duracho is pretty much ignoring them, hitting onto the tier three. Shiro's they in trouble. Him with the sun. Ace stepping forward, they get the pullback with the rift. Shiro's in trouble. The Hex is there, Strip thrown down onto towards Duracho. Shiro, it's not enough to fight back to save Shiro. Shiro taken out, and short of the money on buyback. You also to fall. They don't have the buyback here. LGD is gaming gladiators, taking them down one by one. Stood over the walls, nothing to say. He's also out without no buyback. The tier four is exposed. They're looking at it It's over. GG is called. Gaming Gladiators take this one 2-0. We'll be moving on to the grand finals. What a display of dominance. This last pick, oh Queen boy. of Pain. I mean, I mean this yeah. seemed perfect. Quinn just took over everything. Nothing to say. Ends the oh. game. Zero, seven, and zero. That is got to be crap. one of the most brutal mid comparisons we've seen. I think Quinn just letting out his disgust for Pango Pickers big time <laughs> in this game with how dominant and how just rough that mid matchup ends up looking on the scoreboard. Folks. I mean, look at the damage numbers. It tells the tale of it all. Quinn, look at this. I mean, ridiculous. 36,000. How many four-man ults can we see? How many times is he just going to stop? Nothing to say. In his tracks in the Rolling Thunders, nothing to say. Did 11,000 damage. LGD tries to play for the late game but it doesn't even matter. Gaming just controls everything. And even if it gets to these later stages, they had full grasp. I mean, they look brilliant. I mean, as we said, we, we knew it from the Duraccio death of the neutrals that this game was over. <laughs> they always win the games like that. It's a crucial point. I mean, you know, from that point on, we should just not beating them. You know, Duraccio, he's in full Duraccio form and he does not get stopped. No, he does not. A flawless game from Gaming Gladiators. Absolutely. I mean, LGD, they had a great run, but here today, they get shut down out of the competition by Gaming Gladiators who are going to be moving on to that grand finals with an incredible force after the, the sort of ferocity that they win these two games with. Gaming Gladiators, they'll take the series 2-0 against LGD and are going to the grand finals. A dominant showing up from this team. They have made it all the way from the first lower bracket round. And now they're going to be playing in the grand finals in a short time. They have a little bit of time to reset. And we have some time to break down this series to talk about game number two. Because Naga could have done work, Gunnar. We saw the pick coming. We thought it was a great counter pick. But the game never progressed to a point where she had map to farm, where she could do anything. Yeah, I think the Quinn Queen of Pain kind of popped off. Yeah, massively. Nothing to say had a really rough time in the mid lane, and uh, Quinn just showing the mid diff. Uh, he's kind of shown that the entire lower bracket run. I think every game they play, it pretty much ends up being Quinn just destroys the lane, and they just snowball it throughout the whole game. He took that Pango pick personally, for sure. He did. I mean, Tomatoes also did Tofu rotations, right? Because Tofu yep. came in coming here to the mid lane twice. And <laughs> I mean, this this from the right show is just hilarious. But anyways, like coming mid twice and like making that insane advantage from the mid lane starting. And like Quinn, he never died. Like this game, he played perfectly. And he was doing so much work in these fights. Like we thought Naga would be a problem, but with the way he played and how how much he was like uh, scaling and like uh, how many items did he get? Like this Naga was not even, even, even being able to do anything in yeah. this game. And all their heroes allow them to keep pushing their advantage so hard. Like you have a Wraith King, like you want to... Wraith King can be quite squishy when he's on the back foot, right? But when you're ahead, you're able to use those two lives to front for your team. You're using Nature's Prophet tree as to scout everywhere. You're checking back in your own jungle to make sure LGD aren't trying to farm there. You're scouting into the enemy jungle to find people to gank and kill. Like you're able to just keep going and going and going. And in the moments where they thought they might have had something, suddenly game in are up and item. They have a BKB. Queen of Pain's able to use her ult to maybe rebuff the Pango, uh, you know, ultimate. Like they, they have so many tools from this lead early to just allow them to stomp the game. I mean, there's also these little things that Celery does, right? You don't notice it in game, but he's like blocking the uh, spawns with the trees, like you know, the neutral camps and like denying all the farm from uh, LGD side too. Like those little things that he's been doing on the summon heroes, they're like very flawless as well. 
We heard a, a little bit of comments as well throughout this game. Quinn was making the call. He said, let's play in formation. Let's not play scared. But how do you ensure that not playing scared doesn't result in a bad initiation, Gunner? How do you make sure, or what was their formation to make sure every team fight was going to go in their way that they could have the advantage? Pretty much what he means is don't make the same mistake of the diving too far on the high ground or diving too far on that tri camp in the first game. Right. Where they just stay in a ball and they just move up slowly, slowly. They take the objective that's in front of them. They don't go for more and... Every fight seemed like Quinn would just delay the fight with his ult. He would just push back the pango roll or whatever initiation there was from Magnus. And once the fight kind of starts and they get to survive that initial time and Queen of Pain gets two Qs off, three Qs off, the fight just kind of was over. Gaming Gladiator is now a top two team. They're going to be the grand finals. I'm sure they're elated. So let's hear from them in a little bit. Well, he's actually not ready yet. They want to take some time. They want to compose themselves so we can hear maybe a little bit more from you, Sheep, about the game. I don't know, I just thought it was like so clean and nice. They never really got to their timings and then when they were able to like skewer back, it's like you're too tanky, you're too hard to kill, you have an ages. Like they're playing this so carefully and disciplined. Like the fact that they stomped early, but the game still kind of, you know, dragged a little bit. It's just because gaming are not giving them any opportunity to throw. It was a hidden counter pick to the uh, to the Pengo as well. I didn't know that you know this Queen of Pain is such a big problem to the Pengo during the fights because he couldn't really roll into the fight and like, create this chaos because he was constantly pushing back. And they did a really good job of like stopping Magnus from initiation because like it was their only chance of like getting these two or three man RPs to turn the game around, but they never had a chance to do that. All right, well, now I know for sure that they are ready. We're going to have a winner's interview. We're going to see how Ace feels about playing in the grand finals being a top two team. Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen, it's Ace from Gaming Gladiators! Ace, you are the rock of this team. You are hardly ever moved by anything, but now you're going to the grand finals of the international, a completely dominant year with only the smallest amount of stumbles, and now you are back. And I'd like to see crowd, if we can finally crack this egg. Can you guys give it up for Ace and get this guy to get a little excited? There it is, there it is. How does it feel to be going to the grand finals, baby? Yeah, it feels pretty good, but uh, we didn't win yet. So I'm not, I'm not all in the sky yet, you know, I'm still down on the ground. Still need to be focused. Oh, that's what your team needs. Fantastic. Uh, any words out there for your competitors, you know, that have come and gone? You guys have crushed everybody, breaking records, potentially one in a million in history, going from lowers to going to the grand finals and winning it. Any words for the teams that you have brutally eliminated along the way? Sorry, boys. Maybe next time. <laughs> And of course, thank you. Coming up to the Grand Finals, this is a match that you guys have done many times before. How are you going to beat Team Spirit? They are hard to crack, but we're just gonna play our game, do what we've been doing so far, and then adapt uh, along the way, and we'll see. We will see. We will see. A calm man. But I'm not gonna get you, let you get away with that. Are you going to win the Grand Finals? Coming up, my friend, I wanna get you hyping up this crowd just once, once in your entire career with me interviewing. Hype these people up. Are you going to win? Let's fucking go. Let's fucking go! Go get the rest, baby. Get in there and get right. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll see them soon. Back to you guys. Thank you so much, Slags. What a fantastic interview. We finally cracked him. We were able to do it. Asa gave us all his emotion in one go that a rile off the crowd to get them hyped for the fact they are going to be going to the grand final. It does mean, though, LGD, their run has fallen a little bit short. They're still third place, a top three team. It's an amazing performance, considering this org had a pretty big roster reshuffle for themselves. Three brand new t players, this was their first TI, and they went the distance, Rezo. Not the whole way, but they went a long way. <laughs> I think they did amazingly, uh, but uh, the only thing I would like uh, suggest them for the, for the future, like just like, you know, f think about their own play style, like, uh, you know, find their, their strategies and like, like not respond too much to the enemies. Yeah, because it always seemed like this entire series and kind of the entire lower bracket is gaming forces everyone to play their game. Mm. And LGD, it seemed like they fell to it. And looking forward, there's Spirit, which I think are one of the teams that are really good at doing their own thing. Whether they're winning early game, losing early game, they're going to play their game and they're going to win. So if there's one team that hopefully won't conform to how gaming plays, it'll be Spirit in the finals. 
How do you feel about LGD Sheep? What's one of your highlights that you had over the last three weeks with them? I just think, I mean, I'm just really happy that they managed to take it this far. I think like them and Azure Ray really showing up for China, you know, we, we, there was this massive gap at the beginning of the year where so many old players did retire and we had this new players filling in, like we have how, uh, now on LGD and then, you know, some players came back. but. They filled that gap really well, and they got the experience they needed to bring themselves to this TI and to perform. And, and so many of these players had their first lands this year, mm -hmm. and like to get third place now at TI, like that is phenomenal. Like they should be so proud of themselves, and I really hope they take that to next year and go even further. Do you feel like this is the uh, revitalization of the China region, Rezo? I think for sure they have like a lot of motivation right now since uh, two of their top teams like in the top three and four. So it's it's, it's a really big uh, boost for the region. I mean, of course it would have helped if they won the whole thing, right? But mm -hmm. it's still a very good result, and I'm sure like a lot of people get inspired by that, and we're gonna see a lot of more like Chinese competition coming to the next year and next season. Yeah, because they struggled, I think, the full season, but now it kind of yeah. goes to TI, and this is what matters, right? So them doing good at TI is definitely really good for the region. Yeah, they were within the region really dominant, and then it was like that ninth, 12th, a lot throughout. So I think it's a massive feat for themselves, a massive accomplishment, so they should be very happy. But uh, LGD falling short here, but Gaming Gladiators moving on. Do you want to talk about the Gaming Gladiators Team Spirit matchup before we get our exit interview? Yeah, sure. All right, we, we, like we're, we're, we're listening to you, so okay. you're the pro. Um, Again, I think it's kind of the same story, right? It's hopefully the, the drafting. You have to solve this early game issues where Game Gladiators wins their lanes. Quinn has won his lane, I would say, like probably 80% of the games at this TI, maybe 90%, to be nice to him. And they kind of just snowball off that every time. And it's also the, the supports rotating. I think the supports are probably the best support duo at controlling the early game, moving around, controlling runes, ganking mid. And just the way that they always set up their silence as well. It's, all, it's everything you just have to counter. And so, it, to some extent, what Rezo was saying was you don't want to purely counter the enemy draft, but I think there's some limit to kind of finding a balance where you're doing your own thing that doesn't get countered by what gaming is doing. Yeah, I'm definitely a bit worried about Laurel because uh, Quinn is like showing like every time, like every matchup, like it doesn't matter who he's playing like, against, like he's something the the guy, and like also with the support rotations, it's, like it's a really big problem. So Spirit needs to be ready for that and accounting for that. You don't have uh, faith in the growth that Lal has had over this year? He's been showing up more and more every event that we see him? I think Lal is like so stable that if you kind of, if you crush him the way you crush, like nothing to say in that last game, right? Like I think he'll struggle to find a game and it will be very hero dependent on the impact he's able to have. For example, in games that they're losing when he's on Conker, he's going to play a lot better than like when he's on his Viper, you know, just by way of the hero, by way of his play style. So I think it's going to come down a lot to the draft. I really hope he doesn't get his Conker game and want to win. I hope he does get it if you want them to win. Uh, but I, I do think he's good enough to like play, play this match easily, you know? They're in the grand finals for a reason, waiting. Yeah, I mean... It, they did go through upper bracket. Exactly, so. I was about to say, they're coming in the team. upper bracket. Like, they were able to stay up there. They knocked LGD down here to be uh, then eventually knocked out by Gaming Gladiators. What's a big takeaway from the LGD Team Spirit matchup that we had in the upper bracket yesterday that you're like, oh, maybe this is something that is a weakness we haven't seen in Team Spirit before? Well, the biggest thing that excites and worries me is that there was a 70-minute game, which we really haven't seen gaming play. So either Spirit will be able to force gaming to play this really long game, which I would say favors them, or you know, will gaming just destroy the average game time for Spirit, make it really low, and just kind of crush three games in a row? Hey, we kind of heard when Ace had his winners interview that they're going to keep playing their game. Maybe it's going to be that tempo. But right now, we do have to close out this series. We want to hear from one of the LGD players. We have our exit interview. It's Tsunami and Why You Smile. Thank you very much. Yes, I am standing by with Why You Smile, and Jin will be helping me translate. Uh, Smile, it's uh, kind of strange to think that you're now very much a veteran and for a squad like this with so many players that are kind of new to an experience like this, what was it like guiding them through such a high intensity tournament here at the International? Uh 
Um, it's more of a, it feels like a wake up call to myself as well because just watching these younger players, seeing their drive, seeing their motivation, it um, it kind of it's like a wake up call for me. It reminds me of what kind of men mentality I should be having as well. That's wonderful to hear. Then also in terms of maybe reigniting your competitive passion. Obviously here in this venue even, you must have some very fond memories. So was there any experiences that you had with the fans or just the being back in Seattle sensation that you're hoping to remember as you leave this event?然后包括这次来到场面上难过吧因为最后的决赛并没有杀进去然后就是并没有没办法继续听到他们为我们呐喊吧 um, I don't really feel uh, much of those emotions at this very moment because uh, we just lost our series I'm feeling pretty sad right now however it, it is very touching to see so many fans so many Chinese fans and international fans here at the arena cheering for us I think one of the biggest a sense of loss I feel right now is just not being able to get into the grand finals, not being able to hear them cheer for us once more. Well, why I'm sure there's no doubt in my mind that we will be cheering for you no matter what happens in the future. Shesha, appreciate it. And back to the panel. Such a beautiful interview, Tsunami. Thank you so much, and my smile as well. I, there were a lot of fans every time LGD was playing this crowd was louder than I felt it could go, and it just keeps pushing itself more and more. So why you smile, there's a lot of fans here, and I'm sure that they'll be cheering for you, maybe even later today if they see you around, you know? They'll be having a lot of fun. But for now, Gaming Gladiators have got a little bit over an hour rezo to reset themselves, look towards the grand final. You were in a very similar position not that long ago. What did you do with your hour? What, what do you think they're doing? I mean, to me, it has been really tough because the series that we played before was like three three games, and it was like really like up and go. Like you know, you you don't really know if you're gonna win or not. But mm -hmm. for for gaming this time around, like they're very confidently taking those two games, so they don't really, I think they don't really waste it and all their energy. So they don't really need to do anything other than just like you know prepare themselves for taking the spirit and like think about what kind of heroes they wanna draft for the next series. Yeah, you don't want to like phase yourself too much. You still have another game. You can feel good, but at some point you have to just reset. Just, all right, start of the new game, so let's play the new game. Well, look, they're going to have their time. We're going to have some time as well. And to help us fill in the time, there's going to be some more content. We have a very exciting video that we're going to get to watch right now. Please, this is not how heroes act. You both think it's in your nature to fight, but your first and only answer can't always be violence. Your sisters. Violence is never my first choice. Never my first choice. We know, it's why you lose. Lena. I'm just saying, sometimes you gotta burn shit down if you wanna win. Except you don't just burn people or things. She starts emotional fires. She knows her stupid real fires can't touch me. Are you kidding me? Emotional damage doesn't even work on you. It hurts my feelings. You don't have feelings seen warmer eyes on a shark. We should really, um... And nobody's buying your cute little smile, by the way. You look more like a hell bear. <laughs> oh, I remember how great it felt when mom and dad sent you to live in that desert. Remember, For something let's... I didn't do. Why would anyone believe you? Be fair, Riley. Let's listen. Lena, can we talk more about why you had to leave home? home because she burned home down nine times. That's a lie. Everything you say is a lie. The ninth one wasn't me. Mom and Dad said it was my last chance and I wasn't gonna blow it. You're afraid. I was innocent and no one believed me. It's funny. 
I was scared at first, but now it's my happiest memory. Watching you cry. You cold-hearted bitch. I am so sorry about her. <clears throat> She's been that way since, since you were born. Before you came around, I was- Enough! I see a lot of dysfunction walk through that door. Believe me, your co-workers are all a mess. But somehow, you two, you take the Aegis and the cheese. The good news, there's still hope. You just have to be honest with yourselves, with each other. Maybe move forward for a change. Maybe you're right. Lena, there is something I have never told you about house number nine. It was me. who started the fire. And when they asked me who did it, I lied. You got sent away because of me. And I, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Alina. Shut up. Really respect that. You wait, you what? That doesn't sound like you. Okay, maybe I don't respect it. But I'm proud. You solved a problem with fire and lies. That's my playbook. You learned that from me. I didn't think you were that smart. That's not the lesson here. You need to work on your problems. You can't just commit arson. That's insane. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's, it's not insane. Right? What, what is sane, anyway? You know what, Doc? I think we're just about out of time. So, that's what happened with our last counselor. But I doubt we'll have a problem with you. That's not a compliment. What are you writing down? Say something. Yeah. You don't want to make, make my, my sister, sister mad. <laughs> Leader and Crystal Maiden, definitely some uh, twisted sisterly love going on there. I would not want to be in that counselor's seat at all. Dude, I was laughing the entire time. It's like the ninth house. <laughs> I mean, the highly flammable war, I was like... I was going to say, that was my favorite when it rolled <laughs> past the newspaper. <laughs> TNT. But the highly flammable water, that's, that's dangerous. That's like some old, like, TF2 type stuff, man. That's the, the good humor that I love Valve for. Yeah, it's the regular thing to hold that thing in your house, right? Like, at yeah, any time. is that not what your house looks like? Yeah, yeah. Just to have everything lying around, <laughs> just fire, stacks no of TNT yeah. in your lounge room. You don't? Silly me, I put it elsewhere. We're in the USA. <laughs> True, that's the difference, being in Australia. You have to hide it, you have to stock it away. But look, speaking of being in the USA, we're enjoying TI-12 here in the arena. There's a lot of fans still sitting around, and there's a lot of fans elsewhere around the world. So we're not just watching TI-12 in the United States. There's fans everywhere, sheep. Oh my God, but none in England. We have no door players. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> TSM will take offense to that one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
yeah, no, it's great to see all the fans all around the world enjoying it. It's like all the time zones, right? It's like some of these people are just going to be up at like 5 a.m., 4 a.m. Just like, yes, we're here for the Dota. We care. We love it. And shout out to you guys. I was going to say, I know a lot of my friends back home in Australia, they're all sitting in Discord. They're watching it together. It's an ungodly hour. I think it's actually 4 a.m. for them. So there's probably not any uh, places for them to watch it out in town, but they're at home. I know they're enjoying it. And I'm sure a lot of SEA fans are doing the same as well from the company of their home yeah, and hopefully it's a long night for them i'm I'm, yeah. I'm hoping for a really long best of five some fun games so if it's a late night for you already i'm sorry about that but i'm hoping for more we're all hoping for that one isn't that so rosa i mean ti finals is always where you stay up till the very end and like you you cheer and you get the energy from like just watching purely it's, it's just an insane journey you know five games would be phenomenal there's still a lot of time before that grand finals do you guys know how else we're going to be filling in the time hmm Perhaps with the some film contest. Okay, that. Yeah, Maybe that's one of them. Cosplay. Yeah, a little bit of cosplay. Do you have a favorite hero that you would like to be seeing on the stage in cosplay? Okay, Meepo. someone said Primal Beast. Meepo. Why did I even <laughs> ask? Why did I even look at you? That was I don't know so silly. <laughs> Invoker. Invoker. Alchemist. Alchemist. That would be a pretty difficult one. I know one. something. I know something. You can't spoil anything. Rizzo. Yeah, I would want to see a witch doctor one. That's that's the cosplay I would like to see. Have you guys With seen like the monkey on the shoulder? Yeah, coconut? but an actual monkey. Oh. I don't want it like paper mache or anything like that. I want a real monkey. Hey, we'll see if it's gonna happen. We're gonna see a lot of costumes though. The cosplay contest is happening. We've got tsunami on the stage. That's right, friends. And there's a very special thing happening on the stage because if you notice, I am flanked by some cosplayers because we have a tradition around here. It's time for the International 2023 Cosplay Competition presented by Steel Series. Are you guys ready? Lovely, lovely. Well, I already have some judges joining me, so I would like to take this opportunity to introduce them. I am joined by Fairy Fingers as a Crystal Maiden. Fairy Fingers, wave to the crowd, wave to the crowd. And then, how long have you been cosplaying for? I've been cosplaying for 28 years. Oh, a wealth of experience, and it shows with this outfit, as well as joined by me. It's Anahi from Seattle Cosplay, where uh, I, I suppose, like, how about, uh, how about we just, like, um... I know, right? I totally agree. I can't wait for Grand Finals also, but I want to do this cosplay competition first. And lastly, it's Abby Cat Cosplay joining me as a nature's prophet. And this isn't your first time here, is it? No, I've been competing on this stage before. Ooh, and now you're ready to judge our contestants. Well, let's get started then. May I present Styro Girls as Alchemist? You may remember the name Styro Girls from a few years ago because in 2018 Vancouver, the Styro Girls were Ogre Magi and here they are treating us to an alchemist. That's our first contestant. Next up, we've got Makabaka as a Marcy. Now this Marcy took over 200 hours to complete and she specifically added all the bling to her costume to make it really pop on stage. And boy, does it look that way. Next up, we've got Sunray as Anti-Mage, or Way specifically. So this Anti-Mage is a really new skin. It's only one month old. And she does, or designed all the lights that are programmed in C++ using Arduino. Arduino, we got the tech over here. You know Anti-Mage doesn't use magic, but he does use technology. Next up, we've got Kronos Chick as Pugna. Now, this Pugna has these beautiful, vibrant colors, and all of that was done with airbrushing. And it pops on the stage for sure. Moving on, we've got Fuivo as a vengeful spirit. So this, the wings on this costume alone took 250 hours and it was all hand-dremeled feathers. 
The intricacies are amazing. Moving on, we've got Tyrant as a Void Spirit. His cosplay completed within a month. It is a really impressive first ever cosplay. Shout out to the anniversary set. It looks incredible as well as the poses. Next up, we've got Chiyu Neko as a Skywrath Mage. With almost four meter wingspan, the six inch heel with clear makes it look like she's floating in the air. Almost comes sometimes, uh, looks a bit like a chicken sometimes. You gotta get the cook, 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 cook. <laughs> Next up, we've got YMR as Drow Ranger. The Drow Ranger took seven months to complete using household items. Her arrows are actually chopsticks. That's right, even you at home can find things to cosplay with, but it takes a lot of hours to look at this intricate. After that, we've got Not In My House as a Phantom Assassin. This cosplay took 130 hours of work, 30 hour work is on the blade alone. And last, but certainly not least, we've got Dawn as Crystal Maiden. Her staff is 3D printed out of dual color filament that makes it look like different in various light lengths. All right, friends, those are our 10 finalists, but we've got a handful of awards to give out. So let's start it off with the best technique is Crystal Maiden, Dawn. <laughs> Next up, best transformation. Could we get some eyes on the Skywrath Mage, Chiyu Neko? <laughs> now we've got a thing called Judge's Choice. Abby Cat, what is Judge's Choice exactly? Judge's okay. Choice was the cosplay that we were very impressed with, that we really liked the finishing on, and that just had great stage presence. Well, we can go ahead and hand that to Fuevo on the Vengeful Spirit! <laughs> Seattle, could I get a little drum roll going as we get ready for Best in Show? The anticipation's killing me. It's almost like an unstable concoction because it's Alchemist, the Cyro Girls! What an amazing showcase this year, cosplayers. We loved all of the performances. But we've got more festivities to attend to. I appreciate all the help of judges and the pre-judging and joining me up here. But are you guys ready for some short films, maybe? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tsunami. Incredible cosplays that we got to see here today. The community is so creative, and that's why we love being Dota players. But as impressive as the cosplays are, one of the most creative moments that our community has are our short film contest every single year. And today, our top three are some of the best that we've ever seen. So, to start things off, may I please present to you the third place, who was a second place winner at TI10. Let's go on a journey and see our third place contestant finally get their prize as they travel across all the Valve universes in Game Breakers.
So many fantastic references in that one and a joy to watch. What an incredible journey. Thank you so much for your submission. But now it is time for our second place winner. The first place of TIA, this one is from Keller Max. You guys ever been in a game where they just keep fountain farming you and you can never get out? What do you say? Of course, you would say, finish, please. God damn, those are some big ass boys. Those mega creeps, absolutely fantastic. And for the coveted number one slot, a three time winner. In fact, the winner of last year's has come once again. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Four Fun, who will show you what it's like to have some chemical rage. That's how every single carry thinks that they feel in your games. That was uh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much to everyone that participated. So many of our community members submit short films and every year they get better. So please, if you didn't win this year, try again because we love watching them and they are such a absolute little joy. All right, anyway, there's one more video I think you guys might want to see. Something I forgot. Perhaps you might want to look at this. We've all heard stories of children running away to join the circus. Not in my experience. You can't drag them away. Besides, you'd be astonished the lengths people go to get a child back. People miss children. Ha, ha, ha. 
your average run-of-the-mill hero. They're easy to catch, easy to train. Plus, they're all egomaniacs, so they're natural performers. <laughs> Why not capture heroes? The Ringmaster coming to you soon! You guys ready for a new hero? Yeah. I'm left here thinking in honor of North America, of course they would add a hero for a circus. It only representative, it has to be representative of our entire region. My friend, you know the question that's in everyone's mind. What kind of hero is it? We got a support, we got an off lane, we got a mid, we got a carry. What's happening? Uh, it looked like it has some kind of catch. So I would say like a support, like a position four. Okay, okay, traps. Uh, the Dota community kind of has a troubled history with heroes that make traps. You, uh, you miss uh, old techies at all? No, that at all. I hate old tendencies. Yeah. I really hate old tendencies. How about. Bro, is it Puppet Master? What was that? Did I take over heroes? That was sick as hell. What do you feel? You're playing a literal game right now. This, is... <laughs> this guy's playing Dota Underlords. What the hell? What do you think about that hero reveal? What? The hero. You were playing Underlords. Did you even say it? Yeah, I'm dead. Dota Underlords! Okay, great. Thank <laughs> you. What do you guys think about the new hero? Look, yeah! yeah. Thank you. That looks hype as hell. Good lord, baby! The circus is canon! It's canon! Thank you, Tsunami. What is with you and the lore, Slacks? Were you gonna do another lorgasm for this hero? Ringmaster lorgasm? No self advertisement on the stream! Thank you very much for watching! <laughs> Very generous of you, all right, all right. We can revel in at that, but we got a grand finals to get to. We've got a little bit of time for it. What do you think of that lower bracket final, my friend? Uh, it's gonna be amazing, but I hope Quinn doesn't win. <laughs> all right. Boo this man. Listen. He's trying to improve his entire image right now, all right? We know we all had troubled past. Do you not believe in second chances? Uh, it's been a while and his persona has been the same, so I don't know if he's gonna recover from the mentality or not, but... What's on your mind, friend? Quinn will win! Yay! Yeah. Yeah. You think oh, being a TI so winner will change someone's personality yeah. for the better or for the worse? Better? I mean, you can talk to S4 after that. It doesn't get much better than that. Who are your uh, expectations as we look forward to this grand final? Just a good final. I don't care who wins, I just want good Dota. Who doesn't want some good Dota? But before we get to the grand finals, we have a little bit of another treat for you guys. Obviously, in the grand finals, you got some champions. Let me show you some champions on the floor. Thank you so much, Tsunami. The enjoyment, the content never stopped. And I have one of the most decorated panels I think I've ever seen in my eyes. We're just gonna enjoy the cheers for a while, Jerax. You're joining us, Owie, Fia, Dendi. You guys all have one massive thing in common. You guys have won a TI, two TIs in some cases, maybe different ways too. And uh, there's 10 players sitting out the back right now. They're about to come on stage. They're about to have their grand final and hopefully win uh, a TI, whichever team it is. I want to start all the way down the end with Dendi. You were at the beginning of this. You won your TI so many years ago. Did you expect? TI-12 to happen, to be in Seattle, to have a crowd like this and the history and the legacy that it would create? 
Oh, of course not. Like uh, it's hard to expect something like this. But yeah, back in my days, it was a long time ago, and uh, different stories were around. Overall, I love it. Like STI is great. Uh, yep. Competition is super high level. Watching those teams is amazing. Good feelings. Do you think you'd have nerves if you were going into this grand final, either as gaming gladiators or team spirit, with the crowd? No nerves at all. Come on. Look at this crowd. What kind of nerves can it be? No way. Everyone is cheerful, so yeah, it's easy peasy. For sure. Jarax, we'll, we'll move up here because two-time TI winner, Teen Spirit, going to the grand finals. They could be joining you in the ranks of a two-time TI winner. Does it, you're like, oh, I don't want to share that title with anyone. Or are you hoping that another team is able to do it too? I think there's some anxiety about it, but uh, in the end of the day, I feel like we're all cheering for the best Dota. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that happens here, then... That's doesn't, what happened. doesn't really matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Were you more nervous the second time round when heading into the grand finals? You're like, no one else has done this. No one's won two. Or was it more, we've been here before and we've done it. We can win a grand finals. Uh, I think the emotion that I had the most is, I think we kind of ran out of the game. So that was frustrating, I would okay. say. Because the first time we just went through the open qualifiers all the way. and I, I think as a player, you really cherish these moments when you really get to play on the highest competitive uh, environment. And uh, yeah, maybe frustrated. Oh, that's an interesting emotion to feel. But Aoi, you've been uh, in two grand finals as well. One as a coach, one as a player. Is it hard being a coach, seeing the grand finals? Like, what would Silent and CY be feeling out there seeing their five players about to walk on? I think as a coach at this point, you're mostly just proud of what your players have done, what they've come through. You've watched them work hard for so long. And I think mostly what you want is for them to be able to enjoy the moment. The best still just played when you're having fun. Yeah. And Fia, you shared your win with Aoi. Do you want to, any, any stories, any feelings that you had? Because you're a very stoic man. I, I think any, <laughs> I think any like uh, finals experience is gonna be different for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. But the, when I went into it, most I was thinking there's always gonna be nerves, of course. But what I always told myself going into it is just like, as long as I choke less than the other team or <laughs> less nervous than the other team, that's good enough. You know what I mean? Because every yeah. single time you're gonna be a little bit nervous. What was the main feeling then? Jarex, you were saying frustrated. Was that the second time around or the first time you were saying? Was uh, that was the second time, so yep. just the lack of games. I feel like when it goes really fast, then you don't really get to prove yourself as to the same level. I don't know. I think that's fair. That's a very valid thing okay, to thank be you. able to say. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, of course. I have no idea. That's, that's how I felt. So the first win meant just a little bit more even than Yeah, more? absolutely, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, what was your main feeling, Aoi? For, for TI-11? <laughs> Either one, you can tell me. I mean, I think TI-5 is definitely more nervous, like as a player than a coach. I think um, it's just so much happening. You feel the vibration of the crowd. You don't really know what's going on. I hadn't really experienced anything like that before. For TI-11, it's a lot more calm. We worked a lot on like controlling our emotions to make sure that we were in the best performance shape. I think it was honestly sort of similar to JRX. Like, we wanted to show off our Dota. And I mean, TI-11 may be similar to TI-9, not the best for that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't really speak for you, but uh, for my, that's my only experience, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what advice would you give to those 10 players out there right now? What is something that you wish you had have heard when you were in the tunnels, when you were building up to walk out, when you, know, you either had the, the lower bracket one hour wait, or when you were coming in from the upper bracket, if you want to start, Denny? Sure. Uh, simple advice. Play the best Dota of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the sort of advice the crowd would give as well. I mean, it's going to be similar for me. Like, you just don't get this opportunity very often. Who knows the next time you'll be in this position. This is, like, going to be your opportunity to potentially win a TI. In Spirit's case, win another TI against Laurels first. Cherish it and take advantage of this moment and do the best you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, same for me. I think just make sure that, like, the main thing you have here is making these memories. I think that's the most important thing. No matter what happens, win or lose, you want to be proud of what you've accomplished in Dota. Uh, personally, for me, I feel there's a, when the nerves really get to you, you start to really look outside. But I think if you really tune into yourself and give opportunities to those thoughts of like, okay, we have this crazy idea, we don't really feel like pulling it here in the TI Finals. But I, I think if you commit to that, I think that goes very well. Mm -hmm. How much internal pressure did you guys place on yourself? and? Who was trying to help you pull that out of you that you weren't getting too caught up in your head? Is that for me? Yeah, all of you guys. Uh, 
Johan was the very big part of our energy, mm -hmm. our flower. Uh, uh, I definitely felt that uh, I was very supported in the team. Uh, and if, if that wasn't the case, I, I don't think I would have enjoyed as much. Okay. I think honestly during 2 5 it was Fear. Like he was always a solid rock. You could, I feel like Fear actually has a Dota superpower. Like he makes all his teammates feel super comfortable and able to play at their best because he's so reliable. And at TI-11 it was supposed to be me, I think, but just, I don't know. <laughs> just, just a little bit of all of you. It was more chill, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I say that about Fear for, for panels as well. He definitely comes and knows for all of us. Well, I guess for me then, I kind of felt like on EG there, it was an unspoken rule that everyone kind of just had to play their part, you know, and just be confident in what we're doing and just believe. And I didn't really feel like anyone looked up to anyone, <laughs> personally speaking. And I thought we just like, we're just going at it together, and we all knew what we needed to do and just had to get it done. Uh, I had an amazing team, and uh, I was very unconfident coming to the TI, actually, but they all cheered me up through the entire tournament. And coming to the Grand Finals, I had the feeling we cannot lose. That's the feeling I got. It's very weird. I well, don't know yeah, if I would beer. ever repeat yeah. uh, Wait, Okay, well, when, when was the shift for each of you then that you felt you cannot lose this? At what point in the tournament, if you were coming in nervous, what point was that changing? I mean, moment? for me, it's if Curtis ever got techies or Naga. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew we couldn't lose, you know. It was a guaranteed win. So yours was in the draft. All right, I see, I see. I mean, we, we were so confident that uh, we even pick, like, in one of the games, we picked Pudge just because we wanted to have some fun, you know, like, <laughs> to play it. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was kind of crazy back in the days. Yeah. yeah, honestly, I think as soon as, like, Boba found out they don't play Lashrak, that too, yeah. Yeah, and Sumail was like, okay, free win. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was good. Uh, I didn't really think if we going to win or lose. I really just played. I don't know. I, I just had a lot of fun myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really get to think that if we're going to win or lose. Mm -hmm. I didn't, yeah. Do you guys want to show off your rings, by the way? I don't know if everyone in the audience has seen these before, but you, I mean, you got two, Jarak. So we'll start with you. We'll, we'll show off both of yours. Do you wear it often? What was the feeling when you picked it up as well? Because there's going to be five players and a coach getting to pick up theirs in, uh, you know, after this one. I think they're getting dusty most of the time. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, I guess I don't really have a place to show them mm -hmm. except this. Yeah. You come to TI and you're like, oh, hey, guys, check out the rings, by the way. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't really like live off right now. I wish I could do that, but I, I don't really, I don't seem to do that very well. All right. Didn't you guys uh, want to quickly answer? Because I know there's some more questions circulating around the arena. Uh, no, I don't leave home without it. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I've seen you all the time, Fia. He's polishing it in the back room, in the green room. He's just making sure that that is shiny as. We've got Slacks in the crowd. We wanted to ask some more questions out there. There's going to be some fan questions. Hey, Slacks, give, Hello, give us the first friends. one. Yes, yes, I've spent a lot of time finding someone with a real question that was not trolling. Thank you. One person in this entire area, but we did get a Wojnin. Sahil. Sahil. All right, fantastic. What would you like to ask these folks? for all our Archon, Heralds, and Crusaders out here. Uh, what does it take to be a TI champion? What does it take, TI champions, to be a TI champion besides just being one of these Archon, Herald, Crusader scrubs? No offense to 90% of the audience. Do you want to go first, Jarex? Because you've had to do it twice in two very different ways. A lot of emotional damage in your public matchmaking. <laughs> But that's the solid advice to be a TI champion. All right, all right. I don't think you can make the step from being Archon Herald to TI champion. That can be your dream, your aspirations, but mm -hmm. I think the only advice I can give is just play a lot of Dota. <laughs> just keep playing, and eventually you'll play with better players, and then you'll play with pros, and then from there you'll get on teams, and then it's a slow process, but it'll happen. Yeah. How were you saying the other day that it's, uh, it's a lot of luck, a lot of things kind of falling into place for you? Yeah, I think it's a lot of luck, honestly, but I think it's, you have to like put yourself in the position to get lucky. Think if, as Fear said, like if you just keep grinding at it, like that's gonna open the opportunities for you. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna add anything else, Danny? Oh yeah, I completely agree with, uh, to that. You need to love the game and uh, try to not get frustrated in your pub games, which is uh, not a simple. <laughs> Wish somebody to told me that before. <laughs> yeah, then maybe not so much uh, emotional damage would have occurred before Jarex, yeah. Tsunami is also out there. He has another fan with another question. That's right. Uh, my friend, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Seth. And uh, you got a question from one of our panelists. Of course, for fear. So my friends got inspired to play Dota 2 because the North American representation. So how does it feel, fear, to be the 
North American representative of Dota 2. Free to play, I mean, you were the main guy for us. How does that feel? I just feel honored to give them the opportunity to like be represented in free to play. Like they could have chose a lot of different people. They chose me. I just love Dota overall. And mm -hmm. I'm just very fortunate. I feel blessed that I was just given this opportunity. And I just will run with it for as long as I can because I just love Dota. So I'm just happy to be here. Serena giving you a big round of applause there. That's also made me think about another question is at the end of uh, the grand finals, I'm sure you guys had a lot of elation, a lot of joy, maybe even relief, but when did it really set in? Where were you like, oh, I wish I had spent more time in the moment? Was it a couple months after or it still really hasn't? Every time you come back to TI, you're, you're taking it back to what has happened in your, your past and your history. Uh, I think uh, thinking years back, I feel like now it's maybe coming more than before. Uh, personally, after the, especially the first TI, I think it took me like two weeks to even understand what happened mm -hmm. uh, because I was so much in the moment and I guess that kind of carried over that you're just not really thinking what had happened. No. Yeah, honestly, I think the same, like when you're there, like there's just lights everywhere, there's fireworks, you just like... The confetti coming yeah, down. Yeah, you don't know what's happening. You're like, oh, I guess we lifted this now. But I think as soon as you have some time and you think about like, these are the memories you'll never forget. Like you always remember these moments. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, it took a very long time for me as well. Like, there's a lot of people cheering for you. You, get, you win, there's confetti you talk about. You get back home and I'm like, all I've been doing is playing Dota for the years and years. So what did I do when I got back home? I just queued it up and just <laughs> played more Dota. So it just felt like it was, nothing happened. I was just back on it and later emotional on... emotional damage. Once you start playing less Dota, you're not playing as competitive anymore, then you really look back and how special these moments really are. Um, I hit every year for like a week, I think. And I was looking in the sky and like, oh my God, so good. <laughs> Like, uh, that's happened a lot of times through that week and uh, trying to uh, work through the information in my head. We actually won TI. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, after a week, I get back to normal and just keep green. Going. <laughs> Such a surreal feeling that sometimes it's like uh, it never really will set in. But we're going to keep asking some more questions. We've got Slacks out there. Another fan, another question. Let's hear what it is. Thank you, thank you. Now, I did have a question, by the way. I, I managed to catch up with a guy who has an ORT sign earlier, and I said, what the hell is that? And he said, quote, I don't know. I just think it's funny. So thanks a lot. All day, this guy is about ORT, 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 ORT. He's a goddamn madman. Anyway, uh, a real question. What is your name? Dylan. Dylan. Dylan, what do you have for these legends of Dota 2? Legends of Dota 2, what advice would you give to the teams that have been vanquished from TI? Do you disband? Do you <laughs> reform? How do you, how do you move forward as an org? Yeah, good luck with this one, Howie. <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it's a, it's a tough question even when you do win TI, what you do with uh, the roster after that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think, honestly, if you attend a TI, you watch the finals, you watch them win, and it doesn't motivate you, then maybe you take a break. But for, I think for like 99% of Dota players, they watch that, and like, this is the fire that burns. This is what keeps you going through the emotional damage and trauma. So, yeah, I just keep going. It's tough being a spectator at an event that you were a part of, you wanted to win, you had that drive, motivation, and passion, but you just couldn't get there in the end. Then you're not in your head. Yeah, it's very tough sometimes, but it's good to live in the moment and enjoy because uh, this is also a great experience to watch it from crowd and have a lot of fun, for sure. Yeah. Do you want to add Fiat Jarex? Advice for teams that have gotten knocked out? Yeah, you're pretty normally brutally honest. Sure, I mean, for a lot of the teams that have got knocked out, they're, they're still young. Like, I didn't even win until I was 27, so just keep at it, keep grinding. Like, it's good to feel sad, in my opinion. It's good to feel, that's motivation, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as you don't give up and you still have the passion, as long as you think you can still win and just don't give up entirely, that's good enough. Did you know you're not the oldest uh, TI play winner anymore? I know Snaking is by yeah. a few months. By a few months. <laughs> Were you yeah. devastated when you heard the news? Oh, I, I mean, he's taken everything from me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I had left. <laughs> that was it. That's the only thing that was keeping you going was being the oldest TI winner. Uh, look, I'm going to move on uh, to another question. I do know Tsunami has one out there, so let's quickly hear what it is. That's right, my friend. Uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Abhishek. 
and um, I've been playing uh, Dota for around uh, five years. Yeah. And you have uh, some specific fond memories from Jerex specifically. Uh, what were you hoping to ask him? I've been like astonished with the tiny lands in the TI. It's so good. And I just wanted to know, like, what's your reaction when Samuel uh, did the tiny lands to the RTG in the base? Wait, and, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Yeah. Tsunami, can you please repeat it? Whenever, uh, you know, obviously you're very famous for some tiny airlines plays, Jerax, you're tiny in general. Uh, does it ever warm your heart a little to see that play be pulled off on a high-stakes stage, such as previous TIs, when maybe Sumail did it to RTZ or something? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> make a trend, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to start getting all the clips and then just put hashtag Jerax Tiny Airlines next to it instead. Uh, I'm happy to see it anytime. So. <laughs> I love it. Look, we're nearing the grand finals now, okay? We're only a couple minutes away, so I want to go back to the teams that we want to focus on. Team Spirit, Gaming Gladiators here. Fear and Jerex, this is mainly for you two because they're such similar things. And, and actually you as well, Aoi, because that TI5 win for you both. It was, you were in the upper bracket, you came to that lower bracket, and one day you had to go lower bracket into grand finals, and you won it. So your advice for Gaming Gladiators right now, what would it be? How do you contain these emotions? And how do you persevere through a potential best of five? Uh, I guess I'll start, I suppose. Yeah. For, so we got knocked down by C-Deck and went into the lower bracket. We won that match too, I believe. And then we went in. I think we just, sure, we lost to the team beforehand, but we knew we were better. We just had to make a couple adjustments. And if we just made those adjustments, we knew we had to take to win. So it was just confidence, really, and good preparation. Do you have anything else that you want to add on to, into that one, Aoi? No, not really. I think that sounds right. Like, you just go in. I think Gladiators, they had a long run this TI. You know, they got... They start a lower back after losing to the Talon. They've come all this way. I think it's time, like, you put all this work in, you got all this experience in the tournament, they've grown a lot. If they feel confident, they can just execute that. They should feel really good about the series. So there weren't actually that many nerves for you both when you were about to walk out after even having played a series earlier. Do you think the earlier series actually helped you and could help gaming gladiators? I thought it was good to play, honestly. Like, you're all yeah. warmed up. You have the momentum going. I feel like as long as it's not like some, I don't know, like two 80-minute games that you just played, it's going to be really good for you. That's yeah. true, where it's more as the, the 40 minutes that we just previously saw, it's a bit better. Yeah, I'd like it. this is where I say like every finals is going to be different for everyone because we had a unique situation where we scrim C deck a lot. We always beat them. We lost them that one time, and then we had the right strategy. We had this one idea that we went into, and it worked, and from there it just felt easy. Okay. And my one for you, Jarex, is around... Team Spirit, winning it a second time. I, I already asked you how you felt. There was that little bit of frustration when you went through the upper bracket. So do you think their drive right now is going to be higher than it was in any other day to be able to win Dota right now? I, I would imagine it's actually harder to have drive night now. Uh, and I think it's because the first time it just feels so much more. And I, I think if they can really tune into what they felt back then and try to like channel that same kind of environment as a team, I think that's what you're looking for here. Just put it out of your mind. Just think this is a redo of TI-10 if you're Team Spirit? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, just repeat. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Easy. Then the, for you as well, uh, I like that you're very aware of everything else that's going around you, of this environment, of the arena, of the crowd. I know that you love it. I know that they love you. So for Gaming Gladiators and Team Spirit, again, I ask you, what would you want to hear if you were back there, if you were going to be in front of this massive arena and this crowd, knowing everyone was watching? Uh, I think sticking to your uh, game plan, sticking to your confidence, uh, to your comfort, like just give it all in your games. So I don't think I need to hear much. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure the guys know their stuff too, what we're going to do. We are pretty focused on what is coming up to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, it's building up. Uh, I want to show the rings again for you guys. I want to thank you guys for coming on. It was so invaluable to have you all talking about I like it. It is a bit cringe, but it happens. We've got our grand finals. We're building it up. Our teams, Gaming Gladiators and Team Spirit, let's enjoy the grand finals. <laughs> Look at all that fresh meat! <laughs> Sorry, I got carried away. Okay. Who 
who's that handsome devil? Trick question, it's me, I'm that handsome devil. But I wanna remind you of one thing. There are many Earths, but only one Earth Shaker. Okay, I gotta stop screwing around, get to work, okay. Welcome, Dota fans, from around the house, around the town, around the block, and around the world, to the International Grand Finals! <laughs> this is the ultimate proving ground, and together we bear witness as the Aegis of Champions hangs in the balance. Please welcome to the stage our worthy contenders battling all the way through the lower bracket, Gaming Gladiator! Welcome, Duracho! Continuing their march through the upper bracket. Team Spirit! remain standing. Only one can claim immortality. Who will emerge victorious? The final battle begins! The final proving ground where 16 teams once stood. All 
but two have fallen. Both have outlasted the finest adversaries the world could offer. Buybacks now from Liquid Side. Mega Creeps in their favor, and now it's a five versus three. Here it is! Toronto, Tokyo ends the game! And with that, bet boom! Oh, Azure Ray takes them down bit by bit, building by building. Both have fans still eager for one more reason to cheer. One will join a pantheon of greatness. The other can hope for better luck next year. The final showdown for the Aegis is upon us. Two teams remain standing. Only one. Immortality! Who will emerge victorious? The battle begins. International 2023 just moments away from happening here in the Climate Pledge Arena and I am so ready for this best of five to read it together with my panel. I'm joined by Lacoste, by Tigov, by Effie and I gotta say it Effie, he did it again, TI-10 he did it, we see it right now as well, Yatoro has sacrificed his hair for the Dota Gods. Dude, the second I saw him walk out, I got chills. He shaved his head, he sacrificed his hair. That is how he won TI-10. He started the trend of going bald for TI, and he he came to win today. I would be worried if I were gaming gladiators. Yes. Others have tried to copy him. Others have tried to go bald to win a TI. They failed, but this morning when I was leaving the hotel, I saw him and I just looked, I was like, bald? And he just gave me that cheeky little look and I was like, oh, this is a guy who wants to win this TI. Oh. And they have done it before. Slight change, of course, with now Lara on the middle lane, but they're looking so good. Their opponents look fantastic as well, though. The whole year, Lacoste Gaming Gladiators, they've had a fantastic one. Absolutely. This is the team that uh, got the top 12 in the previous year. Something was missing. Two missing pieces were Quinn and CY, their coach. We think, I think we've got to give them huge credit for what they managed to do with the team because they managed to win three majors, all upper bracket runs, and suddenly they're in the lower bracket. And we had an interview yesterday with Celery, who talked about the importance of the series, the series, the seeding match against Talon, how much they learned from it. And ever since that, they're just speeding things up. This is the team that can beat you in 19 minutes. We saw a flawless performance yesterday against Azure Ray. They were playing turbo mode, pretty much. Yeah, they really, really were. And we must not forget, a grand finals like these is not a crowning of a tournament, not even of the year. It is a crown of a career. And we have seen most of these faces lift the ages already, team for Lau will be the first time, but they have tried so many times. They have, and for Lau at least, last year he played on Betboom, he came last place, and now this time around he's in the Grand Finals, of course, surrounded by four TI winners as well. If they are to lift this Aegis, first time for Lau, second attempt, two-time winners potentially for the other four players. It is an incredibly storyline. And of course, for Poshko, he's attempted this eight times already. Sure, he's lifted the Aegis once, but Ace as well. He's attempted eight times, but yet to lift the Aegis. Can he do it himself this time? And Quinn, let's not forget to talk about Quinn. Seven attempts, five TI attempts. Everyone thought that Quinn, you know, was just hanging around the NA Dota scene, wasn't gonna make it very far, but he joined Gaming Gladiators. Something clicked and he proved to the world the kind of caliber of player he is. He is world-class, he has been destroying 
everyone in his way, and he's here for the Aegis lift. He is here for it. We'll see which team will come out victorious. Of course, on one side, we have a chance of four fresh two-time champions on the side of Team Spirit. But Gaming Gladiators, they could be having two crowning achievements in their finals if they were to lift the Aegis. First one coming all the way, starting off in the lower bracket tee. Yeah, I think, so TI9 Liquid, they got all the way to the finals, but weren't able to win it. But if Gaming Gladiators are to win this TI, it'll be the first time a team starts in the lower bracket and lifts the Aegis. That's six lower bracket games that they have to win back time and time again and not drop a single one. And they could do it. That, that's, that's an incredible. And then also the fact they won three majors, like, that's so many things going their way. Whew. Yeah, I think, Lacoste, we've heard a lot about the majors, and they all went through the upper bracket. And people are like, well, I don't know how they fare in the lower bracket. You know, everything's different over there. There's so much more pressure. But this team, they thrive under it. Absolutely. This is the team that uh, powered up the most, I would say, throughout the whole tournament, because this team is uh, not really familiar with the lower bracket, especially when it comes down to the DPC and the tournament. So. Really glad that they're showing what they're really made of. They're going to their own, like how they started to dominate the year with these like uh, strength heroes, uh, these aura buyers, grouping up, grouping up S5 and just uh, complete domination from start to finish. I think uh, coming into this because they just played two games, I think they have advantage. And let's not forget, Game and Gladiators, because of their dominance this year, they are the team that shaped the meta. They are the team that got the meta nerfed and changed to the way that it is today. So when the initial patch happened, they were the team that was hit the hardest by it, and it took them so long to adjust. Everyone thought that, okay, it's the TI curse. If you're dominant the entire year, there's no way you win. There's no way you get this far. But they said, what meta? We are the meta. And they proved to everybody that they're not just a patch team. Yes. Strong. They're a strong team and they're here to compete. And they have played the most games out of everybody here going through the lower bracket. So it's not like they're saving strats. Everybody knows what's coming. The question is, how are you going to answer that if you're Team Spirit? I hope they have something, something very special cooked up for this. And this series, there's a little bit of a change compared to all the series we saw before. It's a best of five. And normally you've got one team coming in thinking, oh, maybe they don't have a lot of experience with best of fives and actually taking them in the end. But both of these teams, T, have shown that the adaptation that is needed in a series like this, they got it. Yeah, and not only do they have the adaptation, but the, but the kind of play styles mirror it as well. Like, Spirit, they're a team that have been behind quite a lot to come back into their games. And then for Game of Gladiators, you mentioned that they played the most games, 24 games. Their average win time is 36 minutes. That's 10 minutes quicker than Team Spirit. So it really feels like this whole series will be, can Spirit survive the onslaught of gaming? Can they find those moments of collapse brilliance to get back into their games and then close it out? Like, this is just... Two so different teams, uh, it's yeah. like a beautiful finals. Two different styles because Gaming Gladiators, they've been so dominating and everybody was focused on them starting from the, like the laning stage, one of the best, you know, everybody was also talking about the Bed Boom as a strong laning stage team. But Team Spirit, when it comes down to late game, decision making, the way they're making their plays, they're just top notch. I, I think when it comes down to super late game, Team Spirit is the best team in the world. But they gotta get there first though. A lot of that, teams yeah, have failed true. to do so <laughs> against Gaming Gladiators. I think that one thing that I've noticed over the last few days is that there has been a lot of talk about the offlaners, Effie. I feel like we're seeing them be put in the role to be the star player for their squad. Yeah, I mean, when you look at uh, Gaming Gladiator's offlaner, Ace, he is the rock of this team. He is their stable player. He is the one that they can depend on, the one that they build around. He's the player that enables Doraccio to play in the hyper-aggressive, sometimes very risky, sometimes very dangerous way that he plays, but he makes it work because their offlane, the offlane of Tofu plus Ace is so strong. They're dominant. He picks heroes that rallies his team into the game, and he never disappoints. I've hardly ever seen Ace have a bad game, whereas Collapse, he he also fits that role in a similar way where he is the playmaker of this team and him and Mira have been playing together for as long as Tofu and Ace have. Yeah. But the special thing to me about Collapse is regardless of what situation you put him in, even if he has a bad net worth lead, even if his lane goes poorly, he finds the initiation. I mean, I think Collapse is the best initiator Dota 2 has ever seen. 
Yeah, Collapse has been showing fantastic work. He, he brought the Magnus out again. I think that's, it must be, it's, it's, it, at this point, T, it's a mental story for the Magnus to be played by Collapse. Yeah, I mean, we're probably going to see Collapse at least once in this finals. I want to see at least one Axe in this finals. Um, on here. Mars. Ma <laughs> the un is it unpicked still? Yeah, it's pretty. It's unpicked, but it has been banned a couple times. If we get to see that as well. But like, there's so many specialties, and I think that Effie mentioned is beautiful. It's like Collapse is the initiator. He's the one that is the one that always needs to start the fight. But Ace, he plays quite different in his offlane style, where he wants people to group around him. So he's not starting the fight through literally initiating, it's just more like, I'm going to be in the position where I'll force the fight. And that kind of differences could be something that they try to exploit between the two offlaners in this series. Yeah, and in this series, we're going to see gaming gladiators go up against Team Spirit. And that means that throughout this entire series, we want to we wanna learn more and more about all 10 players and their coaches on stage. And we're going to start right now by learning a little bit more about Team Spirit. I think Team Spirit probably has the best understanding of how to win a game from any point. They prove again and again that they can, they can be behind for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then they can just like really sit and wait and be patient, and all of a sudden they hit their timing or they see an angle to, to kind of to kind of turn the game around, and they do it. What I admire the most about Team Spirit is their team fight execution. Like, when it comes to little skirmishes, late game fights, playing around ops and vision, they really excel at that. And for some reason, when there are uh, high stakes, they really know how to perform. Now, Kiratech shows up, finds Mira immediately onto him. Yadaro dies, but the cat is close up the damage. It's almost enough, and it is! Uh, and I think against them, you can't really afford to be sloppy. Uh, because anytime you make a mistake against them, I think they, they punish you severely. Uh, and I also think individually they're, they're amazing. I think Yator is, you know, he's up there with, with the best of them. Uh, he's, he's so consistent and, yeah, always, always delivers. And I think their supporting cast, uh, the four rest of them, combine really well to, to make space for him and enable him. And yeah, they're just a very well gelled uh, kind of team. It's big brain time, everybody. Welcome to the draft panel for the grand finals. You heard AUI, you heard Dendi, you heard Fear earlier talk about, you know, previous experience with TI finals. Now it's time to get into the nitty gritty of this one. You guys, you've been there before, you know what the stakes are, you know what to do, so let's get going. Um, these two teams have had very different styles, as was pointed out by the panel going into this, uh, this grand finals. What are you guys looking for? Who's gonna throw the first curveball? That's a good question. I think the one thing that you do really have to look out for is going to be the Magnus, right? It's Collapse Magnus. He only just showed it yesterday, his first time playing it. And this is what they won TI-10 off. This is something you've got to be afraid of. Do you have the confidence if you're gaming gliders to leave it in the pool? That's what I'm mainly looking for in this series. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at how both styles going to collide and, uh, you know, meet each other in terms of, like, uh, gaming gladiators where we apply a lot of pressure uh, on all stages of game, especially starting from early. We have very strong lanes, very tempo drafts, and uh, as Panel said, like uh, Team Spirit, we have longer games when we win. So I'm curious if we come up with some ideas, some plan how to stop it, uh, how we're going to deal with uh, Man collapse apparently yeah, on lanes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Team Spirit, they have a lot of info on gaming gliders. They watch so many of the games, they have a lot of data there. I think, honestly, going into the best of five, you have a lot of games, you have some room for not experimentation, but to test your limits. I think they should sort of try to pick a gaming glider strategy that they want to play against, whereas the Ent, Chen, Pangolier, Necro, they should try to break that early in the best of five. I think that's what gives them the best shot of, like, sort of getting a draft advantage in the series. It sounds like a lot of the heroes you're talking about overlap with are healing-based. Ancient Apparition still in the pool. Is that a potential overall first pick for Team Spirit? Do you think that's a, an angle to try to, to target what gaming gliders have been running? I would really like the A. I think Maposhka was actually the first player to start playing A. I think he was playing a bit before Riyadh in pubs, and they even ran a couple of officials. They actually go with the Weaver, which... Oh, wow. 
I mean, it's a bit flexible, but honestly, I'm a bit surprised. I thought this Weaver, it's a bit weaker into sort of gaming Gladiator's ball, but what it can do is it can break down the laning stage a lot. If you get ahead of these ball lineups in the lanes, oftentimes they can't group up in the way that they want to. Yeah, the way I look at this Weaver a little bit is Team Spirits, they're playing against gaming Gladiators, right? And what I've noticed a lot from gaming Gladiators right now is you want Dorachu on the CK or Weaver, so they ban the CK, they ban they take the Weaver away, and Dorachu is... He's really good, but he's really good at playing these aggressive style carries. That's mainly because we see Ace playing a little bit greedy too, right? So Dracho can play a little bit faster. So I think this is very targeted to just take it away from Gaming Gladiators. Yeah, both teams have uh, very similar uh, three cores idea, which have all three cores getting big. But uh, compared, for example, to Gaming Gladiators, Dracho is doing the more space creating stuff. And in Team Spirit, it's Solaro. So it's a little bit different for both teams. So it's very interesting that Team Spirit stealing this Weaver away, like from Gladiators. And Yatoro played an amazing Weaver like a few days ago. Like it was very, very strong. I think we might be seeing Yatoro on the Weaver. Cubano here is like Bloodseeker. I think the support Weaver, like, I mean, you care about Rupture, but then you're just rupturing a support. I think you would only ban this type of hero if you want to play the Weaver on core. Tuff was also getting like his 89th Morta game of the tournament. <laughs> so I think that's like gaming gladiators. They should actually feel really comfortable right now with this opening. I guess another thing about the Bloodseeker ban is that it kind of feeds into gaming gladiators general approach to the game in terms of pace, right? This is a very aggressive carry that wants to fight and bring that pressure early. Uh, it doesn't mind diving towers, which I would would say game gliders have done more than any team this tournament so it's very clear here that the teams are targeting different players you pointed out you're banning carries when you're spirit here and you're stealing one away whereas as as denny was talking about laurel is playing more of the aggressive style for for team spirit do you think gaming gladiators would be wise to try to match that idea so to speak by targeting laurel as much as spirit are targeting um Duracho here I think uh, the best idea would be to pick an extremely strong laner for Queen, which usually Gaming Gladiators do in every game, and it's working perfectly because Queen is one of the best laners out there for sure, without doubt. So I think this, this is a part of the uh, plan that should be to lock down a little bit on Laurel so he doesn't have a good game. Yeah. I think if they go with that plan, they can probably look for the Enchantress here. I'm honestly surprised that they're giving it to Gladiators on the second phase. I think both Ench and Chen are two heroes that, if you have the winning mid, you can snowball the matchup really hard. Yeah, it's one of the best heroes to rotate for five minutes each and create an insane amount of pressure. And we saw how gaming Gladiators took taking towers from their enemies. Like, if you look almost every game, like, you know, 10, 12, there is no tier 1 towers on all three lanes. So it's crazy. Yeah, I think just going into the series in general, Gaming Gladiators, they like Tofu playing this Morta because it gives Ace a good game. They can get the Enchantress you mentioned, that way they can snowball the game. And it's very clear how Gaming wants to play. They're going to want to play fast. If you be greedy, they want to punish it right away. And teams, oh. they seem a bit more flexible on what they want to do in their draft, and they kind of want to just take strategies away, and they're versatile enough to do it. This is a, quite the curveball, right? Is, Picking yeah. Pango in this slot is very early on in the draft. Uh, as much as I'm sure all the meme enjoyers out there are happy to see Quinn play the Pango for the nth time this tournament. Um, you're effectively offering Team Spirit the possibility of truly counterpicking mid here. We've seen uh, Laurel on a hero such as Dazzle destroy mid melee heroes. Is that a good matchup against Pango or is he one of the heroes that can kind of float that lane? Uh, it's pretty good. Dazzle is destroying almost every melee hero on lane, but I don't think that Team Spirit want to go for that path because that will uh, switch them from the more of a comfort strategy. Even though I'm pretty sure they can uh, make it, but uh, yeah, like we're putting Waro in a situation where uh, I think we will need to decide with more limited like uh, hero pool against this Pango because you want to punish this hero, but at the same time, uh, what kind of heroes left here to punish it? from the Laro uh, comfort zone. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit different because like, if I'm Weaver in this situation, I don't find Pango to be an issue for me, right? Like you can get yeah, away Weaver should be good for Pango for sure. Yeah, yeah, and then now you get the tree to lock down the Pango in these earlier fights. And also you get a counter pick in the laning stage. So it's already not a good Pango game by any means, but they're just showing that Quinn is just super confident on this hero. And that's about it for me on this pick. 
Okay, here I can talk a lot or right. I can just be quiet. I, I played around uh, 80 games last month of Puck and I enjoy this hero a lot and I really like uh, how Laurel play it. Even though uh, he has a bit different uh, interesting ideas on it. Like it's uh, he's switching to physical carry later and it's actually a pretty good answer to Pangu because for Puck you cannot win your lane but if you do 50-50 you're very happy and Pangu one of those heroes that you can do actually 50-50 nowadays. So I believe it's a great answer uh, in addition to uh, against Pango. Against Muerte is tricky, but yeah. Honestly, I'm a bit worried for the lane. I feel like Quid has played this matchup like every single pub since he picks Pango every single game. <laughs> but I think Puck, he has like zero armor, right? Once you get level three on Pango, you start spamming him. I think it's a very, very skill dependent matchup. And Team Spirit Strat, what I'm looking for at from them is I think they watched the Liquid series that Gladiators played. And that's the series where Gladiators look the most vulnerable. And Liquid's strategy coming into that was picking as strong a safe lane as you can. So that's why they picked the Treant. This Weaver might be carry. I'm not too sure the matchup against Lone Druid at all, but I assume it's fine for Weaver. Lone Druid's sort of a scary laner. But I'm not too sure if like Puck fits into that that well, because if you're shutting down the safe lane, generally, like, P I don't know, like, I'm not the biggest fan of the Puck hero. I think he sort of lacks some damage, and I feel like he's a hero that can actually get run over on mid. Uh, absolutely, what can happen? This hero cannot, uh, is not very effective into helping side lanes, so you really need to make sure your side lanes are extremely strong, because he's just, you know, getting bigger himself. And actually, Puck is uh, getting strong now more late game, so... Um, I also agree with uh, it's kind of like uh, might be a problem to stop gaming gladiators like pressure and we have a puck because it's not the hero that's stopping pressure for sure. So for a lot of teams, I feel like this lone Druid could be considered a flex here between carry and offlane. I don't think we've seen Duraccio play lone Druid this tournament at all, right? No, not, not that, right in saying that. So does that mean what angle could Team Spirit take here? Are you trying to now specifically counter an offlane lone Druid because you could put the Weaver on support like AUI was pointing out? Or are you kind of committed at this point to putting a carry? Because in reality, is there a safe lane hero that can truly challenge Lone Druid in the lane together with Treant? Is that possible? I think Weaver's fine, and I think okay. you can pick the strongest offlaner here, most likely, because they're going to target it next. So, like, the Weaver tree matchup versus Lone Druid, it should be perfectly fine, because one rotation, or if you manage to get on top of the Lone Druid's real hero and you Sakuchi in with bugs, he could die pretty easily. But Lone Druid, no one's going to, like, just straight out CS this hero. That's why he's so strong in the laning stage. But there's definitely a threat to kill him. And Weaver doesn't have problems like CSing because you have the Gymnate attack. You also have like the Sakuchi. You're going to get CSing just fine against the Lone Druid. At least go even with kill threat. So I think it should be good enough. Where did this hero go? He was it's been pretty much top tier a couple of weeks ago. And we've, we've barely seen him on the main stage at all. So what makes this a good uh, Beastmaster game? And the hero got some pretty significant nerfs. I think the Hawk, especially level one, is it used to be completely OP and now it's sort of pathetic early. Um, I think it's a really good pick here, though. I think generally when the... Like, if you just look at Gliders lives in general, but also this one, a lot of times you can run out of damage. We've heard from the Quinn clips, like, something they talk a lot about is, like, keeping the formation. And when you play Dota in that cell, the enemy tends to... You know, you try to burst one guy, they save him, and then you let run out of damage, you don't have enough to keep going. But Beastmaster is sort of like one of those unlimited damage heroes. You can keep the fight going, keep throwing these axes, your damage keeps ramping up, you're summoned. It's also like sort of a classic counter to Silencer, just because if you get to the levels on Beastmaster, Silencer doesn't really do anything to your summons. Curse doesn't do much damage, it's too much mana. And once you kick out a sort of weak laner like Silencer and Beastmaster, it's one of the offlaners that really snowball really hard, take over the map. I think Willow, would Phoenix be a good ban here too? I know Silencer is good against Phoenix, but I know Lone Druid hates playing this out hero. And I think Spirit's looking for a position four here as well to lane with that Beastmaster, most likely. Do you, do you even feel like part of the Silencer pick here was a protection pick, so to speak, against a potential Phoenix coming out when they picked it on Gaiman? Hard to say, because, like, yeah, you can silence them, but at the same time, you could buy ways to get out of it, and you don't have a good way to kill Egg, because Pango's just rolling, he can't attack. Lone Druid Bear is ineffective versus the Egg. Morta can sort of do it, but that's like going to be your support most likely, so... I don't think they have enough, but they're going to leave it anyway, so we'll see what Team Spirit wants to pick up here. Uh, I feel like Team Spirit need a partner for Puck to make some plays on the map, because with Trent it's going to be complicated, and they will need something to be happening for sure. Maybe we don't need to do anything, and Gladiator is just going to run at them, and <laughs> we're going to just like take... Like a maybe? Ten I can see Skyrath working. I think the number one priority for Team Spirit right now is making sure the Beastmaster is a good lane. If Beastmaster does not have a good lane against Silencer, then oftentimes it can be hard to fight into, especially versus Pangolier, another matchup where, yes, you can roar his roll, but if you cannot 
like burst him in that, then Pangolin becomes very good against Beastmaster in the fights. So I think the lane comes first, and then they can look at options after that. Yeah, for sure. We're aiming some good carries against Beastmaster right now too, like with one turn, but and this looks interesting. I guess we'll see if the Weaver will be on that position four or not here, if they're going to go for a carry, because that option does still exist if they want to go in. I wouldn't mind the Weaver carry at all. I think yeah. the lane would be pretty strong for Sancer. Uh, Weaver doesn't have to like commit. I mean, I think it might depend what carry they're predicting Gladiators to pick, but I'm just not too sure like what carry they're looking at. Honestly, in my head, I'm like some Drow Ranger, but that hero's not very strong right now. I just see Yatoro, you know, and I'm like, oh, TI, Yatoro, Drow Ranger, it might come back. Nobody's been picking that hero though, right? But it is a no, really good game for it. <laughs> it's super good versus Pango. It's so annoying for Lone Druid. I feel like it's probably not good enough of a hero, but if they were to pick a new carry, like I want something like that with really high damage. Oh, it's awesome. Oh. Okay. Is this... Um... I think they're just punishing the Silencer, right? In the so, on, on Team Spirit, I think they've been playing Nagwashka on the Tusk more so than Mira, if I'm not mistaken. Is there a world that this is a 4 Treant, or do you think you just have to put the Tusk 4 here with Beastmaster? And how good is that lane against what you're supposedly facing here, especially considering it's a blind carry so far? I mean, I wouldn't mind the Treant on 4. I think, like, honestly committing really hard into the Beastmaster's lane, making sure he secures it and he can take over the game is a good idea. But I think oh. it's like, ooh, Gyrocopter. That's an old Weaver. Really, <laughs> really good for Beastmaster, too. Yeah. His summons just die. The Hawk is free, golden EXP. Double melee versus double range. That's scary. Don't you guys just love when you go into the finals and there's, like, multiple heroes that you haven't seen for a week that come out in the very first game? Amazing stuff. So, yeah, Beast and Gyro. Dare I say it's their first appearances on the main stage? I think so. Probably haven't seen Shiro on the main stage since TI5. <laughs> <laughs> He's back. Awesome. Uh, what do you guys make of this overall? Like, if you do, you feel like there's any sort of advantage that you can infer from specific lanes, or you know what you've seen from the team so far in the tournament that makes you lean one way or the other? I think this game's going to be completely decided in Spirit Safe Lane. Like, I think they picked this Weaver and Treant just to be strong, and Lone Druid is honestly sort of the same. Like, this hero really wants to win this lane. Depending on which way that lane goes, I think it'll determine the tempo for the post lane phase. I also feel the same about gaming Gladiator's safe lane as well. If it doesn't go well and Gyro doesn't have a good laning stage and Collapse can manage to get kills with Mira, that could change Spirit's momentum a lot with this beast. Yeah, very, very depending on lanes right now. How the lanes go, we'll decide uh, a lot in this game. So how's the mid lane matchup going to go, Dendi? Uh, to me, it's maybe a little bit favorable for Pango, but it's still a pretty good game for Puck. Uh, but uh, it's pretty risky in my eyes to pick Puck so early. Like, usually you want to see more heroes. There is still two silences, so you want to buy a defensive item, which slows down other, like, aggressive items that you might go for. So, yeah, a bit scary for Puck. Yeah, honestly, I'm really worried for a lot of this game. I feel like the ganks from Tofu can come in. Lone is a hero, you know, he can just pull away with his bear. You can sort of leave him alone. And hopefully, like, that's why I feel like if they don't win the Yotaro Matoshka lane, it's going to like bleed really hard into mid. They can't keep the Morta there. What do you guys make of the, uh, the, the Tusk here that Spirit ended up going for into Silencer, who's notoriously a really good anti-save hero, and a big part of the Tusk is saving allies with Snowball? Do you think that's maybe a little bit on the risky side, or...? I think he wants to kill the Silencer. Yeah, I think this is enough. a hero that can just like, get on him and kill him right away. It's going to be more of an aggressive Tusk team uh, instead of a defensive one. Yeah, for sure. We're going to double jump with Puck. That's where we're going to be their target number one. All right. Thank you guys very much for your insights. We are ready to get into the game, but before that, we're going to a coach's interview with Silent from Team Spirit. Thank you very much. Yes, I am joined by Silent of Team Spirit as we get ready for this grand final, a best of five grand final. Not many teams get the privilege of playing best of fives, but you've been to many of them. So to you, is there any difference between best of three Dota versus best of five Dota? Uh, for me, you have uh, more chances to do a mistake. Best of three, you can really don't figure out how to play against your enemy and what might cost you series. Uh, but here, uh, lucky is best, uh, best of five because uh, players have some. We, we play way too fast, and I think we need to adapt somehow for that. Uh, that's the point. All right. Well, we got to get that data with a game number one. So, Seattle, are you ready to start grand finals? That's what I like to hear. Let's get into it with game number one. 
That's right, it's time to make our grand finals head underway. On one side, we have a team that is absolutely the best team of the year, but on the other side, the strongest team of the tournament. On one side, we have three-time T major winners, and on the other side, TI winners, but only one can claim the Aegis. I've seen a lot of TIs, Cap. We are going back 12 editions of this right now. We have seen lower bracket runs, we've seen upper bracket runs, we have seen first bloods, we have seen Roshans, but one thing is absolutely clear to me right now at TI-12 in the heart of Dota in Seattle, these two teams are undoubtedly the best two teams in the world right now, and both oh. of them are absolutely terrifying. And that's exactly why Gaming Gladiators stacked the Bounty Runes, but they failed to be able to claim the first blood. They wanted to be able to get that early momentum over a team that is so scary. I mean, Team Spirit have demolished every team that has stood in their way. Gaming Gladiators, though, have had to make the long run through the lower bracket. And there's something special about that lower bracket momentum. You cannot underestimate how much this team has gone through, especially going to their fourth Valve event grand final of the year. No team has made a complete sweep, and usually the team that is favored in that sense can't even make that type of run, so this team cannot be underestimated at the same time, all of us here watching. When you see a Toro come out of that player walkway with a shaved head, the amount of fear that instills into you, the amount this man is willing to sacrifice to claim a second Aegis and join that limited pantheon of two-time TI winners, you can't not help but be a little afraid of what he's willing to do here. In a best of five, both these teams are capable of anything. The greatest question, however, if you've watched this lower bracket run from Gaming, is can Team Spirit put a stop to the speed and the tempo in which they are playing these games? Because right now, nobody across all of those series has been able to do it. A lot of these games have not gone past the 25 minute mark. So you need to slow it down, you need to play your game, or at least take it back to them. And if there is one team in the world that can accomplish that, it is Team Spirit who have shown that they are no slouches when it comes to the first 10 minutes, particularly the laning phase. Yes, this laning phase is going to be the ultimate test for this best of five. It's going to be a long journey to get through this finals. And who walks away winning this laning phase could just end up winning the entire thing as Maposhka will end up going down. Koku finally claims first blood for Gaming Gladiator. And this is a familiar story. Acceleration for Ace on the offlane lone drew this is a hero that has demolished the lower bracket along with all the buildings in those series a scary hero to give a lead off to here especially when once more gaming have a lot of tempo that can just go with ace go through these objectives play with that bears timings but i like what spirit have brought out here in game one right these are a lot of heroes that are not afraid to skirmish early and Toro take it straight back to, to you. death against tofu will end up helping to get the kill on to, to uh, Tofu, but we'll end up falling into the end. The Ace is gladly going to be able to dive a bit more onto Maposhka. They are definitely winning this lane. They're walking away with it a bit. And that's going to be fast over Corrosion for the Bear. That's going to give him a lot of chase down potential in this lane. He's still going to find it. Maposhka, oh! He has that extra little bit of heal. The they end up dying the Bear. That's going to be 300 gold over to Yatoro, but Ace can keep up that pressure with a fresh resub. Big turnaround for Yatoro, honestly. This lane was looking a little grim if you get Ace to that fast over Corrosion, which has just taken over a lot of these lanes. All of a sudden, you get a bear kill back. A lot of golden XP for Yatoro. He can start to regain momentum in this lane. This is a very strong lane for Team Spirit. Tree Weaver, there's not much that beats us, so this just shows how strong this offlane is for gaming as well. They're oh, it would be such a massive win if they could actually bring down Ace, but Yutoro's gonna have to try and go for Tofu instead, who gave up his own life to be able to kill the bug on Ace to protect his core. He Kinda does die, HP. but if Yutoro gets caught by an Entangle here, it's gonna be a heavy punish, but not afraid. Turns around, battles back against that bear, knowing Ace still has some time before he has another resummon available. Still a lot of gold going to Yutoro here as he takes a net worth lead. Good sign for Team Spirit is, I mean, Weaver has to be one of the fastest carries in this meta. I think CK is the other one that I had point to. Of course, Bristleback, he's a pseudo carry getting banned out. This is a hero that Team Spirit first picked for a reason. If they get him to a good position, he can go and defend all these towers. You can take every single fight with this carry hero, try and match Duraccio's pace where I almost feel like it doesn't matter what hero Duraccio is playing. This guy is going to run at you. He's going to join all the skirmishes with Quinn. You have to be ready for the five-man collapse at a certain point. Either get some trades, be ready to defend them at the towers. This Beastmaster can trade on the map. That's another objective that Team Spirit can look for as this game progresses. I feel like uh, out of all the players on Gaming Gladiators, it's definitely Duraccio. That's a resummon. Yeah, it is. Ace 
He'll lose yet another bear. Yotoro is just climbing up the network chart now. A laning phase that started off a bit bad for them, but now they've got a full 20 second window with no bears, so they should easily be able to get most of the CS. And also the, the bounty. Man, he is sitting at 3k net worth already. It way ahead of anybody else in this game. It adds up real fast. These bears are worth a lot. It's also extra damage going into Ace. You're not healing while the bears on cooldown. There's a lot going wrong in this off lane for Gaiman right now for the hero that's supposed to give them that lead, at least comparatively to those other games, right? This is still a very even game, but if you watched any of these series yesterday, particularly the Azure one, I guess if you're not down 5k at the five minute mark, you're doing pretty well. Yeah, seriously, you cannot let Gaming Gladiators run away with the laning phase. And that, when we were talking about it backstage and so many, else, so many other people that we talked to backstage, everybody was saying, Team Spirit is not going to get run over the laning oh, phase. The they won't let that happen. You can make these kind of rotations. Pick up on the snowball. They have three heroes to all bang on to the Jar Copter, but it's not quite good enough. Tofu protecting them nicely. They'll get some damage in return, but Team Spirit are going to remain relatively healthy. Nice missile dodge on the snowball. Mira, he's going to be able to make some really nice plays this game. This Tusk is a hero that can not only give him the physical burst to go through the bear at the later stages, but the snowball dodge on heroes like Gyro and Pango that have to throw out their spells at the start of a fight. It can get you your core BKBs off. It can stall out the fight, get you a roar off of, you know, collapse coming back out of it. Something that could be really instrumental as this game progresses here. And once more, Spirit making the first moves here. Mopochka has been really active in this laning phase, trying to skew it as much as possible to Team Spirit's advantage. Give them that breathing room. And of course, this is a Dream Protector lineup. We're talking about these objectives, something gaming's focused on. You can keep your towers up. Living armor. If double slows are gonna help here, and Quinn's gonna come back into this place. He's an opportunity, but so is Laurel. The two supports are already dead, though. And there's no way for this puck to change the matchup now. Plus two int on the board for Celery. Glaive's already getting some extra work done. We'll leave solo lanes on these sides, so Yatoro gonna try and make the most of it. He gets rooted. Oof. Oh, you know he wanted another bear kill on this lane, man. He has been taking it to ace. Level advantage already going Yatoro's way. It'll look like it'll just be the Dragon Lance. So defensive-oriented build here from the Tokyo Toro. Get the high HP up. Don't get bursted in this game. Man, he is just chunking Ace down. This is a roam opportunity up here, right? Like, this is a great hero for Team Spirit to roam on. If you can keep chipping Ace's HP pool, because every time you kill this bear, he has to resummon. He's susceptible again, and you don't really take the ult too early. Laurel. He's going to try and bait it out here by using the Illusion Rune. The first Power Rune was an Illusion Rune. Not necessarily one that you feel the best about, but he's going to try and bait it out by showing his Illusion mid and seeing if they can catch something in this top lane. Tofu. He's going to be marked there. Couldn't get there in time to snag away the Wisdom Rune, but they can get this one kill. Ace is around. Laurel, he'll back away. So will Ace. He's ready for the push that's coming in. In fact, he knows he's kind of surrounded by heroes, so he wants to play defensively. But Laurel already back to the mid lane. Doesn't want to miss out on too much of his CS. Nice heads up smoke by Spirit. Uh, they are a team that will happily smoke to any of these Wisdom Runes. And if you study them, you know it's coming. The 7, the 14, the 21 especially is one of their big power moves. They really want this XP advantage. And again, rotating to Ace's lane, I think, is a recipe for success. The other move you're going to make is to collapse when that helm is up to try and push this tower or kick to watch you out of the lane. But I feel like every time you make one of these aggressive moves on game in the early game, you're pretty happy with it, right? Because it means they're not going to ace, they're not pushing your tower, and then things like this can start to happen where another kill for Yatoro. He is absolutely out of control. Oh, and their carry's going to be in trouble as well. Both cores in big trouble here on the side of Game of Gladiators and no TP rotations coming in. So they're just going to run down Duraccio. Do they dive the oh, tower, mana. though? It's a bit scary, and they've run out of resources. So Duraccio lives, but only on the sliver of HP, and it's not doing him much good either, because he's going to have to make a run back to the fountain, very likely. You can see the side lane pressure here. This is another thing that's causing Gaiman some issues right now because they want to rotate towards mid, play around Quinn. So every time you bring supports off the side lanes, it's up to Spirit to recreate the pressure there and not let Quinn get away with these skirmishes with the power runes. However, Gaming rotating supports mid will secure that power rune for Quinn. Now it's a question of what he can do with it here. I mean, can you rotate into Yatoro's lane? Is this Weaver killable in the very early game? Calling plus some roots, it's doable. And in fact, they're just going to bring everybody up here. Try and go on Ace again. This is when the Lone Druid is susceptible. Perfect opportunity with the Bear now being put on cooldown. They have done serious damage to Ace, killing him so many times. And even maybe catching Tofu here. Celery's going to try and slow him down, but that's two supports without a real stun. They're just going to back away, though. Bottom lane, that was the rotation coming out from Quinn. Mira left a bit alone here as the Beastmaster went for the Lotus instead. Good separation there with Shard. And Quinn doesn't feel like diving too deep.
And this is the Helm coming out, finished for Collapse. So now you have a second pressure point on the map if your Team Spirit. You've gone through this early game in a pretty decent spot. Yatoro well ahead of the pack. So if he wants to rotate, play with Collapse, start pushing some of these towers, you can start to take Gaming's game plan against them here. As they are still struggling to keep Ace in that offlane. This bear has just been exploited in the early game. So much extra golden XP. Trying well, to make Oshka gets back to the safety of the trees. Gaming Gladiators are here in force, but fortunately the Pango versus the Beastmaster doesn't necessarily leave you the most options. Can't really put to use that Rolling Thunder super well. He's going to try for it anyway, perhaps. Going to force out the Primal Roar. Collapse now going to try and back away with that extra bit of movement speed. Does get hit by the Gyrocopter Ultimate. That's going to slow him down enough. Good snowball pickup from Mira. That buys him a Yotoro. couple of seconds. But Gwyn is going to follow that ball. He is perfectly going to be able to hit him both. The Swashbuckle lays it enough, though. And Jirachi and Quinn are now in trouble. Top of the coil. Laurel going to lock him down. And there's not much these supports can do to stop it. In fact, they're just going to feed right alongside the other two of Gaming Gladiators as Team Spirit in a five-man move, sweep over Gaming Gladiators, run them down underneath their towers, and even through the portal, Tofu will be denied that exit. Instead, he'll head back to the fountain after a triple kill for Yotoro. And Yotoro straight back to the top lane, doesn't miss a beat. The downside of all that off lane going wrong for Gaming is Ace didn't even have a bear during all that, so you cannot bring the numbers to that fight. Just an overextension on Collapse that Yotoro is happy to join and get the big swarm turnaround kill. Of course, the Laurel with a beautiful coil. Just lock him in place. Let the Weaver do the damage here. This is very deep. Yeah, this it's is almost, the It feels like a forced play. Yeah, forced play, if anything, right? And you know the Snowball save is going to come out here. This is what I'm saying. You disjoint the missile. You disjoint some of the gyro damage. That turnaround is deadly. Trian's going to give you sustain to just push through a lot of this poke damage. You're also missing the support ults. Like, Warta and Silencer are not too strong when they don't... Oh, got the first oh, Silence on him. If they can keep him in place, the dead shot moves him back in. They have to use the global, but it will get the job done. A huge kill streak going the way of Ace. His net worth just shot right back up as he got 587 gold for just himself off that kill. I mean, we're 11 minutes in the game, and Yator already had a 6x streak. So Ace, absolutely happy to pick that up. That's the power of the global versus the Weaver before he has any sort of dispel item, which... Looks like it's going to become very late in this game as Yatoro has opted for a Deso buildup. Another reason that kill was pretty valuable, right? You slow down the Deso, limit the charges you can get in these early exchanges. The slower it is, the worse it's going to be. Because his pace is very strong right now. And of course, Duraccio, we have not seen Gyro too much this tournament, but the big upside for this hero is the stacking, right? It's not yep. something we've seen Gaiman go back to a lot as the game's been very fast. But this triangle is getting stacked and is waiting for Gyro to come and collect. The other Ancients are also doubled up right now. So this is a lot of golden XP sitting in the bank for Gaiman if they can move Dorachio over there, start to clear through with the Max Flat Cannon. Something that Team Spirit might think about contesting depending on how fast they can push these towers down. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that in this game, it's funny, but I feel like the game plan is kind of swamped where Team Spirit want to be able to run over Gaming Gladiators, take these outer towers so they can disrupt that ancient farming. They're going to go straight to it. No hesitancy whatsoever. Immediate coil put onto Quinn, but they don't really have the strength to be able to bring him down just yet. Protected by all of Gaming Gladiators who, again, they saw Team Spirit in the bottom lane show up as five. They will do the same here in the mid lane. Quinn. Looks to find his mark, looks to see if he can drive right on through and straight to Maposhka. He'll find him here in the corner, clear out most of the trees, but Laurel's actually going to bounce back in here. They're going to retake the fight. But Poshka's going to stand and fight his best he can, but they off Ace immediately. Laurel trying to make his way out, and... Oh, the silence! Maybe he gets clipped again? He's dead! Couldn't jump to his orb in time! Yeah, they get Ace, but it does cost them quite a bit as Laurel was a big piece of the momentum for Team Spirit here. Tofu coming up big. Calling is just going to be their biggest way to deal with Puck in these team fights. If you can land it, it's probably a dead Puck. You dead shot him back into it. It's an extended duration here. Once more, that fight got dragged out. Really nice disengage from Spirit. Draw them back up the ramp. Waste this rolling thunder. Chasing Maposhka on the cliff. Yatoro gets another pretty good angle. You can see the aggressiveness they're trying to play with this Beastmaster right now. They're taking the push to gaming, not playing defensive at all. And once more, the aggression continues. No rolling thunder for Quinn right here. Global we'll sounds to try and protect him. Another swashbuckle up in a second. He's actually going to turn and fight as best as possible, but the puck is going to be the end of Quinn. I thought he was going to swashbuckle down and away from the trees. Maybe that was an error. Now, this is looking all spirit in this first 50 minutes here. They're getting a lot for their beast, the start for Yatoro. And now it's just going to have to come back down to the flat cannon, clearing through the Ancients to put Tarachu in a spot where he can 
start to take these fights. This is a position we've not seen gaming in in a while, right? In this yeah. tournament especially. They are usually the ones with a very strong lead going into the 15, 20 minute mid-game period. All of a sudden they're on the back foot. Double damage definitely gonna help accelerate Duraccio here. But we talked about the resiliency of this team, right? There's a reason they're here in this Grand Finals. There's a reason they've been in a lot of them, too. This is not a team that can only play from ahead. They're going to have to show some resiliency here and playing a little bit from behind, particularly with, I mean, maybe Ace's times, but also he's found a lot given his start. I'm surprised at how rich he is. Yeah, he's got three deaths. I think his bear has died like five different times in this game, but still second in the network chart. Still, though, Spirit clearly holding the tempo control of this game. They're up by 3K. They've got to be feeling pretty good about it. Even if they couldn't stop the Gyrocopter from clearing out stacks, they don't have to do it the first time around. Just taking these outer towers and trying to scrunch in the map a little bit. Yeah, take advantage Ooh. of the fact that Duracho is not ready, and it is dead even. And that would have been my prediction before this series as well. Maybe Goes to show. I mean, it, respecting the ace timing as well, too. Yes. Like, this Radiance on the bear, we have seen them do an incredible amount of work with it, and it's coming soon. I think Team Spirit really want to finish off this mid-tower before those timings reach the Aghanim Scepter on Duranchio, the Radiance on uh, ace here. And these are acceleration items. That's the thing. If you, if you give game and time to get to their big farm items in the Radiance and the Aghanim Scepter on Duranchio, those items let you fight, but they also let you just clear the map. So holding these tower-ups, if you can limit the space they can use these farming items on in terms of the size of the map, that's going to feel really nice with this Dream Protector lineup. Maposhka did not go for living armor points early, hasn't even needed them at this point. And all three tier ones are up. Another well, aggressive the foil lane, play. Kofu with the calling, trying to protect Mira just outside of that silence, uses the snowball, trying to get some distance. Nice dead shot, though. Actually hit Laurel in the background. Yeah, but the, the exchange on the other side of the map, Ace. Going down to Yatoro again with this Desolator. Instant reveal gets two charges on it, plus a bear kill as he was just pushing towards that Radiance. 700 off. And this tower dies. This is an influential tower for what Gaming want to do on the map because now both Ancients are exposed and Yatoro straight in there. He would have liked to have found that stack, but he will be happy to take the net worth away from Duraccio, a hero that just needs these camps up. Now you're going to have to need a bit of a backup plan if you're gaming gladiators. You no longer have that good control over the double ancient stacks like you're talking about. And look at so, this fast shard for Yatoro too. Yeah. This is where Weaver's just absolutely terrifying. You're getting the extra Gemini hit off the Sakuchi going through everybody with an early Desolator. These heroes just don't have the armor to deal with this right now. Now it does you don't mean, burst him. He wants to play super aggressive and like yes. get on top of people which against these kind of silences could play against them. That's why it's very important for them to get this Aegis, get this second line to give them time to get the BKB up on Yutoro so he can't get punished just yet. I mean, this man has absolutely no chill. He, he's not here to win an Aegis. He's here to take it away from you. And right now he is controlling the tempo of this game. It's going to force Gaiman into a smoke that yields nothing, right? They are nowhere here in time and still missing those big core items to take the fight anyway. You're still 300 gold off this Radiance for Ace. That's your big 5v5 timing. Just an awkward point. Yatoro playing this game way too fast right now. And the Beastmaster from Collapse speeding everything up. Helm of the Overlord is already done, by the way. So this map pressure is going to escalate. Gaming Gladiators really not able to do much besides just kind of make sure Duraccio doesn't get smoke ganked. Playing around him heavily. Here comes the pressure from Team Spirit, though. Radiant's done. This is a good point to get it done if you want to defend this Tier 1 mid. A really fast time lapse there. You could really, like, Yotoro, I think, felt like he was overextended there. If he gets caught once by the silences, there are chances he just dies behind the tower, and then that Aegis may be useless. He may just die twice in a row. And that's why this build is starting to come together for the Aegis, right? Because Yotoro still doesn't have a defensive item. The global's still very effective here against Spirit. Laurel also considering a BKB this game on Puck early just to deal with the calling and the global silence that's coming out. Gaming have a lot of tools to lock down these mobility heroes if they can find them. Right now, Maposhka just doing some scouting. Do you mean to spot Maposhka? But <laughs> there's nowhere for him to really run. He knows it too. He's definitely been caught, but he got some good information. Information that'll lead to the pickoff on Ace. He saw all those heroes and he said, guys, this lone druid is alone in the top lane again. Kill him. The single target physical burst is way too fast for this true form to even be considered in terms of casting it. They just had Ace's number. Radiance reveal down the drain as his timings are going to get prolonged yet again. And I mean, Collapse, he's just farming it up. 
not too worried about playing on game inside of the map right now. Just wants yeah. to hit his own BKB. It looks like Team Spirit, they're just going to work towards a triple BKB timing eventually. Look towards that second Roshan with it. Get the spell and debuff immunity up for the silences that are causing them problems in the fight. Then you're not too worried about anything as Quinn is getting shredded by the death Yeah, though. even if you get out the Rolling Thunder, the physical damage from Yutoro is too much for him to handle. Tofu was kind of desperate, wanted to be able to get that kill on Mira, maybe trying to take away the Aegis, but frankly, he doesn't do nearly enough damage right now to deal with this carry, even on low HP like this. Missed the dead shot on Mira. Managed to sidestep that one, and they'll dive Tofu pretty easily. Toro does manage to get off the timeline, service so barely. Meanwhile, Celery is picked off in mid. Team Spirit, they are absolutely outplaying Game of Gladiators right now on the map. They just know all of these heroes are getting picked apart. There just seems to be no response whatsoever from these gladiators. I mean, there's nowhere to run, right? You, you need to combine the damage here on Gaiman to get anything done right now, and instead it's just Team Spirit going on you on multiple lanes, so you can't group up. Age is still up for two minutes here. Eight Deso charges already done for Yatoro, as he is just slowly claiming your soul. This is going to escalate fast. This is a scaling lineup, too, with all the auras they can bring to the table. The Swarm's going to go through. You have Tusk physical damage to pour in on top of it all. And a Chrysalis for Yatoro. I mean, how many aggressive items does he need in this game? I love the fact he's like, yeah, I, I don't need that BKB yet. Still have the Aegis for another minute and a half. And considering the pace of game right now, it does kind of feel like he's going to get that BKB once the Aegis expires, because this is going to be another team fight and perhaps another objective taken. 21 minute Wisdom Room coming up, Tormentor, an object as well. Silence already going out. They're trying to lock down this Weaver, trying to stop him from killing anybody. It gets off the time lapse though. Forces a little bit of a resources out of game and Gladiators. They're just throwing some damage around, Laurel. Looking at that back work. line. Uh, you got to be careful of giving Duracho these good flak targets up front as they're going to trade a bunch of the bears and HP. And they're still looking still, for yeah, Moshka over here. They, they don't have the detection to catch him out. Something is going wrong with the detection on this tree and for sure. He's just getting way too much information way too deep right now. Team Spirit will play it safe, play it slow. Aegis out in 50 seconds, so you have to think about the timer here. Look at that burst damage, Quinn! Black caught by the coil and instantly killed by Yutoro. And you can feel it, Yutoro seeing an opportunity. They're gonna be able to cut down Celery, and now he goes in for the kill. The Aegis does expire, but the rest of his team provides the disable. No, so as second life comes back up, he's gonna shred through Ace. Looks over to Tofu next. Now, last left, perhaps Duraccio trying to run him down. Duraccio is doing as best he can, but up against three different cores, he can't actually fight back. He has Yutoro to run away. Oh, missing out on the dead shot. Yutoro is unstoppable. He's just diving to the base like it's nothing. He was thinking about it again. The 30 HP is the only thing that'll save you from this man right now. He's just running rampages through the fight. 12 and 2 at 22 minutes. He is just taking everything and more. He has the Oris to back him up. This aggressive item build has paid off in spades. The aggressiveness of Yutoro I've seen in very few players at TI before. I mean, that play when he was, he was more playing, he gets skewered into the base, and then he waveforms deeper into the base. That's the kind of aggression this guy's playing with right now. You gotta play to win. You play not to lose, it eventually will happen. Right now, Team Spirit just taking over the map. Really good deep wards on those fights. Will get dewarded from gaming, but that's the power of what Maposhka is providing them with this tree. All of these fights and pickoffs, they've been scouted. He's been on game inside of the map for a lot of it. It's paid off to a large degree, this early tree and shard. Doing some work. And of course, the vision's really nice for these silencer lineups, because if you're the one initiating on gaming, forcing out awkward globals, taking some damage on your backline, the fight gets very weird very fast, and suddenly, Toro goes in, he kills somebody, time lapses out. There's a black dragon, pouring some fire on somebody else. Too many fires to put out quite literally here. And once more, Bapochka just scouting out the moves from Gaiman. Gives him all the setup in the world. This is deadly, man. The cores from Spirit are converging on top lane. Look at Bapochka, man. He doesn't care if he gets caught. As long as he gets information for his team, he knows all five heroes of Gaming Gladiators are up here. So Team Spirit are going to slowly approach. They're going to group up together okay. and take this fight. Yatoro just time lapsed to the fountain and back to get his BKB. He will not have time lapse for this fight because I don't need it. With the three man coil. It's looking beautiful. And Yatoro's right in there with this fresh BKB to lay the damage into these cores. Once again, Ace has no chance with the bear and of course the Beastmaster is going to lock down that ball. You're not going anywhere, Quinn. They're going to catch more. Tofu is going to be the last one down. Jirachu only survives because of his TP. Everything coming together. Triple BKB instantly revealed all together on the exact fight Maposhka sets up.
It's just beautiful gameplay here from Team Spirit and gaming still searching for answers because the second these fights start, they're already over. They don't even know they're coming. Yep. Yeah, Toro, he does not need an ultimate at all to take these engagements when they are completely one-sided. It'll be more objective pushing. This is just a beautiful four-man overgrowth setup. You cannot ask for anything more. Swarm hits everybody, and then you get to save Roar for the Rolling Thunder after Ace goes down to just right clicks. I mean, making it look easy out here. The item timings, the positioning, all of it is just so perfect for Team Spirit. That's the power of Vision. This is a team that won a TI previously off of Vision Advantage, and they're showing why. The Beastmaster might have gotten nerfed in this regard, but Maposhka doing his best Hawk impersonation. If you want to be worried about uh, the Chen of Gaming Gladiators, I think it's the Tree Protector of Team Spirit that may become a problem in this series. He's Maybe there's just not enough sentries in the world for you to buy to catch this guy. I mean, he's dewarding them too, that's the problem. They're, they are lacking sentries, they are lacking the detection. No one wants to buy a gem right now. I mean, you don't want to have to buy a gem for a tree protector, but we're getting to that point. And every time one of these fights goes wrong, you fall a little bit more behind with the... I mean, core heroes that don't want to function in these team fights from behind, right? Particularly the gyrocopter. This is a hero you want to accelerate with the triangle, accelerate with the ancient camps, put him in a prime position like a Luna or something where he goes in that fight, he's the absolute raid boss. Duraccio has escaped these fights, but across his teammates' tombstones as he cannot output the firepower to match what Team Spirit are bringing with the ball right now. And everything is looking towards this next Roshan, which Team Spirit would be very, very happy to collect and put an Aegis on Yatoro with his aggressive DPS build. Not to mention, I mean, I mean, Laurel is picking up the speed, right? He's just going for the Maelstrom right-click puck. It's also a fearsome late-game beast, especially when you have that Beastmaster or pumping an attack speed to everybody on this lineup. You have tag team to buff the physical. You're going to have multiple scaling right-click cores here for Team Spirit. You're going to need armor on gaming at some point. You're going to need survivability. Satanics, AC, anything that buys you time in this fight. Game of Gladiators only getting caught there, the overgrowth. Not quite landing on to Quinn. He'll survive as a result of that. Yutoro still gonna have a poke at them though. Quickly time lapses away before the silences catch him out. He's just so aggressive, man. He's gonna start backing away with the rest of his team. As you said, 19,000 net worth lead. They're very comfortable. It's really just not slipping up at this point in time. And that starts with being able to get the second Roshan of the game. And then comes the high ground push, which Game of Gladiators I don't know, how do you, what, what do you feel better about? A Roshan contest or a high ground play? Uh, <laughs> maybe game two. <laughs> high ground play for sure, right? You let him go into you, abuse the fact that the calling's a really strong defensive spell. You catch the tree in first, that's a nice pickoff. That is actually really gem. nice with the gem on the ground. Yeah, okay, so Ooh. you needed a gem in this game, Maposhka will give it to you. That's a big pickup, limit the vision, limit Maposhka's aggressive positioning. That was very deep, right? Especially for Team Spirit looking towards this next Roshan. They have the Beastmaster creep in the pit scouting it out. A rich man's hawk, for lack of anything better. Just waiting, waiting on their vision. Yeah, sad part for Game of Gladiators is they can't actually do anything off of that play besides getting a little bit more farm than normal. They'll be able to push out some of the side lanes. I assume they know that Team Spirit's going to be doing Roshan sometime soon. Of course, they're doing it right now. And it happens so quickly. It gives you such a small window if you're uh, Game of Gladiators to actually be able to contest. So you're right. They're going to play for the high ground. They're going to try and see if they can make Team Spirit slip on that staircase. Just a question of what are they going to get up for that high ground defense, right? It's the Daedalus on Darachu. That's going to be the big DPS item here. Ace is just, I mean, he's just going Wraith Bands. He didn't even get to anything else in this time period. It's just going to be armor up, try and survive the initial burst. Now these Wraith Bands are pretty nice first Team Spirit's minus on the Wraith. So they are very good value. I don't blame him for doing this, but in that other Lone Drew game we saw, I mean, he had a full harpoon before he went back for these Wraith Bands. So yeah. it tells you how far behind he is off that, you know, first 15 minutes, Team Spirit shutting him down right now. And the question is, how do you want to go high ground? Because there is a calling to fight into. There is a Rolling Thunder that can abuse you on the choke points. There's the Radiance Burn with Mischance and a resummon, assuming it's hard to jump Ace initially. And of course, Global can bail out any sort of initiation from the Tusk or the Beast. See how strong Yatoro really feels he is if he thinks he can just walk up and start hitting this tier three. Wouldn't surprise me. Maybe that's why he's gone Scotty here. Level 20 done for the Weaver with Scotty completed a double damage rune and a quiver. Oh yeah. 
I, I mean, if you get hit once by this Weaver, I think you're gone on the supports. And that's a huge problem for Duraccio as well, because he doesn't have that Satanic buildup yet. So he doesn't have the sustain to be able to stand toe -to -toe against the Weaver for too long, Ace. I don't know if you know what's coming for you right now, but <laughs> you're not going to like it. It's going to be a shot to the back of the yeah. head. Gone! <laughs> I... <laughs> Blown away by Yatoro, and they catch Quinn in the mid lane. They don't need Yatoro to make this kind of play. Laurel activates his BKB to catch the opposing mid laner. And with two dead, a double damage activated. Team Spirit are just all but just waiting for the creep wave to catch up with them. Well, that's one way to break the high ground. Just one shot and enemy off lane carry here. Oh, and uh, force it with a double damage here. Yatoro has AC Aura behind him now as well. So that Deso plus the Swarm plus the AC. It's just going to amp this physical through the roof right now, which makes this high ground siege a lot more tempting. Here it goes through the jump. BKB immediately activated by Duraccio, but there's that physical damage. Duraccio, he can't actually stand up against Yutoro and has to of back away. Of course he's diving. Yutoro, yeah, he's just going to go for it. See if he gets oh. the grid and got it! Oh, no way! The final bit of damage required. Yutoro can claim it. Yutoro, boss. This man knows no fear, no limits right now. He's just taking your base at 30 minutes. A position Gaiman is used to putting their opponents in. The noose has been pulled taut here as G Team Spirit have just given them nothing of the map, it feels like, for 15, 20 minutes. Ace can't even escape the Tier 3s right now. You're just going to have to take a high ground defense without your carry. I watch another lane disappear. Yeah, I don't see LA, how they stop this without Duraccio. I mean, I think Mira can also jump if he really wants to just force the issue. Yeah. This Tuscar is hella tanky right now. Gossamer Cape, Drum, happy to start the engagement, particularly if you can find a good core target. He got feared on the jump. That was, well, that was incredibly impressive, actually, but it will not yield them the fight. And it'll be a second lane. Two lanes of barracks up for Team Spirit. And they still have a minute and a half left on that second life for the Weaver. That final push, I mean, if you're Team Spirit, you're here playing a full best of five against Game and Gladiators, why not make the first game quick? Just for your own sake. Yeah, give them a taste of their own medicine. Uh-huh. And show that the zoo is indeed not dead. That's the scary part of this game for me. You have collapsed on a hero that... I mean, they have been incredibly proficient with it, right? This was a first phase ban at Riyadh for a reason. Yep. It is a collapse signature hero, but it's not one of those big jump stunners that everybody is afraid of. They're afraid of the collapse Magnus, the, the, the collapse stunners. This is a hero that just took over the map. He farmed, he played his game with Yatoro, and it was the raw aggression and objective taking to put gaming on the back foot. It's a scary thought if Team Spirit are taking He's doing it again, isn't he? Yeah. Own strat against you, and yeah, time lapse to the base for some Daedalus action your own X marks the spot. That is so much burst damage. Yeah, when he's got, he's got the enchanted quiver on top of that. This is an insane, like, single hit, right? It doesn't take much. He just, Sakuchi's in, hits you instantly, can start to run away. You're just getting chunked. This is the strength of Weaver right now. 15 and 2 for Yatoro. Mira looking for his opening. Game of Gladiators, it seems pretty clear. They can't take an honest fight against Team Spirit anymore. They're going to have to play around the fountain here. As a jump forward, the Dream Coil is slowly taking him out. Tofu does manage to live for now. Gets back to the fountain. But Team Spirit, they still have more opportunities to come. The Aegis is going to expire. So Game of Gladiators managed to weather that storm. And it's possible that Team Spirit may decide that it's best just to wait for a third Roshan before they end it. I think Yatoro's happy to give the Aegis up. It'll free up another slot for him at the rate he's going. Yeah, seriously. He just wants more damage, more survivability. Everything <laughs> is great for him right now. The scary part is you can still work towards a Tusk Ags in this game. I mean, Mira's quite farm. Oh, yeah. You're talking about a high ground break mechanism. They really get in a stalemate and need it. He's going to kick someone out, and Yatoro just runs straight into them. Pops BKB, turns around. Oh, man, that damage is just building up so quickly. Quinn's got it in it, and so is the bear. Duraccio battling up against Laurel, but the big bad boss of the, the fight is definitely Yatoro. And once he turns it's his over. eye on a hero, Absolutely it disappears. Over. Game over for this one. The team spirit making absolutely no qualms about shutting gaming gladiators out in their own style. 33 minutes and it's done. <laughs> Such a one-sided game one. I mean, nice low bracket run, right? Welcome to the grand finals here. Welcome to the ultimate boss of Dota right now. As you might have won three majors, you might have made it all the way here, but if you can't find a way to break this team, which nobody else has been able to do, you're going to go home empty-handed. 
And Game Man, Gladiators, uh, like they had such a good run leading up to yes. this, right? They lost one game in this playoff run of theirs, and that was against Team Liquid. The only team who managed to take it until they run into Team Spirit. And they, they kind of look shook, right? Oh, yeah. I, that's what they want their opponents to feel. A 30-minute high ground GG, make it look easy, just run away with the lanes. You had a couple power runes go Quinn's way, but he couldn't find anything on these side lanes. The mid clash didn't work. The side lane pressure mounted way too quickly. You had Ancients to fall back on for collapse. Yatoro is just slaying people. Ends this game 18 and 2. This man's just padding his legacy stats at this point. I mean, seriously. He's trying to make a, a name for himself here, as he already did once before at TI-10. But if he could become a two-time alongside his team, it would be something magical. But that game one, that might have been convincing. We've seen plenty of convincing games in TI. It's sure. a best of five for a reason, right, Avery? Absolutely. And there's some changes we can make strategy-wise in particular. What was one thing you would point for gaming gladiators that you would like to see heading forward in the series? I mean, you have to think about the lanes going a bit better for you and how, who you're going to play around right now because it felt like they left Ace on an island for a lot of that off lane early game, and T-Spirit just abused it, especially with this Weaver pick. It's basically the most aggressive carry. You give Yatoro a start like that, he's just going to pop off on it and never look back. He's the best carry of the tournament so far, showing why. Absolutely showing why, and the panel will sure to be able to talk more about that as we head into game two. Thank you very much, Captain SVG, Team Spirit take game number one here in the Grand Finals of the International 2023. And it was, uh, it was almost, almost as if Team Spirit just taking a page out of Game and Gladiator's book and uh, basically was the oppressor in this game. I'm joined by Effie, by Tiga. We also had a change on the panel as we now have Insania weighing in for the insight, and you said this is oppressive gameplay coming out from Team Spirit here. Yeah, I feel like normally when you play against Gladiators, they tend to corner you into taking a lot of bad fights. I'm sure anyone that's watched this play are like, why are you guys fighting them? Like, it's so obvious you're gonna lose this fight. But I feel like what uh, Spirit did this game was they, they brought the numbers really early on and made sure that wasn't gonna happen. Yeah, it happened at the nine minute 50 mark for me when they take this fight bottom, Mira, he holds a snowball, he kind of baits Gaming to take this fight. Meanwhile, Ace is in the mid lane playing Lone Druid. Like, how does he rotate to this bot fight and contribute to these quick early engagements? And that was the story of the game for Spirit, just constantly dodge, take away the fights away from LD. But also, when he's by himself trying to recover, you kill him as well. He had eight deaths by the 30 minute mark. It was the most times Ace has died on Lone Druid so far at the International. He was just completely shut down. Yeah, and on the topic of that Lone Druid, that game felt impossible for Lone Druid to ever recover because I think that Spirit had a genius lane versus Lone Druid, and that came after it. That's the interesting thing. They picked Lone Druid after they saw Weaver and Trian. I mean, conceptually, when you have these very high damage output heroes like Weaver and Trian on the lane, you should be able to kill the bear over and over again. And that's what happened. They killed the bear a couple of times on lane. They were able to constantly pressure and dive the Lone Druid, and it made it so that because that lane went so poorly, there was no way for Quinn on the Pango to rotate top and correct it in any way. Yeah, it was a strong performance and it definitely looked like Team Spirit was very well prepared for what Gaming Gladiators uh, was gonna bring to the table in the first game of the best of five. Insania, you've been against these two teams in the Grand Finals several times this year. Yeah, unsuccessfully so. <laughs> what, what makes these two teams be the Grand Finals raid boss, if you will? I think they, they're both teams that have pretty strong identities. And usually by the time that they get to Grand Finals, they've really figured out what makes their identity work. So um, they're not really, I would say, like the most adaptive teams, but they're really good at figuring out how can we enable ourselves to play our own game. So it wouldn't surprise me if Gladiators, you know, they swap up some heroes and then they go look to do the same thing again. It's probably going to be a battle of like two very specific styles. And if Gladiators can take control of the map and really like force you into a corner, then they'll probably be victorious. And if Spirit's able to like hold that away, hold the aggression off, then I think they'll have the edge. Yeah, I feel like as well for Team Spirit, they're coming to this series, they pick Beastmaster. They hear that we haven't seen them play at the International so far. Of course, they do play it multiple times before, but it's the fact that Spirit, they look at game in, they read them and go, you know what, rather than trying to be defensive, let's just overwhelm you as well with our own level of pressure. A lot of teams have tried to delay, prolong, and survive that onslaught, but it was refreshing to see Spirit just change up the style and go, no, this is how you beat gaming. Yeah, and they closed out their second phase with that Beastmaster, right? I mean, back when Beastmaster was very broken, that was the most difficult part of drafting, is you're very concerned for those gotcha 18 pick 
on the Beastmasters or the Storm Spirits. And they picked that Beastmaster when they saw the Silencer and the Moita, two supports that can't do anything versus the Zoo. So not only was that pick genius, but I really feel that having this Weaver in the first phase for Yatoro is going to be something to look out for in the series, because if they can bring the aggression to Gaming Gladiators from their safe lane early on, Gaiman might not be able to ever play the, for the tempo that they're looking for. Yeah, we mentioned that the offlaners were going to play a big role here today. Uh, and Zania, I don't know if you've noticed that as well. I mean, for us on the panel, we talk about the, the, the best looking stats, if that makes sense. And it's been very often this international, the offlaner. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, so I feel like there's been like multiple metas. Yeah. At, like the group stage, it was one meta, now it's another. But the, the offlane seemed to be like the general place where you get a lot of pressure. And with how the portals now work on the map, where you can like kind of portal around and you kind of want one lane to go to, the off lane seems to be like the easier place to connect to and then like get that thing going. So having strong off lanes sets up for like your position five to rotate and like everybody to come in and create a lot of pressure. And both these teams are very like off lane uh, heavy teams, you know, like Collapse yes. and Ace. They're yeah, two-star players for these teams. Very much so. And we heard our draft panel at the end there as well. At the end of the draft, they mentioned how important that top lane was going to be. And Effie, that's where we saw the Weaver just pop off. Yotoro had a fantastic game. Yeah, there is nothing really to stop that Weaver, like I mentioned before. And pairing it up with the Treant made it so that not only was it a strong kill threat lane, but it worked perfectly in playing against the Lone Druid that they didn't even have to prepare for or think about. Or maybe they did it in the preparation, knowing that Lone Druid might be run by Gaiman because of their series yesterday. But if Lone Druid can't have a good start in the lane and his mid laner cannot enable him by maybe getting some cleanup kills after he's fed a couple of bears, then where do you go from there? Because T was mentioning there's no way for to rotate bottom when there's a team fight going on. He's too busy recovering in the mid lane. Yeah, and recover Gaming Gladiators never really did do that. So they're now one game down in a best of five grand finals. They have some time to reset. And while they do that, we are going to check in with Keisu. Somewhere in the crowd? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What up? <laughs> wow. Grandma's here trying to look hip. Sorry about that. Everybody. All right, we are coming in to talk to some crowd. Uh, get away from me. Oh, hi, I'm sitting down. Oh my God, you're making me nervous. Sir, I have, yeah, I'm talking to you. I have several questions for you. Um, I'm not sure whether I should put the microphone in front of your face, but I'll give you one chance. Uh, hey, I'm sorry. I lost my voice from screaming at the game so loud. Team Spirit LGD. Well, luckily you're drinking tea and getting better. All right. What was the? Hello. <laughs> Do you really Why? think I can't see you? Why do you always pick the drunkest people? Did you? Why do you do that? <laughs> what was the best part of that first game? Shatoro just deleting everybody. <laughs> oh. You know, Yatoro, it's funny you say that. That is what we call a sexy transition to what Slax was going to talk Absolutely. about. Absolutely. I asked these peeps up here, who was the biggest Yatoro fan? Uh, you guys said you were Yatoro fans, right? Oh, yeah. He's getting me all my fantasy points right now. Oh, the fantasy points. Thank you, thank you. And you especially, when I said, is anyone a Yatoro fan? This guy ran up on three levels up, and he just started sprinting. Why do you like Yatoro? Yatoro is the best carry ever. Gold. Let's go, Yatoro. Ame is watching that. Let's go. Ame is watching that. Yes, that's right. Poor Ame. We're so sorry, Yatoro, about Ame. Keep trying, my friend. Nothing is forever. Okay, right. wait. What oh. thick haired beast said that they were the biggest Yatoro fan? Yes, yeah. we have to find some way to find out who is the biggest Yatoro fan. Now, if you know the Lator Yatoro lore, he does one thing before he goes in the grand finals now. You guys said you were the biggest fans. Who's willing to shave their head for Yatoro? I'll do it. Fuck. Whoa, no, no, he won't. no, 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 no. <laughs> Just a little bit, okay? Just a little bit. Wherever you want. No, no. However you want it. However you want it. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. We got it. We got it. All right, man. right here. Oh. Love you, Yatara! 
Back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Casey and Slacks. Uh, Zaini, have you ever tried that? You know, maybe something's lacking with the squad. Little we bit had of... this last year. You know, our coach said, if we get top yes. four at TI, yes. I will shave my head. William looked us in our eyes and said, I promise you guys, you if to we get top four, I will four. shave my head. Yeah, okay. so we got top four. Yeah. And then we're like, all right, William, you know, we got four days. Where is it? Let's shave it. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 no. I said top three. But we had vlog footage, so we went back and watched the vlog, <laughs> and it's very clearly top four. But and you then, guys also got top three. And then we got top three, and we're like, William, shave your head. And he's like, mm. you know, like, he Williams <laughs> out of it. And then, uh, yeah, no, shaving your head, I think, probably would have is the reason we didn't do better at this TI. Yeah, I mean, next year. Oh, yeah. There's always a chance. So maybe, I'm you sorry. know, there's a 15 minute yeah. break in the meantime. Maybe Game of Gladiators is finding a razor as we speak for their head, that is. And. <laughs> 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 that was very grim. That's not why I wanted to go with that. <laughs> what I do want to say is, I mean, we've got some very dedicated fans. I am sure that if Slacks pushed it, that uh, there would have been a bald head behind us. And while they, we have very dedicated fans all around the world, there are venues packed with dedicated fans watching the Dota 2 from afar. You guys are all with us here in spirit in the Climate Pledge Arena. And a lot of you are also with spirit as we saw a lot of cheers there where Team Spirit take the first game of this best of five grand finals. And we, we got to talk about adaptations because it's the best of five. Both of these teams have been here before. Both of these teams have shown that they have what it takes to be able to adapt on the fly in the break that they get. The question is, where are they going to go with the adaptations? I have to address a little bit, it's not really an elephant, it's more like horse size in the room. I want to talk about the gyrocopter that came out as the overall last pick, Effie. It's not a hero that we've seen do very well, or it has been very popular over these last few weeks. Why, why was this attempted and why didn't it work out? I mean, it was just a response to the Beastmaster, right? It's like, at that point, what do you do? You're playing against a summons hero. You don't have anything to address it. Your Pangolier is going to be a little bit busy because he's playing against the Puck. Pangol alone isn't enough. You go for Gyro, who's typically the AoE clear type of carry. But in you know, this hero fell out of meta for many reasons. I feel like he plays a little bit too slowly. If the aggression is brought to you in the way Team Spirit brought it with that Weaver, Gyro does not have enough time to respond to that. He needs to sit in his Ancients, needs to farm up like two or three items, and they couldn't reach that point. Yeah, I feel like maybe the main question for me is going to be Lone Druid. I don't think gaming will pick it so openly now, knowing that Spirit are going to be able to play such a high-paced game, kind of abuse the fact that he's on one side of the map, you can only bring four. And then on top of that, like Effie was mentioning, if you have a Gyrocopter as well, who also wants to hit Ancients, like Lone Druid wants a lane, Gyro wants Ancients, what, three heroes will do everything else for you? So I think for gaming, LD, that's going to be the big question mark for me. Maybe they pick it on like 18 or kind yeah. of like a closing part of the phase rather than so openly. Yeah, with LD and Lone yeah. Druid there, indeed, the offlaner for yeah, Ace. Didn't have, didn't have a great game. And overall, it felt like then the, the plan, Insania, that Gaming Gladiators had, it was very different from the style that we've seen them play because if they are playing for the later stages of the game, they're not going to be able to do their aggression ball that we've seen them be very dominant with. I think the idea was to try to set up like the same thing where they have this lone druid and Amuerta do very well in the off lane, and then you know you have Tofu running mid. We call it cringing in our team. It's like when the two supports show up mid and they just cringe <laughs> the mid laner. Um, so I think they wanted to like cringe Laurel, you know, make sure his game is terrible, but it kind of. Uh, relies on the laning phase going well. And I think the gyrocopter in many ways is picked to enable that. You want the safe lane to be strong. You just want the lane to go well, to free up Celery, free up uh, Tofu to then go pressure mid lane and enable Quinn to then, you know, get the ball rolling. But in this game, it just I don't think the lanes really played out the way they expected them to. No, I do, I do think we should mention the mid lane a little bit because we've talked a lot about Pango this entire weekend and this entire event so far. In other people's hands, other than Quinn, the hero has not looked great. Overall, he's had a fantastic win rate with it this time around, TGov. This game, though, he wasn't able to get the ball rolling. Yeah, no, he, he kind of <laughs> fell flat. Yeah, right? thank you, thank no. you, thank you. <laughs> Audible sigh. Um, but no, I think <laughs> the early game for Quinn, he was able to make a couple of those moves. He was punishing the support from Spirit. But then it got to the point where he was making so many rotations that eventually Spirit knew which one 
to capitalize on, which one to punish. So I think we they shouldn't be deterred from picking this hero. It is a matter of there's so many other factors laying into it. But yeah, the Quinn Pangolier is probably a hero that he would want to play a couple more times if he's going to try and secure this, uh, this Aegis. I mean, the issue was he couldn't rotate on the lane that he needed to rotate to, yeah. which was the Weaver lane. Right? If he's consistently putting all of his efforts in playing on the Beastmaster lane, you're not really solving the crux of the problem because even if you can get a couple of kills on that lane, Beastmaster is just going to sit in the jungle and farm for a little bit while the Weaver is playing a supremely aggressive game versus your lone druid and not allowing him to come back. But when Quinn has looked good with the Pango this tournament, it's usually come out later in the draft, right? Yesterday, they had it close out their second phase versus Azure Ray when they saw the Enchantress and the Naga, and it looked great there. Today, they brought it out after the Weaver, and is seeing a Weaver enough to pick a Pangolier that early? No, I don't think so. I also like the fact that they picked, so on the, on the flip side, with the Weaver, you have a Tusk and a Tree. So when things are going kind of chaotic, whatever of these melee heroes wants to go to the Weaver is going to be a kill lane, right? It's like you can use that Twin Gate, get a kill. So it's a bit difficult for that. It's a bit difficult indeed, and you see a lot of thoughtful faces there for Gaming Gladiators. And uh, we have a lot of data on them. They've played a lot of games, the most games played here at the International, making it all the way through a full best of three lower bracket. It means that uh, Team Spirit has a lot of data to go off of as well, Insania. How much in a best of five do you really put stock into the game that has been played um, not just today, this morning, but throughout the entire tournament, because I know a best of five generally also has like its own meta developing. Yeah, I mean, usually what's going to end up happening is you kind of get a good understanding for what it is the other team's trying to accomplish in the draft, and then how to adjust to it is usually the, at least for us, I think it's been a trickier part throughout the year, so... Um, yeah, you definitely like develop your own meta. You kind of understand, like, usually game one is like a feel your opponent out kind of the game. Mm -hmm. And you get an understanding of like, this is the idea I had prepared, this is the idea you had prepared, how do these two clash? So now gladiators kind of have to, you know, show their hand. They have to kind of mix something up. Probably won't be seeing gyro again, might see some adjustments to the bands, so they don't feel like they're in a position where they need to force the gyro. Um, yeah. yeah, as a gyro enthusiast myself, I don't mind seeing the hero, it's nice. <laughs> do you think they misclick this one or? No, I think they wanted it. Okay. Yeah. Would you have chosen the same cosmetic? Hmm, I don't, I'm not really sure what gyro cosmetics he had. The, the cosmetic that he had was the one that makes flat cannon incredibly visible. Like it was disco show out there. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. It was a good yeah, one. Yeah. All right, awesome. Why not? <laughs> but I, I am actually curious, Aiden. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about this Pangolier coming out early and yeah. when, or when it doesn't look good, like how much stock did you guys put into thinking about this Pangolier? Because obviously you're going to consider it, it is Gaming Gladiators, but you did let it through a few times. I think we've been letting it through all year long. Um, I remember I had, a, uh, I had a conversation with, I think, Tundra at some point, and they were like, just ban Pango and you win against Quinn. Uh, but it's like the hero doesn't feel that good. So when you play it yourself and like it doesn't seem to work, you're kind of surprised because every time you play against it, you're like, oh, this is you know free lane for Nisha, and then somehow like he makes it makes magic happen. But I think the point about the Weaver is true. Like it's very difficult for Pango to like run to Weaver's lane, roll up, and then look to do something. And then that I feel like every time they make the Pangolier work, usually they manage to bring the two supports mid, snowball the game, and then like you're scared on both side lanes. Well, we're going to find out what is happening in game number two as the draft for it is right around the corner. Climate Pledge Arena, Dota fans around the world, get ready! Team Spirit versus Gaming Gladiators. Grand Final, game two. Welcome back to the draft panel, everybody. This is going to be game number two between Spirit and Gaming Gladiators. Game one, Team Spirit kind of ran them over, I think is fair to say. So that begs the question, you know, the teams are feeling each other out. It's a best of five. What is the adjustment going to be for Gaming? How, what would you like to see them do first? Honestly, I would really like them to not target Collapse as much in the bands. I think that they should play more to their strengths than what I felt was like a little bit of fear of the opponent. I feel like the Magnus ban was maybe a bit overboard. I'm not too sure. Maybe it has some scrim experience versus or something. But I think Gaming's strength has always been playing through Quinn in the mid lane. And the way that you have to do that is that you need stronger sideline supports. They target their bands towards maybe a bit of Laurel, maybe a bit of the uh, spirit safely, and I think they were able to rotate on mid a lot easier. 
to me, it looked uh, actually pretty decent uh, at the beginning for gaming gladiators. Like, rare lanes were not that bad, and as soon as spirits start rotating super hard, like, and being super active, especially on uh, carry viewer, like, this 10 minute rotation, like, kind of break the game apart for gaming gladiators at that point. Maybe we were. Uh, uh, we should have not react to that at some point or ignore or something and find a better like fight a bit later on like so we don't lose the phase of the game yeah I, yeah i think my theory so far of like what team spirit's trying to do looks true with these bams like they don't want the Rachio to play ck they don't want him to play weaver he has played other heroes like alchemist razor but those are much later picks and if they are on the first pick by the way, Gaming Gliders, they chose first pick this game, so yep. they wanted to change just the, the draft order up just a little bit here. And it's pretty clear here. Gatoro is going to be like, I will take these away from you. These heroes, I don't play a lot of them, but I'll play them. I'll play them just as good as you, if not better, <laughs> which is getting into your head for sure. But now you're in a situation where Drasho, he's been playing a bunch of Weaver, a bunch of CK. And then later on the draft, this Alk gets banned. It has to be a perfect Razor game. I think Drasho's heroes has been very key for Gaming Gladiator's success here, and Team Spirit's really focusing it down. This opening pick from Gaming Gliders, we've seen quite a lot. It's been respect banned against them a ton of games in this tournament, but obviously at some point it will make its way through. Uh, this is not the first time they get to play it on the main stage, and you know, uh, that's that's usually what happens when teams get all the way to the Grand Finals, is they just have so many good strategies that you pick your poison, right? And you see here Ace with a 3-1 and one score line on the Primal Beast, and you know, Spirit probably feeling pretty good about breaking his zero loss streak on the lone druid. It was 4-0 before the last game. Uh, they took that one out. Now it's time to take out arguably maybe his second best hero of the tournament. Yeah, I think that just speaks to the confidence of Team Spirit. I think last game they left the Pangler in, they left the lone druid in. They will have something prepared for each of the heroes. Something to know is like, they've sort of been chilling for a bit, you know, they get to watch gliders play a lot of games. They're gonna have the time to develop a counter strat for each one of these picks. I think what Fear said was right on the mark, like making sure that Diracho doesn't play these aggressive carries and keeping off the Weaver and CK, it looks really good for him. So I think they'll continue to want to do the same line of thought, like just make sure that your um, Diracho's game's a bit sort of slowed down. Ooh. And this was definitely a change that they made in the draft. They decided to collapse Magnus. We'll let it through. They played it only one single time at this TI, and that was in their last series. And Collapse was an absolute madman in that series, doing what he was doing at TI10, just getting all the skewers in the world here. He didn't have the strongest early game, but I think if you do put this in the off lane, I, I, correct if I'm wrong, probably not the strongest off laner right now with the way he builds, but they played with a Shadow Demon last time. They just got a lot of stacks up, so maybe we can look for them to ban out the Shadow Demon so Mag doesn't have that recovery option. Yeah, Shadow Demon is one of the best heroes to counter Primal Bills. Primal, Primal Beast also is like, it's countering him on all stages of the game. Like, it doesn't let him get stacks. It's uh, cancelling his ulti. You can hide him. When he gets BKB, you hide your teammate. It's actually an amazing uh, hero against this. Uh, I think it's probably one of the best support counters to Primal. Is there anything else you think Gaiman are debating here that could be an even more important ban? Like, you know, the classic, if, if you haven't watched Dota for a bit, you're like, oh, Magnus, now there's going to be an Empower carry. Is there anything that is a really strong Empower carry that's also good against Primal? No, it's going to be the Shadow Demon, so right on point there. Um, what are you thinking for Spirit here? Are you saving your Tauros here until the very end, or is there something valuable you could grab now against the Primal? And on top of that, do you expect this to go offlane even? Quinn has played Primal as well. Um, I would probably think they want to wait just because there is that potential of the flex. I think when you play with Magnus, you actually don't need to think about the Empower too much. For example, if you play some PA with Magnus, usually you actually still buy the Battle Fury just because Dota's... There's just a lot of camps. You don't want to make one of your other cores run to another core in order to just to empower you. I think right now they should think that they've given the Primal Beast. Right now they need something that does enough damage to kill it. I think probably... Do you know if AA was banned last game or is it just unpicked on banned? I, I think that's sort of rare for this tournament, honestly. I think it was picked and banned pretty much first phase in like most of the other games I've seen. I think they could look at something like AA. You see Phoenix is already out and um, the Shadow Demon's out. So I think they want to make sure that they get a support who can deal with this Primal. A, a looks pretty interesting, like, um, but it's all also need a good partner on lane because it's not the strongest laner, I guess, on uh, easy lane. But Meposhka plays it uh, very, very good, like on next level. Enchantress. That's a five that is strong in lane, I've heard. Um, are you going to do a cringy mid? We're going to cringe the mid this one with Enchantress for sure. This is one of Makosha's like, signature heroes. He's really good at this. And I think when you do play a hero like Magnus, who will take a little more time, might be a little bit slower, having that early game pressure 
can help a lot and we'll have to see like I believe Varl probably still can play the Magnus if they want to go that route but normally when you do see it on Spirit you'll have to automatically think collapse but will game and also automatically think collapse as well or are they gonna respect it and think that it could be a potential mid laner. Yeah, I think Enchant is also one of the supports that eventually you're actually the one who could kill the tanky heroes. In the post where he pretty much always plays for the Hurricane Pike plus um, Moon Shard and BKB. Like I saw Southside Seller, he's playing for like the Solar Crest Pipe, but I usually don't see him in post go, go for that type of build. Something interesting to that point is we've, uh, I was reading over a breakdown of team farm distribution and for team spirit, I think Maposhka has a higher average gold per game than Mira does, right? So they're, it's clearly by design that they're giving uh, Maposhka a lot of space in the game as a position five. And obviously this, as you guys pointed out, can turn into a carry. Do you think there's like a specific type of four that is perfect for that mindset? That, okay, if Ench needs to take some space at some point in the game and get strong, this is the type of four you want to pair it with? Or is it kind of not really that relevant and you're just counterpicking specific heroes rather than making a duo? I think it's mostly mirror playstyle, like uh, we both share the responsibilities of 4 and 5 in a way, so it kind of looks like we're both playing 4 and 5 and even sharing warding uh, a lot of times, so I think any hero Mira is going to play is going to fit with role. Yeah, and I think Mira in general, he just likes to play the damage that just follows up, he plays a lot of Dark Willow, um, he plays the Phoenix as well with the Grimstroke, Skywrath, these types of heroes that don't farm very fast, but they do go for kills, and of course Enchantress, you know how fast this hero can farm as well, so Boshka just gets more gold by nature of the heroes he plays, but I do like how Gaming Gladiators, they're sticking to their guns quite literally here with the Morta yet again for Tofu here, and I like this combination a lot with the Nature's Prophet as well, you just come in, you sprout them, you get a free dead shot target on the sprout, and you just push them back, so a lot of synergy there. Do you think there is going to be the necessity for Nature's Prophet maybe even to rotate? Like, how does this lane matchup go between what we're assuming is a five position edge playing in the safe lane versus a four where to off lane? Is that, is that one of the matchups that Muerta will struggle in or can she hold her own? I think it's a pretty stable lane for Muerta. It always depends a little bit for Ench. There's a little bit of element of RNG. Sometimes you want the hard camp to spawn even if you're playing against Ench because you think you can control the side, but then it spawns Wildkins and you're just like, oh, I guess I lost the lane. <laughs> but I think especially with a Faces Void, who's like a more stable laner that you don't harass as much, you can actually use this to your advantage on the Morta side. I think most likely this is going to be Ace Primal. If you have Morta and Primal Beast together, you can, like, um, Poshka has to be really careful on the Ench. He can get 100 to 0 really quickly in the lane. And there's the Grimstroke that you were mentioning, Fear coming out. Yeah, be expected on Mira. Great yeah. partner for Magnus. And overall, it's a pretty good hero against Primal Beast too. Overall, uh, Void and Magnus is one of the best like partners. Uh, and uh, this, this is looking scary if it's, the game get delayed a bit, because we have insane amount of Aoi BKB control. Aoi. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if you're gaming gladiators here, if you're fitting the bill of like needing a Duracho as hero, the hero that kind of stands out the most that they're successful with this would be an Alchemist around this point. And a lot of the other heroes that he might want to go for, like the Razor, you're not going to pick that versus Faceless Void. Potentially, if they want to, it could be an okay Wraith King game to carry. It would be a bit faster, so... I really like the Wraith King, actually. I think it'd be really stable in lane. Right now, I think they should want something that they can leave alone in the safe lane. If you have the Wraith King in the safe lane, even if your lane starts to go slightly bad, you can just go to the bad camps, and this allows Fearon to make the plays. I think right now, their number one priority is making sure that their supports are freed up to rotate onto mid. Will this fit the bill, though, for how Duracho has been playing in your face, hitting these really fast timings and running at you? Definitely the same style as, like, an Alchemist, but probably comes on a little bit slower because you don't get that blink as early. But if he has a good laning stage, it could do what they need him to do. Are we getting a little bit ahead of, ahead of ourselves here? Is this guaranteed to be carry Wraith King? We're seeing Gaming Gladiators no, it's the not. off lane and they could put the primal mid. I feel like the flex is still there. Uh, what would you guys rather like to see if it was if you were in their shoes right now? Do you think the Wraith King 1 or the 3 fits the bill better here? Uh, I'd be really happy with the Primal Beast on 3 and Wraith King on 1, but they definitely could do it. They could switch it up if they... Even like at the end of the draft, they could pick another hero that's flexible to another role and just keep Spirit guessing. It wouldn't be a bad idea, I think. Personally though, like the only other hero I can see sort of slotting into the safe lane would be the Alchemist that Fear mentioned. And I'm not too sure like if he does that job better than Wraith King. I think he's a bit more susceptible. They did manage. Pressure. So they okay. are keeping So they are thinking that it can be an offline Wraith King in mid-primal. Yeah, we can still uh, pick uh, a carry hero too, but uh, we are not really flexing that much because last pick is still on Team Spirit. I'm just looking at what carry heroes are left that 
if they get banned here, that's going to be good versus Void. Is Wraith King going to be the most punishing hero for a faceless Void in the laning stage as well? These are all the decisions that they need to come up with, because Wraith King is already really greedy if it's an offlaner, which would give you more space technically as a carry to make things happen, but a lot of the good ones that can be faster are probably just going to get removed. This is quite a rare sight in the last phase, right? To see a team ban one carry and one offlaner. I think most of the time you kind of commit to the one idea, okay, this is the biggest threat, is that they put the heroes in this way. But the way Spirit seems to be approaching this is these are the two specific heroes that cause the most problem for our Faceless Void, it seems like. Um, do you guys think this Lone Droid ban would have been, or this Lone Droid would have been a really big problem for their safe lane to deal with? I feel like that should have been a Spectre, maybe, to be honest with you. Yeah, I also watching a Spectre, and I felt to, even to point it out, like it, uh, it, it might give the tempo what we needed because this hero now like is really really aggressive and it cannot add up to the fury on global pressure can't really get chronoed either right like if magnus initiations kind of get ruined by this hero it's a little bit different you don't have the global until you get the agonims but it's still whenever you think about playing versus a faces void you want to play a hero that just doesn't show up to the fights with illusions or has two lives or can just have infinite jump from like anywhere on the map so that could be a good choice if they do want to put this primal into the mid lane these actually are two pretty decent mid bands for primal as well both necromos and the Volker i think have pretty good matchups for some so i think they might be looking to get a new parry here just the Invoker ban protecting against the EMP for the Wraith King regardless of role. I think it, it's, it's there, of course. Okay, more flame. Oh. Well, this hero is like pretty decent in lane versus Magnus because you can match his humongous base damage. There's really no kill threat as well with a Magnus against the Morphling, so that does help a lot. And of course, the attribute shift will help if you get Chronosphered. But this hero is slow, and this is not how Gaiman has been winning most of their games by Duracho just sitting back and hitting timings. They've been in your face, so it looks like Gaiman's adapting to the series. They might sort of have a read, because they have a Furin versus Grimstroke, which I think is a very favorable support. <laughs> Coming to <laughs> the circle here. Um, but I think if Morphling wins his lane, then he can actually be a hero that's sort of impossible to kill on the map, and he's actually pressuring a safe lane, but you have to win your lane in order for that to happen. Uh, I believe this matchup, the Morphling against Magnus, was the exact one that Spirit played against LGD in the upper bracket. Is that correct? I think that was how they tried to solve yes, the nothing to say Magnus. Yeah. Do you think the conditions here are equally good? Obviously, Spirit did come out ahead in that game with your Toro on the Morph. Uh, or is there something to be worried about for Duracho? It's a different type of game, I would say, because in the last game, like, Collapse was playing CK, just crushing the lanes, which allowed Yatoro to get the farm. And Spirit has proven that in late game, they're that type of team to take it. All right, that is, uh, that's going to conclude the draft for us here. We are going to go over to a coach interview with CY from Gaming Gladiators. Thank you very much. Yes, I am joined by CY of Gaming Gladiators. A tough game one, but whenever these post-game discussions happen, you're obviously being able to say everything that we see, the entire game. Your players only have half the information. So whenever you're debriefing, do you spend much time telling them this is why things went wrong based off of all the information I have? Or do you mainly focus on, forget about it, here's what we're going to do for game two? Uh, it depends a bit. Sometimes you need to readjust like, um, how you value certain heroes, for example, in the draft. But it also depends a bit on lanes. Let's say the lanes go bad. Okay, it's reset, go next game, right? You don't want to be too affected by it. It also depends, like, this tournament I can hear the communication. So I can hear it's like chill still, like we're like, not stressed or anything like that. So I don't really need to do any work in that regard. So I kind of consider what I have to say and what I don't have to say, and then take it from there. How about the lanes for this game? We got good expectations on how the first seven minutes are going to go for you? I have good expectations. So uh, I hope my boys can live up to it. I hope you guys are up for it also, because we're getting ready for game number two. This game needs to start off very well for Gaming Gladiators because while this may be a best of five, this game too feels particularly important, Avery. I mean, last game, Spirit, they took your best trait, your speed, took it away from you and turned it right back around. They ended that game so fast. And this time, they're going to take the late game and the scale, right? Mm -hmm. Void Magnus. Love this is a lineup that is very happy Love to go into that late game. And particularly when you have Yatoro in the reins of the Spaces Void, it is a fearsome beast. This is a strat that goes all the way back to, I remember, TI6, TI5 era, where people were developing the Magnus. Wings Gaming were a team that took this strat all the way to the Grand Finals. We're happy to play this Magnus with the Void, particularly on Shadow. So this is a throwback for me being back in Seattle, seeing this once more on the main stage here. We're going to see what Team Spirit can do to get to that late game once again against Gaming, who 
have continually punished teams for the greed, for the slowness, for the uh, willingness to go to 60 to 70 minutes. They just don't want to let you get there. But here they've gone for kind of a, a hybrid draft, right? Going for Morphling in their own hands on Duraccio, a hero he is perhaps more infamous more than f infamous more than for than famous for yeah. in some sense. Well, I mean, a uh, the right kind of performance on a TI final, that could change the entire narrative about his Morphling. Uh, he's going to try and do just that by taking away and taking down Yatoro's Faceless Void. But there's also some no other notable heroes. I feel like we focused a lot on Yatoro in that last game for a good reason. He had a monster performance. But there's also some other big ones here for Team Spirit. I'm looking at that Moposhka Enchantress, man. I feel oh, like this is one. Enchantress and Chen's. They are really scary in this current meta, even if we don't see them all the time. I mean, we saw the way that Chen worked for Game of Gladiators, and Moposhka is going to try and make that Enchantress work for the laning phase. Enchantress is a hero both these teams really highly value and contest. It's a hero that's been banned against game a lot, so they opted to take it away here. It's also a hero that can deal pretty well with Primal Beast in those mid-games with the Enchant ruining his charge in. I don't know, when I saw that Inch come out, it, it gave them the tempo they needed with a Magnus opener to feel really good about it, so they just don't fall behind too much on the lanes. And a quick little body block to push it under the tower here to try and secure the Equilibrium. Very heads-up play. Duraccio read it, got a block of his own, and it will end up outside the tower, so... Nice heads up play by Duraccio to counteract that as they're going to start three top. Maybe looking for a cheeky kill on the Furion who's TP up here. Yeah, that would actually be uh, an interesting idea, but they quickly abandoned that. <laughs> Celery waves goodbye to the Enchantress as Poposhka heads back down to that bottom lane, which is going to be Ace and Tofu in the Muerta plus Wraith King, the double undead hero against the Faceless Void of Yutoro. And this that is dangerous. A, a very deadly lane as well. We've seen a lot of like the Raid King Dark Willow come back. That was a yep. classic a couple TIs ago. Raid King Morta equally as strong. You get the insta stun into silence, into dead shot pushes you back in. Your attack speed so you can't fight. Skeletons are hitting you. What did you expect? Very high kill threat on this lane and a lot of pushing power if you start to run away with it. So this is an off lane for Gaiman. They want to go very well. They want Ace to drive the tempo and the objective control of the game, which is something he didn't get to do last time because Team Spear brought the gank parade to him, right? So that's a big question as well. Do Spirit decide to commit the same resource into shutting Ace down this time around? And does that just inadvertently free up more room for Duraccio on a hero that I feel like has a better time this game than the Gyro did in that last one? Mm. It's a stronger hero in the meta and there it is. decent matchups and, yep, already on the board. Yeah, you said this combo is deadly. Any sort of four position that can output some good damage off that Rayfire Blast. You got to be careful if you're a support in lane. Gaming Gladiators will find the opening kill. And this early game is going to be a question for game in, in terms of how much they get out of it. Because they have the Fury on the can TP, accelerate the lane ganks. They have a Primal Beast who can just gobble up runes, gank side lanes very early. He is the king of it. Maybe not a hero we've seen Quinn play a lot, but one he has practiced very well in pubs recently and is very comfortable on. So this could be an incredibly fast early game just in terms of the gank potential, not necessarily just taking your towers. Which is also a reason if that Wraith King lane goes really well for gaming, it's a lane they can easily rotate to. Because again, the kill threat is so damn high. The heal, too much, and now they're going to turn back around with the Nature's Attendance leveled up. And Ace will take a bit of damage as he heads back in, but Yutoro doesn't want to miss his CS. Right now, lanes are going pretty well for, uh, despite that early first blood, we got uh, the Pango taking the top spot on the CS chart. Nice dead shot. See how much Laurel can do with this. It was kind of a quiet Pango game last time around, right? I, I think Quinn was struggling to, to find his openings. And if this is a hero you can get to play your tempo game to control the runes, combat where Quinn wants to go with the final beast. You can definitely turn some of those ganks around. I think that's what Laurel's looking more more than being the aggressor, right? I, I think him just going in these lanes is going to be difficult because you don't have a lot of damage fall. But if game and overextend dive you under one of these side lane tier ones, then suddenly the Pango can come in with a counter gank and the rolling thunder and turn things around. You're really happy with that type of gameplay here because again, you're farming it up. You got Magnus Faceless Void. You know game and are going to go into you. This is a hard duo to match up against. You throw that ink swell on the Magnus. He pulls you closer with the shockwave. You get hit by the stun. And then that stun leads into a free skewer back. So even underneath your tower, you are not safe. And the Grim Shark could be really nice this game as well. Just throwing it on these cores that want to jump in, and get the extra, you know, debuff them out, reset the, the fight or the primal. These types of interactions could help them take the team fights in the mid game when they're likely going to be behind a little bit in terms of the speed, right? Because Gaiman are pulling a decent position out in terms of the laning phase here. 
doing pretty well on their cores in terms of CS. They gave him the Harpy. That's going to make a big difference in this bottom lane. He's going to die now, but does some decent economic damage. And he's got a small little Hellbear to work with, too. I mean, it's also just time. Time Yator gets to sit down here versus a lane that eventually will kick him out. Quinn amping up the pressure here. Has a little bit of an XP advantage, pushing this triple ranged wave in. I mean, this is this is pretty rare. You get three range creeps. He pushed into the tower. Lara will clean it all up. No roam coming in early here. Just way too high on the, the HP to make it look enticing. And of course, these side lanes, vital to your game plan. Still, he's just going to go for it. Here comes the rotation, though. Mira gives him the ink swell underneath the tower, but he stops him midway through the charge. And Quinn, caught underneath the tower, will die. Sometimes greed is good, and sometimes you get punished for it. Mira happy to counter that. Push Laurel ahead in the XP. Now you're going to have a Rolling Thunder. Oh, well what a before. sprout. Collapse. Cut down a tree, but he was still stuck on the corner there. Did have some stick charges to work with, though, and so he will survive for now. They wanted to be able to punish the fact that Mira had to TP into that mid lane, but couldn't quite finish the job. It's a game about pressure. Every time one of these supports makes a move, you need to create the pressure somewhere else. So the enemy just can't clump on you. Get the numbers. Your Toro gets pushed back into the silence. Oh, he time walks up. Now he's still kind of in a sticky spot here. Gaming Gladiators are going to try and run him down. Look at him throw the blood grenade. But oh. Oh, he'll make the difference. He's going to show up with that Rolling Thunder. Do manage to finish him up with the two supports. But Laurel, he'll be collecting some heads here. Uh, even the Wolf gets a couple oh. hits in. Stuck there on the corner, but that's okay. Yep. The Swashbuckle will finish the job. A lot of XP going into the Pango and the Inch down here. Yatoro. A little sad he died there and doesn't get it for himself, but I mean, that's sometimes the life of a Faceless Void versus a lineup that is going to pressure you, is going to go for that kill. And if it was a lot cleaner, maybe Gaming can just walk that off. But Team Spirit, they get the rotation in. Suddenly, his Pango's having a terrific game off of that in the turnaround mid. And those are those counter turns that Laurel's looking for, right? Yep. Force the Ray King in, force this Morphling into an aggressive situation. Maybe Quinn dives you, and that's when you get the strike here. Arcane Rune picked up for Quinn. This is a really nice rune on the hero. CFC uh, pops it here to try and deal with Mira. The silence is going to last a while. Can he get it? Yes. Quinn, very fast with the trigger there. Does manage to get him collapsed. Going to try and dissuade Quinn of that notion. And he does manage to do so successfully, keeping him off his support. And the quelling, saving Mira at the end from the sprout. So value pickup already for him. Arcane Rune still in the bottle. So Quinn can still look for a rotation off this. And he probably wants to. I mean, his early game is getting a little slow here. And you have threat on the sidelines, right? And this is where the Primal Beast strikes really hard, really fast, gets momentum going for the team. That's your theoretical ideal. You just shove in mid, make the move. Wisdom Rune. There is a Furion. There is. There's always the opportunity of the Celery to try and make a move, but I feel like the teams have been really good at pro protecting their Wisdom Runes against invasions, particularly against the Nature's Prophet. More times than not, it seems like Nature's Prophet tries to make that kind of move. He just walks into a trap. Just a hard gamble. You use your teleport for that, you're dead on the map for 60 seconds, and your chances to get it should be minimal in a TI Grand oh. Final, I want to say. Yeah. Good D ward there. Now that'll help because Quinn wants to be able to make moves, particularly with this Arcane Rune, which he's going to put to use now. Caught a mid-shield crash. So that ability no longer there with the two support rotations. It's easy to kill Laurel. Exactly what they're looking for. Combine the Calling Deadshot with this Primal Beast. Anybody goes down to it at this point. And this is where you want to ramp up the speed. Start getting the map in a position where you can just guarantee the power runes for Quinn and get the connections going and hopefully lead to like jungle invasion, right? Because the one thing you have to think about with the Magnus is the stacks. And if their carry just gets to sit in triangle and double ancients and clear through them at that point in time, the earlier you take down these tier ones, the earlier you get aggressive obs out, the happier you're going to be when that period comes. Another power rune should be secure from Quinn here. Oh, these runes are getting a little crazy. Uh, oh, that skewer plays against Collapse as he does a ton of damage onto himself thanks to the trample from Quinn. Blocked out by his own sprout, though. He's going to try and get to the other side of this cliff. Laurel does hop down to chase after him, though. Laurel showing the power of a non-real hero in his hands as he will take that rune away from Quinn. No haste. I mean, that that's one of those situations you almost rather take the haste rune. It's so damn good on your hero. Collapse will suicide himself to take Quinn out in the process. Yeah, kind of have to be careful with those skewers against the Primal Beast. That kind of movement and could be deadly. Look at this. Just a quick rotation from the supports. Power of Enchantress. Early creep takes down two-thirds of this tier one mid. Yeah. Didn't even feel like that was a real move, but they still got a lot of this tier one tower damage out from it. Once again, it's Gaiman responding to some early objective pressure. The whole time this is happening, 
It's also space on the side lanes, which means the Toro got to catch up a bit. He's not the one getting ganked or killed by the calling here. Very happy with that. Ace not able to force him off lane yet. However, Gaiman doing a bit of stacking of their own, and maybe that's something they took out of that game one, right? Like, you go in game one, you try and run Spirit over. Instead, they run you over. Okay, this is not a team we're going to beat in 20 minutes. Not a team we're going to beat in 25. Maybe we go back to some of our other tricks, other things up our sleeve, like the efficiency on the map. Yeah. This is a team that has stacked their whole way through the season. Going back to it now when it matters. That particular, particular strength of Western Europe in general. So, I love those DPC matches throughout the year. Stacking was a big factor for all of those teams. Ace, he does have the reincarnation here, but it looks like Team Spirit want to try and burn it away from him. The Skeletons will push back, though. But well, brother does chase away. Brother against brother here. Whose Skeletons are better? Well, right now, it's going to be Gwyn trying to jump in, but immediately stopped by Laurel. Once again, with the counter initiation, Gwyn's trying to get out of here, but he's going to be caught. The Inkswell plus the Sans is going to try and trample his way over the left-hand side, and he is slowed down, pulled back in by Collapse, though. Oh, and Acronos here actually locking away these two other cores Are right in fighting? front of this tower. Seller is trying to stop him now as they turn back around on Ace, trying to finish him up. There goes that reincarnation. Duraccio doesn't have much mana to work with, and on the fresh life, Ace is going to be pulled back underneath that tower again, just like Quinn. They are in trouble well. now. Duraccio is under this one as well, surrounded by five heroes. He's going to start desperately morphing in his strength and try and wait for him over the left-hand side, but with all of this damage, he just cannot get far enough away. Game and Gladiators will lose all three of their cores, and that attempt at a fight at bottom lane. That is the danger of making an aggressive move into this Pangolier Grimstroke. The turnaround potential is just so damn high, and time dilation absolutely ruined Duraccio as he goes in that engagement, gets time dilated, can't do anything for the rest of the fight. And of course, Quinn, he ate the big ults, still trying to make something happen in this early game with a, a very aggressive mid that can do it, but he's just struggling. His heroes have been too tanky for him to bring down alone, and. The combinations, they haven't been exactly on point for gaming. This will give a really nice bump to Laurel, who is just feasting on these early game fights. It's going to be a very fast Pangolier defusal in this game. And these are some heroes that are susceptible to mana burn, right? You're looking oh, yeah. at two strength cores and a Morphling that also doesn't like his mana getting burned with an early defusal. Back to clearing some stacks, and that worth still looking pretty good for gaming, but the fights... Fights are just not going their way. Particularly when you know the Wraith King wants to rush this Radiance as quick as possible, we, which means an Ag Shard, he really doesn't want to have to buy that until at least after the Radiance. There's definitely a timing here where this Pango could punish Ace heavily. Especially since it's just done. This is 1130 Arcane Booth Defusal. This is crazy fast. In a game where they maybe expected Laurel to not have the freest time. Right. Up against the Primal Beast yeah. with a Furion who can rotate. They're supposed to shut him out early, win that lane, and then later on to the game, as a Primal Beast, you could just BKB and grab the Rolling Thunder ball and stop it immediately, right? And look what's waiting for him. Some good old stacks for the mag lineup. This is another downside of Gaiman not securing those early team fight wins. You can't invade enemy side of the map this early, and Laurel's just going to clear through it all. Diffusal going to help him. He's so big right now. He's got a shield rune to boot. So they're going to be looking to take a fight. It's also going to be the blink timing for Collapse. He's going to finish this off, off the stack. Just rush it out here. Look for a big blink RP skewer on a core. Continue to slow the pace down here. Spear are going to be happy to use their ults for big core kills. So the question on game inside is what do you do when those ults are on cooldown, right? How much can you get off the map? How much can you push the lanes and look for kills? Quinn once more looking for something to get his game going here. Just can't find anything. Good read by Maposhka, dipping away into the trees there, out of sight from Quinn. And as a result, that's going to be yet another rotation that fails. One way or another, Gaming Gladiators, whether it's running into a five stack of Team Spirits and they lose the fight, or the smoke's just not working out for them, so much of their early aggression with this Primal Beast has been completely stymied, and now Team Spirits are sitting in a pretty happy position, I would say. The net worth is dead, even. But it does feel like Team Spirit have answered Gaming Gladiators and all the moves they wanted to make early. I mean, there's a lot of Magnus teams over the history. To, I think all of them will say, if you are even at the 15 minute mark with a mag lineup, you're winning the game. Like, you're happy because you know this game is going to get extended. You're going to outfarm the enemy. You're going to, in theory, outscale them. Now, a lot can happen in those fights. And this lineup from Gaming can scale very hard. We've seen Primal Beast go very deep. In these later games, one stun, and follow up silence. Of course, too many heroes. That yes. can also happen. 
Yeah, this is the move the Game of Gladiators, they, they were trying to play off this, being able to get numbers movement, right? Like the Primal Beast and the Nature's Prophet offer so much mobility around the map. They should be able to outnumber Team Spirit and find openings like that. It's what Celery wants to do for sure. Every time you get one of these pickoffs with the Fear on, you get to farm their side of the map. You get deep wards up. It's going to set up for your next play. And then your economy is just going to explode. And you get some extra items on this Fury, and he can control the fight. The Ag's very good this game with the Root and Disarm, right? This is a great Fury on Ag's game. Yeah. Wrath of Nature's going to do some mad work here. If he can get anything else to help his team survive in the Chrono, in the RP, Celery's going to be a force to be reckoned with, and he can continue to shove these waves in as well. As Spirit continue to play this game slow, continue to farm up Laurel with their Empower going to work. But that is a successful move for Game in, in a period where Collapse didn't really find that opening with the Blink. We'll have to settle for some farm. Find an interesting note, there's just no hand of Midas's in this game. Wraith King, Faceless Void, both heroes that have bought it throughout this tournament sometimes, but feels like as the tournament's gone on, particularly probably because the way the game of Gladiators has stomped through some games, uh, there are teams who've been a bit wary about picking up that greedy item. I mean, Midas is a crutch item, let's be honest. Mm. Now, Midas, Midas is an item for, you know, the bottom 14 teams. It's not really a grand <laughs> finals item, you know. You gotta, yeah. If you're worthy of a true Pantheon, then you don't need the extra TPM. You're gonna collect it off your enemies here. See, that is what... can can do that. He's still trying to find something with this blink, or maybe he's just happy empowering his other cores and letting them take the bulk of the net worth. Yatoro still pretty much untouched during this period. He's just going Mask of Manus into the Maelstrom, empower on top of it. I mean, this Void is going to keep up and farm, even with a Radiant Skeleton King. Am I allowed to say that? Farming up the entire map. <laughs> <laughs> he will match him. Oh, Laurel? It's essentially there to grab him. Mira can stop some of this, though. Throws out in silence. Thinks well. Oh, so much burst damage, though. Celery hit him big with that one. He got up the shield crash, though. No way. And those shields are keeping him alive. They need a bit more damage, but now he's teeping away. Goodbye. Oh, no. Gaming Gladiator's got to feel so bad about that. A pickoff on Laurel, the highest net worth in this game, would have been a dream opening for them. And that was one of the few openings you'll have against this guy because he is closing in on the Lincolns fast. Just not crisp enough. Laurel walks it off. I think he even misclicked his swashbuckle there. Dratio on the edge of the Chronosphere. Now that's an idea. Team Spirit said, oh, you used all those resources. Bottom lane, huh? It'd be a shame if your carry got picked off, wouldn't it? A heavy cost indeed to missing this gank. As Laurel just plays with his food and... They're going to put those ults to use on Dorachio every time. Anytime you can just collect the Morphling in this game, you're super happy about it. Gatoro will just continue to farm. Says, give me the freebie and back to the jungle. It's coming down to Ace right now, right? I mean, it feels like it comes down to Ace in a lot of Gaiman's games, but... Yeah. Particularly right now, he's the strongest hero on the map. He can create the pressure. He can do things like this where he can just solo create an opportunity. They're going to find both supports. Uh, Ace will walk it off. Yeah, he's got to back away. He showed so many heroes up there killing Moposhka earlier. Moposhka, again, continued to play very aggressively. I mean, the Tree Protector, he was on Game and Gladiator side of the map all the time because he was invisible, but this Enchantress seems to have a similar game plan. He's going to be playing up in Game and Gladiator's face, and that does, even if it costs him a death every once in a while, it does create information and space for his cores. Particularly when the Chrono and the RP are down. Yeah. This is where Gaiman can pretty much run the game to the map, choose which objective they want, and claim it for free. There's no way you're fighting them without those big ults off cooldown or without collapse being stronger skewer on skewer play you're coming with me you're up, up into the tp point from quinn collapse as long as he keeps the damage on him he's not going to be able to blink away and quinn will finish the job great move from duraccio those are the kind of plays you need to see here if you want to be able to take down the best team at this tournament you need to be able to pull off some solar moves like that. And create the pressure that's going to create openings elsewhere. And suddenly, yeah. Duraccio, this stolen in power is pretty damn nice. He can throw it on the, the Ray King. He can throw it on the Primal, especially bonus damage on Primal. Quinn is going to be very happy with that. That is something we can see in a lot of these fights. Probably going to be the best deal for Duraccio outside of maybe time dilation thrown back against Team Spirit or just creating his own Grimstroke combination. 
These are good Morphling combos you can use for the fights and the team. Quinn starting to pick up the pace and instantly silenced and a beautiful soul bite. And now it ink swelled up. Pinball coming through straight into the heart of Gaming Gladiators. Dorachi has already burned out of most of his mana. Pops his wand, but Dorachi, he needs to be able to get away from out both Paul and Yotoro. And he's been burned out. No chance there. Gaming Gladiators still have a chance, though, to be able to fight back around Ace and his Radiance. But without their carry, it's not looking great as Ace is going to be burned out of his first life. Can they fight around the second one? Quinn sticking around. They certainly don't want to be giving up ace like this. Here's Toro. shot back. Coming up in two seconds here. Yeah, yeah Toro says, my cooldown's back. Can push this. Just not enough reach. Not necessary, really, for Team Spirit, right? No, no reason to give them an opportunity like that. You could stretch out, claim all of this map space you've just fought for, and farm away. Now, I do think this late game is not 100% right. Like, we're talking about okay. Mag Void. It is very powerful. You're yes. going to get some pickoffs like this for sure, and then Power is going to clean up the map. But there's, like, some weird things that can happen with Wraith King Ags. There's, there's some weird things that happen if Dorachu gets a free angle in the fight and can, like, clean up the backline with Morphling first, empower himself, you know, Grimstroke Swell himself. Yep. It's going to be Tier 1 down in the bottom lane as Laurel marches forward confidently with his Lincolns because what's really going to catch him? It feels like he's most of the time going to have a chance to be able to escape if Gaming Gladiators ever try and jump him here. That's a really fast Lincolns as well. This is Mag Pango in its prime. I think a hero that is not afraid to fight off cooldown. They're really going to try the Tormentor right in front of Gaming Gladiators base. That is crazy, but they just did it. Four heroes, that's all they needed. Meanwhile, Celery being gone on by Yutoro. He and just gets a bit of a poke, gets a reaction out of Gaming Gladiators. Ace will try and punish him, but... Just no follow-up. Yeah, he needs a lot more. Celery's going to try and chase up. The TPs are coming in here, tries to block him out with the Sprout, but Yutoro is running free. Dorachio chases after him, hits him with a time this dilation, really though. Forced. But it is a very, very good move from Dorachio, but he gets it. He gets that kill. No, turns back around on the Collapse. Oh, RP'd right in front of that Tier 2, but Silence up just in the nick of time before his skewer comes through. he wants more. Yeah, he does. He sees the opportunity. What a beautiful entrance from Dorachio into this game. That is the power of stolen time dilation plus the time walk, right? Infinite chase potential. Suddenly, Faceless Void can't do the same back, and Dorachio says, two can play attack game, Yatoro. I can get aggressive, too, and make it work. Just creates an opening out of nothing there off a chase that felt, you know, like, what is Ace doing here? He's wasting his time? Not at all. Everything coming together, gonna propel Celery up that board as well. Imagine you have that Ag's Wrath of Nature here, right? Suddenly, chases like this become a lot easier. Oh, yeah. And Yatoro, he's just still looking for that big dispel item. His choice will be Manta first over the BKB, but until that's out, Dorachio has a decent opening in these fights, and you got the RP out of that. Yeah, it actually just leads Gaming Gladiators into more opportunities, perhaps. That Ags, finish for Celery if you can fly it out. Okay. That is something that can bounce through, lock these heroes down, create more openings for the Wraith King Primal to just get in there and set up that front line. Second Tormentor will go Team Spirit's way with the Shard. So now they've got a Shard on both of their supports. That's pretty funny. I think that the Mirror One, Grimstroke, uh, that's so much better for them. Hard Dispel to be able to help save this Pango or this Faceless Void when they need it most. But maybe there's just too much firepower some of these times. As you can see from Gaming Gladiators when their cores start linking up, and they're picking up the pace now. Dorachio, he's just swarming forward, seeing if there's anybody else to be able to catch deep on Team Spirit's side of the map. And this is the part where Team Spirit needs to be able to slow down the game. The momentum is beginning to play against them. This is where the map becomes difficult. You have Skeleton shoving in one wave, you have Wrath of Nature pushing all the lanes. The Morphling's not afraid to show right now. He has Mant Illusions on top of it. And the Primal, if he's in the fog, it creates a scary situation with the pickoff potential. They're just getting more information than Team Spirit right now. There are still very deep Observer Wards that the Potion got out, but you can't really get there and use them. And they're not scouting anything right now as everybody's on top of him. Yeah, that, uh, that shard is pretty helpful when it comes to the Sprouts, but it may not save him from this since he's going to be surrounded. He'll create a little bit more time, a little bit more space. In fact, he's going to go for the TP away, and there it is. Okay. They do manage to stop that. That would have hurt Gaming Gladiators a lot if they let him get away from that. Solid space, I'm sure is what he'll say. Yeah, absolutely. Time to try and get to the Dispel item on Yatoro as Collapse will finish Harpoon. So he can't really deal with time dilation in the fight if it comes out. This is a very aggressive item. He can lock people down, guarantee the skewer better. But if the fight starts on him, could backfire. 
And Quinn's still working towards that heart. So, Gaiman looking for the next big damage items that are going to let them ramp this game up. And, of course, Ace still sitting top and pretty here. He's the big objective driver, so if he decides that they need to force Tier 2, go for Roshan, where they want to fight and how, it's up to Ace right now as he is the front line. Yatoro calling for a smoke, looking for some kind of pickoff here. Just they get not the a lot of right vision. kind of opening, they could translate this into a quick roast take. Exactly. But They're looking at the corner of the map, so anybody that dies down here, Yatoro's instantly going to go in the pit. He might just do it anyway. Yeah. Gaming Gladiators say they look inside, see if uh, it's actually Gaming who's taking that Roshan. That's going to be pretty tough to deal with you, Toro, with that shard, jumping around with Inkswell on top of him. So even if you catch him midway through his time walk and stop him from leaping back into play, there is that Dispel that can come out. That's why you want to create a situation where he has to choose between Chrono in the front line in the Heart Primal or, you know, the Wraith King with two lives. Oh, if they make or this not. move fast enough, it could be massive for Gaming Gladiators. They have a double damage in Morphling's bottle. Oh, if they can get close. to this fight in time, Team Spirit may get wiped and lose the Roshan fight, and they are not doing this fast enough. Gaming Gladiators are going to get here, and it looks like Team Spirit have made the right read. They're going to smoke, backing themselves away. See if they can find the opening on Gaming Gladiators oh, instead. Has position, but there's a war. position on the high ground. BKB immediately goes out. Now he has to turn and chase, but he's not going to be close enough. Team Spirit got something big out that of him. Route, but they do they hit a wall. That's going to be able to hit all those heroes. The RP does manage to lock down the two heroes. They jumped into the RP. Duraju dies immediately. Oh, he's going to have to do all the damage from here on out, but the Rolling Thunder is dangerous. It slows him down with the bashes, and the Rolling Thunder hits, and there's no chance. And now now they leave Quinn. Yeah, trap him inside that chronosphere. His BKB is gone. Get the rest. Oh, it's Game and Gladiators who had an opportunity there to be able to upset. But now, just what they feared the most, which was losing a fight and giving the Roshan to Team Spirit. That may have just occurred. It's going to switch the sides. So they're going to have to run up top. They might not have enough time before Game and respond. I mean, you got to remember, they can TP to this dire outpost up here as well if they still have them off cooldown. But damn, what a heads up RP from Collapse. That is a team fight salvaging RP as the Wrath of Nature just got them all on the backside. And Dilation was thrown out early here. So right there, it goes on Quinn, but that opens the fight for Duraccio by a decent margin. Just didn't, I don't know. I mean, he just RP'd him. <laughs> There's no way around it. Yeah, they Go only had one stun to work with. Duraccio just makes a complete misread of the situation there. Maybe thought the stun was going to latch and be longer, but there's a lot of bailout here. And the second that goes wrong on the Morphling, this fight's just completely over. Yatoro's going to clean house. You cannot give too many of these openings. The upside, though, like we said, is this Roshan switch sides and the respawn timers were not too long here. So Dire side going to work for Gaiman as they come back into this map and stall out the Roche a second time, I think you just man up for it here because you know RP and Chrono are on cooldown. Yeah, 100%. And Team Spirit, I mean, it would be a pretty bold move to try and take this fight without their ultimates. No, they're just looking for the pickoff. They're not going to find it, clear the wave, but this contest, it's all on Laurel with Rolling Thunder. Maybe they can take oh, the fight afterwards. He, uh, he's thinking about going in with this Inkswell. He tries to jump in, see if they can get the skewer pickoff. No such luck. Gaming Gladiators retreat very defensively after claiming that Aegis. They know Team Spirit are bold enough to make a move like that. They respect it. They'll back away. Duraccio will try and get his farm into the Silver Edge, which is a great way to be able to find some of those backline heroes. I mean, I think that, that Grimstroke is a big problem for them. It is. The Link and the Dispel off the Swell are both really nice here, especially when you just throw the Cell onto the Faceless Void or the Magnus. They get a free jump, and if they get stunned, you just bail them out, right? Yep. I think we're going to see that the whole game. It's going to make sure that both Collapse and Yatoro can hold their BKBs or the Mantha for as long as they want here, and Mira can bail them out. Of course, you can also just throw it on the Pango and let them roll in. Yeah, speaking of the Pango, his item timing was definitely delayed quite a bit, but he's finally going to get there. He got that Lincoln's a while ago, but the Aghanim Scepter that he was looking for next will finally be complete. Right, Hurricane Pike for Mapochka. So the damage starting to heat up here for Spirit as they're going to spread it across four effective cores going into this late game. That is why they love the Enchantress. Mapochka is going to start to cause his own mischief in the fight. And that pushes the question back to Gaiman in terms of how are you scaling in this game, right? Because right now you have an Aegis, you have a Morphling pushing towards Silver Edge. Ace just hit his BKB timing here. And the heart is a couple hundred off for Quinn. So you have some really strong fighting items coming out all in the same interval here for Gaiman. You would really like a good team fight out of this, especially if the Chrono or the RP gets wasted. Or if you trade an Aegis for it, you might be okay with that in the long run you can at least find something on the backside. Because right now, you're looking at Yatoro. 
He has a Manta. That's it. He did not go for BKB on the Faceless Void this game. He's just hyping up the damage here, abusing the fact he has a power. Going to go for a later Lincoln Sphere, but it will be collapsed with that BKB. So it's a question of who do you want to start on? And maybe the Silver Edge is going to give Dorachio the option to put his aggression to use and just start on a support, start on a core, give the Vision for a Wraith King jump. Vision means everything here for Gladiators as they try and take these next few fights. Yeah, which means Moposhka is a particular nuisance to them. As he once again leads forward, just using the creep to be able to find information. They got the Harpy and Skewer back. Now he does have BKB locked down by the RP, but maybe the damage is going to be enough. It's going to be a close call. Quinn starts walking away. Celery's going to jump in with the Wrath of Nature. Soon coming out, he tries to use the Ogre Seal Totem to get away from the Rolling Thunder while they jump forward on Duraccio. They want to get something out of this. They see an opportunity, surely, but they couldn't actually grab anybody, just lacking the disables. Glimmer Cape posing problems for Duraccio as well. and just can't see anything to hit. And Team Spirit able to disengage after that Wrath of Nature rooted them all, which means Yatoro wants to go back He's in. got an opening here, looks for it with the Chronosphere. They were so grouped up on Gaming Gladiators, but he doesn't have the vision. He's now been grabbed. He's been time dilated. Disabled. They actually have that AoE. The calling goes out. He's on the other side. He actually gets away. Thanks well. Time walk undo so much of the damage. And now Gaming Gladiators have to play it a little bit slow. Have to respect that Soulbind. They cleanse themselves of the Ghost. That Silence is now gone. The Soulbind is away. Oh, Yatoro, though, he's still waiting for his opportunity to get that Chronos. got three. Out two, three, one in the back, two in the front, and that's going to be the Aegis down for the Morph, like a second life for both him and Ace, though. Can Yatoro fight through this one? Is he going to be able to get away? The shot comes the through, the Entangle as well. That's enough. They bring down the carry. Now for the rest, Team Spirit. Playing back into this one, the end of inks well. Now Skewer locking them together. Laurel, maybe he can fight this one out. Durachio, wave for him so far. Trying to separate from his team a little bit. Make sure this Washbuckle doesn't evidently decimate them like it does Tofu. On the back lines, Ace trying to chase down Durachio. Durachio 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 out, but Durachio dies as Snarl. He does manage to finish him off just on the very tip. Just oh, enough to be able to get that kill before he falls. Collapse tries to skewer away, but locked down by Gwyn in the end. Cannot escape the inevitable, which is just too many lives on the side of the game. And a buyback from Celery gets another Wrath of Nature through. That fight lasted so damn long. And of course, you had the Aegis on Duraccio, the Reincarn on Ace, and Quinn just abusing this heart region on the backside of that fight. The Chrono was absolutely beautiful. And did you just say buyback on Celery? Three lives. <laughs> Three lives. Yeah. Game of Gladiators just brought more numbers than Team Spirit could possibly even dream yeah, of. It's like an eight on five here, right? Yeah. So you kill three or two and a half of the Chrono, you're going to take Ace on the other side. Then they're all coming back. I mean, that's exactly what you want to use this Aegis and Reincarnation for. Create a situation where you set the fight up towards the end, the Ultra on cooldown, and you just get an even man fight. And that is when Duraccio can start to clean house. This Morphling, he does some serious DPS. But damn, were those Ink Swells off problem. They were catching so many heroes. Collapse gets to survive the entire fight, just right-clicking people the entire time. And I thought Laurel was maybe going to carry the end of this. Pango is doing so much DPS. Yeah. But I mean, him and Collapse, I think, saved so much of this fight because if Jirachu managed to live through it, then who knows how much damage they do exactly. while Team Spirit is dead. But the fact the Morphling is gone, there goes a decent amount of their pushing power and uh, threat for the high ground. Instead, It'll, it's the Furion and the Skeletons that push out. It'll be Ace who collects it, and this Wraith King is just turning into a straight carry right now. This is not even a bad carry matchup versus the Faces Void yeah. if you have help to do it. It's just going to be an AC for Ace here. Shard to boot, so you cannot mana burn him out. And he's going to be a problem. He's going to deal enough damage, create enough threat that you're going to have to think about him first, or at least maybe skewer him in deep, take him out for free. And think about when you commit the Chrono or the RP, because it's not so straightforward anymore. You can play off some Pangolier pokes, but the damage in the front line is coming through for Gaiman right now. And a lot of it does come down to Duraccio. How does he find the angle into the fight? Who does he start on? And does he get caught in those ultimates? Because this Warplane is still incredibly susceptible to time dilation post Manta. He's susceptible to just getting ulted without that morph going out. If that happens, so much of your DPS goes out the window. Suddenly that long fight is no longer favorable for you. It's so wild to me how much Yutoro trusts his team in this situation. I feel like so many other carries, especially carries in this tournament, would have gone for a BKB to help protect themselves, but he seems to just fully trust <laughs> that Mira is going to be able to back him up, right? I mean, you, <laughs> you think Yutoro God is going to buy a BKB. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't been watching this man. <laughs> He's going to go for Scotty up next, which is going to make him very tanky. Gaming Gladiators 
May not let him get to this point. Smoked for very, very far forward here. Yeah, Radiance turned off for Ace. They're not showing too much on these waves. They wanted something so badly out of that. They used double scans to try and find some sort of pickoff, but they're left with nothing. They Team Spirit the holding around their tier two. They saw something on that ward, and they'll counter smoke it instead. They're missing the Scotty from Yatoro. Big item versus Morphling, but he's happy to fight without it. Treants will see nothing. How closely were you looking at the body blocks here? And Aegis could depend on it as they will bypass the vision mechanisms. Level 20 for Yatoro. He has Chrono attack speed here, plus this full Mjolnir. You get caught in this Chrono, it's a very different story than the last fight. How much room are you willing to give up right they now? Charge, they spot Celery. Chrono Sphere on the two of them. So he's gonna bring down the support first. Nice use of the dead shot there. That'll make sure Ace doesn't get punished too much. But Chronosphere for a five position. I don't think Gain and Gladiators mind that too much as long as they don't lose control of the Roshan pit during this window. I mean, the upside is that buyback still on cooldown for Celery. So they right. know they're getting the 4v5 out of that if they take down the Fury on first. There's no way you're committing for the Wraith King there. Dead shot will prevent it anyway. Another quick pickoff for Yatoro. More gold into his pocket. We'll finish up to Scotty. Now, what about this next part of this matchup? The Wraith King versus the Faceless Void, especially this Wraith King off lane, always gonna be going the Aghanim Scepter at some point in time. That Aghanim Scepter is pretty interesting against the burst that Yutoro wants to be able to employ, right? He wants to Chrono Sphere, make sure that there's one hero or maybe two that gets no impact in the fight, oh, just like Quinn. it looks like Quinn. Ooh, he barely gets off that, but he is going to be slowed down as soon as the DKB is worn away. The time dilation kicks into play, and yeah, Team Spirit have caught him. Just good vision on the map. Let's set up for this kill. And just as he was pushing towards that Aghanim Scepter, you're talking about the Raking as the Primal Axe will also play a big part in these fights, just breaking these heroes down, removing some of the passives, letting them get easy kills on things like the Enchantress, removing some of the time lock on the face's Void. Any extra bit, you can gain an advantage for Duracho in these man fights. It's going to be nice, but... I mean, the Wraith King Axe is great versus the ults. It's just a question of can you do anything with, like, the five seconds you have afterwards, right? They're actually going to man up. They're going to jump onto this face's void. See if they can burst him down. Once again, there's that Inkswell heart to spell. Oh, into the time one. An attempt. Collapse. He turns around. Gets that RP on the two of them. Locking down Dorachi and finishing him off. And now Ace is going to come back into this with not much support. With no Quinn, they knew they had the numbers advantage. And they take the fight in the game of Gladiators no matter the cost. He gets a jump away. Four staff helps him out, but it's not far enough. There is nowhere you can go. The collapse in Yutoro cannot follow. That is a very bold move. When your primal is dead, he's so much of your damage, so much of your burst damage. I mean, again, they're very close to bursting Yatoro, but the man knows his limits. Elvin Tunic oh, up and... Oh, Tofu! Yeah! A shot from downtown claims the life of Yatoro. <laughs> Just as I cast or curse the hell out of him, he gets shot down. Well, the man knows his limits, but I guess not every limit in Dota. The Tormentors are new. We'll cut him some slack, but what a find from Tofu. Just claims it all there, and... Now, the Tormentor did go to Radiant, so they get the kill on Yatoro. Collapse gets the shard. That's a 1,500 gold kill. Yeah, that's a, that's the final shard, by the way. Team Spirit, 36 yes. minutes in, have all the shards for their team because they've claimed every single Tormentor. This is crazy. Of course... The Chrono was off cooldown, so you're gonna have some downtime for your Toro where he would have liked to have been up on the map and used it. Surprised it burst him all hard. <laughs> he must have like time lock hit the torment there. I mean, at last at least he can lap it off here because there's nothing else he can do. And Back in the on. game though, they still don't have ace. They're still looking forward with this smoke. There's and Quinn, there's a hesitant out here. Yatoro? Yeah, this is... Uh, I'm surprised Game of Gladiators. They're surprised that they're even out here. What Quinn starts the out hell is this move? Put the high ground. Oh, what? Quinn. He doesn't have a TP. Where are you? Quinn. He's, He's going to be able to get a force staff down to low ground, but that was an opportunity to get the pick off, and instead it's Collapse who finds the pick off. Another Ogre Seal totem for Celery, trying to keep him alive. Bump back in. Oh, the swashbuckle just Great. barely outside of the range there, and they do and get the back. And Yotoro's back into it. Dorachi will be the first one down. Quinn, he has a BKB. Can he get it off? No, too many stuns. This damage is ramped up so damn oh, fast. Oh, Collapse got him on the ink swell. Yatoro says, you had your fun, you had your cliff walk, but I'm here to clean it up. And Ace 
trying to get away desperately. Blink is up. He will get out. Yes. Oh, they got a scan on him. Yeah, turn that radiance off, son. You need to get the hell out of there. You gotta hide. You gotta hide. You can't be farming right now. There's that shard. Collapse. Pulls him back in a little bit. No harpoon just yet, though. So I mean, he couldn't get him any further. Yatoro knows what he wants right now, and that is an Aegis. That is a Roshan fight. The game could have just committed to. It's also a fight that 30 seconds of it had no Yatoro. They couldn't find anything. They found an inch off of double die between the Morphling and the Primal Beast, and that's it. Team Spirit just way too good at kiting these fights out, not giving you an opening. That Hurricane Pike did some serious work. Sent Quinn back to NA with his pal Arteezy stuck up there. <laughs> but what else are you supposed to do? You have to find the openings. You have to dive. You only had 20 seconds without Yatoro. Just none of it went your way. And now it's going to be the Aegis into his pocket. A cheese on the back. And I guess... Everybody can buy BKB at some point. It'll be his next item here at last to seal the deal. <laughs> he really wanted to save that double damage rune for Laurel or for Yutoro, but uh, little Treant will deny them that opportunity. Still though, Team Spirit got to feel very good about this next four minutes. They've been winning a lot of team fights lately with an extra life on Yutoro. He's already been very aggressive. Leading a lot of the charges for Team Spirit, giving information to Collapse to follow it up. And the late. second life, I feel like there is nothing to stop this man. No. If you get caught in the corner, you're gone. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Even if you're morphing, I mean, who cares, right? The second you come out of it, you're basically dead. The Zags from Celery can only do so much, and suddenly the lanes are not getting pushed in as deep as they once were because this Empower is just going to work on these cores. They're just mopping it up. At this point, the Skeletons and the Treants are just extra gold into their pocket. We're looking at 440 CS for Yatoro right now. Just cleaning up these lanes. 500 for Laurel, by the way, who's been swashbuckling. What feels like the entire map. Still being a tremendous game here on the Pangle here. He is. And look at the difference in the last hits, man. I mean, that is what Empower does. That's what Early Mask of Madness and the, the Maelstrom does. But it's also all these summons going down the lanes. So it's inflated a bit, but that's extra gold. And now Miro with an Ags. This is a great Dark Fortress game, right? And these yeah. soul binds have been landing. There's not a lot to block them. You get the Wraith King, you get that aura going back. It's a great illusion. You get the Morphling, you're going to clear house on the back line. So suddenly, the scale from Team Spirit is starting to pick up the pace on their supports. And these are scary ones. RP straight up in the top lane. He got caught trying to hit that tier two. You can get nothing for free against Team Spirit. Collapse denies Dorachio that opportunity. Dorachio compliments on the initiation, but the damage is done. Gaming Gladiators without their carry for 70 seconds, there's going to be some serious damage coming their way. That just feels like a move that's it's based on pressure, right? They feel like this game is slipping away from them. They feel like the scale is going to be insurmountable. Dorachio trying to make something happen on the map and find a tier two. Instead, he will pay the price only for an RP in exchange, which is going to be up pretty much when he's back up. How much do you want to push with this Aegis right now? Level 25 on the Faceless Void already. He already has the backtrack talent. Just going to make that burst even harder. And Yatoro says, this is enough farming. I want to end this game. I want to end it now. How much do you have to take the fight on your high ground? Look at him. They're just trying to catch whatever they can in the side lanes because, well, you don't have a carry, so there's not much point in acting like you're de going to defend this mid lane. Just have to use Ace's strength. You have to find a way to use this Raid King Ags and the Radiance Burn. Get something going in the fight over the long duration. That's where the Pain Galeer shines. And I mean, Laurel hasn't even had to jump in aggressively yet. He's just playing behind his other cores. Yeah. Be a free lane of racks here. They're going to go for number two. Duraccio, three seconds on the spawn. Butterfly completed for Yatoro now. No MKB in sight. You're going to have to do this the hard way. Just charge in and hope it goes your direction. Checking it out, seeing who's TPing in. Toro with the Lincolns. He's got an extra life. He's got a BKB in his backpack for that second life. Oh, and they got an opportunity from Collapse. Pulled Celery out of position. All right. Raggio going to try and use that Faceless Void for him to be able to help out. But the Chronosphere goes into work. The Old Scepter not actually grabbing the real one. He is still up, and he finishes off the Morph like so easily. And now the RP gets the other two cores. Team Spirit so clean. The extra ghosts come out from the Wraith King. But doesn't really do anything. Ace just pops BKB on the second life. They do manage to get another pick here on his salaries. He tries to jump forward. They've got nothing left in the tank on Gaming Gladiators. They are all going to fall. They're going to throw their damage around. The Chief's actually getting popped as Collapse got a little bit low, but into the foul. Laurel goes. He's going to be a 
Rampage, maybe a double. No, Daryl Tofu's gonna deny him that. They're gonna call the GG unless pulled back in. No, this one is a in. second Rampage to finally close it off. <laughs> I mean, why not add to his total, right? This is the player with the most Rampages in a single TI run in history. He will add some more to the stat page here as Yatoro just mops him up at the end with way too much damage. And once more, Gaiman are sitting here thinking, what the hell are we supposed to do against this team? We can't outpace them. We can't push them. We can't outscale them. We're having troubles in the team fights. We're losing the towers first. This man's playing faceless void in a meta where no one else was really willing. He got you on the Weaver. He got you on the faceless void. Team Spirit got you on the Pango on both sides. They defeated the Pango, and Laurel took it into his own hands. I mean, <laughs> there was so much in that early game where Laurel, he was controlling so much of the tempo, and he knows it too. And the crowd knows it too. They're going to thank Team Spirit for an excellent performance in this game too, but it might be a fast closeout to the night the way Team Spirit looks utterly unstoppable. They are speed running this grand final right now. And the scary part is at 30 minutes, Gaiman had a lead in that game. That game yeah. was not some super one-sided net worth stomp, even with a Magnus Void farming it up. It's just, it, it felt inevitable, right? Like, how are you taking these late game fights? Even with a Rave King Ags, you're respawning just to watch the corpses of your teammates fall right where you were. There's no real burst. There's no real push tempo here. Yeah. Nothing going their way in that game, too. Well, they, I mean, they at least were able to even out the net worth a little bit. There That's have true. to be small That's things true. that went the way of gaming gladiators. Are there any highlights you can point to? I mean, I think the laning phase was a bit better for them, but yeah. the point in their laning phase that they wanted to work the most that I feel has worked for them all year has been Quinn on mid. And that lane was the one that felt a little lackluster to me, yep. right? The Proud Beast had a very slow start. He didn't get to use the power runes. It all has to come together. If you're going to beat this Team Spirit team in a grand final at TI, you need to pull out all of your tricks, get all the cylinders firing, and make it synergize at its peak. It, they have played so many games, having to go through the lower bracket the entire time. Does Game and Gladiators have anything left in the tank? Big, back to the panel. Thank you very much, Captain SVG. We'll find that answer in game number three, because right now, Team Spirit is on match point. One more game away from being crowned second time TI champion. And what a game they did it on here. It was a very back and forth, a lot of fights in this one. We have a little bit of a change on the panel. Storm Stormer, welcome, joining us as well. I want to dive right into it. Uh, what did you make of this game? Thank you, Shira. Um, yeah, I mean, this game was actually quite a treat to watch for a long time. I think there was some really, really cool plays coming up from both sides. I think Lol played exceptionally well on his Pangolier. Like, there was, like, some situation where they went on with three heroes and he just barely got out. I think he carried the game on his, uh, the team on his back for quite some time until the Altura and Kodas uh, caught up. But, um, yeah, well, definitely a treat to watch. Yeah, I mean, for Lau at least, it, in regards to net worth, I think I saw a tweet from Noxville where it's like, it's the fifth highest net worth of any Pangolier on land, and it's like, he had Diffusal, he had links like pre-20 minutes, and just, it was just an incredible start for him. He was so farmed. Yeah, so farmed. And it is really hard to top the net worth leaderboards as a Pangolier, right? You usually never see that happen, but it's also due to the Magnus that they right. were able to play around. They had three melee cores with a Magnus, and when the game stagnated, they were just collecting that net worth lead. Every time that Gaiman weren't making any moves or any plays, that benefited Team Spirit entirely. So if you're playing this game to scale, all of a sudden, Team Spirit, they've got the superior team fight, right? They've got the Chronosphere, they've got the Rolling Thunder, they've got the uh, RP. So it made it so that Gaiman Gladiators couldn't ever really look for those fights later on as the net worth lead was built up. Yeah, it felt like at some point both teams wanted to look for the fights. Both teams were ready to fight, but you only want to really fight when you know you have the advantage. And I think, T, that led to some Pretty, <laughs> <on your head. laughs> Sorry, <hold on. laughs> quite, yeah. quite cool. Uh, but that's some pretty, uh, pretty surprising locations where fights were actually happening because we had both teams trying to surprise the enemy team in final locations. Yeah, it happened a lot. <laughs> you had for the, in the bot side of the map, you had like this awkward Roshan where Spirit started it, but they weren't strong enough, and then they baited out with the fight. And then we had a pick up onto Primal, and then it's near a Tormentor where the Poshkus just free farming top lane, hitting a tower, and then the rest of Spirit's just slaughtering the entirety of Gaming Gladiators. So I. I feel like this entire game was Gaming trying to construct a fight where they could survive the big spells, while Spirit was always chasing, oh look, we have our spells available, let's just win every single fight, because we know if we have the Chrono, if we have the RP, we're going to hit these big spells and just crush every single engagement. Yeah, and it's hard because they didn't really have that overwhelming team fight ability on Gaiman, because even when they did have that Aegis on Morphling, they 
couldn't really ever make anything happen. The fight that they did finally manage to force versus Spirit when Morphling had the Aegis, when they tried to burst the Faceless Void, they couldn't, he time walks away, he chronos. They end up killing the Void in the end, but they didn't really get much in return. I mean, they traded off one of their heroes, everyone else disengaged, and they couldn't turn that winning fight when they got the Void down into anything because they committed too much and they didn't get enough back. And that really was the story of the game. Yeah, it really, really was, and I feel like we saw Team Spirit, you know, we, okay, so for people that have been uh, following their vlogs, they have a lot of them, they, they show a lot of their in-game communication uh, of their vlogs, and those fights that we see them take here on the TI stage, they seem very calm and collected. Storm Stormer, there's like, oh, I, guys, I killed that dude. Yeah, oh, I got stunned, used my ultimate. Oh, he used this one. <laughs> it's like they're, you know, like you're walking in the park, it's like, oh, bird. <laughs> you know, nice, nice tree. It's literally very cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's definitely what you want to stray for as well. I think it's also something that uh, Team Tundra was exceptionally good at when they won uh, TI last year. It just shows that you're confident in what you're saying. You're not over emotional about things. And also, what I think what I love about this team is that even if they die, you can see smiles in their face. Yeah. You know, like this Yatoro, he's dying at the tournament. Mentor, you might think like, oh, I just had 2k cold to tofu, but then he's just smiling, you know, and all the team, like, I think they're having such a great time right now, which makes it look even scarier to beat this team. And I think it's worth so much that, like, uh, no matter what is happening, they're keeping a calm head. And this, this calm communication that you said, like, I think is really, really good to point out because it just shows um, that they're really focused, really in zone about the most important things. You don't over communicate. You don't talk louder to make sure your voice is being heard. Everybody's on the same level. Yeah, um, and that combine that with the, with the fun they exactly, are having at the same exactly. time. I mean, I, that is a skill. I think they have like the perfect balance, honestly. And together that with how good they play Dota right now, this team is just really scary. It is really scary. I bet the whole team was uh, was having a lot of fun actually in one particular moment. And we talked about it a couple times already. You've seen it in the highlights as well. The great escape from Laurel. Purge is going to talk about it now too. Thank you, Shiva. Yeah, the Pango survive was very, very important for Gaming Glad or for uh, Team Spirit because he had the most net worth on his team. If he gets killed, it's a big comeback momentum potential for gaming gladiators. They spotted him farming up above. They saw his invis rune, so they placed the sentry now, and they are looking to chain disable him here. Now, the uh, the AoE, the remnant here for, for Tofu, it does a little circular thing, and every ghost that passes through him is gonna silence him. And if they can chain disable him, it's a really, really crucial kill here. But unfortunately, the Primal Beast charge is gonna push him back outside of the radius of this next coming ghost. That means the second silence doesn't hit. The the pushback does, but he's disabled still in this very moment, and he gets pushed slightly to the left here by the fear. Now, before Pango's uh, ability here, this one, the, uh, the the roll thing, whatever it's called, it used to give damage reduction. Now it gives you a barrier. So because there's three heroes, he gets 600 HP from this, which buys him time to survive. And one other moment that was really, really cool here, because he was in trouble and Mira was on the right, he puts Inkswell on him. It's uh, this little animation. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in this clip. The Inkswell on him, he pops this the moment before he dies. If he doesn't do this, Celery here on the Nature's Prophet attacks him one time. A second auto attack would have killed him. But because these two guys were stunned, he ends up surviving. All these things going together to keep Lara alive, keep his net worth high, and waste Gaming Gladiator's time on the map. Just an incredibly important moment. An incredibly important moment for sure, and I bet there were a lot of people in the crowd cheering. I know in the green room people were like, oh my god, he got away from that one. And I think a lot of people around the world and all the different versions that people are watching Dota, we have had people cheering them on. This is from Chicago, where the vibes and the atmosphere is definitely very high. We'll see if we can get a punch on stage. I don't know, maybe not today here, but we can only hope. It was, uh, it was very dominant towards the end, of course, from Team Spirit, but it was at the start of the game, incredibly back and forth. We heard our drafting panel say the first seven minutes are going to be really important. Uh, we're, that's what the coach said as well. And Gaming Gladiator survived that, and it looked okay. It just, they couldn't get that final push to get the advantage, and that is uh, something that they're surely going to work on for the next game, which is coming your way very soon. This particular point, though, T, it's... It's, it's all or nothing right now. They're two games down. Gaming Gladiators has been in this situation before, but that was an online tournament. This is very different. It is, and I'm going to just say that I don't want to see Morphling. You know, this hero is Arteezy got eliminated with it. Mm -hmm. Nightfall got eliminated with it. Mm -hmm. Now, Doratio wants to play it, and 
he lost game two? Like this era, it's the bane of these lower bracket teams' yeah. uh, life. And unfortunately, I don't think it's the, the, the one that you want to bring out when your life's on the line. You know, I can only imagine they're going to have something something out different planned that they have to have. And while they're planning that, we are going to see where Casey is hiding. I think she's in the crowd somewhere. Where are you, Casey? I'm way up here. I'm sorry, I'm turning away from the camera. I'm way up here. How's everybody doing? Okay, so usually... As I move my cord out, I'm such a professional. Usually when we ask people, is this your first TI? We get a lot of, yeah, it's my first TI. I got a very different answer when I came up here. How many have you been to? You know, I'm not sure, 14, 15, 16, went to Canada, was the last one, and now I'm back, so I'm super excited. And the three of you have been to m most of those together, a couple? I would say like half of them, all the Seattle ones. Okay. I, I soloed in Canada. <laughs> I've been to two, this one, this one in I think 2017. And then we were talking just a few minutes ago about the way that this grand final is going, and you heard Shiver say, like, this is do or die, game three, how is everybody feeling? You, sir, are feeling very well. Want to tell everybody why? Uh, I bet on Team Spirit on the compendium. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm sorry, what is wrong with this crowd that, like, three of you are like, yay. <laughs> okay, I want to hear from the, from the Game and Gladiators. Wow. I think this section can do better. All right, I want to hear you as loud. Do you see, now this is what Slack should do when he starts talking louder. You hold the microphone further away, like this. All right, come on up for rafters, let's hear it. I'm gonna have my amazing photographer, Phil, spin around and show you how great this view is from up here. You were saying this is like the best seats in the house, right? Been here for three days. <laughs> the best seats in the house. Nice. Oh, oh, I hear a, I hear a cheer starting. Three people. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Casey. I mean, that does look magical. I will say that is definitely uh, one of the better seats in the house. Although I must say, there's a lot of good seats. The screens are fantastic. The Dota has been fantastic, but I would... I, I'm going to show a little bias here. I would really like this series to not be in 3-0, so I'm rooting for Gaming Gladiators in the next one. And I, I wanted, I know all of you want more Dota 2 coming into the Climate Pledge Arena here tonight. And I want to know from my panel, Stormstormer, what does Gaming Gladiators need to do? Uh, I mean, I think, first of all, don't let it get to your head. I think they are respecting Team Spirit maybe a little bit too much as well. They're not showing the same Gaming Gladiator support that they showed the entire lower bracket run. You have to remember, this team started in lower bracket and now beat how many teams? Six, seven teams in a row to get here. I just think they have to get Spirit out of their head and uh, just focus on their own Dota again. Maybe adjust the drafting a little bit and then just, you know, keep the ball rolling, uh, rolling again. Get back to your seat. Get back to your seat. I think everybody should get back to their seats right about now because, ladies and gentlemen, we want some more Dota to be played. We have got Team Spirit two games up. Can Gaming Gladiators push them back? Masters and they have not dropped the ball since. 
And the fact that they're coming into this grand finals, that, that like each draft is completely different. In game one, Weaver, Beastmaster, they swarm the map, they're, they're the aggressors. Game two, they got big cooldowns. Magnus, Void, like being the team down 2-0 and having to try and work out how do we do with aggression? How do we do with the skein? And like, you don't know what's going to come at you in this third game. So for gaming, it's not about team spirit at this point. It's about what can they bring themselves? What is their draft to get them through the laning phase and set themselves up a game that they can actually dictate? Because right now, they're just victim to team spirit two times in a row. Yeah. But also, I, I just want to have Storm uh, elaborate a little bit more on what he was talking about when he said they need to get spirit out of their heads. And how do you feel like that? What, what does that mean when you say that the enemy team is in your head? Are you drafting differently? Are you playing differently? Can you speak to it from your personal experience? Yes, I think both of it. I think like, um, I think first of all, all their gaming players are just play the heroes that they're most comfortable with. That they don't like, for example, draft heroes because they want to block pick them from the enemy team or stuff like that. They should just play their own game regardless of who they're, who they're playing against. And I know that some players on gaming, like it is good to have healthy respect towards the enemy team on Team Spirit, but I don't think it should like affect your own gameplay too much. You should respect what the enemy team is doing. You should know their strengths and weaknesses weaknesses, but it should not cause yourself to have more weaknesses, if that makes sense. Just basically, reset, don't care who you play uh, play against, remember all the games that got you to this point, got you through the entire lower bracket, to this game three, and make it like a home run again. Mm -hmm. Gotta remember as well, Team Spirit, when they won TI10 back then, right, they were also two games ahead, and then it still went to a five-game series against yes. PSG LGD yep. back then. So this is not over yet uh, whatsoever, and I hope Gaming Gladiators also have that in their head right now, that like, you know, it's maybe a longer day for them as well, they also have to play the lower bracket final, against, uh, I forgot just now, I have bad, bad memory. LGD. LGD. <laughs> okay, let's talk about LGD, right? And now they're here again. So it is a, a longer day for them, but I all just hope they, like, whatever it was, they, they got the energy running again. And they just go in, uh, into it right now. Yeah, we're gonna find now. Can Gaming Gladiators force out the next game, or will Team Spirit be the two-time champion? Now let's hear it for Game 3! Team Spirit! versus Gaming Gladiators. Grand Finals, Game 3. Welcome back to the draft panel for game number three, everybody. This is everything on the line for Gaming Gladiators. Down 0-2, Team Spirit have been crushing so far. Seems like they have all the answers, they have all the strategies that they need to become champions once again, just like back two years ago. What do you guys want to see Gaming Gladiators? I feel like I'm repeating myself after game number one, but it really is the story here. How can Gaming Gladiators dig themselves out of this strategical hold they found themselves in? Honestly, I thought their draft last game, they had a really good shot. I think they identified that they want to target a little bit more of non-Collapse heroes. They let Collapse heroes Magnus, and I thought that it was not a bad idea. I don't think Collapse had the usual Magnus impact. Maybe he didn't need it, maybe he didn't get there. Uh, Tof was able to pick up an early Yule Scepter, but I think I just want them to do that, but there was a time where like they had the triple wave with Quinn. I want them to play even more for the mid pressure, because Laurel just he had. I don't know. The guy's too good. He had too good a game. Uh, I would like uh, Gladiators uh, get back to the idea of super pressure, super tempo, crazy, super fast, uh, super strong lanes. I think uh, that potentially might work. Yeah, something like this. Uh, you, you you need to risk at some point, right? You're zero two. Uh, they definitely have it, like, they definitely gave a very good fights in both games. Like, both games, they actually uh, gave good fights. They had good lanes and stuff. Yeah, but uh, this last game was rough to play after some point, because Void Magnus is just too strong, like, when it's come to late game. So I hope this time maybe we just, you know, go super tempo. Right. Yeah, I definitely agree with Dendi on that one. The way gaming gliders got here was with that tempo pushing the high ground it felt like in that last game they kind of fell back like we don't really want to do that instead we're going to try and match you in the late game pick up a Duraccio morphling I mean, he played pretty amazing for the most part had a couple bad deaths but overall like you're playing into how team spirit wants to play at that point you're not really playing the game that got you into this grand finals in particular so we'll see if they go ahead and do that but the problem is i think when you play against team spirit right now there's like a triple threat here it's like you have to deal with collapse which they've been trying to do through bands and then i think what really leveled up spirit is laurel he's just playing so good every game and you see quinn he's normally taking control of the map he's like making moves he hasn't been able to in these last two games because laurel's having a great laning stage and of course there's always yatoro who's you're gonna pick the ck but you don't even know if it's his he's strategically taking away a lot of Duraccio's heroes making them feel a bit uncomfortable so there's a lot of things they're doing on a strategic level and in game that it's just really hard for gaming to address so what, what do you think uh gaming if we want to see this early aggression from them what
what is the first pick of the game? Do you just go for the Celery and Charon or like, okay, full focus on early laning stage and putting that pressure? Your Chen was obviously banned that you've had a great success within that macro strategy. Is the Enchi into CK even appealing to start off? I think it's a it's normally like a decent matchup for CK because he's actually one of the heroes that can kill Entry pretty easily when you bring her out of position. But honestly, I sort of like that line of thought. Uh, I think at this tournament, they usually pick Entry with Weaver, but, um, just because it gives the Entry a really strong lane. Once you give Entry a strong lane, you can snowball the other lanes, you can leave it alone. But I don't mind that if they pick another strong carry with it. Okay, there's the AA Ooh. we were looking for in both of the previous games, and this time, Gaiman are going to bring it out. Does this fit the bill for you guys? Not a strong laner. Not a strong laner, not a fast tempo hero, but it can buff really well like other heroes that you can have in a draft. Uh, Vortex is extremely strong, also shut down a lot of like fat heroes with Bion, Hurt of Tarask and stuff, so might see something. If you build up a strong like uh, carry that fits AA on lane, it can still be pretty strong lane. Yeah, I think the hero, he just has a lot of range, so he keeps clicking, right? If the lane is stable and you get to just keep clicking your opponent, his lane's like not weak or anything. He's going to constantly harass on the region. I think generally what AA picks mean is that they want to play with their mid. Generally, when you pick AA, you pick some high damage mid and they just sort of run around together. You get stacks and then they play together. You get stacks, you get played together. And I think that's also something that we saw a lot from Gladiators in this tournament is they would play a lot off these stacks. I think the AA could be a good start for that. Look at that stat. This is their first time playing the hero this tournament. They haven't brought out the AA a single time. So really digging deep here in the final game, and or I say the final game, what could be the final game for them. Um, to look at it from the other perspective, Team Spirit, this is probably a surprise for them, given the circumstances that there hasn't been a single AA from Gladiators. Do you change any sort of approach on the Spirit side? I guess, like you guys said, maybe you want to keep the CK flex. What are your What are your next two go-to picks to make this AA feel bad? Laning Sage, I think the last time they ran this, they're probably looking at a Dark Willow for Spirit to lane it. That lane seemed incredibly strong. I'm not sure who's going to play the CK. They might keep it open for a while. It is a little annoying to play CK versus A in some ways because the armlet issue, you can't really toggle that. So that could be annoying. But then again, the Phantasm does delete AA pretty quickly. So I could see this being an offlane CK if Yatoro finds a better pick for himself. But I think the Dark Will is definitely something they're looking at. I would really like it if they picked Dark Will. I think what you said about the 3 CK sounds good as well because A can keep clicking the CK, but as soon as it's level 3 or 4, these clicks aren't going to do anything to him at all. Yeah, uh, A afraid of mobile heroes and heroes who are very fast and can jump uh, back lines and stuff like this. So we can see already Primo and Park Bands. And uh, uh, CK is one of those heroes actually. It's pretty like fast hero, it gets into back lines pretty fast. So uh, heroes who doesn't afraid A in some sense, maybe TB can work again for Team Spirit because uh, you always can swap HP, like even, in, even if you're under A ulti. Yeah, I think they're gonna pick 18 Spectre. Like they should start to look at it. I don't know if they will for sure, but I liked what you said about like getting these backline jumpers. I think Yatoro, he played a lot of Spectre. I mean, he played some at this tournament, but he was playing a lot of Spectre in pubs. He always goes for some really high damage builds. He go like Bloodthorn, uh, Manta. Like he never goes for some like tanky build at all. He just looks to kill the backline. I guess Grimshock does something similar that you were saying as well, yeah. right? Just giving you a really high kill threat lane. You want to make sure that the CK is at least open as a flex or the 18 pick. Yeah, I think they go for that because it's a lot better versus the Pango than the Willow would be, right? You can get the leash on him and then he can get stuck. So same thing in the laning stage, though. It's really strong, get on top of him, lots of damage. Just Grim is better for this particular game. Trand is in again. This was a hero spirit ran against Pango last time, uh, but they are going to go for the Tusk. Tusky, um, Tusky. <laughs> Oh, are we are we committed here to a five tusk for this reason? Has Mira been playing Grim? He has, right? They've both played both of these heroes. So this for Team Spirit, I believe, is a complete flex among their support players. Uh, Mira has not played Tusk yet, so it's mostly 100% in Poshka so far. Did he not play Tusk in game one? Am I? Oh, he played it in the last game, but outside of that, I suppose. Right, outside like, of this series. Okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. My notes are outdated from the last. I'm sure they can <laughs> flex it perfectly well. Um, I think. Actually, uh, Morta's not banned in this series, which is sort of surprising because, I mean, they broke Gaiman's confidence in the hero a bit because I think, I don't know, I think Tofu played literally every game on this hero before that. Uh, you just go back for it, yeah, because it <laughs> does what, well, they what need you need him know? to do, Sorry. right? <laughs> I feel like you just have so many issues with Gaiman's other heroes that you feel like you don't have to ban it because you have to ban so many other things in this game, like the Necro, the Phoenix, the Chen, all these heals, and this is Really good banning, I think, by Team Spirit, even the Konka. These lineups where you see them group up, be able to push, 
they're not being able to get them because you have to deal with the heroes that you see in front of you and some of your best heroes to do these pushes are just being banned out by team spirit so they're gonna play the brewmaster the only question i do have yet again is is this pango too early is it too early of a pango game will he have a game right now it looks like they only have one answer for him but i expect more to come is there any mid laners potentially dindy that can punish that's left in the pool oh for sure for sure or is a bunch like this, this hero become not as strong as it used to be. It's actually pretty strong on lane still. Like, there oh, is the dazzle. Here we go, okay. <laughs> the lane punisher. If I decide to put it mid, I can still think about it. It's weird to see sometimes healers picked into A, but I think the purpose is especially like having this insanely strong lanes. So they can still do post free dazzle if we decide, or I don't know, like if Collapse uh, is gonna play it or not. Uh, I'm, I'm curious because one hero that uh, comes to my mind that both teams ignoring uh, second, I think, uh, both, all games is Spirit Breaker, right? We all talked how imbalanced and broken this hero is, and now we don't see it much. Because even here, I saw, okay, we have Grimstroke, maybe potentially, who knows? There's not so many uh, heroes to stop it, if you think about it. Yeah. yeah, I can see the Spirit Breaker, especially since I think there's like a mechanic with Brewmaster where the Brewlings take the creep damage from the charge. So you actually kill like over half their HP even after the Brewmaster's 20 time. One interaction with the Dazzle versus A that I think swings the matchup a little bit is you can actually permagrace someone if they get A ulted. Uh, as soon as you hit 18 on Dazzle, so it's not as much of like a, oh, they can all in no matter what with this A on one target. What do you guys make of uh, Spirit's approach to dealing with gaming gladiators, which, I mean, if you look at the game in lineup, it seems very teamfight centric, right? You've got Pango, you've got Brewmaster ult. Are you a little concerned for gaming gladiators having downtime when they have cooldown on this? Uh, you look at Spirit's lineup, it seems very fast, very low cooldown. It can play in duos, trios. Uh, do you think by design this Dazzle fits that playstyle really well? Uh, for sure, and I would add up here that both uh, previous game and this game so far, uh, what bothers me in uh, Gaming Gladiator's draft is uh, we don't ha really have a saves in their lineup. If you look at Team Spirit lineup, we already have two, and usually on like middle game, late game, this is one of the most important things that you have in your lineups. So not only like big cooldowns like on Brew or something like this, but also like uh, saves, I think it's often can be like game changer. Speaking of saves, I think Gaiman probably needs to ban Centaur in this game. This could be a really good hero. Like, you see the roll come out, you see the split come out. Some Centaur Stampede could disengage that really well. I think they need another hero that... I'm just kind of looking at Yatoro's hero pool. I'm not seeing anything much better versus the Brewmaster than the CK right now. Potentially, it was like a Morphling, but then you're playing versus AA, Weaver's banned. It's like a Night Stalker. Carry? Yeah, I think Nightfall yeah. pulled out all a couple of hits. I, I could actually see Yotaro playing in a game like this. It's actually a really good Night Stalker carry game. I agree on that. That looks uh, amazing <laughs> if we go for it. It's very hard to play with this lineup so far against Night Stalker carry. You don't have so many uh, reliable stuns, I would say, on uh, Gladiators yet. Like, you have a lot of some skill shots that you need to aim, so it can create a problem. Yeah, also, by the way, Grim is also safe if you think about it, right? Like his shard is uh, used so efficiently at uh, TI so far. Yeah, we saw it in the last game as well. Like, I guess the only question is, like, they probably are wanting a ranged hero because you have Tusk potentially five. And I don't know if CK Tusk lane is going to cut it. But I guess they could do it. I think just because they see the AA, they might feel like they can greet it out. Like they have a five that doesn't really prevent the carry from getting all in and that can't protect themselves. So you can like play for the kills in lane with something like a CK Tusk. I could see them just go for the range route with the Tusker 5 though. I think they'd have really strong lanes that way as well. It seems like gaming gladiators have the same mindset with this uh, Dawnbreaker ban, right? This is a hero combination that we saw other teams run earlier in the tournament. The Tusk Dawn as a dual lane just absolutely obliterating weak fives. So it does seem like gaming are still in that mindset of this CK is going to be the carry. Um, but as you guys pointed out, I don't, I don't even think CK Tusk is going to struggle here unless that carry last pick from Gaiman really solves that lane. AA does not like this matchup. Honestly, I just like this last hero from Team Spirit to sort of solidify their teamfights. I feel like right now they actually have a chance that they'll get run over in teamfights. I think Pango, Brewmaster, and Mortar are all really strong all right. heroes. Oh, okay. Got a call. Space well, it was time. Bendy wanted it, he got it. Oh, that's a beautiful lineup here. Spirit Breaker Grim looks very scary, very scary. Also, it's uh, BKB Pierce once again, which is very strong in a lot of situations. Ten 
Yeah, I think the carry pool, I think the troll being banned and the void kind of can signify that you want this CK to be your carry. So they're going for the offline route, not going for the centaur, going for the spear breaker, which Brewmaster, I guess you have a dispel, which helps a little bit against that if you can get it off on time. But we've seen time and time again in the late game, it doesn't really matter. You have like a BKB, Octarine Core, and uh, I can <laughs> refresh your orb, so you can't really deal with that. So this has been a collapse special throughout like the entirety of this TI, and he's really good at it. And it looks pretty scary here. I will say the game in this lineup, it looks pretty good though so far. I think whenever you play against uh, Dazzle, having that AA is really good if you can ever commit on him. And we have a Spectre. Gonna All round right. it out with a Spectre, so. Giving some, maybe some skirmishing potential to Gaming Gladiators. You have a, a carry that can join globally. Does this, was this just a matter of, okay, there's nothing left? Is or? the lane going to be okay? Is there yeah, really? honestly, I'm really worried for Gladiators. I feel like every time I've seen Spearbreaker have a good lane, this hero is like the most unreal inbo of the patch. Yeah, Spectre A is one of the best combinations in the game for ages, and I don't think anything changing in that, because those both heroes complement each other very well. But at the same time, the lineup on Team Spirit looks crazy in late game if it's uh, the game D-Ways. All right, so. seems like we're grasping... Are we grasping at straws for gaming gladiators? Is this actually going to be that difficult of a safe lane? Or is there maybe some sort of hope with rotation from maybe a, a gating where it could offset this balance in the top lane? Can you leave Brewmaster alone for a minute to try to help? Or do you need to get really creative? I think a lot can happen in this game, and I think a lot's going to come from the mid lane. And can Quinn get rotations? And can they abuse Laurel this game? Because I think Laurel is very exploitable in this game with a old Spectre old. And if he feeds a lot of net worth back, that could be a way back into the game. Yeah, I can completely see that. If one lane starts to being start getting pressure, like you have the Spectre to add on. The Pangolier probably is going to be the strongest hero in the game when he gets his roll. So they do have a lot of angles on Gladiator to snowball off that. So I guess, I mean, not to sound like a broken record, but we are uh, we're very focused on the laning stage, as per usual in this series. Um, if you're in Quinn's shoes in this game, obviously you've had a couple of games that were did not go according to plan, right? Are you... Let's talk a little bit about the mentality of him going up against what we assume will be a very unfavorable matchup against Laurel and the Dazzle. What do you think Quinn is telling his team right now? Is it, all right, I'm going to be struggling, but I'll come back, or I need help for sure in this game? It's actually not that bad for Pango. It's one of the better heroes uh, to uh, sustain against Dazzle because he have two jumps to jump away from its poison attacks. So it, I think Quinn is extremely experienced, and he will be fine. All right, guys, Gaming Gladiators, they are on the ropes. I'm sure Team Spirit are feeling themselves right now, and let's see if it is the same for their coach, Silent. Thank you very much. I am joined by Silent of Team Spirit, where around two years ago, you were in a very similar spot. It was Grand Finals, TI-10 in Bucharest. You were up two games. Now a lot has changed since then, but it hasn't changed for your team. The energy from two years ago to now, does anything feel different? Uh, no, I think uh, we feel the same. Y you need to be focused and play till the end. It doesn't matter, uh, lead you or losing. Same. You, you don't like to, okay, we're leading it to the arrow, we can make some YOLO plays. A championship mentality through and through, but I know one thing that's different. Two years ago, you didn't have a crowd. But this time... I think they're ready for a game number three. And we are certainly ready for a game number three. Though we certainly don't want to end it here. Seattle, do we want to see some more Dota? Here in the Cathedral in Seattle, we may just be witnessing the final game of the Grand Finals, but I'm sure a lot of us hope for so much more. And that all depends on Game and Gladiators. I mean, they have been the ones to run the gauntlet through all of these majors. They were looking like the best team of the year until they ran into Team Spirit. Until Team Spirit ramped up in just the right time, shown up for championships and they have only lost two games in this entire tournament avery they're 43 and 7 in their last 50. this team is looking unstoppable is there anything gaming gladiators can do to halt this momentum even just a little bit you have to play dota there's no way around it you have to meet this team on their plane 
and give them a taste of their own medicine because you came in with a plan, but everybody has a plan until Team Spear punches you in the face. And right now you're laying on the ground trying to figure out what the hell just happened in the first two games. Your plan did not work. Whatever you thought it was going to happen in the games one and two, it fell flat. So right now, Team Spirit are in control of this draft meta. They're in control of the series, and they're dictating the pace in these games. They're dictating the team fight. So you have to meet them there and beat them. You have to outplay them. You have to start winning these team fights, scaling into the late game. You are not going to run this team over, which means you got to find some more momentum going past that 30 or 40 minute mark. It's not been Gaiman's MO this entire lower bracket run, but Hey, you're in a dire situation at Grand Final. You don't have another chance here. You are at the total limit. So figure it out fast, make the adjustments, and get cranking. This is a draft that is heading in that direction, right? A lot more team fight, a lot more scaling presence. Yep. Spectre AA here designed to put Yatoro in a tough position. We've seen the AA be a counter to CK for a lot of this tournament in terms of limiting the lifesteal interactions. Of course, it can also have a huge impact for the Dazzle as this game progresses into the late game. So I think these are much more even lineups in terms of what happens past the 40 or 50 minute mark. There's not some crazy inevitable scale outside of maybe Dazzle Spear Breaker doing crazy Dazzle Spear Breaker things and Celery, Celery in trouble. trouble in the bottom lane and that is going to be your first blood. Collapse will claim it with a bash. Of course, a little luck goes a long way. A classic Team of Spirit strategy going back to their first TI victory in a career hey. boot. Courier pick off as well. Look at that. Duraggio even like taking himself outside the lane to block the hard camp because this lane is already going a little bit awkward for them. The mid lane's not looking much better. We're 12 and 4 on Laurel over this melee range versus melee matchup. It's not a fun one. You should expect the Dazzle to win, but Laurel is already taking commanding lead. And then we've got your Toro, 11 and 2. Now the Brewmaster is keeping pace, but he's certainly not slowing down the carry of Team Spirit. So Gaming Gladiator's got to be able to, to uh, hold this momentum a little bit further here. Bit of damage on to Ace. They're turning it back around, but Dofu's here to be able to help him out. Nice shot to get the extra bit of damage on two heroes. Yeah, double proc. Win the War of Attrition. I think these silence can go fine for Gaiman over the course of the lanes. Uh, they don't look too terrifying to me. Uh, I think the Brew can fight back with the help of Morta. Just a very tough hero to trade into. That mid lane is what I'm worried about, though, right? It's Dazzle versus Melee. I mean, Pango has some escape mechanisms, but if you get some roam going through with the poison adding up, it can be deadly. Every single time, Seller wants to be able to stop that hard camp opportunity. He does risk getting gone on by Mira and Collapse. This time around, he's fine. The Shard inadvertently kind of helps him out as he's pushed underneath his tower. Just try and get as many pulls off as you can in this lane. Boost the XP up for both heroes as they both really want and need it here. You're not going to be able to shut Collapse down, which, I mean, that's a worrying factor, right? A Spear Breaker with absolute free farm, it's going to have a fast Midas, is what Collapse is going to have here. He's going to have his choice. And it'll be quite powerful going into that mid-game. So you got to be able to strike back in these small skirmishes, get the ults up, particularly the Brewmaster Primal Split, the Rolling Thunder here, very powerful spells. If you can get them fast. And of course, A Blast coming in on top of it with Vortex amping up all this magic damage. And put that mini haunt to use on the step. Real quickly, want to give a shout out to our observers, our hardworking observers who have been keeping us through this entire tournament. Ace. Maybe in some trouble here, Maposhka. He's trying to dodge all of these ghosts. He doesn't want to leave the calling. He'll take that extra bit of damage to try and risk it, but he does end up falling as a result. And now Ace, he'll have some oh, nice helping here. in from Tofu. Beautiful dead shot to push him back in and gain the gladiators. A very clutch fight there for them. A Tofu and Ace get a big win in their off lane. That's the strength of the Morita dual lane that they're looking for. This is why this hero's been a first pick for them for a lot of these series. They are very confident in what Tofu can do on it in the early game. And now he has some roam options. I don't think you can leave Ace in the one on two, but if you can get some breathing room like this and look towards mid, maybe you can get some damage poke, help skew this lane back in Quinn's favor. Because he is still getting known. 31 and 10 on Laurel, almost doubling Quinn up here. He got the Courier as well. Quinn with a slight misstep will hurt his regen fairing. That just means more pressure going to build up between Laurel and his melee foe. Just not much you can do against the poison touch here. Yeah, he, this is looking like Quinn kind of needs one of his supports to die just to refill that bottle. And Celery may grant him that wish. He's going to get a double blood grenade before he goes. So this may be a fair trade off. Interrot, you can claim his life, and he does manage to get it. It puts an early level into that desolate, and it's just the added damage they need. Honestly, I think Celery is okay with that. Solo XP for Darachi on a Spectre. He gets to collect all these creeps under the tower without any pressure. 
Pretty happy about that exchange with a very defensive oriented lane where I'm, you know, what are you doing aggressively with AA Spectre? It's all about getting farm and XP down here. And there's that TP rotation to fill out Quinn's bottle and try and help with the six minute rune. Let's see if he's able to do so. But Team Spirit not going to worry about the runes here. Instead, they try and win this off lane situation where Ace and Topo were doing pretty well for themselves. They bring three heroes to the matter to bring down Ace if they can get him. Slow down by the blood grenade. They only need a couple more hits. They've got more blood where that came from, apparently. Gives them over that Lotus, and that's enough. Evasion with the haze enough for Ace to just walk okay. off here. I lied. They do care about that uh, the power rune because they brought Collapse to secure it. Not just that, but also the kill on Quinn. That's just going to secure the double check for Laurel. He's going to walk all the way top and get himself a shield rune. Putting this matchup to good use, giving Quinn a taste of his own medicine here with the roam. Maybe not expected out of the offlaner, but that is a hell of a rotation from Collapse and gets a lot of momentum going into this dazzle right now. And this is a pressure point you're going to have to respond to. This is a hero that scales very hard in Dota right now. Pretty strong early game for Team Spirit. They're going to look to try and fight back, but Quinn with a nice rotation, just eyeing Yatoro up here all alone. We'll get the hit back. If you're just going to keep dying in your lane, you might as well rotate out of it, even if it means you're doing it pre-level 6. So, uh, as you can see, anybody who shows up in the mid lane is going to be run over by the Dazzle, especially if you get the extra vision of, like, a Tusk Snowball or the Spirit Breaker charge. You just can't get away from this Poison Touch hit, so... No, especially with these wards behind the tower already. Deep Observer for Team Spirit behind Game in Tier 1. Collapse having a chuckle about that. Yeah, yeah but that was all because Quinn tipped him before the charge even completed. Quinn knew what was coming. He could do nothing to stop it. Well, could have picked a real hero. <laughs> just, <laughs> always an option. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> four to four, seven and a half minutes in. Did we trade off Wisdom Runes? Yeah. Yes, that was the Hero. one upside of, you know, them going on mid. You guarantee the Wisdom Rune trade, which Celery's definitely happy about. Yeah. I mean, you're saying he's, like, happy to soak up XP here, but it is a weird position for an AA who'd rather just be pulling if nothing else is happening. They'll leave Durantio low into the bottom lane, but a really good use of the dagger will get him over that little cliff area, and Tofu can get some damage back in return. No threat of anybody dying, but a decent punish, and will allow Durantio to clean up some CS, but he is being pushed out of lane. Mira's not giving up on it just yet. And the Poshka even rotating down here, potentially throwing that Ink Swell into the Breaker. I mean, this is a combination we also saw when Breaker was hot that last patch. The Team Spear were very comfortable playing. The Ink Swell Breaker across the map, giving you the guaranteed setup. This is what the CK is designed to help facilitate. Push the lanes in with CK Illusions, be a ghost on the map, and all of a sudden you get one pickoff and your map just collapses, right? Well, yeah. On the flip side, Gaming trying to do something similar. If you can set anything up with a Primal split or the rolling thunder then suddenly Tarachu can come in and clean house and this is a smoke designed to find Yatoro but nobody's home Yatoro yeah. they took him out with a phantasm he sent it back instead Quinn and Ace will bite down on that but it doesn't matter too much that bait they still get some pretty good damage onto the tower one thing to note about that uh, inkswell combination with the spirit breaker oh Thought they were going to go on to Mira, but Mira is going through the portal. They don't have a stun to stop him. He gets the other side. Duraccio pursues. Dagger does hit him. Yeah, he's pretty damn slow, and he's going to hit him with another dagger. Mira, he needs the help from the Spear Breaker. He has a snowball to buy a moment. Collapse, pops his ultimate, immediately goes for the kill on to Tofu. See if they can trade things out here for the shard and the calling. That actually protects him there. Collapse doesn't want to trade two for one, so he's going to go ahead and give up on that. They cannot afford to give any more kills to this Duraccio Spectre. Got to rotate Laurel bottom. They really want to punish Duraccio. There it is. Coming back. The Inkswell charge in, chaining the stuns and adding up on the damage. Spearbreaker got that 5% buff. The movement speed as damage got buffed up by 5%. That was enough to bring him back into the meta, but then that's even more if you add in this Inkswell movement speed buff. Uh, it's a deadly combination for reasons. I like that rotation from Laurel, though. That's such a heads-up read there. You can just walk down the lane. There's no vision here. They probably had a read because Celery's been mid the whole time, right? It's going to limit where your observers are going to go. Just gets a really cheeky kill on the Spectre. Nice shard to buy some time. Good driving by Quinn. Gets around that little speed bump in the way. Hopefully, Duracho can finish him up, but not quite. No, Shall Grave comes in for Law. Perfect timing there. Quinn does manage to get some decent damage on Toro. And he Ace is hold. here. He makes the difference. He makes it so Team Spirit can no longer fight bad. It's an overwhelming amount of team fight that he'll put to work to bring down Toro. And it looks like he's going to chase down Maposhka. Mira really trying for this one. He might just get himself killed in the process. Will it be good enough? Maposhka still dies. And sure enough, Mira, he's going to be in trouble as well. Good use of the shard, blocking him out, but he still falls. Cannot stop. 
Game and Gladiators as they bring all five, learning from Team Spirit, perhaps. The only way to beat these guys in a team fight is you gotta bring everybody to the table. And that's why I think this draft feels a lot better for them to play. They can connect the heroes a lot faster. The Spectre facilitates that at a tremendous rate. And then Ace is just on a hero where, even if his lane phase wasn't spectacular, which it has been this game, that Primal split into a fast Radiance is gonna give them all the team fight they need. This CK does not have free engagements, where I felt like in the first two games, Yatoro's connections were uncountered, right? Yeah. He goes in with a Weaver, goes in with a Face, this word gets what he wants and gets out. This game, Yatoro finds himself in a pickle mid where he just can't escape, pays the price. An 0 and 3 start for Yatoro got up here. Perhaps one of the rougher early games we've seen from the entire tournament. That is a very good position for Gaiman to be in. It's Which shut down a lot of the pace. Varl's going to have to pick up that, that little bit of slack, right? Yes. He's going to have to step in with this Dazzle. But the Dazzle, I feel like, isn't a hero you, you really want to utilize just yet. It feels like that Aghanim Scepter is such a key timing. You can't afford to delay that by getting into some risky engagements. And this hero is like Tinker in some ways. I guess <laughs> first item, kind of easy to get to. You're a powerhouse when you get it, but then you fall into a valley. And it's like the next two or three you have to get to before you really come online in the ultra late. And those team fights start to become impossible for the enemy. That is a period where Gaiman can strike with this Radiance, which is going to be coming out fast on Ace this game. And just take the team fight to Team Spirit, which is where, again, you have to meet this team. You have to be willing to take the 5-on-5s five and win them and translate it into objectives. You can't just go for the other first. Smoke across the map. They failed to get the initiation on Collapse. We're going to try and join Quinn for the power rune. Quinn's going to need that help, too. He silenced up the Poison Touch. The Inkswell's on top of him, but he does manage to get away with the Swashbuckle just in time. The charge is going to complete. Collapse, he's got his ultimate. He may not even need it, though. The I Poison Touch David. slowed him down so much. And Potion is getting a TP out the shot. Oh, oh he's so close, but it runs out. It doesn't get there in time. And now a snowball to the other side to meet Zoraccio, as it is now him who is surrounded by Team Spirit Heroes. Too many to count. And that is a Midas Chaos Knight coming in and cleaning up the enemy carry there. And Yatoro gets some XP, a much better turnaround for him as opposed to the last river fight where they're still missing that tier one. So maybe a smoke and connection that Quinn and the gang just didn't expect considering, you know, they're missing that objective that went down in the previous fight. Yep. But it seems like Team Spirit take advantage of that uh, bit of an overlook from Quinn. And now collapse. Highest net worth in the game, but Game of Gladiators don't want to slow down just yet. They still have that Rolling Thunder. Didn't use it in the last fight, so Tofu and Celery think to themselves that if they can get the right kind of initiation here with the Rolling Thunder, they can follow it up with the Ice Blast, but Yutoro? Uh-oh, he's in the staircase. It's going to be very awkward. The Soul Bite does actually latch onto the two of them as Spectre jumps into no the mix as well. Please tell me they're going to hit him. Oh, they barely got it. In the fountain, he will go down. It wasn't even the blast, it was like an urn tick or something that got him in the end. Post that grave. That was a nasty soul bind. Something they're gonna have to think about with Duracho haunting in. He, they he will find responds. the big pick. Ace is so close to his radiance, he could not afford to get picked off here. So at the first sign of danger, he uses his primal split. Though you could see the spirit breakers pretty good answer to those brulings. No threat of dying here, but, but something to think damn. about later into the game. I mean, normally the dispel and tornado is a problem for this hero, but. Doesn't look like it so far, and like you said, Radiance 300 off for Ace. He just wants to get his big item and get the farm rate going. Still having a very good game on this Brewmaster. Yeah, considering the Lone Druid game, where he exactly. was so close to the Radiance for so long, I don't think he wants to risk that happening again. And Radiance is an incredibly powerful item in this meta. It's better the faster you get it. In a lot of those games, Ace just didn't get it at a time where he could take the map or the fight's over with it. This is going to be a game where he has a very good chance to do that. As Yatoro still behind, right? Yeah. This is a double Midas lineup for Team Spirit. They have one on the CK, one on the Spear Breaker, which, you know, has become the de facto build for the XP getting to the late game talents. It is going to slow the team fight presence down. I really feel like if Gaming can get a fight going in the next two to three minutes here, they're pretty favored, especially with Diffusal and Radiance coming out at the same time. This is a huge damage power spike. You want to get something going with it, and you want to get it going now. They go for it. The Radiance is complete, though, on Ace, but they know the Primal Split is on cooldown. Yeah, this is a beefy target to just go into, especially when you don't have the global ability to connect. I mean, how much does Collapse oh, think he can chunk through here? Tofu just left him alone. Tofu was needed to be able to disrupt this combination, but now Ace is left alone, speeds himself away. Somehow the Inkswell didn't go off in time, but Poshka didn't pop that one. And was like, okay, now it's my opportunity. Hello, Maposhka. Oh, almost got him with a fear shot there in the left-hand side, but Maposhka still dies. Collapse still in trouble, has a charge instead. Opts with the TP out, but that doesn't make it. Calculations not on point here. Yeah, he could have just charged the other side of the map. Maybe he didn't have a good target, but there was a mid-wave. 
They will collect a 3 extra this recall such him. an important kill, too. Gaming Gladiators with the Ice Blast on top of Laurel. Now, Collapse and Laurel, who were very much needed to be able to buy Yatoro time. Now they've both fallen. And now you're invading enemy triangle. This is where gaming want to strike. They want to strike hard on the map right now. Gain a lot of the momentum in this game. They have the supports to follow up on the core initiations. They have a crap ton of damage in the tank. As long as they can see heroes. And with Darachu able to join any of these goes, suddenly this map has collapsed pretty fast for Team Spirit. And Ag's on the Tazzle. Try and stem some of this bleeding. But right now, this crowd, they want to see a game four. They want to see Game and Strike back in this game three. And they are delivering. Yeah, I'm not even convinced those are all Game and Gladiators fans. They might just be Dota fans who want to be able to see more from a grand finals between these two teams. But it's still a long road ahead for Game and Gladiators because they're only 2K net worth up. They've hit some timings, yes, but they still have to worry about the double hand of Midas. They have to play this clean. They need to be able to get good executions, but they can't afford to use any pickoffs. Good roll in from Quinn from behind, though, trapping Team Spirit. Uh, shot goes out, looking for more. The Dazzle was shown there. Quinn getting in front of him. Blocks him out with the swashbuckle, slows him down with the inhibit from the defusal plate. It allows Duraccio to do the damage. He pops a shallow grave. Laurel, he really wants to well, pick off Quinn. Will he get that kill? The poison touch. He's got to reach it. A Lotus given over to him as well. Good plays from Gaming Gladiators. Give him the extra bit of regen he needs, and now he can pop the regeneration in his bottle for a full heal. Max efficiency right now. All Team Spirit can do is cut some waves with their double Midas heroes and, and go late. Because right now it is all gaming on the momentum chart. And a full vessel was completed very fast here from Tofu. That even gives you more damage. Vessel plus A blast is nasty in these team fights when you're throwing the vortexes down, particularly versus Dazu wants to just heal through with the inverse waves and get that going. Yeah, da you've got Dazzle, you've got the Inkswell heal that, you know, would have been a factor if it wasn't for the all the anti-heal they have. And then also the Chaos Strike, that lifesteal that he, the Chaos Knight is so dependent on. And there is no downtime for this lineup. Look at him, burned out of mana. They try and give him over a little bit, see if he can charge his way out of there, but he's silenced up by the calling traps on the corner. And then they use that Storm Panda to be able to catch more. Laurel's gonna die as well. The Dazzle getting no footing in this game. Ace making his presence felt, and this was with a second item, Boots of Travel. So this isn't even some, like, Earth oh, Core item. Oska. Looks like he didn't have a way back to the base, so he tried to skirt on through Gaming Gladiator's side of the map. But he was spotted, and he will be brought down. This Pru Spectre combination working wonders right now. Ace is 5-0 and 10. Completely unstoppable. And you can't bring the CK in to really help you here. The Brew is just great versus the hero with the Radiance Burn, the AoE Miss. He has the evasion that Yatoro can't pierce. And not to mention his ult, he can go in, start messing up the CK illusions. Yeah, with Radiance and the Dispel, yeah, his Chaos Knight's gonna be... So, what are your op... I mean, you have to just wait until Yatoro's ready to fight, I think. You have to split the map with the Breaker, and this is where Gaiman can continue to try and pick you off, put the Vessel to use, put the Radiance to use. And of course, Duraccio... He's on a hero that doesn't have to, you know, farm up some crazy stacks, doesn't have to go in the fight first. He can just farm the defensive parts of the map. If nothing happens, he's still happy. I mean, you still got a Spectre. Drum for Tofu, just to buff up the team fight even more here. Sporta is doing work, also having a perfect game so far. And the calling is not a spell that these Team Spirit heroes want to fight into. It's, it's annoying for Mira going in with the Snowball. It's annoying for Laurel trying to run in and grave people with low-level Grave. This team fight is very obnoxious right now, and it's going to collect a free Tier 2. So, a Tier 2 at 19 minutes for Game and Gladiators. They can actually take away that outpost. They've got a pretty good chokehold on the map. What they desperately need now is just not to slip up anywhere, not allow Team Spirit an opening. So they're building up this net worth lead. It may become insurmountable as long as Team Spirit doesn't pull anything sneaky here. The smoke up, it slips right past Team Spirit. They that the high ground immediately spots him a Pushka, and Durachu recognizes that that is the hero he wants to get first at the dead shot. Bounced over to Yatoro and hit by the Rolling Thunder. He's trapped, caught, and there's nowhere to go from there. Too many disables on the side of Gaming Gladiators, and they have way too much damage. They need the BKBs on the side of Team Spirit, but they're not going to get them anytime soon. He had it. Oh, now, he had it. Yeah, it was a BKB. Oh. He disassembled in body. He just didn't want to pop it. He didn't have Phantasm. There's no turnaround there. Yeah. He will choose to save it for another day. That is the fifth death for Yatoro here, who has yet to make a single kill in this game. Hey, there's the Dazzle play, though. 
20 minutes on the dot. They're going to use the Couriers to uh, use the Aghanim Shadow Wave. He could solo up that. That's the better shard I think they were hoping for. Oh, yeah. Inkswell shard from Aposhka going to be pretty damn nice here. Try and dispel these melee heroes when they go in. Still, I feel like if you're Team Spirit, you're trying to wrap this game out right now. And that is a big paradigm shift from games one and two. Yeah, how do you wrap, though, against a Spectre? And, well, you got this Quinn. He Arch is running one. around with a Pangolier. You're not going to be able to solo in a lane for very long. It only takes a few seconds for Gaming Gladiators to spot the opportunity and jump onto you. An Ice Blast not even needed. Toku has the damage necessary to kill the support by himself. And the really nice thing about what's happening right now for Gaiman is this Spectre is doing an amazing job protecting their wards. One of the biggest things you have to combat when you play against Team Spirit is the vision advantage. They had it a lot in Game 1 with that Tree and Protector. They abused it pretty damn well in Game 2. Here, it's Maposhka trying to get out, get vision for the team, to de-ward these aggressive obs that are doing work for Gaiman because they know they're there. They're getting taunted on. Yeah. But the cooldown is just so damn low. By the time you're back up, by the time you run there to try and gain anything, they're ready to jump on you again and... Uh, yeah, I mean, there's always a little Spectre bias in the win probability, and I think that's fair to say, but this is this is the best game it has looked in this series by a large degree. They're continuing to build the momentum. And he can continue to build the single target items since Ace is building the, or built the Radiance, so he can just focus on being able to take out a support in a second. He's going to build into an Orchid up next, so now if you're spotted anywhere on the map, Duraccio can guarantee that the Grimshoke dies or the Tusk dies or maybe even some of the cores. He's going to pop it here, looking for Mira. They just get the vision on him. They'll spot him now, and there it is. They jump immediately. Snowball tried to put to work, but it just means he's going to be dragged back in. He does manage to get a shard, but unfortunately, Duraccio doesn't care about your blocks there. The Ice Shards does nothing when he has free pathing. Spirit just bleeding out right now. They have no answer to the Spectre on the map. Their supports are way too squishy. They don't have an early Aura buy. There's no Beastmaster or anything to, to help protect the backline on the map or help them get lanes out. All three of these cores are just building for themselves, right? It's damage items into BKB. You have two Midases that are still trying to get the work done. Collapse will try and find a pickoff on Tofu, and this will combine with Maposhka, so they strike back a little bit on the map. Much needed. And finally, they're getting some deep vision out as well. You look at these dire obs. It took Maposhka a while, but these are some visions they can play around at least. Though, of course, the second you get spotted... What? <laughs> Maposhka <laughs> somehow doesn't uh, get spotted by Quinn there. And they have to charge back in. Are they really going to try this a second time? He's got an armor rune. He's so much shield he's got. Maposhka's just going to stay hidden here. The charge canceled by the Spirit Breaker. Rolling Thunder very far away. <laughs> he's just going to initiate from... 3, yeah, because at any point in time, the Spectre can join him as soon as he gets that initiation, but they don't quite catch him. The Ice Blast is going to be stretched out. Yutoro, they see an opportunity to turn this around. Yeah, he's going to go for Duraccio here with the Snowball. With the the dispel. Tail. There's so many heroes. They dispel out the Phantasm, but Yutoro himself, he will bring down. He will use his own hand to take down the enemy carry. Now looks to finish up these Rulings if possible. Game and Gladiator one. trying so hard. The last one is going to die. Double kill for Yutoro, and they turn back for Celery. A blink away from Quinn. He cannot afford to get caught here, but he doesn't have a TP. If he gets spotted... They scanned him. They know. Him on the scan. Uh-oh. Quinn's going to be in for a rude awakening in a second here. He just needs his blink up, and he gets hit by the Dig Joe. Swash will go from the side, but they have the silence on him. The Ghost remains with Quinn. He tries to go for a roll-up play, but he's got nowhere to roll away to. Those have TP back. But... Stuck in the corner, gets some good damage from Swash yeah, too, too many heroes. Really nice scan to finish up that fight, and I mean, a little overextension there under a Tier 2 gives a really good fight to Yatoro. Ace dispelled a lot of the illusions, instantly dealt with some of the DPS, but... Ink swells, the shards, all these little spells adding up. And of course, Duraccio going down first. That's a lot of the damage that's been working for you. Downside of this Orchid build, right? The pickoff game is where it's strong. The five on five, this Orchid's not doing anything for you into the early BKBs here. Team Maybe. Spirit strike back, and just like that, somehow Yatoro is top of the board with from 05 to Tyus net worth. This Midas and the Illusions are doing work on the map right now. I remember this was double Midas lineup plus a Dazzle, the, the, the hidden yes. tinker. This lineup is going to start ramping up pretty damn quickly if you give them the space to work with. And right now, they've got three cores farming in three different parts of the map after a successful team fight. Game in Gladiators, they cannot afford any more slip-ups. They've got Roshan still to be taken here at 25 minutes in. 
also time from Aposhka to D-Ward. One of the problems they were facing earlier in this game, suddenly he can run around with his courier, place a bunch of sentries, make sure there's not the deep vision yeah. that Gaming were playing off of earlier. So now it shifts the onus back on to Gaming in terms of you got to make an aggressive smoke, get vision back on the map, and keep setting up these pickoff plays for Duraccio, who's the one maybe getting picked off here. Jator just walks in blind. Get a free second gun, blade. pull him back in, but the silence is doing a lot of work. Quinn tries to roll up, but collapses. Oh, the ice blast does manage to grab two of those cores. Roll up, snowball onto Duraccio. They can chase that three more. In big time trouble to give him the shallow grave. Laurel oh, what a shard! BKB, but a beautiful shard block it out. Some of these heroes is not enough. Taurus still falls, and now with the toss up in the air, Laurel will come down to a hard reality. Crash down, he does have the BKB, and look at that, that heal. heal. That Aghanim Scepter with so many units around him, it's so much <laughs> heal. He is not going to die so easily. Gaming Gladiators thought they had an easy target. Oh they will fight to the bitter God. end. They'll <laughs> bring down Duraccio before he finally falls. Collapse stuck, though, in the silence. The buyback required from Gaming Gladiators because Laurel was too tough of a nut to crack. That looked way closer than it should have been. <laughs> These inverse heals are doing mad work at the end of the fight. Have to respect the person and come out from this dazzle when that A blast has been used earlier on, but still great team fight from Gaiman. Started out with Yatoro just walking blind into their triangle and they were ready for him. Shadowblade did not help him out in that type of fight and that ice blast. It was a beauty from Celery. Landed on pretty much everybody. Forces the disengage and the calling silenced Mira on this jump, right? This yeah. is the problematic aspect of this support matchup. When you go in with the Tuscar, this AoE silence clips you. Your team fight's just a nightmare. Beautiful shards on the flip to block off the pandas from Laurel. Another really heads up play, but damn, the damage is already done at this point. And now it's just a matter of cleaning up, which sounds easier than it actually looked like, right? All of those solutions and rulings play against game and gladiator yes. in the worst way. And in the end, Laurel Living does get Duraccio killed, so. Have to think about clumping up on top of this Dazzle in the later portions of these fights, but I mean, luckily, that's all the primal split, right? The second ace comes out, he's still full. He's still got Manta Radiance, he's ready to party. He's gonna slap some extra kills down for the full team wipe here. Just when this game was slipping up a little bit of momentum, Game and Strike back, get themselves a full five-man wipe into the Roshan. We'll put an Aegis out on Quinn here, who's slowly getting towards that Axe. That team fight definitely helps. Still 500 off here, but that's gonna be a large damage ramp as the Shadow Step comes out. Look, Karachi is trying pickoff. to do this solo. It's a bit dangerous. Collapse. They're gonna try and turn back around. They do have the ice blast that'll finish off here pretty easily. And collapse. He's gotta be careful of his damage by Yutoro. He comes in, swipes down Duraccio. But the rest of the team is now here from Gaming Gladiators looking for the catch, but Collapse has already rolled away. Catch him. Ball taking out the old hook shot. It's not quite enough. They have no stuns. Collapse breaks free. Straight through the man's heart. He did not care. He just walks it off. Can't really get much closer than that. And once more, Yatoro, he finds an angle in the fight, cleans up the Racho and gets the hell out. That is a full Silver Edge reveal done. And Looking now the Aegis is going to be taken away from Quinn. Ah, uh, the pickoff game is shifting, right? Yes, it is. They're not respecting the Shadow Blades, not respecting the aggression, but the Yule Scepter stalls him up, collapse, and Yutoro actually has more. BKB. They do catch the uh, Ancient Apparition. He's going to die pretty damn quickly there. Roll up. The Ruling's going to work, though. They Just need to stalling punish. out Yutoro. Now that his BKB is on cooldown, now their magic damage can really go to work, and they can slice and dice through that carry pretty damn quickly. But Poshka, obviously, he doesn't have much hope of living through this. So the fight does turn against them. Not the worst, though, for, for Team Spirit, I would say, just purely the fact that they're continuing to keep things a little even. And their other two cores are farming the map. Yes. And they've got to be happy with, like, you know, the next 10 minutes here. This is when the Dazzle and the Breaker are going to come online. They've recovered some of the lost net worth differential here. These heals get very spooky around the third to fourth item, and they're going to get them damn fast as Collapse is just farming up the map. But Yatoro's aggression used against him here. They'll get the return carry kill. That was a cocky move going up that hill and just taking the fight with his BKB. He, he can BKB TP there. Just opted. Blood for blood. Why not? We're in the arena. I love that Duraccio still not slowing down. He may die every once in a while, but he says, you know, ultimately the end game is okay with me. We're still getting some good trade-offs and bites. I'm still going to try and limit your split push oh, by collapse. going on whatever he can. Doesn't want to let him get away with a tier two for free. BKB, they stun. stick on top of him with the silence and the stuns. It's enough. Win is stunned up for so long. And now Tofu is going to be in some trouble as well. He pops his ultimate. That just kind of delays things a little bit, but there's no one coming to save him. If you're getting multiple ink souls off in these fights, it's probably going to win you the engagement. And right now you're just getting outnumbered at a tier two. You overextended on. Courier will die as well. No Brewmaster ultimate for that type of fight. 
as strong as Ace is right now with a full AC completed on top of everything else, he does want this ult to take the long engagement, right? He's the most farmed hero in this game right now. If you're gaming, you have to play around with what he wants to do, where he wants to take the fights, and what he can commit to. Otherwise, you're just creating an opening for Spirit to come in and pick you off. Yatoro once more looking for the initiation with two heroes dead. He will get scouted on an ob sentry. This is something that started happening in that game, too, where they managed to get, like, it was that one pick off on Celery, right? Where it's like they used the Chronosphere, picked off Celery, and it was like, okay, Chrono for a five position, but then they kept that going. You're like, okay, it's four versus five. Then they found another pick off and another pick off, and it just so quickly snowballed against them. Game of Gladiators, it gotta be where Team Spirit will keep this aggression on point if they think they have the advantage. And another Tormentor swiftly dealt with from Laurel and the, the Courier brothers over here. That'll just be his Chaos Bolt is all the more deadly for some of these supports. And we can see how Yatoro wants to take these fights, right? Great confusion with, with his ult going through on lanes. Show up with a Silver Edge, get a pick off, maybe reset. He doesn't have to commit into the full five on five into the Brew and Pango, which could control him in that type of situation. Oh, he got stuck! Uh, oh, no! Landed on a pebble there. And as a result, Maposhka gets a pretty free TP on out of there. The smoke that's ruined, a Rolling Thunder that's used for nothing. Interesting little tree. Trees just powerful. <laughs> One of the primal forces in Dota. First cliffs, then trees. Quinn's having a. Yeah, Quinn's, ha Quinn's having a tough time with the terrain. He's, he's today. fighting Team Spirit. He's fighting uh, the, the, the map. Game. Yeah. Happens to the best of us. Another pickoff that they will miss, which is time for the Midas's to go to work, right? Yep. They have been yep. cranking this whole time and climbing the charts. This game is a 1K net worth lead now at 32 minutes. Dead even. And everything depends on these team fights. Collapse just They're charging. the right kind of initiation here. A charge oh that hits God, both that supports. Quinn on the run here. They beat him, jump after him. Laurel chasing after him with that charge to be able to slow him down. Yeah. He's not going anywhere. Three dead on the side of Gaming Gladiators and Team Spirit have changed this game. The narrative was supposed to be Gaming Gladiators controlling and seeing if they could end it, but Team Spirit have turned this all back around in the space of just this five to seven minutes. And this is the Spirit Breaker problem. What happens when you enter the mid game and this hero starts to take over the lanes, get mega farm, and suddenly one charge, you're down half your HP. Inkswell just makes this combo even more oppressive. The only real answer is you just start the fight on your terms with the primal split going in with a haunt and delete the supports. Create a situation where you have numbers advantage and even when the charge comes through, you don't care because you have the longevity and ace to deal with it. If you're just getting caught in the open like that, it's a death sentence. And right now, Collapse is just running the map, literally. He is getting six slotted very fast. Yep. And the question is, do you have good late game answers to the Spear Breaker here if you're gaming? Outside of tossing him in the air, dispelling him before BKB. Not really, right? None of those traditional answers like a Shadow Demon or the Soulbind, which is on Team Spirit's side. Yep. And that'll be a problem, especially if Collapse is able to use that charge to kill those Groomlings. That charge damage is pretty heavy. 31 to 22, 4,000 net worth lead for Team Spirit. Zeb managed to turn this game around and continue to dodge attempts by Game and Gladiators. You could see the window's been taken out of the Game and Gladiator sale. Durancio's not playing with that same kind of fearless that he once was, where any time a hero showed up, he would just instantly jump and see if he could get the kill. Yeah, and the map has just gone dark. Yeah. Right? You have one defensive off of your game, but those days of where you were picking people off on spirit side of the map have come and gone. You're now entering their portion of the game. You kind of have to get around this. You can go late here. Spectre plus the Brewmaster, especially with how much farm Ace has found in this game, are going to continue to scale pretty damn hard. And of course, you always have this option of like tossing the Dazzle in the fight with the Wind Panda and taking the fight that way. Yep. It's a pretty damn good option, a pretty good way to deal with Dazzle and a lot of the historic matchups between these two heroes. But you got to keep scaling on everybody. The Morta and the AA scale is really important here for gaming. If you can get a fourth core out of this Morta, which, you know, Tofu has a full link. It's, he's very far. None of it is, like, direct worth the damage, you know. I mean, he doesn't have, like, an Ags or Mjolnir or Silver Edge of his own, but can only expect so much. Still, it will deal a decent amount of damage. You can lock heroes in the calling post BKB. That's the dream. A little pump fake action. Next fight coming up, all about Roshan. Ten seconds till that potential spawn time, and then we'll see when he's actually going to show up.
Also, Celery went back for this Ancient Apparition Blink, something we've seen develop in this meta. He is looking for that A Blast on the big course. The Dazzle and the CK especially, that is who he wants to hit. Cannot get Snowball dodged. You can't really just A ult some random supports. It's not going to be good enough to win the fight. Need to connect this ult on a big target and collapse. He's just going to lead the charge with Bulldoze here. Not afraid of too much while both carries on the other side of the map. Look at him just running in there. This is a fight without Yatoro. Oh, that ward somehow slips past detection. Oh, no, no, no he's got it. Brace Lincoln gets him with the dispel on the Gold Scepter, but it is going to cost Celery his life. He does have five back. He's going to play for it. Quinn off the mark there with his blink in, trying to hit some heroes, but they've already popped their BKBs and are resetting a little bit. Celery, he's going to try and walk back into this fight. He's got to be careful, though. He may get caught by Collapse. He spots him. Found the A again. The tower. Yeah, that Ancient Apparition's gone. No more Ice Blast for you to be able to use. Ace has to use his ultimate. He knew the Toro was gunning for him there, Stintly and he could have been chain stunned up. Now they back away. Primal Split being used. If they can get everybody out, it's a dream for Team Spirit. Collapse is making that momentum, though. Pushed back by the Void Panda. Now hit by the Orkin. If they can kill Collapse, that'd be great. But he has so many dispels and so many heals. Spirit jumping in. Going for the back line. The Pango's been caught, and Yatoro, he destroys him so instantly. Now turns his damage on to Durante. Oh, the charge. Back by Collapse. A charge on through. Tofu, who just managed to get the Force Staff down to low ground, does get a dead shot on the Collapse, but he's still pretty damn healthy and they can't turn this one around it is all team spirit and they will feast on the brewmaster last team fight decision making just off the charts here i mean the kiting dealing with the ult they just make it look way too easy right now and so many charges going through from collapse he is looking for the high five and he will get it here that was a fight for roshan but it is now a fight to hit high ground i mean that's Game a fight for ages uh-oh what are you going to do if you don't have the buybacks or you're not willing to commit them right here? You don't even have the primal split if Ace is back. He doesn't even have the buyback. You are short. Massive swing. Short on so many levels right now. Collapse even ulting a Bruling because he knew the Lincolns was coming back up on Tofu just to get back in there and get another charge through. Lead is absolutely exploding here for Team Spirit as they are sensing potentially a second Aegis going their way. One, One more lane of Ferris and a Roshan to take. Team Spirit, they still have time on the clock. 30 seconds left on the Brewmaster's revive. That is more than enough to get this Aghanim Scepter and a Crystallis. They were winning that fight. Now they've got like 10,000 more gold of items to be able to use with an Aegis and Cheese and all these other items slowing in. Now you've got a Grimshoke with an Aghanim Scepter. Is Silver Edge fully complete? They are creating too many problems. You can't deal with any of them. Level 25 also coming out on Collapse. So even more bashes on top of the Ags. If you thought this Spirit Breaker was causing you problems before, he's going to be causing them double now. Just no control for him. And he's way too tanky to try and burst. Arachio is just not doing enough single target DPS at this point. You're going to need one hell of a long drawn out fight. Team Spirit. Uh, crazy. They're up 2-0 in this series they're down in this game three they have a five percent chance to make it back in sure they could just give it up say well guys it's the best of five we can give them one but they claw their way back into this game are now in a commanding position to potentially 3-0 the challengers in gaming gladiators that is what makes this team absolutely terrifying at this point in tournaments and we saw everybody from all these teams talk about it right if you get ahead of this team what does it mean it just means when they might beat you it feels even worse Right now, this game has turned itself on the head, as you said. Over 20k lead. Age is up for four minutes. So it'll be up to Yatoro in terms of whether he wants to push the high ground during this interval and try and end this game. He feels like he needs even more. There's still a lot of room to grow here. They did finish up an Ags on Maposhka as well. So now you can start to get some dark portraits in the mix. Just add even more chaos and confusion to the fight. More damage sources. Yatoro. Win. Blank it away. No fear. Can't get caught. Otherwise, that is welcoming Team Spirit into your base. Charge completes half his health. Yule Scepter is going to be used. Nicely breaking with that Lincolns, but he didn't use that Bulldoze towards the end there. And these are just free. They have the ways to get Collapse out every time. There's a Lincolns, there's a Swell, there's Four Staffs, Grave. Yatoro's going to take his chance to... Oh, man! 
before you can even complete the sentence. He's already gone. They do have an Ice Blast, though. That's pretty well positioned. Duraccio's already cleaned up the Grimstroke. It's not too bad, but Duraccio, he needs to get out of there. It's, oh, my God, that's so much. Five back it's the too Spectre. much damage. Spectre has to win this now, but he has to be careful of that something. Dazzle. They have to be able to take away this Aegis at the bare minimum. Surely they have to go for more. They have to risk it. Collapse is going to charge on through to make sure you can't set up on Yutora. Now Yutora will turn back around on you. He's ready for that fight. He pulls back into Duraccio. This could be it for Gaming Gladiators. And let's find a way out of it. Quinn's dead next. Now Duraccio, a dive back for him. He falls. Tofu's pulled back in. He is pulled to his death, down into his grave. Quinn, last man standing for Gaming Gladiators. It will be a one-man stand against what is looking like the best team in the world right now absolutely as they take a commanding team fight victory inside gaiman's base no buyback on the brewmaster there they just delete the highest net worth hero for gaiman straight off the bat no turnaround potential and you are running out of lives you are running out of games to play here as team spirit they don't want to just be the best team in the world they want to prove that they are one of the best teams ever to grace this stage right now and they are showing why they're going to go for the megas play it safe and ags finished on mira He's about to kick this team straight out of the tournament if he has his way. And they're going to go right for the throne. Quick reactions from Quinn. Has to blink away. Just one little opening is all it takes with Mira lurking from behind. Ace back up. We'll see what he can do to stall this out. Going to need one hell of a primal split here. Yutoro starts pushing forward. Mira doesn't quite get it there, and they actually stop the Spirit Breaker right in front of their base, but they're locked in by the shards. Quinn's able to hop around it, but now the Silver, it holds him in place. He can't do anything against that, but at least the Brewmaster can. Gets and off they the kick split, him in. But the throne is exploded, and now he's been pulled Welcome back. Welcome to hell. Oh, no. It is too much for Gaming Gladiators to be able to handle. They are not going to be able to get through this. They have to pray to get out, but the Cathedral is merciless. It is Team Spirit who are unstoppable. They will take it. The best team in the whole goddamn world, without a doubt. Silence every other team. 3-0. Absolutely an incredible performance in the Grand Finals against the best team in the season, an undefeated Grand Final team in Gaming Gladiators, a team that has defeated an entire lower bracket to get here. They take 3-0 in record time. Kick them out of this event, claim a second Aegis for the crew, the first one for Laurel, who has fit in immaculately with this roster. This is a team everybody had on their radar, but they have slowly built it up over the course of the year, are hitting in prime form right now, and it shows this team has multi-generational players, and now they are absolutely cementing themselves as one of the best teams ever to play the game of Dota 2. How do you stop these guys? You can't beat them early. You can't beat them late. Even when you have the full advantage, you have full control of the game, they'll beat you on the comeback too. Team Spirit did it every way possible. Nothing is left for them but the handshakes in the end for Gaming Gladiators who had an admirable run through the lower bracket. I mean, it was the stuff of great stories, but it comes to an end here with Team Spirit just being too damn good. Yotoro boss, this man walks out, he shaves his head, he sends a mental message before the round even starts. This is a long due victory for them over the course of this year, they built up to it. And for two times, the second time in the Dota's history, Team Spirit will claim the ages. Team Spirit win the international.
All right, all right. Sorry, Tom. Just a moment of your time. Congratulations, Laurel, from last place to first, baby. How are you feeling right now? You have joined the club. You have won the international. Uh, I feel great. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for an unbelievable game. Miposhka, hello. I must interview you right now. Congratulations, led the boys again. You've joined the two-time club. Did you know you had a 5% win, a chance, probability of winning that game? And you guys came back. How's it feel to be a two-timer, baby? It's a magic. Like, it's uh, our team spirit. <laughs> and finally, I got to do it to you. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the undisputed best carry player in the world! Thanks. entire time, all your fans around the world, any last words for the world of Dota coming from you, my man, and Team Spirit. Thanks for all our support. Oh. Let's go. Thank you so much, and congratulations to Team Spirit. Well done. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up one more time for your TI champion. for Gaming Gladiators in that Grand Finals, and this will be a moment that will go down in history. One of the most dominant teams in Dota 2 history. Gaming Gladiators came close, but Team Spirit, the ultimate raid boss selfies need to be taken. That Aegis will be pictured a lot, a lot tonight. I'm joined here by Lacoste, Effie, and Tigov, and we're here to talk to you about everything that we missed. If we missed anything, I don't even think we missed anything. I think Team Spirit Lacoste, they are amazing. Absolutely. This is the team that, uh, you know, they didn't get the chance to experience crowd at TI10 yeah. when they won it, and really glad that Seattle is cheering really hard for them. This is the team that had a bit of a rough year at the start, and they started to pick it up, you know. Going into the Riyadh Masters, Dream League, they know when to power up. This is the team that enjoys playing on the main stage so much. You can see on their faces all the smiles. That's what Dota is about, having fun and winning some big money. <laughs> oh, yeah. But my God, what a team. I mean, they are magical. I feel like the only other team in the history of Dota that embodied this kind of resilience and passion for the game was OG and their former run, but this team spirit, it's like we haven't seen anything like them. Their players have improved so much in the last year. So much. I can't even speak to the improvement of Mira, of Laurel in particular, and for them to just win this Aegis after a year that looked rocky for them at the start, after not placing well in the three majors this year, for everything to suddenly fall into place for everything to finally click right around the corner for TI. I mean, if that isn't magic, I don't know what is T. Oh, I mean, just it's the fact that they have these systems in place to be able to shape Lao into the player, to become the mid laner, you know, be able to replace her into Tokyo. Again, like Lacoste mentioned, the start of the year, it was shaky. They barely got in the top eight of one of the three majors. And now here, they get first place. And for Toronto, uh, no, Toronto, Yotaro, sorry. Two-time TI winner, and also second ever player to get a Rampage in a TI Finals. The crowd love him, yeah. he's just popping off in the game. Like this team, they are just incredible. I mean, Dota has not seen a player like Yatoro for a very long time. I mean, he was in contention for people saying he's the best carry in the world, the GOAT, but he has proved that here today at TI. And even earlier this year, during the Riyadh Masters, he carried his team to victory. He fought tooth and nail when they looked like they were going to lose, when it looked like there was no hope in their games. He was the one to just push them forward. And here at TI, they all connected, they all came together, and it was just a beautiful team victory here. It was a great victory. 
victory. Great support coming out of the Climate Pledge Arena as well. And for everybody in the arena, I also want to make sure that you guys are aware that you are allowed to stay here for the late game show as well. So you can witness that. You can witness team spirit in uh, the late game show with Perry and Flax and Jenkins. So just so you're aware, you don't go anywhere. There's a lot more to come. Team Spirit's run has been fantastic. We got four new TI, double TI champions, and I'm, I must bring it back to Laurel because his story has just been fantastic. You heard Slack say it on the main stage. He came dead last, dead last, last year. And it was a rocky start, but there was support from all his teammates, support from the organization. We heard on the main stage, Toro said, at Rehab Masters, I really want to win this championship because I want Laurel to experience what it's like. And that he did, and then he went to take on the international with the same squad, and T, I can't believe they did it here as well. And they just did it in such style as well. Like, they've played so many different types of games as well. Like, they're not just doing one thing the entire time. They are, every single time they approach a game, it's a new way Spirit approaches to beat their opponents. And I don't know, it's just the most commendable way to win it. And sure, it was a 3-0 but it was a 3-0 in style and yeah team spirit it just it's so it's yeah they, like they believed in laurel when yeah. uh, you know getting that last place at di and also some big shoes to fill this guy he's nuts every single game that he played you could see that he's powering up uh, so throughout the tournaments uh, you could see that he can be toe-to-toe -to -toe against some of the best mid laners in the world and now he is the best mid laner in the world crown immortalized yeah. absolutely what a story and i mean for laurel to play in this team like lacoste mentioned the shoes were big the nerves were there and every time Team Spirit performed badly, he was blamed. There was mass criticism mm -hmm. from the fans, mass criticism of Laurel from the community. People were begging to have this player replaced, but the other members of Team Spirit refused. They believed in him. They said that they think he has the potential. They said that they trust him and they know that he's their mid laner. And here we are at TI, he's won it. Yeah, immortalized on his dazzle at that. I just want to take a, a, a small moment to just iterate the Wallpaper every time is the heroes that want TI. We have Chaos Knight, Dazzle, and Spirit Break yeah. as our boards <laughs> on that wallpaper. I think Tigov, that is the perfect embodiment here. Oh, that's so, so beautiful. You know, just Spirit Breaker, you know, just gonna be next year. We're gonna have to remember this beautiful cow just in the, oh, the good times. The good times will be remembered for a very long time to come. I also know that the average age of players here, this might be a random point, the average age of players playing at TI is around 23 years old. Yatoro is 20 years old. He won his first international at 17. Now his second international at 20. Lacoste, I mean, hey, this, not to, not this to think guy about. can continue going. He pretty much played for only one team, Yellow Submarine, which kind of turned into Team Spirit. The other th members of the team, Laurel, who started to play professional Dota in 2021, collapsed. He only played for three teams, Mira only two teams, one of them also being, you know, just predecessor to Yellow Submarine and the veteran Miposhka leading the team. You know, so you have this mix of a new blood and also some veteran player that's going to lead them to the victory. I mean, the key thing here is the future of Dota, Dota is bright, right? Like when you think about the players here, they're 20 years old, 22 years old, and they, they've only been playing competitive Dota for, what, nearly four or five years, some of them? like. These are the ones lifting the ages time and time again, and it's like, yeah, it's just so good to see. And also, I just want to highlight the support duo of Team Spirit. I mean, we've talked about Laurel, we've talked about Collapse, we've talked about Yutoro, and these are incredible players, but Miposhka and Mira are the heart of this team. They are the backbone of this team. They play so well every game and their praises go unsung because it's so hard to shine on a team with someone like Yatoro, right? But they're so consistent. They're there with the saves. They're there with the lanemen. They're there with the pressure. They do everything right and they have done everything right this TI. Yeah, and for Maposhka especially, uh, we know that his first his first recorded professional results were in 2015, but he's been around for a very long time, Lacoste. And this guy, this is his second TI win. What a crowd achievement at such a successful career absolutely this guy is just amazing you know whenever we get the chance to talk to him like the insight that he gives of course he doesn't want to reveal yeah. everything maybe after ti we're gonna see in some of these vlogs oh, this so. guy is just a rock of the team like you can rely on him he's gonna be carrying the game on some of his signature heroes when it's necessary this guy is just a menace to play against
And he has that, you know, compassion that embodies a leader in a team like this. If you've ever interacted with him or heard him speak of his teammates, he views them so fondly. He's very calm. He's not the type of person to lead with anger, to lead with a form of aggression. He's, he's one of those captains that just leads through friendship. And as cliche as that sounds, that is who he is. Yeah, and it bleeds into the team as well, because when, when they're even behind, when they're down, they're still smiling, they're still having fun. Like, how often do you see a pro team when they're, you know, backs against the wall, they're still enjoying the game? Like, team spirit throughout this entire journey, not only were they the best team, but they just enjoyed every single moment, and it's why they're able to be so successful. At TI-10, they won first two games, then they lost two games, but this time around, TI-12, they made it look very easy. Two games were complete, uh, you know, obliteration coming up from Team Spirit in the third game, 4%, and they still managed <laughs> to come back. Dota Plus, not really, you know, Team Spirit, they're all against the odds. 4% it was, by the way. Yeah, 4% <laughs> to win that. that is, whew. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, they, the game was very close. It just shows a lot of character that they were able to beat back, Effie. Exactly. I mean, this is the spirit of this of this team. This is what they embody. Yes. They are determined. Even when they're playing with a net worth deficit, they never play like they are. They play like they're always in the lead. They play like there's always a means into the game. And you've heard from the teams who have lost a spirit or won against spirit. They always say, regardless of winning against this team, they exhaust you. They make you tired. They fight for the entirety of the game, for every inch of the map. and I mean, that's why they're here. That's why they lifted the ages. That is why they lifted the ages uh, through hard work. They, they worked really hard this, game, this year to get to the point where they were on their team synergy and on their Dota, of course, as well. They went through the upper bracket. They only dropped this entire TI run, Road to the International and all. They only dropped two games, T. Only two. It was just crazy to think about, and especially because like the group stage, it was so clean for them. They dropped a, a, a game to Virtus Pro, a regional opponent. They yep. dropped a game to Liquid as well, and then as soon as they went against LGD, I feel like they just leveled up. And of course, Yataru, I mean, he shaved his head. Like, do you, <laughs> did you expect any other result today? Sacrifice was made. I mean, he is the most successful to go bald pro player ever in the history. People have followed in his footsteps, failed miserably. He has two times in a row done it. Bam, Listen who wins? You, he's the only one who can wield that power, okay? Yeah. This power exists within Yatoro's realm. It's not something for other mere mortals that to shave true. their heads and win TI. But on the topic of one more player, I do really want to give my commands and Mira his flowers because I remember after he won TI 10, he did a few interviews where he said that he felt like an imposter. He didn't feel good enough to be a TI winner. He didn't feel, he didn't feel like this was valid. He didn't necessarily get that sense that he was one of the best players in the world. So now that he's a two-time TI winner, I really hope that that imposter syndrome can go away because he's proven it not just to himself, to his fans, but to us, the Dota community, the rest of the world. Yeah. They need to update this picture. I'm sorry. This is oh, unacceptable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do. I mean, to be honest, I don't think... Well, we've seen other pros attempt to shave their head to embody a Toro's power, but let's be real, that power is his own. And it, it works for him. It works for the team. They have done it. They have taken the ages for the second time round, which is an incredible achievement. So congratulations once again to Team Spirit for having their victory. I feel like we also need to give a little bit of light there to Gaming Gladiators because they also had a fantastic fantastic run. They came second at this international, and that is not something to be ashamed of. It might feel really rough right about now, especially after that third game, which it was a game they were very close, Lacoste, to be able to, to force out a next one. Absolutely. I mean, Gaming Gladiators, they were the team to beat throughout this year. But like, all three majors were won by them throughout the upper bracket, and they did look, they looked like a team that's not going to stop. But uh, unfortunately for them, Team Spirit, they did power up at the right time. And also, Gaming Gladiators, they also had really, really good tournaments so far. You know, dropping down to lower bracket and making the magical run. Unfortunately, Team Spirit, they were too strong today. They were were very much too strong today and while we witnessed Team Spirit's victory a lot of people around the world were able to cheer them on and revel in their victory this is Moscow we have so many pop stops happening around the world I also want to say once again late game is coming right after this so you don't even have to leave I know a lot of people were having their time slot booked out for a full best of five we might not have gotten that but there is still more content coming on this very channel and in the Climate Pledge Arena as well. Oh, 
so much love coming from around the world here for Dota 2 and its World Championship. The international was taken by Team Spirit, but truly the real winners are all the fans. And I know, I know that there are so many people already that can't wait for 2024 when there's a new hero in the mix. I also think that we learned a lot at this international that we can all incorporate in our own games. And I'm not talking about that a bit, although I think we might see that as well. You mean aim your head before queuing up some pubs. Oh, no, I, it, there's new ways to take the uh, the Tormentor down. That's something that, uh, that, that I learned. You can do it with Bristleback. With this Aghanim Sentry, you just turn your back. You can do it with Dazzle if you just have couriers around and you heal the couriers and get the armor low and everything. I, I'm just I just realized as well. Technically, Yatora, he also won the Aegis, but he also won the uh, most deaths to Tormentor this TI. He... <laughs> So congratulations! <laughs> Yay! Yay! I mean, Another one. Holder. Another win. <laughs> Wait, Another win. If that's true, then that proves that the Tormentor is the ultimate villain. It's the hardest thing in Dota to beat because it beat Yatoro. There it is. The only thing that could beat him. The Tormentor. Yep. Yeah. Tormi is too strong. Tormi too Nerf strong. Tormentor. OP. OP. Now, I know I've said it a couple times, but I'll say it again. There is a late game show, and it will feature all of Team Spirit. You can watch it at home if you want to. That's fine. You can watch it in the arena if you want to, or you can uh, watch maybe in uh, Charlotte Martin Theater in Seattle, if you can find a seat, which I'm sure you're gonna be highly coveted, but uh, if you get there in time, then uh, kudos to you. But there is, uh, there's a lot of content in that one, and it will be a fantastic late game, so you better, you better make sure you watch that one and take your time to do that. Oh my gosh. Oh, deep breaths, everyone. I mean, we still got all the confetti here and the memories that will stay with us for a very long time, but it's about that time. It is about that time. T, you want to go first? Dota's a beautiful game, connects the world, and yeah, thank you everyone for doing it. Without the fans, we wouldn't have all this, so yeah, good job, thank you. Dota is a part of me, Dota is a part of my life for a good 20 years now, and I just want to say thank you to every each one of you who attended. Thank you, Seattle. Thank you for each and every player, each and every person who managed to, you know, stay up uh, to 2, 3 a.m. to do the work, every single person behind the scenes to make this possible because it's the most beautiful event, especially this one we've ever had. Yeah. I mean, nothing can match the prestige of the international. We've seen it today. It was special watching the audience, is special seeing everybody unite, coming from all over is special. And yeah, Dota is a magical game. I'm forever grateful to be part of this community. I'm grateful for the game, for introducing me to all of my new friends and meeting everyone in the audience has been incredible. People have been so kind and so passionate and what an experience. What an experience indeed. It's, uh, it's, it's TI vibes and we say that we say that a lot, I mean, especially backstage, because TI Vibes there is something special, because it's just, it's in the air. It's the people you see, everybody is happy and passionate. TGov, there's just nothing like it. Yeah, nothing can replace it. And, and it's simple as that, and that's the joy of TI. And I look forward to the next TI, and the next one, and the next one, and the next players that come in and try and take the ages away from Team Spirit. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's in a class of its own. It's in a class of its own, and I, I just want to give a massive shout out to everyone that's tuning in from around the world. I know, I mean, it's very special to be in Seattle. I mean, I also think back in Seattle, whew, that in itself is amazing, but so many people tuning in from around the world, and as Lacoste said, time zones. Ah, who cares? Everybody tuning in at awkward times just to make sure that they can witness the greatest Dota to have ever been graced. Lacoste, what were your favorite moments of this international? Hard to choose, you put Hard me on the spot. Yeah, yeah, I, am, I, am. <laughs> uh, I don't know, it, it feels like, you know, we just had so many things that, uh, you know, made this tournament special. Like, uh, there's like the shift in meta where we see like shifting each day pretty much, especially during the main event. Uh, it's what makes this game so beautiful. You'll think you know what it is, then someone shows you like a couple of hours later that you don't know what you're actually playing. Even these like top tier teams, they lose in 20 minutes because the other team is just better. Like they prepare, they don't sleep and they, you know, show you how it's done. Yeah, it's also just really fun to watch the players come out on stage and really feel the energy and you can see them just basking in their, you know, own enthusiasm and their love for the game. You see them clapping and smiling and they feel like they're on top of the world there and you can see that and that is a special thing to see. But I guess my favorite moment would have to be VP versus Bud Boom, that really long <laughs> 75 minute game where Kira touched TPs to the racks and dies there and whew, that was that was one of the good ones. A wild one for sure. 
The fall of Western European Dota. Finally, we get a bit of China love. We get a bit of what else? We got, we got Eastern <laughs> Europe, and then also this orc guy the entire time. He's been pretty good. <laughs> oh, 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 There we go. Very, very, very much. A lot of dedication coming out from. <laughs> there we go. I will tell you mine as well, because uh, I was walking around before the road to the international playoffs, walking around, and I took the wrong turn. We went for coffee. We did? You and me, T. We went yeah. for coffee, and I <laughs> told you that I knew the way. I did not know the way. We went exactly the wrong way. Yeah. But that did mean we were right in front of Ben Oria Hall when we found out that we were in the wrong place. And Ben Oria Hall, the place of TI2 and TI3, a lot of special memories. So for me, that was very special. And then I must, if you're talking about Dota, the best Dota 2, I mean, the finals were fantastic, but I must, must highlight Team Spirit versus LGD game one yesterday, upper bracket finals. That was intense, insane. I, I loved every second of that. And that was, uh, that was, I think, my favorite moment. I got to watch the last minutes also in the arena because we thought it was over, obviously, you know, 20 minutes ago. So that, uh, that was very special. And seeing Team Spirit win here again, it's just, there are so many, so many wholesome moments that this team has, and they have captured all of them as well. They capture everything. We saw already the moment that they won. We saw Miposhka, Effie standing with a camera in his hand. They vlog everything. I mean, actually, if you go on their YouTube channel, you could probably learn every detail that you want to do about any of the players. But I, I do love that about them, that they're such an immersive team. Like, if you're a fan of theirs, there's so much content to consume. You can get familiar with all of them. So I, I do think that's why they have one of the strongest fan bases in Dota, outside of just playing solo. Yeah. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I know that uh, there's still a lot of people here waiting for late game, kudos to you. There's a lot of people waiting in the crowd still already for the actual late game to watch it live. There's a lot of people still watching here because they're waiting for late game to watch it from their homes or from the comfort of pub stomps. Uh, but we're, we're just getting, getting ready with late game. We want to make sure that the moment we tune out, you're entertained with late game. So we're, we're, we're holding the four down here as, uh, well, this entire tournament, we talk about regions a little bit there, TGov. I feel like we have to continue talking a little bit more mostly in regards to the Chinese region because I felt like compared to last year, last year they came top four, uh, fourth with Aster, and that was the only team that really did uh, incredibly well. We had LGD still doing okay as well, but of course that was a different LGD. I felt like this was the resurgence of the region. No, for sure. And I think it was refreshing throughout the entire year at the majors and stuff. We had this like kind of just Western European dominance the entire time. It's why I was happy, you know, that they uh, maybe didn't do so well this time around. Because I think once TI sets a statement to what region to look at, mm -hmm. then the Western European fans and the, the kind of Western audience need to look elsewhere to, yeah. to absorb their Dota content. So uh, I think for China specifically, LGD and then the old guard of Azure Array being able to show up at TI both get top four was incredible just for international Dota. Yeah. And also they produced one of the my favorite memes that uh, Dota has ever seen, you know, Lanham <laughs> talking about his team that everything is fine against no, gaming no. gladiators no, and sounded no, like this please. is this is fine and everything's oh. burning in the Happy back. There's like four people dying. It's just like, you know, it's, it's going to be one of those things. They, I, I, I was I was watching that yesterday and I was spitting water out of my mouth through my nose as well. But we got to give credit to them because they played some amazing Dota reaching top four without even trying too hard. You know, we talked about the teams that have practiced throughout the year. They formed and they're like, you know what, we're going to show up at TI and do well, and they reach top four. Yeah. The old guard plus some of the new yeah. generation of the players, they did extremely well. Yeah, but on the topic of that, imagine being Lanham in that moment. I mean, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> like you're doing an interview and everyone's cheering so loudly, so you're thinking to yourself, yeah. wow, oh, we're really winning, yeah. yeah. And the cheering <laughs> gets really loud and he goes, oh, come on, a roll here with my answers. You know, yeah, he walks down back to the green room, he's looking at the screen and just goes for now. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah. uh, we did see, we did, we did hear, apparently Chala said uh, on his uh, social media that they were, they were all laughing at it. They were all running <laughs> away from the fight. And then someone goes, kill that bear. <laughs> <laughs> Tears around. Oh, this, uh, I mean, there, there's going to be a lot of memories from this year's international. And of course, I mean, that one is a great one. But the biggest memory will be that we have for the second time in Dota 2 history, a two-time champion. Four new players are getting that award. And Laurel, of course, now also a TI champion. And Team Spirit with their championship. A clean sweep. 3-0. There's only two other times that happened in the history of Dota 2. So Team Spirit will go down in history. It's one of the most dominant teams of all time. We'll see if they can repeat it next year. I know that the hunger for these players, it just doesn't seem to cease at all. 
But that is it, ladies and gentlemen. We're ready for a late game. So without further ado, I mean, we, we've loved every second of it, and we've hoped that, ever, that we've been able to convey those feelings to you at home, to you at the arena. We've, we've loved it, and we hope to be back here in Seattle some other time to experience the same thing, because it's something special, and I, I can't even put it into words. But um, I'm going to have to. So thank you so much from everybody in front of the camera, everybody behind the camera. I know everybody cares a whole lot. And it is amazing to feel the love from everyone in the arena and online. So thank you so much for that on behalf of everyone involved. And ladies and gentlemen, your TI Champions of 2023 Team Spirit, congratulations. And we'll see you for the next one. All eyes on the prize.
from the Charlotte Martin Theater in beautiful Seattle, Washington. It's Late Game with your hosts, Kirian Flax and Jenkins. Thank you guys so much for coming out. I realize we just had. I love Jenkins. We all love Jenkins. We, we, we spread this event by word of mouth, so I'm surprised we have a packed crowd. All right, let me try something. I've always okay, wanted to do Okay, okay, okay. Who's ready for the light show? Wait, I want to do, do another one. Okay. Who's ready for a new Dota patch? All right, ho hold on, hold on. We don't know anything about a new. We don't know anything about a new Dota pack. Next right? week, there's official. No, I'm just kidding. I okay, don't know. Yeah, there's no I announcements. There's no reveals. It's just us and some guests. Who wants to see Team Spirit out here? Well, we we got. You have news. to wait. We got. Bad yeah, you're news. gonna have they're, to wait. Yeah, they're way over there. They're winding theirs. down. They just yeah. had just had a really long series. You know, really hard long series. It's been a long day. Long day. Five games. Let's so uh, let's have a seat. We'll get some guests out here. How about that? Thank you very much. That's our band for this evening, by the way. Eldridge Gravy and the Court Supreme. <laughs> Phenomenal. Phenomenal. All right. Uh, should we get some guests out here? Let's do it. Let's just get in. Let's into get it. our guests yeah. out here. Do you guys like uh, Suns fan and Cinderin? You guys yeah. fans? Yeah. Well, we, we didn't get them. We didn't get them. No, we did get them. They're coming out. Suns fan and Cinderin! Somewhere. Keep playing. They're coming. Keep playing. Keep playing. I know this is the late game, but you didn't have to be quite that late. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's it. That's, That's the bit. It. That's the bit. <laughs> Wait, left us waiting for. I was really enjoying the band, so. Oh no, they are know. great. Yeah, yeah. That's fair enough. What did you think about Ti? Great. This year? You, you've been to a few. You've been to a ton. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I had a great time. I think it was a great tournament. I loved the arena. I loved the vibes. It was it was good. You know, three and a half hour flight for me. That's sweet. Seattle. Yeah. That was the highlight. That is his highlight. Is. It was a short flight, so it was a good TI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's about right. Let's just talk about the thing you want to talk about. Let's put all the cards on the table here. The new hero. Shannon, what do you think about it? Suns fan? Yes. What do you think about this new hero? Is this Puppet Master? Or is it no. Puppet? Okay. I see a, a belch sign in the audience. I appreciate you back there. Uh. <laughs> we get a belch? No. He can't, he can't do I don't want to get fired. We, they've already uh, denounced my voice line many a time. Anyway, uh, yeah, a lot of people seem to think it's Puppet Master, but the reason they think that is because uh -huh. in the files, it was called Puppet Master, oh. but the skills are nowhere near the same as, for people that don't know, the Heroes of New Earth hero named Puppet Master, which was really cool. But I do have some inside information that's definitely fake. Go on, then. Uh, 
the quote-unquote leaked ability from years ago is actually a Sir Action Slacks ability that he created in our custom game called Community Hero and Item Project. He made basically a virus in our game that just destroyed the custom game called Parasite. And his ult was to take over another hero. Okay. Like you take over an enemy hero and you can just waste Ravage. But that's not, that's not, just for the record, that is not anything to do with this new hero. That's just something that's That is a theory. Did. No. That's your theory. There is a theory that that is what it is. That would be a bit strong. A lot of theories turn yes. out to be true, Perrin. That's true. And a lot of dumb shit that makes it into the game turns out to be a Slacks idea. That's like also that is the true. Centaur that Cart or a Pocket Ricky, you know, all this stuff. Wait, was, was the Centaur Cart actually something he came up with? Uh, he, he did like an Ags. Oh, it was a lichen axe. The that's lichen right. axe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one where you bite an ally and turn them into a wolf. A, wo a wolf, as he calls it. Thank you, thank you, Slack. So, waiting for the Ursa where you get little baby Ursas to walk around with, that was also his idea. <laughs> <laughs> thank God he's not in charge, honestly. <laughs> I do love him, but uh, thank God he's not in charge. Uh, Jenkins. Do you have any questions for these boys? I but you guys really hit bottom of the barrel <laughs> getting us for the late Shut time. up. It's a setup for a bit, you jackass. Okay. Yes, of course. I've got a he question. He was staring at the crowd looking at the signs about himself, by the way. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I'm looking at that pudge sign. All right, clearly they don't have any questions. Do you guys have I got any a question, question for you guys. Oh. I got a, I, I don't know what he just said. I got a question. He asked when we're doing grand finals, and we did already. It's called Captain's Draft 3.0. There you go. <laughs> We're here to announce the Moonduck 2.0. No, we're not doing that. When you guys, when you guys are casting grand finals, when you're in it, well, when you, whenever you guys are casting on the non-grand finals days, of course, <laughs> okay. group stage, yep. are you in character? Do you feel like you're playing a character and the guy, the guy that's at home is different from the guy that's on the screen? Not that much. He's very stupid. I'm very smart. We kind of <laughs> just do the normal thing. I don't think I believe I, I can't. Well, who was it we were talking? We were having a conversation backstage. Oh, yeah, it was your financial advisor, right? Yeah. So we met We met Shannon's financial advisor. What? That's, yeah. He, At he a Dota was, event? He was yeah. here for some reason. They were having pizza. It must have been a really good deal. So yeah, I feel they, like they you're were, getting scammed. They yeah. were having pizza, and his financial advisor is there. And we have a conversation. We talked to each other for like one minute. I've never met his financial advisor before. And he immediately says, okay, you guys are exactly the same as in your cast, because we were just going at each other. So well, I don't pretty know much if the I same. True. That. I don't know if I believe that. And we've got a way to prove oh, no. whether you guys are telling the truth. Uh, okay. So while we set that up, we're going to have a little uh, bit of music from the wonderful house band. And uh, they're going to play for us while we get that set up. You guys, don't worry. You sit tight. All right, take it away. Get up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, We're Eldritch Gravy in the Court Supreme. If you didn't catch that before, this one's called Exceptional.
y'all. Get up! so much guys thank you that was amazing are you guys ready for this this is a genuine no. acme lie detector oh okay that we have acquired using valve money uh <laughs> you can't, don't look inside the here. box this is all extremely elaborate equipment as you can see uh and we're now going to ask you questions jenkins will be the question master we'll and do, I will we'll, be, do a, we'll do a test a test run we'll just stand. what's your name oh yeah let's do we got to set it up my real name yes, yes. Your real name shannon that's true that's true, that is correct. Are you just pressing a button randomly? No, this is a no, genuine is lie detector. Wait, right. read it. Look at what it says Look. on the box, lie detector. It's a lie detector. Gotcha, okay. Okay. All right, you gotta, you gotta make sure that he's on the level. Should we too. calibrate yeah. his? What's your name? Shannon. That's a lie! Can I say his name for him and then you hit You're green? making this very confusing for me, pressing the buttons. Pose. <laughs> that is just not true, so. Yeah. Hey, I'm very good. <laughs> no, whatever. All right. Uh, Jenkins, um, ask them a question. Question number one. I'm going to ask him two in a row. Ask him two. Do you listen to ASMR? Hell yes. It's disgusting. It gets more disturbing each time, too, which is kind of sad, but that's a different story. What stage are you on now? Uh, you don't want to know. When we're doing business meetings and he screen shares, he forgets I can hear. I just hear, you're a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sick of this. <laughs> that leads me to my second question. Second question. Are there erotic undertones to the ASMR that you listen to? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I, I didn't say I listened to them for that reason, but yeah, of course. They got to sell somehow. You think I lie, by the way, ever? <laughs> he's telling the truth. This was not, he was not a good guy to choose to do that. Yeah, I know. Okay. He's too honest. He'll lie. He'll lie. We, we'll, we'll, we'll do him now. All right, all right. Get trolls. Do you have a belch reflex? <laughs> no. That is true. He does not have a, he cannot belch. I cannot belch. So sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't do it. So sad. Was That's that the guy comment. with the belch sign really saying that? I really lost the genetic lottery. That was so unfortunate. I really wish. Oh, no. Do you want me to talk about the crop dusting on air? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> My kind of show, I'm not going to lie. I won't. I won't. <laughs> you can talk about it, though. Yeah. Uh, I'll pass, because he's uncomfortable. Well, he'll pass, he'll pass gas later. <laughs> <laughs> not, right. not, not orally. Next okay. question, Jenkins. Okay. Suns fan, do you believe you carry the Suns fan and Cinder and Duo in casting? No. Hit the other button, Jenkins. <laughs> that is awkward. Okay. Very awkward. <laughs> yeah. Cinderin, you often decline events because you're playing World of Warcraft. <laughs> Are you ever playing WoW and you just tell somebody, I'm busy, I can't do something? Am I ever playing WoW? Do you lie? Do you lie about it? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Next question. I didn't really think that far ahead. <laughs> what were you expecting? <laughs> Shut up. You're not, a, you're not the guy anymore. It's him. When's the last time you sharded? Like eight years ago? It's actually... Eight minutes ago. Yeah. 
That's why I come equipped with diapers now, right? It's part of my contract. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they were like getting on stage. That's why. It's on your rider because it rides up. <laughs> Do you ever get upset that he keeps mentioning he used to be a CSGO professional? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well done. The machine does the work, Charles. You don't need to fill us in. This is 100%. What, what patch was it on that you're a pro? Not CSGO. I didn't say CSGO. Beta. Yeah, people call me that, but what patch? <laughs> <laughs> CS. <laughs> I was going to go more into that, but we'll leave no, it for another day. We'll leave uh, it. We'll leave it. All right, last uh, question. Beta 7 is the answer. Great. Really interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You guys get to ask each other a question first. So you can ask him a question, anything you've ever wanted to know that he can now not lie about. Wow, could have maybe given me a little bit of a warning on this. this is a no, it would Ask him anything. Ask him anything. Is Jenkins a good business partner? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. Uh, does Jenkins make you feel very uncomfortable in general? <laughs> no. Sometimes. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> all right. Okay, that's it. That's Thank all you we got. Guys. <laughs> Great Give job. Give a round of applause. <laughs> all right, we're going to get this taken down. So while we do that, we'll have another fantastic musical number from Eldridge Gravy and the Court Supreme.
you so much. That was amazing. Uh, Jenkins, we've got to get these two yahoos out of here because, uh, frankly, they've overstayed their welcome. We want to get Team Spirit out here at some point, but I'm thinking we need an expert to do, like, an exit interview with these boys. Well, there's one guy. There's, there's one guy. There's one. There's two guys, but it'll be the other one that, <laughs> yeah. that you didn't say. <laughs> Shall we get him out here? Shall we get him famous for his out-of-breath exit interviews at TI-10? Uh, let's get Arvo Plus out here. Arvo Plus! Come You know, I noticed you hugged him, but not me. Any reason for that? I really like him. Is it because I'm uh, carrying a Kleenex box That might have been part of it, yeah. Okay, just checking. Yeah. Avo, we need your expertise. I ran here, by the way. I know you did. That's good. <laughs> Unrelated to the show. That's good, but, but you've had a bit of time backstage to catch your breath. Um, we have some apparatus on hand that will be able to recreate the TI-10 situation so you can do exit interviews with these guys. Jenkins, if you would please fetch the equipment. That's good. All right, Arvo. The plan is you're going to sit on this exercise bike. It's yeah. all right. Yeah, Jenkins will hold your mic for you. Thank you. Get, a, get a good sweat going. Yeah, get get go. out of breath. And then you're going to exit interview these guys. Uh, if you chaps could yeah, you come can. and stand up here, please, and yeah. Arvo will interview you. I was come so on, let's get that cardio going. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. Yeah. All right, Jenkins, you're going to have to hold the mic for him. Let's do Sun Spam first. God damn it. He's, I can already feel a sweat. <laughs> Sunspan. Yes? Uh, what's going on <laughs> through your mind after losing a million dollars? That you're riding a bike and asking me questions. If you had to describe the emotions that you were feeling, oh. You can slow down a little bit, Arvo. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say? Your burning sensation right now is higher than my thighs. Probably, I would hope so. Oh. Are you gonna stay with your team next year? What team? God, you're as bad as the interview in the pros. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, just All right, try. do Cinder and next. This man's Cinder. gonna. I mean, this die. is a this is a real pro interview. They get two word answers, right? That's no, true. Exactly. I'm trying to keep it realistic. Okay. Uh, I'm still interviewing Sunsman. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're really in character. Oh my god. This is hell. Fly, I mean Sunsman. Uh. <laughs> Fat fly. <laughs> can you think of your best moment of the year and describe it to the audience so we can end on a very good note? And this I can moment end. right here, you in agony. <laughs> All right, that's good. That's uh, enough. Bravo, thank uh, you. Should I leave? Yeah, you guys can all go. All right, goodbye. Hell yeah, I dodged the Thank you, Alvo. <laughs> See you oh soon, brother. God. Get this man a glass of water. He's drenched. Oh. oh. Bye, Alvo. Wait, stop, stop there, stop there. Why, what's the problem? Stop, stop there. At TI-10, no, TI-8, uh -huh. I, I did a show like this with DJ Wheat. And when we brought the pro players out, there was nowhere for me to sit. So I had to sit on a little desk extension. We couldn't get that, but we've got something better. No, no, you can't use the sofa. This year, I, I, can we bring out the tiny, tiny desk for, for Jenkins? <laughs> Yeah.
There you go. Look, I'll give you a few little bits of paper as well. Dude, I gotta if you want to do some this, drawing. Man. I'm an old man that. now. Well, well, uh, that's Jenkins sat down. I've sat down. Uh, who's ready to see the winning team of TI12? <laughs> All right, let's get them out here. Your TI12 champions, Team Spirit. <laughs> Well, first of all, guys, congratulations on an insanely dominant performance uh, throughout the tournament. Were you guys in a hurry today or something? Because that was a very quick grand final. No. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> why, why was it so fast? It was a joke. Don't, don't worry about it. Okay, so. Okay, okay. So you, They're you're too strong, bro. They're just like um, They're too just strong good. right now. They're just... We are too strong right now. Much too strong. That is true. <laughs> you said you guys were, was it a 6 out of 10 at Dream League? Mm -hmm. what, what are you now? Are you 10 out of 10 Team Spirit? No, uh, not yet. I think like uh, 9 like out of 10. 9 out of 10. <laughs> what else is there to improve? Maybe Playing third ages? Maybe other, or like, uh, maybe, um, like, we'll play better next tournament, so <laughs> it will be a 10 of 10. You've got the bold buff, Yatero. You shaved your head. They call it the bold buff. You're not actually bold, but we'll take it. Uh, <laughs> I, got, I got to host this. I'm obviously bold. There is some power there. SVG got to cast the grand final because he's bold. There's real power in boldness, isn't there? I want to hear it from you. Yes, yes. Yes! Oh. That means a lot to me. Thank you. I got a question for you, Toro, as well. You said, Laurel is your son. He's your baby boy. <laughs> Did he do it? Did he finally make you proud? Are you a proud father? Uh, yes, yes. I think I'm not his son. <laughs> to be honest. I think we need a DNA test, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, Yatoro more son than me. So. <laughs> okay, so I, I've been watching you guys do these uh, vlogs on on YouTube. Uh, they're very very detailed, and you do a lot of stuff with your team comms and talking backstage and all the rest of it. Are you ever worried that you're giving too much information to other teams? No. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think we are giving a lot of information for other teams because we are like, uh, we just like, um, like give uh, what we need to uh, um, them to know. Like. Right. We give um, them just a part of our like, information. They just think about it, but we have like, a lot more. So we, we don't give something special. Like, and uh, anyway, I think we could give more, but it's, uh, I understand it's very important for fans. Uh, right. If I would be a fan, I would like to know how things work, uh, know much more about teams. So I think it's an important thing, but uh, you can't uh, review everything. True, of course. <laughs> Okay, speaking of the content, you guys did Smells Like Team Spirit, right. Nirvana. Was anybody actually playing their instrument? Everyone. We get the lie detector back out. We can get the lie detector. We have instruments, actually. <laughs> yeah, we do. That's true. Team Spirit take over for the band. That'd be yep. something. Yep. All right, let's talk about your guys' team chemistry, because you always look to be... When, when we were, I was just watching the, just the grand final even, you guys never seem to be that far apart. You seem to know exactly what each other's doing. How much practice does that take 
or is it just you just play together long enough it just becomes second nature yeah i think like your second version is right like we played a lot like for one year and then the start of our roster we no our games was not really good and we did kind of bad <laughs> but now no, we had a lot of practice and probably some good patch <laughs> and also we found you know, really good ideas how we should play with each other how we should use mm. each other and yeah yeah <laughs> fair enough quinn said and i don't remember if this is public or not but whatever new <laughs> there's gonna be a new, <laughs> new patch he doesn't give a shit um you guys are a team that you kind of no matter what the patch is you play like the same roles of in the game you know collapse is playing like the mars type heroes you get in there you do shit like no matter what the patch is, you kind of do the same thing, and when the patch is yours, you're like really, really strong at it. Do you, do you think that this is one of those patches for you? It, like, first of all, is he right about that, that you guys just fit the same kind of mold on every patch? Uh -huh. I think Collapse probably playing Kimba Heroes, so if he sh his role has Imba Heroes, we will win. <laughs> like Mars, that's a, Spirit Breaker. That's a fair breakdown. Crystal back, as you can see. As coach, I can say we're trying to use the strongest sides from our players. Just that's it. Okay. Well, honestly, I mean, yeah. Do you think that applies to all Dota pubbers out there? That you should just play to your strengths? Or should I, should I go you know, learn how to be position five because I'm too scared to carry the game? Yes, um, you should actually. Like, if you're scared, <laughs> just don't play. Care. So I should go play position five. Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> Who wants to be supported by Jenkins? That's a. Well, actually, I'm being supported. Yeah, You've I'm been a wonderful right position yeah, five. Cool. Thank you. Uh, when I play carry, you should uh, like have no fear like in the game because if you're scared like of something, you're gonna lose for sure. So. What are you scared of, Yatoro? Fighters. Shampoo. <laughs> So I wanted to talk to Collapse very quickly. Uh, you're Magnus uh, in most of those games that I saw. You're off lane in general. But how often are you thinking, can we fit a Magnus into this draft? Is that something you're thinking? Can we do that? Does that ever occur? I mean, it was like day 10 every time. I just say, pick me Magnus right. already. <laughs> and ju they, they just pick it. And you're always happy playing it? Yeah, of course. Fantastic. I got a real one here for my boy, Laurel. When you first joined, you were replacing a legend. Everybody was saying, Laurel, the new guy, you know, he's the reason Team Spirit's not this TI winning team. Well, you fucking did it, man. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> how, how did you go from Laurel, you know, a year and a half back or whatever it was, to, to Laurel today? How did you improve? TI winning Laurel. To be TI winning Laurel. I, mean, <clears throat> I think it's just time. Just need to wait. I always know I'm going to be the best, so I just need to wait. <laughs> and you guys had faith in him too, right? You didn't listen yes. to the noise. So I think uh, you need to wait. If you know you're going to win, you're going to win. Yeah. I wanted to say just, just briefly, Collapse, just between you and me, thanks for getting my voice line, buddy. I really appreciated that. <laughs> that made me very, very happy. A TI winner used my voice line. That's hype. Who used uh, yours? Mira used mine. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, my you're a good one. Like a um, good meme you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Thank you. very kind. This I don't know great, why they're yeah. thanking me. We should be thanking yeah. them. You guys were amazing. Um, absolutely uh, amazing to win it twice. For those of you who have won it twice, um, which, which was more important to win? Sorry, Law. Which felt better to win, the first one or the second one? Mm, first one, I think first one, because it was like the first time like in our life, first LAN we won. So I think that was like the most important like point. Uh, since when we will be just uh, more stronger like as a team. And now we have to win four times, because like if you win like three times, he will have like only two. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I wanted to go through you guys, for those of you that watch anime, which I'm pretty sure is all of you, mm. maybe minus a couple. What, what anime character, everybody's got an anime character, right, that's like, I'm, the, I'm that guy. Like, this is the guy that I'm going to, like, model my, like, Dota play after, you know, like, I'm never going to give up, et cetera. What's the anime character for you, Yotaro? We'll go left to right, that you're, that you're just, like, you're trying to be that guy, to, to have the motivation to win twice. Mm. Once. <clears throat> I think it's uh, Tanjiro Kamada from Demon Slayer. All right. To be honest, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, did, I, I didn't think thing. about this, but I think, uh, like my opinion, you just need to be better than you in your previous day. Mm. Like better with every day. So I need to be it myself. <laughs> yeah. mm. My character, I guess, it's Himura Kenshin from Samurai X. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. No idea, but uh, I would say it's uh, Mugen from Samurai Shampoo. I'm not watching anime. <laughs> yes! Come on! As a guy who is also not watching anime, I can uh, explain how I feel like this team is already anime for me. I'm not watching. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm feeling like we are, uh, I hope so, I hope we are main personage who can, uh, I'm feeling like we can struggle and lose to not the best team, some middle teams, but when our enemies become very powerful, very strong, we are like, main character of anime, we are going to win it. <laughs> well, as is tradition, uh, especially on late game, the TI winners have to open some champagne. So we're going to bring some bottles of champagne. That's why we're here, actually. Okay, of course. And you're going to pop the corks, and we're going to celebrate. So uh, can we bring the champagne out here for Team Spirit, please? Oh, okay. You guys want to stand up? This is the fun part. Good luck. Let's go down the front here. If you're in the first few rows, you may get wet. All right, are you guys ready? Is your TI-12 Grand Final Champions, Team Spirit! Okay. 